Prologue, 26 Kythorn, the Year of Doom, 714 DR. In a gentle summer rain shower, Flar Starbrow Melruth and his company fought for their lives on the outskirts of Myth Dranor. The streets of the Shashirinam, the Temple Ward, were choked with blood-maddened throngs of gnolls whose battle cries sounded like the barking and snarling of hyenas. Towering mesoloths, insectoid fiend armies with heavy iron tridents or simply their own sickle-like claws waded through the feral knoll warriors to reach the elven ranks. "'There are too many, Flar! We cannot reach the tower!' cried Elkazel. The sun-elf swordsman was not generally given to despair, but Flar could hear the hopelessness in his voice. All morning long, the armsmen in Flar's command, a sturdy company of ak Flar infantry, had fought alongside many others to repel the assault on the temple ward. But the evil warriors came on without a break, heedless of their own lives. "'We cannot abandon Crown Frost,' Flar replied. "'The arms major is still fighting inside.' He turned away from Elkhazel to meet the attack of a pair of axe-wielding gnolls. He cut one down with a quick drop and thrust into the warrior's midsection, deflecting the blow with an expert turn of his left-hand dagger. The other simply disappeared into the confused melee. Unfortunately, Elkhazel was right. There were too many foes, more savage warriors and hell-spawned fiends than Flar could have imagined in the whole world. So many gnolls lay dead or dying in the street surrounding Flar's company that the elves could not form ranks or fight the battle of maneuver that might have favored their quickness and skill over the gnolls' brute strength. Only forty yards ahead of Flar's embattled company, the pale walls of Crown Frost Tower rose over the streets. Home to one of the city's wizard schools, it held no great secrets that Flar knew of, but it happened to be a strongly built building on the city's outskirts. As such, the fiend lord commanding the enemy horde had chosen to launch his assault on that part of the elven city by seizing Crown Frost. Arms Major Olortanol had no choice but to deny it to him. Somewhere in the tower, Olortanol and a small company of elite blade singers and champions fought to repel the horde's attack. But the press of gnolls, mesoloths, and other foul warriors had surrounded Crown Frost, keeping the elf armsmen outside from going to the aid of their commander. We need a better plan, Flar thought. He stepped back from the front ranks, searching for some alternative, some order he could give that would change the character of the fight. As long as his soldiers were under assault from nearly all sides at once, there was little he could do. He glared at Crown Frost, so near and yet so unattainable, and to his surprise he spotted a pair of elves fighting desperately on the broken battlements. Arms Major Olortanol himself, commander of Cormanthir's army, and his second, Arms Captain Selorn. Mesoloths attacked the two recklessly, coming on despite horrible wounds, and Nycoloths flapped ponderously in the air above the tower, closing in for the kill. Flar! The Arms Major! Elkazel called. I see him, Flar answered. He didn't know how he could help the beleaguered champions, but he had to do something. Shouting a war cry in Elvish, he dashed forward into the line again and hurled himself against the press, slashing and cutting on all sides as he struggled step by step for Crown Frost. By the random opportunities of battle, or by the fury of his own counterattack, Flar found a narrow space around himself. Follow me, he called and pressed ahead. When next he found the chance to look up to Crown Frost, he saw Nycoloth alight behind Selorn and cleave the arms captain to the breastbone with its heavy axe. The blow crumpled the warrior to the ground at one stroke. Alortanol half turned to meet the new threat. With his back unguarded, the Mesoloth that had been in front of him stepped close and jammed the points of its trident between the elf lord's shoulders. More weapons flashed, and blood splattered the wet stone of the tower's top. The arms major sagged, only to be seized by the Nycoloth and hurled down from the battlements with a shout of infernal triumph. Arms major! Fla cried. Alortanol struck the white flagstones of the street only a few feet from Fla and lay still, his sword Carivian clattering from his loose fingers. The gnolls all around Fla hooted and yipped shaking their weapons in delight, 
while the young captain stared in dismay at the broken body of Cormanthir's great champion. Alert and all, he said. A knoll standing near the fallen elf lord stooped and split the dead arms major's skull with its battle axe. It howled in delight and shook its gory weapon in the air. Flar's momentary horror vanished in an instant, replaced by a white hot fury. Without even knowing how he did it, he hurled himself through the remaining knolls and rammed the point of his longsword through the breastbone of the knoll that had struck the fallen Olortanol. The creature spun away, Flar's blade lodged in its heart, and wrenched Flar's sword from his hand. Knolls all around the young captain snarled with hate and moved in, axes and maces raised. Flar found himself standing astride Olortanol's body wielding only a dagger in his left hand. At least I will die defending a great champion, he told himself. Then his eye fell on Karivian, the arms major's sword. Quick as a fox, Flar discarded his dagger and stooped to pick up Karivian. It was a heavy hand-and-a-half sword of arcane blue steel, its edges slightly wavy, its hilt worked in the shape of a blue dragon's head and wings. Whether it was meant for him or not, he was in need of a sword, and better that he should take it than leave it to be stolen by gnolls or broken by demons. A brilliant azure gleam sprung from the blade as his hand touched the hilt, and a cold steel voice seemed to whisper in his mind, I am Karevian, last of Demron's blades. I will not fail in my strike, warrior. Flar nearly dropped the weapon in astonishment but he was already in mid-swing, a wicked uppercut that sliced through the throat of the nearest knoll and ended by cleaving the snout-like face of a second one standing nearby. Karevian burned with holy fire, and Flar wheeled to face any other knolls nearby. They were backing away from him, yellow eyes fixed on the mighty sword. Flar's soldiers cried out in acclaim and surged forward to drive off the savage warriors, cutting down any who did not run. A great shadow fell over Flar, and he looked up to see the Nycoloth who had slain Selorn spiraling down toward him, great black wings spread wide, axe dripping in its claws. Get away from my prize, fool, the monster bellowed. I slew him, I claim his arms. Karevian burned bright in Flar's hands, and the captain raised the sword above his head in a high guard. The big warblade felt as light as a willow switch in his hands, and he could feel it burning with holy wrath against the infernal creature approaching. Flar met the master with a grim smile. There is no prize for you here, Hellspawn, he called to the Nycoloth. Come any closer, and I will send you back to the foul pits from which you crawled. The Nycoloth roared in wrath and plummeted down on Flar. Despite his defiant words, terror nodded his chest. But then Karevian spoke again in his mind. I will not fail in my strike, the sword promised. Chapter 1 30 Tarsok, The Year of Lightning Storms, 1374 D.R. The High Mage's summons found a raven Tesher in his workroom quietly making ready to leave Tower Raylock. He was just finishing with the last of his spellbooks, efficiently stowing them in a well-warded magical trunk, when the lilting voice of Kilianthial, the last surviving high mage of Raylock Domeir, whispered in his mind, Mage Cheshire, please join us in the Great Hall, she said. We would speak with you. A raven looked up at the interruption, and a flicker of impatience tightened his brow. He had frankly hoped to avoid this leave-taking when it came down to it, but no elf wizard declined a summons from a high mage, let alone a room full of them, and he knew that Kilianthial was not alone. He sketched a graceful bow to the empty air. I will come, he replied. That is the second time this year I have been called to the great hall by the high mages, he observed. They are beginning to make a habit of it. He shook his head and placed the last spellbook in the trunk, closing and locking it with a whisper of powerful magic. Then he straightened and surveyed the workroom with a long, slow gaze. 
For better than eighty years, a raven had belonged to the circle of Tower Raylock, earning the right to call himself mage, as well as the respect of his fellows. But the time had come for him to leave his studies there. He caught a glance of his visage in a mirror hanging by the door, and smiled without humor. He looked the same as he had the first day he set foot in the tower, a tall sun-elf with a long, sparely built frame and an intelligent, inquisitive expression to his bronzed face. But his eyes were colder than they used to be, and there was a hardness to his demeanor that hadn't been there only a few months ago. After arduous travel, great battles, and deadly peril in the wildernesses of Faerun over the past four months, a raven had become as sharp and unyielding as a blade of fine elven steel, as if fate had conspired to hammer out of him the ease of his former life. He did not like the way that felt. Enough delay, he told the face in the mirror. I am not so important that I can expect high mages to wait on me. But a raven took one more moment to touch his hand to his chest, running his fingers across the smooth purple gemstone that lay embedded there. The Selukira of Selithil de Lardrigeth was invisible to any but a wizard's eyes, and it lay concealed beneath his clothing. But a raven found that he was hesitant to appear before Kilianthial and the others with the stone on his person. They will notice if I do not bring it, he decided. He frowned into the mirror again, then slipped out the door, locking it behind him with another word of power. Even though Tower Raylock was arguably one of the best defended places on Evermeet, a raven had acquired a very active sense of caution of late. Only a few months before, the Daemon Fae had proved that even a wizard's tower in Evermeet was not beyond attack. A raven strode easily through the familiar halls, strangely ill at ease on the day of departure. But the Queen's guards, who stood watch before the hall's doors of Blue Leaf and Mithril, greeted him amiably enough, and admitted him to the High Mages without hesitation. Bright sunlight filled the great hall, streaming in through the simple glass panes of the dome overhead. The High Hall had been virtually demolished during the Daemon Fae raid against Tower Raylock, but in the hundred days since the battle, Artisifers had worked long and skillfully to repair the battered chamber. The dome was not yet set with magic theer glass. That was the work of years, not months. But for the time being, mundane glass served well, filling the elegant hall with slanting rays of warm spring daylight. Ah, welcome, a raven. Thank you for joining us. High Mage Kilianthial stood amid a half-circle of five high mages, the most a raven had ever seen together in one place. She was a slender sun-elf woman, who might have been a girl of thirty, but she was in fact a full five centuries in age. Like all high mages, Kilianthial embodied a spirit of tremendous power in the frail envelope of a mortal, the potency of her art almost shining from her wise face and slender form. She had been gravely injured by a madness spell during the Daemon Fae attack on the tower, but she had since been restored to her power and sanity by subtle songs of healing. Kilianthial had been fortunate. The High Mages Philaren and Arama de Rothal, the other two High Mages of Raylock Domeir, had not survived the attack. I am at your service, a raven replied, bowing. He stole a quick glance at the other high mages who stood with Kilianthial. To his surprise, he recognized the grand mage of Evermeet, Braithel Olather himself. Next to him stood the wry and good-humored moon-elf, Anfallen, then a cold and distant moon-elf diviner named Isolfarl, and finally a stern old sun-elf whom a raven guessed to be the lore-keeper, Haldreathen. "'Are you well?' Kilianthial asked. How is Ilsevile? I am well enough. Ilsevile is in Silvery Moon, visiting the court of Illustrial on behalf of her father. I have not seen her in a couple of ten days now, but we have spoken in sendings. In truth, a raven had found that he had become accustomed to being apart from his betrothed. Despite the months they traveled together earlier in the year, they had spent years away from each other during their two decades of engagement. How may I help you, High Mage? I have heard that you intend to leave Tower Raylock, Kilianthiel said. 
Yes, High Mage, I feel that my studies here are concluded, at least for now. It's time for me to follow my own road. Where will you go? A raven glanced at the others, who stood watching with impassive faces. High mages did not assemble for small talk, and he could not believe that they were all so interested in his comings or goings. The House of Cedars, Lady Kilion the All, I have not kept it up as I should have, and its solitude will suit my research as well. I am sorry to see you depart, Raylock, a raven. So many of our comrades were lost in the Daemon Fey raid. Tower Raylock is not the place it used to be. Kilianthiol studied his face for a moment, then added, But perhaps you are not the mage you used to be, either. He looked up sharply at that. Kilianthiol did not miss much, did she? He met her gaze levelly. No, High Mage, I am not. The trials of the last few months have hardened me, and Selethil Selukira has provided me with whole new fields of lore to decipher, things I could not have imagined before. He indicated the great hall with a turn of his hand. I have done everything that I can here at Raylock. The study of high magic awaits you here if you stay, a raven. A raven smiled and said, While I have changed much in the last few months, I have not grown fifty years older. It is not an unreasonable wait, the moon elf Anfallen said. You would be taking up high magic at less than three hundred years of age. Very few of us do that, a raven. I know. When the time comes, I will be honored to begin my studies. He looked at the high mages facing him and frowned. Is there some reason I should not leave, Raylock? Kilianthia inclined her head. Without meaning to, she seemed to be looking down at him from a great height indeed, though she was barely five feet tall. We have been discussing your recovery of the Selukira and your subsequent reweaving of Myth Glorok's mythal. Lord Severell reports that your efforts resulted in the dismissal of a small army of summoned fiends, and led directly to his victory on the Lonely Moor, as well as the flight of the Fairy Legion and their Daemon Fey Lords. You have accomplished great things since you left Evermeet a few short months ago. Thank you, High Mage. However... Kilian the All said, not quite interrupting him. We are concerned about the nature of the High Lord Gem you have found, this Night Star. She glanced at the others, and back to a raven. May we see it again? It is deadly perilous to touch, High Mage. I have escaped harm only because of an accident of genealogy. The Night Star of Salithil will not spare you if you are careless. We will be careful, a raven. None of us will try our strength against Salithils today, Braitha Olather answered. The Grand Mage was new in his post, having ascended to his duties only a year ago. He too was a sun elf, dignified and stolid, but a raven still sensed uncertainty about him. So many of Evermeet's mages had perished in the past few years, killed in Kimul Nimison's rebellion of six years past or lost in the expeditions to defend Evereska against the monstrous Faerim only four years later. Olather would have been the fifth or sixth choice for the title he held had the other high mages lived, and most knew it. The Grand Mage offered a small nod, and a raven acquiesced with a flickering frown. He reached his right hand into his shirt and closed his fingers around the cold facets of the Selukira. The gemstone slipped painlessly from the flesh over his breastbone, leaving not a mark on him to show where it had been anchored to his very bones a moment before. A raven willed it to become fully visible, and it appeared in his hand, a fine crystal of deep violet about the size of a woman's thumb, etched meticulously with tiny lavender runes. He whispered a word and left it suspended head high in the air floating in place under the power of its ancient enchantments. He withdrew three steps and said, I remind you again, the Night Star is very dangerous. The High Mages moved closer, though none approached closer than a full arm's length. 
Kilianthiol pursed her lips thoughtfully as she studied the dark facets. Braithel Olather whispered the words of seeing spells and stared intensely at the flickering spell auras he read in the gemstones. The loremaster Hadraithan simply frowned, saying nothing. Finally Braithel sighed and turned away from the night star. It is an old stone, of that I am certain. Old and strong. That is what I told you, a raven said. Yes, but I wanted to see it for myself. The Selukira might have instructed you to lie about its origins. Grand Mage, I am not under the stone's control. Examine me, if you are not sure. We have already, Hadraithan said. The scholar measured a raven with a long look. Just because no sign of the stone's dominion is obvious does not mean that you are not under its influence. After all, through this thing you wielded spells of mythocraft we did not even suspect were possible. Who is to say that this Salithil Dulardrageth didn't possess enchantments that we cannot detect? If the Night Star had overthrown my mind, Lore Master, why did it then permit me to strike against Sawyer de Lardrigeth and bar her from the mythal of Mythglorok? A raven demanded. For that matter, why did it not hide its identity and invent a more innocuous origin? It could have used me to subvert one of you if it had concealed its true origin. Sometimes half a truth is the best way to cover a lie, the moon elf Anne Valen said. Still, I agree that your Night Star would probably not have allowed you to tell us so much about it if it really controlled your mind. Even if you are not shackled to the stone's will, you may be under a more subtle influence, Kilian the All said. If you are right, the Night Star is the handiwork of a monster. Selukira hold much of their maker in them, and it seems to me that you might be wise to put it away somewhere for safekeeping, and never handle it again. Better to destroy the thing outright, Adrea then added. I understand your concerns, a raven replied. But consider this. The Night Star holds the spells of Mythocraft that no elf has known for five thousand years. Secrets as old as ancient Arivandar remain inside the Selukira. I do not understand all of them now, but in time I will. Kilianthial gazed on the stone for a long time, then looked up at a raven and asked, Is the Selukira capable of instructing you in high magic? A raven hesitated. He felt the other high mages awaiting his answer. He did not want to speak the truth, but he dared not attempt to deceive them. Yes, he said at last. He heard soft intakes of breath and sensed widened eyes and sharp sidelong glances around him. It was not often that high mages were surprised. The spell I used to sever Sawyer de Lardrigeth from the mythal of Mythglorok was a spell of high magic. There are a number of even more powerful high magic spells in the Night Star as well as a great store of lore on Mythocraft and similar works. I have only scratched the surface of the Selukira's contents. Have you embarked on the study of the other high magic spells contained in the lore stone? The diviner Isopheral asked. Not yet, High Mage, but it is my intent to do so. A raven felt the consternation of the others, but he did not look away. Sarya de Lardrigeth did terrible things with the mythal of Mythglorok. What else might she do, given the chance? Who else might be able to do such things, now that the Daemon Fey have demonstrated that they are possible? Faerun is littered with the remnants of elven wards, vaults, and gates. He paused, allowing the high mages to consider his words. I fear things are stirring in Faerun. Things that our forefathers buried and forgot long ago. Our ignorance may prove deadly. The impudence, growled Hadraithan. Kilianthiol, you erred gravely with this one. Kilianthiol's eyes flashed, but she kept her voice calm. A raven, you have no way of knowing what perils might sleep in that ancient lore stone. 
Even if you succeed in your efforts, we may all have cause to regret it later. If nothing else, your defiance of our will in this matter speaks poorly of your readiness to become a high mage. I understand, high mage. I have weighed all these factors in my decision. Whether you believe it or not, I am the best judge of the perils of the Night Star. You will not study that lore stone here, Kilianthia replied. I know, a raven said. He offered a deep bow. That is why I have chosen to depart the tower. As I said, the time has come for me to follow another path. Deliberately, he stepped forward and closed his hand around the Selukira as the high mages watched. He slipped the lambent gemstone beneath his tunic and pressed it to his breastbone again. Then he turned his back on Kilianthial and the others and strode out of the great hall. Patches of snow still lingered beneath the green branches of the evergreens that mantled Mythglorok's rocky shoulders. Despite the bright sunshine that had lingered all day, spring did not come early to the Delimbier Vale. The air was damp and cold with the snow melt, and not far from the ruined walls and broken domes of the ancient elven city, the Star Stream, second of the four talons that fed the mighty Delimbier, roared and rushed with white, cold floodwaters so loud that its roar filled the air miles from the river's course. Flar Starbrow Melruth pulled his cloak closer around his broad shoulders and gazed over the jagged stumps of a long-abandoned colonnade on the city's southern heights, watching the last embers of daylight painting the snow-covered mountaintops and high, wooded hills with soft splashes of gold and orange. He was a moon elf, tall and strongly built, with the strong hands and long arms of a born swordsman. A clear night coming, he remarked. The stars will be out, but I think it will be cold. Lord Severo Miratar looked up from the large map he was studying on a table nearby. He was a noble sun elf, with red hair showing silver streaks at his temple a high cleric of Corella Narethian who wore a surcoat emblazoned with the star and sword of the elven god he served. I think I've come to like the spring here, said Severo. I find it bracing. As high captain of the crusade, even Severo had come to think of Evermead's expedition as the crusade, despite the fact that he'd resisted the appellation for some time. He had chosen the ruins of Mythglorok's library for his headquarters. Though the empty shell of white stone was mostly open to the sky, the building still possessed strong walls that were easily enclosed with light screens and rugged canopies. Nearly six thousand elf warriors were encamped in the city's ruins or in the forest nearby. An elite guard of twenty knights of the Golden Star stood watch within a stone's throw of the old library, along with dozens of officers and aides who helped Several and Flar to keep order in the elven army. A couple of months ago, you might have thought differently, Flar said. The wood elves of Rythai Welathor told me how bitter the winters are in these lands. Do you know the ice broke on the Delimbier only a ten day ago? Flar was more than he seemed, an ancient hero of fallen myth Draner, whom Several had called back into life with a powerful spell of resurrection. Together, the Sun Elf Cleric and the Moon Elf Champion had led Evermeet's crusade in a fiercely fought campaign to defend Evereska and the High Forest from the Daemon Fey lesions of Sarya de Lardrigeth. Will we still be here in midsummer? Or the fall, perhaps? he continued. Several straightened up from his map table and looked at Flar. There's more on your mind than the weather, my friend. What is it? How much longer can you keep this army together, Severo? A raven banished Sarya's demons, we destroyed her orcs and giants, and her fairy have fled the field. It seems to me that you have accomplished your goal. Evereska has been preserved. The folk of the High Forest are safe. Your army has no enemy to fight. Flar turned from the open colonnade and climbed a couple of weathered stone steps to the empty shell of the library, lowering his voice. For that matter, have I now accomplished the purpose for which you summoned me from Arvandor? What am I supposed to do now? 
Several frowned. I do not know that I have an answer to your second question, Flor. What are any of us supposed to do? You called me back from Arvandor to beat an army of demons. Now that Sarya's demons have been defeated, through no doing of my own, I'll add, I find myself wondering whether I am supposed to, well, go back. Flar looked at Several and shrugged. Do I just discorporate when I'm ready to go this time? Or do I have to go throw myself off a precipice or something? Is that what you want to do? Flar looked at his hands for a long time. I don't think so. I feel alive enough right now. I miss Serena. I miss her terribly. But I know she is waiting in Arvindor for me. And time does not mean much there, Several. In the meantime, there seems to be more of the world for me to see, and more things for me to do. I just don't know if it is wrong for me to linger now. Several stepped close and set a hand on Flar's shoulder. I think I know Corellan's will in this, he said. You were not called back to live one hour, or one day, or one battle. You were called back to live, for as long as fate, chance, and your own heart allow. There is nothing wrong in tarrying here. It is nothing more or less than any of us do. Flar looked up, a crooked smile on his face. Well, good. I would hate to leave again without finding out where in Faerun the fairy legion had gone to ground. You and I both, Severo murmured. He returned his attention to the map spread out on the table. You asked me a moment ago how long I intend to keep the army here. My answer is this. I will stay here until I am convinced that Sarya's legion won't return and cannot be found. I don't expect all of our warriors to stay that long, but I certainly hope that some number of them do. We have unfinished business with her. Flar joined him at the map. We fought her at the Lonely Moor eighteen days ago. As recently as ten days ago, she and her fairy were here at Myth Glorok. He tapped a finger on the Delimbier Vale, thinking, Some of her fairy can teleport, but not many. They would have used that tactic in combat, if it was available to them. But they do fly. How fast could a flying army travel? Fifty miles a day? Sixty? They didn't seem to be tremendously strong or fast flyers, not like an adult dragon or a giant eagle. And they must carry some equipment with them. I'd expect they've abandoned anything like a supply train. Sixty miles a day, ten days, that would be six hundred miles from here. He looked more closely at the mountains and forests depicted before him, and frowned. Within that distance lay tremendous swaths of the great desert of Norok, most of the wild backcountry of the Nether Mountains, the Grey Peaks, the Southern High Forest, the High Moor, and the Evermoor, as well as the forbidding ice mountains north of Silvery Moon, and even the spine of the world and the high ice. She could be anywhere. Have you been able to divine any clues? I have been casting divinations every day, with little luck. I suppose I must redouble my efforts, and ask Vilsilde Gareth and Gerildin to have their own clerics and mages begin the search too. Perhaps if enough of our spellcasters search at once. I suppose it's the best chance we have. But Severo, if we do not find some sign of the fairy soon, you will have to give thought to how much of this army you can send home. Excuse me, Lord Several? Both elves turned as the priestess Thilisil entered the hall. She was also a cleric of Karelin, junior to Several, who had joined Lord Miratar on his quest and served as his adjutant and chief assistant. Lord Kareth Blackhelm of the High Council is here to see you. Kareth, here? Several frowned. Kareth was the High Marshal of Evermeet, leader of the island's armies, and one of Queen Amlerul's most valuable advisers. Show him in. Thilisil nodded and beckoned their guest in. This way, sir. She stood aside to permit Kareth to enter and followed him in, 
anticipating decisions to record or orders to issue. Carith Blackhelm was a moon elf of middle years, perhaps a little past his prime as a swordsman, but still hale and fit. He was not as tall as Flar, but he was a commanding presence anyway, with a fierce determination burning in his eyes and a gruff, confident manner. Lord Miratar, he said, thank you for receiving me. Of course, Carith. Sivril took Carith's hand in a firm clasp. They'd served together on Evermeet's High Council for many years, and even if they did not always agree with each other, they shared a mutual respect. Have you traveled long? I can ask for refreshments to be brought. No, the trip was quick. The Grand Mage loaned me the services of a sorcerer who knows a spell of teleportation. We left Evermeet not more than half an hour ago. Kerith looked about the ruined building. How is Ilsevele? She is well. I spoke to her just this morning. She is visiting Silvery Moon with her companions, though I believe a raven is attending to some business at Tower Raylock. I have not seen Silvery Moon, Kerith replied. He wandered into the old library and threw the ruined colonnade outside, taking in the view. This was Glorok and Ar? Yes, it was called the City of Scrolls in its day. Several gestured at the ruins beyond the library. The Daemon Fae used the Grand Mage's palace as their lair. While I have seen no sign of them since I have been here, I decided it was not prudent to take up residence in their quarters. There are deep vaults and armories hidden in the heart of the hill beneath the palace, and I am not sure that we have found all of their secrets yet. It seems that you have matters well in hand otherwise. Kerith said. He faced Several. Speaking of which, I have been sent here to ask if you would consent to attend the High Council's meeting in seven days, and provide the Queen and her advisor with a first-hand account of your campaign. We have heard many stories, and we want to get the most accurate report we can. You may have forgotten, Lord Blackhelm, but I am no longer a counselor of the realm. Kerith shook his head. No. The Queen is not summoning you as such, nor is she summoning you at all, to be honest. She only requests that you come to speak before the Council, my friend. She will send a maid to teleport you if you like, so it should not take you long at all. And to be honest, you will save us a lot of pointless debate in which Velden and Dorotho question the veracity of every report we have received. Severo considered the request for a moment. He was certain that Selshara de Rothel and Amasil Velden would question him harshly on any account he cared to provide. On the other hand, he could think of nothing he cared to hide, and he no longer needed to be particularly polite to the conservatives and anti monarchists on the council, did he? He looked over to Flar and asked, Lord Starbrow, can you keep things in order here for a time? Flar shrugged. I'll know where to find you if I need you. Several turned back to Carith. All right, then. If the Queen requests my presence, I will not tell her no. I will be there. The House of Cedars stood on a rocky headland on Evermeet's rugged northern shore, hidden with a sparse forest of wind-shaped cedars and hemlocks. It was a rambling old elven lodge of open verandas and promenades anchored into the very rock of the headland. A raven's ancestors had built themselves a home in which they remained a part of the world outside, instead of a burrow from which they could shut things out. Light screens of wood paneling and large windows of strong glass in clever wooden frames allowed him to close or open most of the rooms as he saw fit. Early in the winter a raven had spent a ten-day there, repairing the damage of many long years of weathering. As the spring turned towards summer, and the days grew bright and windy along Evermeet's shores, he was pleased to see that his repairs were keeping well. He had lived in the house as a child, more than two hundred years past, but no one had lived there for a century or more. When he'd finally gotten around to visiting the place a few months before, it had been in poor shape. On his arrival, a raven spent three days arranging the personal effects and arcane tomes he'd had sent from his chambers in the Tower Raylock. The house featured a handsome library on its eastward face, 
which a raven filled with a collection of grimoires, spellbooks, journals, treaties, and scrolls he had accumulated over eight decades of residence at Raylock. Next to the library stood an empty hall that a raven converted into his workroom, installing at one end the cabinet of theer glass in which he stored his collection of magic wands and other such devices. He also wove a potent fence of abjurations and magical defenses around the entire house, since he could no longer count on the wards of Tower Raylock. He wove careful allusions to hide the books and artifacts he was most concerned about, and summoned magical guardians to defend the house if necessary. As the sun set on the sixth day since he'd stood before the high mages, he removed the night star from its hiding place over his heart and set the purple gemstone in a small stand before him. I think the time has come for you and I to speak at length, he told the Selukira. The night star made no answer but a raven thought he saw a lambent flash in its depths. The High Lord Gem was a living artifact. It held dozens upon dozens of spells, much as a raven's own spellbooks did. But beyond that useful function, the Night Star protected the deeper secrets of mythocraft and high magic. Already it had shown him spells for examining and shaping mythos, but the secrets of even greater power still awaited within the stone. He drew a deep breath and focused his attention on the flicker of light that lived in the heart of the gem, allowing his perception, his consciousness, to sink deeper and deeper into shining purple facets. The stone grew brighter, and distant voices whispered in his mind, and with an abrupt plunge he felt himself drawn into the gemstone, falling into a vast and illimitable expanse of towering amethyst ramparts. He opened his eyes and found himself in the poisoned gardens of the Night Star's soul. It was a magnificent place, a palace of gold colonnades and elegant arcades that existed nowhere except in the gem's own intellect. Lovely vines and flowers filled the open courtyard, but they were malicious and alive, things that slowly coiled and hunted with thorn and venom. In an old house on Evermeet's shore, his body stood locked and immobile, facing a shining purple gemstone. But as far as the raven's senses could discern, he was physically here, a visitor in the infernal grandeur that lay at the heart of the gemstone. Saileth Hill, a raven called. Come forth. I wish to speak to you. The hungry flowers rustled and groped at the sound of his voice. But a raven did not fear them. They were not real and had no power to hurt him. He simply exerted his will and made a small brushing gesture with his mind, and the sinister things recoiled from him, leaving a clear circle around his feet. Salethal, come forth! A raven frowned and glanced around, wondering if perhaps he had erred in some way. But when he looked back, Salethal de Lardrigeth was standing silently only an arm's reach from him regarding him with bright green eyes that held all the malice and venom of an asp. Despite himself, a raven took a step back. The ancient sorcerer smiled at the motion. In life, Salithol de Lardrigeth had been a tall and regal sun-elf, with handsome if cruel features, and the figment of his consciousness and personality that was embodied in the Night Star chose to manifest itself in his living appearance. The measure of an undisciplined mind, Salithor rasped, is that the intellect allows emotion to challenge the observed truth. You know that I am not permitted to harm you, and yet you quail like a child at the mere sight of me, a raven Tesher. A raven did not refute the accusation. Salithor would have excoriated him for denying it in any case. The shade of the long-dead intellect that had crafted the Night Star despised self-deceit more than anything. Instead, he decided to take the offensive. I spoke with the High Mages about you recently, he said. They wished you destroyed, and I am not altogether certain I disagree with them. Your High Mages are fumbling incompetence, Araven. They have no idea what it means to be worthy of that title. Salithor sneered in contempt, but he turned away to inspect the garden, folding his arms imperiously across his chest. Bring one here, and I will demonstrate the extent of their ignorance for you. 
Tell me of the high magic spells you hold, and I will judge the question of their ignorance for myself, a raven replied. You have shown me only one high magic spell so far, even though you claim to know a dozen more. Salitho glanced back at a raven and grinned without humor. Ah, perhaps there is some Delargeth in you after all, my boy. You've tasted true power, and now you thirst for more. What I thirst for is not your concern, Salitho. Now are you able to make good on your claims or not? The Delardrigeth archmage studied a raven for a moment, his eyes cold and measuring. I could, but you are not yet suited for the spells I haven't taught you. Not yet suited? In what way? The highest and most dangerous art of high magic is the manipulation of magic more powerful than the mortal frame can bear. Your so-called masters in Evermeet accomplish this by forging a circle of mages to wield high magic. They cooperate with a number of other high mages to collectively shape a magic that would destroy any single one of them who attempted it. I know that much, a raven said. Indeed. Well, there is another tradition for wielding high magic, a raven tesher. Those of us who did not care to shackle our power to the weakest of our fellows wielded solitary high magic, free and unfettered by the prejudices of our peers. In order to wield power that otherwise would destroy us, we devised the Telmir Quran Nashir, the rite of transformation. We sculpted our very natures to suit ourselves for the power we intended to wield. With such preparation, a single high mage could transcend mortal limits and manipulate powers that otherwise might require a whole circle of high mages to manage. I did nothing of the sort when I severed Sarya from the mythal. You did not need to. Many spells of high magic can be cast without the aid of a circle or transformation. The mythal near Darak. The spell of mythal shaping you wielded against my kinswoman Sarya does not conjure into existence the awesome power of a high mythal. It simply allows manipulation of an existing font of power. Salathil shrugged. However, I did not see fit to preserve many spells of that sort in my night star. The rest of the high magic spells I recorded require the Telmir Quran Ashir. A raven frowned, considering the notion. He did not think that Salathil was permitted to deceive him, but he was certain that the Night Star's persona was capable of choosing not to tell him something he didn't ask about. So, you can teach me the rest of the high magic spells you hold if I perform this Telmir Quran Nashir. Salathil nodded. What sort of transformation is involved? You exchange a large portion of your mortal soul for demonic essence. Demons are magical beings by their very nature. A demonic nature serves to shield one from power of untrammeled high magic. The Delardrigeth smiled cruelly. It is not very difficult. A raven blanched in horror. He understood the bargain the Delardrigeths had made so long ago. I will not do that. Then you will find most of my high magic spells inaccessible, Salethel said with open contempt. I expected no better from you. A raven glanced down, thinking hard. He noticed that the poisonous creepers squirmed closer to him, and he brushed them aside again. If Saria had access to the sort of mythocraft he did in the form of the Night Star, she would be able to wield those spells as if she were born to them which, in fact, she was. He found himself thinking of the melodious voice of Malkazid, the sinister presence he had felt in Mythglorak's mythal when that device had been under Sarya's control. What had Malkazid told Sarya about him? What did Malkazid know about mythals and their uses? A thought occurred to him, and he said to Salithil, Demons are not the only creatures of supernatural power in the multiverse. Can your Telmir Kara Nashir bind other essences to a high mage, essences not steeped in evil? 
Salithel hesitated, but said, Possibly. You must transcend your mortality to wield these spells safely. But there may be more than one way to do that. Chaos, order, the elements, the concept you term good, all these principles give rise to supernatural forces and might prove suitable. What other transformations do you know, then? I do not know any other than the one I used. Do you know of anyone else who would know? The Delardugeth Archmage frowned. Yes, he said finally. Ithrades and his students wielded high magic without the benefit of a circle. Ithrades, a raven said in surprise. He knew that name. Ithrades was the grand mage of fallen Arcarar, the ancient archmage who had driven the Delardrugeths out of Cormanthir thousands of years in the past. From there, Sarya Delardrugeth had gone on to subvert the realm of Saluvanid and breed her legions of fairy warriors. But before all that, House Delardrugeth had been defeated by Ithrades and his allies more than five thousand years ago. Was he also bound to a demonic essence? No, he shared your useless scruples. He discovered another soul-binding, something that allowed him to match my mastery. I sincerely doubt he would have had the stomach to follow the path I chose. A raven offered a grim smile and said, No. I suppose he wouldn't have. He took a step back and willed himself up and out of Salithil's poison garden. There was a dizzying moment of soaring recklessly upward into a world of great purple plains and dancing storms of lambent fire, and he opened his eyes with a sudden gasp of breath. He sat in his library in a house of cedars, the night star gleaming on the table before him. The sea wind rattled the windows of his study, and the ocean was dark and wild beyond. Ithrades knew how to wield high magic without a circle, just like Salithil, he reflected, and he did it without transforming himself into a demon. That knowledge might still exist if he looked in the right place. Arkarar, a raven breathed, his eyes distant. Arkarar had become the realm of Cormanthir and Cormanthir's capital was the city of Mithdranor, which had fallen only six hundred years ago. Much lore of ancient Arkarar had been carried out of Mithdranor in its final years to Evermeet and places such as Everuska and Silvery Moon. Evermeet's hoard of Cormanthirian lore had largely been destroyed when Kemal Nimison destroyed the Towers of the Sun and Moon five years ago. But what of Silvery Moon? A raven had heard that many Cormanthirian mages and scholars fled there when Mithdranor fell. It seemed as good a place to start as any, and a raven had other reasons to visit the city in any event. He reached out for the night star and slipped the gemstone inside his shirt again, pressing it to his breastbone. He had a journey to make ready for. Chapter 2 Six Myrtul the year of lightning storms. Sarya Delardrigeth stood on the broken battlements of Castle Cormanthor beneath a warm, steady spring rain and surveyed her new realm. The Daemon Fay Queen was strikingly beautiful, with the arresting features and enticing curves of a noble sun elf woman, but her skin was a deep, perfect crimson and she possessed a powerful pair of bat-like wings she kept folded behind her like a great dark cape. Her domain was quite small, really, not more than a couple of miles from one end to the other, for she could not claim to reign over the great forest that surrounded Mithdranor's ancient buildings and walls. But it is a start, she told herself. Her eye fell on the rose-tinted tower the human clerics had raised within the very walls of Cormanthor's ancient capital, and she bared her slender fangs in a vicious smile. The shrine stood blackened and burnt, scorched by fairy spells and ancient Vishanti weapons. Its smoke was sweet in the air. Her fairy legion, a thousand swordmen sorcerers, the pride of ancient Saluvanid, had made themselves masters of the ancient city. Sarya was not defeated yet, not by a wide margin. Lady Sarya, a handful of the Lathandarians escaped, said the fairy lord Mardim Rayathol, 
as he approached carefully, offering a bow as he addressed her. They used a hidden portal to flee our last assault. We could not follow. Mardim, and the rest of the fairy for that matter, were much like Sarya, sun elves of high and ancient lineage who had been imprisoned thousands of years ago. Like her, they were winged demon spawn, with skin in fine hues of red and great dark wings. But they were still more mortal than not, elves with a demonic taint. Sarya and her son, Zolf, were true daemon fae, with much stronger demonic bloodlines. The portal refused you? Sarya asked. Yes, my lady. The Lathendarians possessed some key or password that we lacked. Since we cannot use the device, I ordered it sealed with stone. Good, Sarya replied. I am not concerned with the escape of a handful of human priests. We are the masters of the city now. But I would not want spies to slip back through the portal and learn more about us. Her army of fairy had easily overwhelmed the small companies of human adventurers and hidden nests of cultists and necromancers formerly encamped within Mithdranor. The temple to Lathander had been the last bastion of explorers and adventurers remaining within the walls. Of course, monsters of all descriptions still lurked within their lairs and catacombs. But Sarya had no real need to eliminate such guardians, and most of the fearsome beholders, nagas, liches, dragons, and other such denizens of the ruins recognized that Sarya's legion of well-armed fairy was a foe beyond their ability to drive off. The fairy did not go out of their way to trouble such creatures in their lairs, and for their part, the intelligent ones did not emerge to challenge Sarya's warriors. There are still the devils to contend with, Mardim said. If we leave them alone, I promise you they will turn on us. Hundreds of the supernatural fiends were bound to the ruined city. Before the arrival of Sarya and her legion, they had formerly ruled as masters of Vermith Draner. We outnumber the filthy hellspawn. Our fairy warriors can defeat them now, before they have the opportunity to betray us. Sarya regarded her chief captain with a cold glare. Mardim sensed danger and dropped his gaze to her feet. Under most circumstances, Sarya, a princess of the demon-ruled abyss by birth, would have regarded any spawn of the nine hells as a hated enemy. Demons and devils had fought each other throughout eternity, the unbridled destruction of demonic evil battling for supremacy against cruel, infernal tyranny. Do not question my judgment, she said. I have uses for the devils of this city. I apologize, Lady Sarya. I do not mean to question your decisions, but it is important that you know when the fairy are troubled. Mardim waited on her, his head still bowed in respect. Troubled, Sarya said. She turned away, pacing along the battlements. Flexing her wings, she luxuriated in the sheer pleasure of freedom. She would have liked to lash out at Mardim, remind him of the fearsome power she commanded, and reinforce the ancient pacts by which she ruled absolutely over the fairy houses. But the war captain was loyal to her, and spoke nothing more or less than the truth. She would do well to avoid teaching her subjects that bringing her bad news always led to punishment. Very well, Lord Rayethal. Summon the house lords to my audience chamber, and I will explain more. As you command, my lady, the war captain said. He bowed again, and vaulted over the battlement and took wing. Sarya watched him glide away into the ruins, then descended from the battlements into the spacious royal chambers she had claimed in the castle. She allowed Mardim half an hour to gather the leaders of the other fairy houses, busying herself with renewing the powerful abjurations and contingency spells with which she normally guarded herself, and she went down into the grand hall of Castle Cormanther. Centuries ago, the coronals of the elven kingdom of Cormanthir had presided over revels and banquets in the grand hall. Its walls were still painted with magical murals of woodland scenes that slowly changed from season to season, 
and the great columns that lined the walls were carved in the shape of tall, strong trees, so realistic that stone blossoms and fruit could be glimpsed in the branches. The leaders of her fairy legion awaited her in the hall. Each of the dozen demon elves was the leader of one of the fairy houses. Some, like Raethel, were ancient houses from Saluvanid that were strong and numerous, having been imprisoned in the nameless dungeon for fifty centuries. Others, like Aelorathi, were survivor houses, families of Daemonthae who had passed their demonic heritage down through twenty generations from the time of Sarya's ancient realm to her revival only five years ago. The descendant houses were smaller and less numerous than ancient houses such as Raethel, but they were made up of fairy who had grown up in the world Sarya and her ancient legion had suddenly found themselves in. They were comfortable with the new world in a way that Sarya and the other ancient prisoners could never be. Not for the first time, Sarya found herself wondering what had become of Nerthal Flotion. He was from one of the descendant houses, and had served as an able spymaster and lieutenant. But he had not returned from the expedition she had dispatched to recover the Night Star, and she could only assume that he was dead. She turned her attention to the proud, cruel lords and ladies gathered before her. Look around you, she began. This will be our home, the founding stone on which we will build our new realm. Before I and my family came to Saluvanid, we dwelled here in Cormanthia. It is only fitting that this is the place where we begin to rebuild. Sawyer leaped down from the steps on which she stood, flaring her wings to alight in front of the fairy lords. She did not look forward to what must be said next. You all know that this is not what I planned when I broke open Nar Karim Hoar three months ago, she began. I intended to erase the realms of the High Forest and Everesca from the map, and claim vengeance for the destruction of Saluvanid five thousand years ago. She paused, holding the eyes of her minions, and said, That, however, was a mistake. Perhaps events might have fallen out differently if Evermeet had not responded with so much force, or if Nerthoflotion had not failed to recover the Night Star, or even if the fortunes of battle had favored us against Evermeet's army. But these things did not happen. I underestimated our enemy's strength and resolve, or overestimated our own strength, or did not plan to overcome ill fortune. It does not really matter. The consequence of my mistake was that we had to abandon our stronghold at Mythglorok and leave our work in Evereska and the High Forest undone. The Daemon Fay Queen turned away from her fairy, deliberately putting her back to them as she paced. She hated the idea of introducing her own fallibility into her followers' minds, but it had to be there already, didn't it? Still, she did not want to let the fairy lords consider that last thought for long. She looked back over her shoulder at her captains and lords. It would be foolish of me to pretend that I am incapable of making mistakes, she said. What I intend to do now is to learn from our mistakes. Before we take the field again, or challenge the usurpers who have stolen our lands and treasures, we must grow much stronger. We will hide here in Mithdranor, protected by the ancient power of its mythal. Within these ruined walls, our enemies cannot divine our existence or scry out our strength. We will grow strong in secret until the time is right for us to return. What of the Beatazu? Alasir Ursaquara asked. When do we destroy them? They are not our enemies, Sarya said firmly. You are to strike no blow against the devils in this city unless I tell you to. The fairy lords shifted uneasily, some risking quick glances at their fellows. Sawyer turned back to face her followers. The devils that were summoned here decades ago were outcasts from the Nine Hells, mercenaries and marauders who have no loyalty to the rest of their kind. So they would have us believe. Alasir volunteered boldly. How can we know they are speaking the truth? Sawyer stalked closely to Alasir, and lowered her voice to a menacing hiss. 
I have investigated the matter, Lady Alice here. Do you think I have allowed myself to be deceived? Alisir Ursiquara paled slightly, but held her ground. No, Lady Sarya. Were her fairy not irreplaceably rare, Sarya would have killed Alisir Ursiquara on the spot. But each fairy warrior was worth twenty orcs or five ogres. She could not be careless of their lives. Sarya smiled coldly. You forget, Alisir, that the devils are bound to this city, and we are not. Spells anchored to the mythal by human wizards twenty years ago trap the devils within Mithdranor. I can alter the mythal to allow some, all, or none of them to escape from this place, or call them back and confine them any time I wish. But I will exact fealty from each devil I allow to leave. The devils cannot escape unless I help them, and I will not help them unless I am certain of their loyalty. They will serve in our armies alongside the demons and yugoloths we summon to serve us. Does that meet with your approval, Lady Ursiquara? Alisir Ursiquara offered a deep bow. I am sworn to serve you, my lady. I do not question your commands. Good. It would go poorly for you if I thought you did. Sawyer wheeled away, her tail lashing like a whip. We hide, we wait, we grow strong, and we marshal the devils of the city to our service, she said. Does anyone disagree? None of the fairies spoke. Sawyer nodded and looked to a gaunt fairy sorcerer who stood a little apart from the other house lords. Very well. In that case, Lord Aelorothy, please describe for your peers the shape of the human lands that have grown up around Mithdranor. These will be our foes some day, but not until we are ready for them. The captains and lords turned their eyes on the sorcerer lord. Aelorothy was a descendant house, and Vesreen Aelorothy had traveled widely all across Faerun for many years. He affected a gracious and courteous manner, but Sarya knew him to be capable of exquisite cruelties. A ten day ago, she had named the gaunt fairy sorcerer her new spymaster, and sent him to the task of insinuating Daemon Fay gold, assassins, and sorcery into the halls of power in every nearby land. It would be my pleasure, Lady Sarya, he purred. Listen carefully to Vesreen, my children she told the fairy lords. Many of you will be traveling these lands in the coming months, spying out their strengths and their weaknesses. She motioned for the sorcerer to continue, and left her assembled captains behind her. Vesreen stepped forward as she left, and moving very deliberately, Vesreen was nothing if not cautious. He wove his hands together and muttered the words of a spell of illusion, conjuring in midair the image of a great map. This, he began, is the forest of Cormanthor. A raven left the house of cedars in the morning after his conversation with the night star. He followed rarely traveled paths into the wild pine forests and hills overlooking the sea, drinking deeply of the scent of the trees and the cool spring rain. Early in the afternoon, he reached a worn old portal glade, a small clearing around a weathered stone marker that had stood in that spot for thousands of years. Most of Evermeet's portals were closed forever, deliberately sealed in the past few decades to guard the island from any possible attack through the magical gateways. But a few still existed, some well guarded, others only one-way portals that allowed travelers to depart from Evermeet but not return, some so old or uncertain in their working that they were risky to use. A raven had always been fascinated by portals, and he had spent many decades exploring them in both Evermeet and Faerun. He thought he might be the only person alive who knew how to wake the one in the glade. He spoke the spells needed to activate the portal and pass through. With a single step, Evermeet's misty forests vanished, only to be replaced by the high, wind-swept downs of the Evermoors. Dusk was falling, the end of a bright and cold spring day. The Evermoors were far to the east of Evermeet. 
What becomes of the hours I missed? A raven wondered aloud. He studied the featureless moorland, speckled with the first small blooms of spring, despite the lingering patches of snow that still lurked in the shadowed places. It was important to be sure of his exact location in case the portal had somehow malfunctioned. Satisfied, he closed his eyes, envisioning a small hilltop shrine he knew well, and uttered a spell of teleportation. There was a moment of darkness, a vertiginous sense of falling without motion, and a raven stood in the small wooded bower of a shrine to Labellus Enereth, a mile beyond the walls of Silvery Moon, another hundred miles from the portal stone in the Evermores. Two large blue-leaf trees had long ago taken root in the veranda, shouldering aside the shrine's flagstones and forming a living roof over the elf deity's altar. A small balustrade of old white stone, overgrown with green vines, offered a view of the swift river Ralvin and the city of Silvery Moon, cupped around both the river's banks. Well, there you are. I have been waiting for you. A raven turned at the words, and found himself looking on the face of his betrothed, the beautiful Lady Ilsevile Miritar. She was a sun-elf like he, but she was much fairer than he was in both senses of the word, with a radiant mane of copper-red hair and green eyes. She wore a tunic of green suede over cream-colored trousers, bloused into high leather boots decorated with tiny gold thread patterns. A slender long sword was sheathed at her hip. Il Sevale, he said, and took three steps and caught her up in his arms. It's only been a couple of ten days, she said with a laugh finally pushing him away. You've gone years at a time without thinking to look in on me. I have spent too much time around humans lately, he answered. After two hundred and fifty years, I believe I am losing the habit of patience. Well, you must wait a little longer. Our wedding is still two years away, in case you have forgotten. Il Sevele looked out over the human city nearby. Hundreds of lanterns were flickering to life in its tree-shadowed streets and graceful buildings, reflections glimmering in the dark waters of the Ralven, and the stars were coming out in the darkening skies. I am glad you told me of this shrine. The view is lovely, and I've had several hours to admire it. I am sorry. I had a later start than I'd anticipated. No matter. I enjoyed a couple of hours to myself. She took his hand. Come on, Maressa and Vilselene are waiting in the city. They're anxious to see you too. The two sun elves followed an old path leading down from the shrine to the human city below. This close to Silvery Moon, there was little danger even as darkness fell, but a raven noted that Elsevele wore her sword, and he approved. Where are you staying? he asked. When he'd sent word to Olsevele that he was coming, he had used a sending spell and didn't know where it might have found her. An inn called the Golden Oak. It's quite nice, really. I like it much better than the Dragonback in Daggerford. I know the oak. You have expensive tastes, he said with a smile. Olsevele drew closer under his arm. I decided that I owed Maressa and Felsalene some comfort after what we've all been through over the last few months. I certainly don't begrudge you that. They'd crisscrossed the Sword Coast in the north in search of the Talkiras containing the clues that would lead him to the Night Star, facing brigands, trolls, wars, demons, imprisonment, and worse. And not all of their companions had survived their adventure. A raven's old comrade, Graith Holmfast, had been murdered by the Daemon Fae, and Graith's armsman, Brant, torn apart by demons in the fight to find the Talkira stones before the Daemon Fae did. Thinking of his lost companions, a raven lapsed into a long silence as they neared Silvery Moon's gates. After a time, Ilsevele glanced at him and said, You seem troubled. I was thinking of Graith and Brant. They deserved better. I know. Ilsevele leaned her head on his shoulder for a moment. He did not want to return, Araven. We brought him to Rymester's Matins, the temple of Lathander in this city, and the human clerics cast divinations to determine whether his spirit would return willingly if they chose to raise him. 
Graith is content with his life and his death. All you can do is honor his sacrifice and carry him with you in your memory. Graith is wiser than I, for I am not content, a raven said. He knew he was responsible for his friend's death. The Daemon Fay had killed Graith to compel a raven to lead them to the Night Star. If he had yielded earlier, the cleric might still be alive. A raven had destroyed Nerthal, the fairy who had actually killed Graith, but Sarya de Lardrigeth, the author of his death, had so far escaped justice. We still have business with the Daemon Fay. I have not forgotten, she replied, with an edge of cold steel in her voice. Ilsevile was a warrior as well as a high-born lady. She believed that some things could only be set right with steel and courage, and she knew her own measure better than most. They passed the guards at the city gates and walked Silvery Moon's broad boulevards until they reached the Golden Oak, a large, comfortable inn whose common room was an open atrium beneath the spreading branches of a great oak tree, from which dozens of small lanterns hung. A bard strummed a lute and many of the inn's guests sat drinking wine or ale beneath the oak tree, quietly conversing. A raven! called a loud voice. More than a few heads turned as Maressa Rost leaped to her feet, calling to the two elves. Maressa was an individual of striking appearance, a young woman whose skin was literally as white as snow. Her hair was long and silver-white as well, and it drifted gently around her, as if stirred by breezes unfelt by anyone else. She was a genocide, a human whose ancestry included beings of the elemental planes. In Maressa's case, air elementals of some kind. She wore crimson-dyed leather and carried a rapier at her hip. You were supposed to be here hours ago! A raven started to bow and apologize, but Maressa surprised him, throwing her arms around him and offering a fierce hug. I... it is good to see you too, Maressa, he stammered. He looked over Maressa's shoulder to the genocide's companion, a rather slight and young-looking sun-elf woman who wore the emblem of Corella Nerethian's cleric on her tunic. And you too, Philsalene. Philsalene offered a shy smile and raised a goblet of wine. Join us, please. I am afraid we are a little ahead of you already. Freed from the Daemon Fae's stronghold only a few ten days ago, none of her former comrades had survived the battle against the demonic invaders. Philsalene still struck a raven as timid and retiring, but she seemed to be recovering well under Maressa's care. Maressa finally released him, and a raven glanced over at Elsevile. His betrothed shrugged. I could stand some song and wine, she said. Why not? They spent the evening drinking good wine, enjoying the music of the bard, and trading stories of old adventures. After a time, the lutenist was joined by a flutist and a drummer, and the three struck up a lively dance in which a raven was kept quite busy by dancing with all three of his companions in turn. Finally, Tired and pleasantly aglow with the warm wine, he and Ilsevile said their good nights to the others, and retired to Ilsevile's comfortable room. Whether it was the wine, the dancing, or simply the hidden relief of having survived the trials of the past few months, they made love for a time. Then they spent the hours after midnight lying together, content to be near each other without speaking. Such moments have become rare in the past few years, it seemed. Ilsevile's fingers glided over the cold, hard gemstone sealed to a raven's chest, and he felt her frown. You brought the Selukira with you? she asked. I still have more to learn from it, he told her. Then he reached up to mesh his fingers with hers, and brought her hand close to his face, holding her close as they drifted off into reverie together. I thought you said it was dangerous, an artifact of the Daemon Fay of old. It is, he said, and said no more about it. The next morning, a raven stirred from his reverie and dressed himself in the dark hour before dawn. Ilsevile roused herself as he rose, drawing a deep breath as she called herself back to the inn-room from whatever far memory or dream she had wandered in her own reverie. Where are you going? she asked. The vault of the sages, a raven replied. He looked over at her. 
It is the best library in the city, perhaps all of the north, and I have some research to do. The Night Star? Yes. I have not yet solved all of its mysteries. A raven drew his cloak over his shoulders and picked up the worn rucksack in which he carried many of his notes and journals. I must learn more about the magic of ancient Arkarar, or at least some specific spells and rites from that era, if I am to unlock the deeper secrets Salithil concealed in this lore stone. Ilsevile sat up sharply. Is it a good idea to do that? You were lucky once with the Night Star. Perhaps you shouldn't delve any further into it unless you have to. Last night we spoke of our unfinished business with the Daemon Fae. If I ever mean to finish it, I think I will need to know what other secrets the Night Star holds. Ilsevile stood to and said, I will come with you then. There is no need. I am not sure how much you could help, to be honest. I am not entirely sure what I am looking for. Ilsevile's eyes narrowed. I remind you, my betrothed, that I know a little bit about magic, too. Besides, I have nothing else in particular to do today, and I might like a chance to look around a fine library for my own account, not yours. He winced. I did not mean to imply that you were unable to help me, he managed. I would enjoy your company, if you wanted to come along. Elsevile crossed her arms. I find that less than convincing. They ate a quick breakfast of warm bread and apple butter in the inn's common room and set out across Silvery Moon as the human town slowly woke. The vault of the sages was a tall horseshoe-shaped building of stone, sturdy and strong. A raven and Ilsevile entered only moments after the priests of Denier, who kept the vault, opened the doors for the day. An old human cleric with a fringe of snow-white hair around his bald pate looked up from a desk to greet them. Ah, good morning. It is not often we are visited by two of the R. Telquesser. I am Brother Calwern. How might we help you today? I am a raven tesher, and this is my betrothed, Lady Ilsevile Miratar, a raven replied. I am interested in making use of your library. Of course. What topics interest you, sir? I am looking for books or treatise on the magical lore of ancient Arkarar from the early days of Cormanthir, the centuries following the Twelve Nights of Fire, or perhaps the Fifth Rysar of Gyronstar. You may also have writings on the wizards Ithrades, Caelethan, Morthil, or Sainathar. A raven did not mention Sailathil de Lardrigeth. Sailathil would never have shared any of his writings with other mages, or left a record of his studies other than the Night Star intended for members of his own house. Brother Calwern raised a bushy eyebrow and leaned back in his seat. We have a few works of such antiquity here. The wizards you named, are they from the same era? A raven nodded, and the Deniroth priest continued. I will have to examine our indices and catalogues to see if we have anything that might help you. It might take a little time. In the meantime, I can certainly recommend a likely tome or two for you to begin with. I presume you read Loras and Thoros. Among others, yes. Excellent. The Deniroth priest stood up and gestured toward an archway leading deeper into the great building. If you please, then, this way. A raven glanced at Elsevile and offered a small smile. When it came down to it, he couldn't resist a scholarly mystery, and there was not a better place in Faerun to solve one than the libraries of Silvery Moon. Together, they followed Brother Calwern into the vault of the sages. High lords and ladies of the council, the Lord Several Miratar of Elion! Several faltered on the threshold of the Dome of Stars, surprised to hear his own name announced. He glanced at the herald captain, a young sun elf who stared straight ahead, giving no further sign that he recognized Several's presence. Eighty years on the royal council, and never once have I been announced, Several wondered. Instead, he had always been a member of the body that guests were announced to. He felt the eyes of the minor lords and functionaries in attendance fall on him, as he stood unmoving in the chamber door. Then Several recovered, and he strode with growing confidence into the Dome of Stars. 
the High Council Chamber of Evermeet, the dome was part of the sprawling palace compound in Luthelspar. A striking chamber with a dark, star-flecked marble floor and a great clear ceiling of magic theer glass, the dome was illuminated by the warm yellow light of late afternoon, striking bright gleams from the glossy stone underfoot. It was a magnificent chamber, and in its center stood the glass-steel council chamber, a delicate ornament of frosted white glass, magically hardened to the toughness of steel. It had always struck Several as a good metaphor for the elf race, beautiful to look upon, yet stronger than the eye could believe. Six of Evermeet's counselors waited on Several's approach. Closest to him, at the left-hand foot of the horseshoe-shaped table, sat the old scribe Zalterish, one of the queen's most valued advisers. Beside Zalterish sat the High Admiral Emerdin Elsidar, master of Evermeet's navy, and on the other side of the admiral, past Several's own former seat, apparently still vacant, was the High Marshal Carith Blackhelm, the leader of Evermeet's army. On the right-hand wing of the table sat two of Several's most determined opponents, Lady Selshara Durothal, matron of the powerful sun-elf Durothal clan, and Lady Amasil Velden, another sun-elf noble who governed the southern city of Nimlith. Both high-born sun-elves stared daggers at him as he came near. To Velden's left sat Grand Mage Braithel Olather, another sun-elf. Several had always thought well of Olather even if the fellow did not trust his own wisdom. At the head of the table sat Queen Amlurul herself, dressed in a resplendent gown of pearl white that was set with countless gleaming diadems. Her raven-dark hair was bound by a simple silver fillet, and she held a thin scepter of shining mithril across her lap. "'You are welcome here, Several Miratar,' Amlurul said in a warm voice, and she smiled graciously. So little time has passed since you left, and yet we have so much to speak of. Sidro looked up into Amlerul's eyes and felt his heart flutter at the sad wisdom and perfect beauty of her face. To look on Amlerul as she sat in state was to catch a glimpse of Sehanin Moonbow's throne in Arvindor, or so it was said. For his own part, Sidro knew of no son or daughter of Evermeet who could stand before Amlerul unmoved. I thank you, Queen Amleru, he replied, and he bowed deeply. When he straightened again, Amleru looked left and right to her advisers. I asked Lord Several here today, in the hope that we might hear from his own mouth the tale of his battles to defend Evereska and the High Forest from the Daemon Fey army. Few events in Faerun within the last few years have portended so much for the people and we would only be wise to inform ourselves as best we can about Lord Several's campaigns. Amlerul looked back to Several and said, Will you speak, old friend? Of course, your highness. Where should I begin? Begin with your mustering at Elion, Kerith Blackhelm said. We were all here for your call to arms when you spoke of returning to Faerun, and we remember the arguments that led to your oratory. Tell us what happened after you left this chamber. Very well, Several agreed, and he began his tale. He recounted the gathering of companies and volunteers in Elion, and the efforts to organize useful military units from the horde of individuals who had answered his call. He described their quick transit to Evereska by means of the ancient elf gates when it became clear that the city was in imminent peril and the victory of the Battle of the Coombe, in which Several's crusade had stopped the Daemon Fey horde from laying siege to Evereska. Then he went on to the pursuit of Sarya de Lardrigeth's army through the wild lands north of Evereska, to the climactic battle at the Lonely Moor. That was a terrible fight, Several said. He could see it before his eyes even then remembering the onslaught of demons and the furious battle as the crusade found itself surrounded on all sides by Sarya's forces. We fell on the ranks of orcs, ogres, and such, and decimated them. But Sarya and her demons teleported to our flank and attacked fiercely, while her fairy took to the air and fell on our rearmost ranks. It seemed desperate indeed, but then— 
Sarya's demons all vanished at once. Each one of them vanished back to its native hell as the spells holding the demons in our world failed. That turned the tide. The fairy warriors abandoned their orcs and ogres and fled the field soon thereafter. The demons vanished. That was a raven Tesher's work at Mythglorok? asked the Grand Mage. It was. What has happened since? Zalterish the scribe asked. Well, we have searched all of the north, or so it seems, for any sign of where Sarya and her surviving fairy warriors might be hiding. The spellcasters among our army have cast divination after divination, hoping to uncover some sign that our scouts might have missed. We have also helped the wood elves to hunt down the last of the orc warbands and ogre gangs that accompanied the fairy in their assault against the high forest. You have won a great victory, Salshara de Rothel said. Several fixed his eyes on her, instantly suspicious. Lady de Rothel had not spared many kind words for him over the past few months. Salshara ignored his dark look and continued. The Daemon Fey attack against Evereska and the High Forest has failed. Events have vindicated you, Lord Miratar. I do not think I was wrong to argue for caution when we debated this question a few short months ago, but I certainly cannot argue today that your impetuousness did not accomplish a great good. Several carefully kept his face neutral, merely inclining his head in response to Durothal's concession. What is she up to? he wondered. So, Carrie the Blackhelm said, when can we expect the return of your army? When I am certain that the threat of the Daemon Fey has truly passed, and that no other enemies will try Evereska's strength as soon as I leave. Some companies I could send home within a month or two, I think. Others I may ask to remain longer. How will you judge when the Daemon Fey have been finally defeated? the High Admiral asked. What if you simply cannot find them again? I am prepared to wait. A few months is one thing, Amasil Veldon observed. What if you find no sign of the Daemon Fey for a year? Two years? They are evidently well hidden after all. Is Evermeet to be left shorn of its defenders for as long as you see fit to be stubborn? The Daemon Fey are not the sole standard by which I shall judge my errand in Faerun completed, Several replied. The Daemon Fey were tempted to strike against Evereska, because the people withdrew so much of their power from Faerun. I mean to find a way to set that right before I am done. That will be hard on your warriors, will it not? Felden asked. They joined you to defend Evereska and Evereska has been defended. They did not answer your call in order to garrison gloomy old ruins in the middle of the wilderness for years. I require none to remain who are not willing, Several said. Amasil Veldon threw up her hands and leaned back in her seat. Nothing has changed, she muttered. Salshara Dorothal looked around the council table and let her gaze linger on Amlarol. I would like to put forward a proposal, she said. If Queen Amlerul anticipated more argument from the conservative Sun Elf, her face did not show it. She graciously nodded. Of course, Lady Dorotho. While I do not necessarily agree that Lord Several requires an army quite as large as he now has at his command, so Charlotte Dorotho began. I think we have all seen the wisdom of his arguments about maintaining a presence in Faerun. In fact, it seems to me that this task may be important enough to justify a lasting amendment to Evermeet's defenses. Instead of relying on the zeal and good intentions of those who happen to take interest in affairs of Faerun, we should shoulder this responsibility ourselves, and formally recognize and support Lord Several's actions so far. Let us name him the East Marshal of the Realm, admit him again to the High Council, and designate his standing army in Faerun as the East Guard. 
we can incorporate the East Guard into the armies of Evermeet, and thereby ensure that our brave soldiers need not abandon their oaths to the crown in order to take service in Lord Miratar's army. In fact, we can assess both Evermeet's current defenses and the forces Miratar will need to continue his watch overseas, and divide our forces with more deliberation than before. Both the defenses of Evermeet herself and the strength of our East Guard should be improved with some careful planning. Several stared at Selshara Dorothal, not bothering to hide his amazement. He noticed that most of her fellow counselors were staring, too. She can't have decided that I was right, he told himself. Almost grudgingly, Carith Blackhelm nodded in agreement. He looked to Queen Amlerol. There is a great deal of sense in that idea, my queen, he murmured. We could station the forces best suited for each job in the right place. Evermeet would be safer and we would be better situated to intervene in Faerun when the need arises. Grand Mage Olather also nodded and said, The same is true for our mages, spellblades, and bladesingers, and I, for one, would welcome Lord Several's voice at this table again. Amasil Veldon turned a furious look on Salshara Dorothal. You are not seriously suggesting that we reward Miratar's disobedience by returning him the seat that he surrendered in this council? She snapped. I do not condone the manner in which Lord Miratar assembled his expedition and decided for himself what was right for all of us, Selshara answered. But I cannot deny that his vision and foresight secured Avaraska and perhaps saved thousands of our kindred from destruction and slaughter. The constituency of the High Council is the Queen's prerogative, Zalterish observed. It is for her to decide such matters. I must consider the suggestion for a time before I know my answer, Amlerul said. She looked at Several. And I suspect that Lord Miratar will wish to consider the question too. You are asking him to take up a heavy burden, Lady de Rotho. A burden that he sought out, your highness, Salshara replied. Amlerol wrapped her scepter on the glass steel table. We will reconvene in a few days to deliberate the question at length. Until then, Lord Miratar, I would be delighted if you could tarry a few days here in Luthulspar. Several bowed again. Of course, your highness he said. Chapter 3 Ten Myrtul, The Year of Lightning Storms For three days, a raven explored the depths of Silvery Moon's Vault of the Sages. He passed long hours poring over ancient yellow parchments and carefully thumbing through heavy tomes of thick linen paper. He wandered from chamber to chamber examining the orderly stacks kept by the priests of Denier, or he waited in reading rooms while the helpful clerics brought him books and scrolls they thought might interest him. It was not inexpensive, of course. To make use of the library cost him hundreds of pieces of gold, but a raven did not begrudge the cost. The clerics of Denier used the fees to acquire and copy rare texts from other libraries all across Faerun. Ilsevile helped him in his search, screening works of potential interest to determine whether or not a raven needed to see a particular reference. She saved him countless hours of reading through dead ends, or wasting time on old works that simply had no bearing on the subject matter he was after. The two sun elves arrived at the library an hour after dawn every morning, and remained until after dark each night, before heading back to the Golden Oak, and joining Maressa and Philselene for the evening meal wine, and dancing. They had little luck at first, spending the first day looking at old records and accounts of Arkarar that had nothing to do with magic or mythos. On the next day, they successfully narrowed their search by reviewing a list of potentially relevant tomes assembled by the Deniroths. Less than sixty books or documents in the vault possessed the right combination of antiquity and subject matter to warrant close inspection. A dozen titles into the list, on the morning of the third day of their search, they stumbled across what they were looking for. A raven, I think I've found something, said Osevalet. 
She straightened up from the desk where she sat, reading through a set of ancient scrolls. This scroll describes a judgment by the coronal of Arcarar against House de Lardrigeth, and records how the house was expunged from the realm. A raven looked up from the window bench where he was sitting, consulting his journals, and asked, Who is the author? A court mage named Sanathar. I know that name, he said. He set down his journal and joined Ilsevile at her table. He found the passage she indicated and murmured aloud as he read, Yes, I see it. The high mage Ithrades gathered a company of wizards, and they used their spells to destroy or drive off the Delardrigeths, finally walling off the Delardrigeth Tower in Cormanthor. That was the old name for Mithdranor, of course. He skimmed the old manuscript, careful not to handle the ancient parchment more than was absolutely necessary. Look here! More passages were added later. The spell prison raised around House de Lardrigeth was finally removed almost five hundred years after the coronal's mages moved against the de Lardrigeths. I saw that. They found that they had missed several of the Daemon Fae. Sarya and her sons, and a few others. Yes, that makes sense. We know that the Daemon Fae escaped from Arcarar and insinuated themselves into several powerful houses in Saluvanid, creating the fairy. A raven read farther, and his eyes widened. Interesting, he breathed. This may be what I was looking for. Near the end of this account, Sanathar tells us that the Night Star was interred in a secure vault. That we know, of course, since I eventually found it there. But he also says that Ithrades departed for Arvindor soon after the creation of the vault. The star elf Morthil took many of Ithrades' tomes and treasures into his keeping. Star elf! An unusual turn of phrase. Do you think he meant sun or moon elf? No, it's quite clear. Look, other sun elves and moon elves are named here, and here. I think the text implies a separate race or nationality. I've never heard of star elves before, Ilsevile said. A kindred of the people who died out long ago? Or maybe he is referring to elves who came to this world from another world. Some of Evermeet's folk are descended from elves who sailed the sea of night in flying ships. A raven studied the ancient yellow parchment for a long moment, eyes narrowed in thought. Just because we haven't heard the term star elf before doesn't mean that no one else has, he finally replied. My friend Quastarte has spent years studying the realms and races of elven kind in this world. He knows far more about the topics than I do. Perhaps he could tell us more about who those people were, or where and when they lived. For that matter, there might be information close at hand here in the vault. He began reading the passage more carefully, studying the exact nuances of the text. El Sevile set aside the pages of the manuscript that a raven was interested in, and continued to read ahead while he pored over the older pages. The two of them read together in silence for a short time, until El Sevile stiffened and drew back from the old parchment in front of her. There is something else, a raven. A raven glanced up from the scroll. What? There's a passage by Ithrades. He's writing about the night star here. Her brow furrowed. Ithrades records that the Selukira killed two mages of Arcarar. The Selukira was protected by fearsome wards, spells designed to make sure that only Daemon Fey wizards would be able to use the stone. In fact, Ithrades writes here that he did not dare touch it himself. Elsevile glanced down at a raven's chest, even though the lore stone was hidden beneath his shirt. If the night star is that dangerous, why didn't it destroy you as well? Did the deadly spells fail with time? No, they're still there. A raven looked down at the tabletop before him. The night star spared me because it recognized me. Recognized you? What do you mean by that? He could not bear to look up to her face. I mean that it found Delardrigeth blood in me. The Night Star is not permitted to destroy a Delardrigeth. At least, not one who knows enough about magic to make use of its powers. I am related to Salithil Delardrigeth, at least distantly. Elsevile drew in a soft breath. A raven? I didn't... Why didn't you tell me? 
I did not know for certain myself until I attempted the Seleucira. Oh, I suspected that I might have a distant kinship to one or the other of the fairy houses. A very long time ago my family dwelled in Seleuvenid, in the years before the Seven Citadels' War. And when I spoke with Elorfindar in the House of Long Silences, he reminded me of our relationship. But I never dreamed that I could be a Delardrigeth. He made himself meet her gaze and said, I understand that you will break off our engagement, of course. I can't blame you. Break off the engagement? Ilsevile stared at him. Because twenty or thirty generations ago a Delardrigeth or a fairy married into your family? If you go back that far, we all have hundreds, thousands of ancestors, don't we? Who can say whether we would be proud to be descended from each of them? She shook her head. Why, I've touched the lore stone myself, and it hasn't harmed me. I might have a Delardrugeth ancestor, too. You've never touched it except when I was holding it. If I ever set it down, don't lay a finger on it, Ilsevile. It will gladly destroy you. It would enjoy destroying you. Ilsevile shuddered. You keep it next to your heart. How can you abide that? It's harmless to me. As long as it is bound to me, it cannot harm anyone else, not without a great deal of carelessness. And I don't have any intention of being careless with this device. Still, if it's dangerous, and you know it's dangerous, why wear it at all? Maybe you should return the Night Star to that vault I Thrades built for it. A raven reached inside his tunic and curled his fingers around the Night Star. He brought out the lambent gemstone, holding it in his thumb and forefinger. The purple facets glimmered with an eldritch light. I can't do that yet, he said. The Night Star has taught me that much already, but there is more to learn. When I master the secrets of this stone, there is nothing Sarya Delardrigeth can do that I won't be able to undo. What secrets? Ilsevile asked. You already learned enough mythocraft to sever her from the mythal of Mythglorok. There is more? He hesitated and said, Yes. Ilsevile studied him for a moment, and her eyes hardened. High magic? A raven nodded. Yes. High magic. The Night Star can give me Selethil's knowledge of high magic. The high magic spells and high mythocraft in this stone will let me defend or reweave any mythal Sarya attempts to subvert, or any other enemy, for that matter. I thought Falerin and the other high mages directed you to wait fifty years before taking up the study of high magic. I don't think they appreciate the dangers of waiting, Ilsevile. I have spent decades roaming the human lands of the north, and I've seen the works of Arivendar and Ilifarn that sleep in the wilds of the Sword Coast. They are dangerous things, and they are growing more perilous every year. So you have decided that you know better than a circle of high mages. Ilsevile was incredulous. A raven, did it ever occur to you that they wanted you to wait for your own good? How can you so lightly disregard their advice? Because I know what this lore stone is, and what it can teach me. But if I waited fifty years to study it, I would be no more ready than I am now. A raven gazed into the night star, then sighed and slipped it back inside his shirt. You saw what I was able to accomplish with only a portion of the night star's lore. I banished hundreds of Sarya Delardrigeth's demons at one stroke. Your father might have won the battle at the Lonely Moor without my help, but even if he did, how many elves would have died to destroy those monsters? Yes, you made good use of what you learned from the Lore Stone, Ilsevile said. But you can't seriously be arguing that the end justifies the means. That is a very slippery slope, and you know it. What if you could have won the battle by casting some terrible spell of necromancy, animating the bodies of our own fallen warriors so that they would continue fighting? Yes, the battle would have been won, and yes, no more of our own would have died who hadn't been killed already. But would it have been worth the price? Banishing demons is hardly comparable to defiling our own dead. You know I would never do something like that. 
Using an evil weapon to accomplish a good end is dangerous ground, regardless of the exact nature of the weapon or the end in question. Of course, but the spells and the knowledge contained in this Selukira are only tools, Ilsevile. The device can't harm anyone as long as I do not permit it to do so, and it offers me invaluable insights into spells and lore lost to the people for ages. A raven threw his hands wide in an angry shrug. Someone has to study the arts our enemies might turn against us, simply to understand how we might defend ourselves when they are used against us. At the moment, I seem to be the only one who can dare this high lore gem to do that. But the Daemon Fae don't have access to Selethil's lore now, Ilsevile protested. Why else would they have been looking for the Night Star before? I don't understand why you shouldn't just put it back where you found it, Araven. Ithrady's defenses kept the Night Star out of evil hands for five thousand years, after all. Sawyer de Lardrigeth was entombed for almost all that time, so it's not at all clear to me that Ithrady's defenses were in fact sufficient to the task. Elsevile stood, seizing her cloak from the chairback she had draped it over and throwing it around her shoulders. I'm not sure you understand as much about the Delardrigeths or the Night Star as you think you do, she said. An ancient marriage and a glimmer of kinship don't stain you with evil, Raven. Flirting with dangerous and hateful powers because you think the end justifies the means? That is what you should worry about. She gave him one final sharp glance and strode stiffly out of the reading room. A raven watched her leave. Is she right? he wondered. Maybe I should simply bury the night star again until I know for certain that I need it. He rubbed his fingers over the small, cold facets above his heart and sat down to read more about Morthal, Sanathar, and Ithrades, and their accounts of the device from fifty centuries ago. Skylua Darkhope, Castellan and High Captain of Zentel Keep, stared intently at the stronghold rising on the green verge of the forest that lay, low and distant, beyond the ruined walls of Eulash. Here on the outskirts of the abandoned city a new Zentish watchtower was being raised, and the heavy wooden scaffolds and booms surrounding the shell of cold grey stone seemed as light and fragile as a birdcage. It struck her as incongruous that a work of enduring strength could be born within such a light and impermanent cocoon. A bad windstorm could blow down the scaffolding in an hour, but once its work was done, why, her new tower might stand for a thousand years. She studied the work a little longer, not really watching the indentured masons and stonecutters at their tasks, simply lost in the metaphor. Her own life could be described in a similar way, she decided. Out of the fragility and impermanence of the flesh, a stone-hard spirit took shape. Out of the weakness of her heart and her foolish early hopes, the foundations of true purpose and real clarity had been laid. When her true self had finally taken form, well, it was of no account that the scaffolding of her ideals and her former dreams had been discarded, was it? Hi, Captain! Skylua pulled her gaze from the ongoing construction and turned to her lieutenant. The Zentish officer visibly steeled himself when she glanced at him. She was not a tall woman, but she was broad-shouldered and athletic, and the black plate armor she wore with the ease of long experience only contributed to her formidable presence. Yes, lieutenant. The wizard Perestrom is here. You asked for him after reading his report. Have him brought up. Skylua commanded without looking at the lesser officer. She rarely bothered to look anyone else in the eyes, and had the habit of staring off over a shoulder, or fixing her blank gaze on someone's breastbone as if she might bore a hole through his heart with simple concentration. She didn't realize that she had that habit, and certainly didn't do it deliberately. She simply found face-to-face -face conversations distracting and did not like to break the chain of her thoughts. The lieutenant struck his fist to his chest in the Zentish salute, not that Skylua noticed, and withdrew briefly, before returning with the tall, vulture-faced wizard in black robes, the Zentrum mage Peristrom. Hi, Captain Darkhope, the wizard said, offering a shallow bow as an insincere smile creased his sharp features. He looked up at the tower under construction. 
That is something of a vanity, you know. The art offers many ways to render such an expensive defense useless. A tower built with care and foresight may not be impervious to a skilled wizard, Peristrom, but at least it will discourage the less competent ones. Skylua smiled thinly to herself, even though she faced away from the others. And we can take steps to discourage attacking wizards, of course. For example, I have heard that our clerics have mastered a rite that would reave the life from a wizard, transforming him into a ghost, and bind him to a specific task for all eternity. For instance, the defense of this tower against enemy sorcerers. I shall have to give some thought to where I might find a wizard of suitable skill for such a task. I will be happy to provide several recommendations, Peristrom replied. If his arrogant smile faltered just a hint, Skylua did not see it. Of course. Now, about your report. What were you doing in Mithdranor exactly? I am the master of a small adventuring company, the Lords of the Ebon Worm. I have led several expeditions into various ruins around the Moon Sea and Old Cormanthia, in search of various glimpses of arcane lore and magical treasures. A ten day ago we arrived in the ruins of Mithdranor, intent on retrieving whatever artifacts we could find from the old city. We explored the ruins for several days with a little success. But five days ago, Late in the afternoon, we were attacked by a large company of flying, demonic sorcerers. I lost several of my fellow ebon worms before we managed to escape into the ruins. Demons and devils of all sorts are known to plague Mithdranor, Skylua observed, and they often slay adventurers there. I see nothing remarkable about your tales so far, Peristrom. As you say, High Captain, Peristrom said, again offering a small insincere bow. However, I find it noteworthy that these demonic sorcerers had the features of elves and spoke elvish to one another. Elves. Skylua glanced over her shoulder at the tall mage. Unusual, I admit, but why does it merit Zentrum attention? Because I think there are a thousand or more of these fellows in Mithdranor now. A whole army of them. Palestrom's smirk faded a bit. They attacked several other adventuring companies in and around the city over the next day or so, and we were attacked by several different demon elf bands during this time. We eluded most of these attacks through my spells, allusions to hide our presence, summonings to conjure up monsters that could cover our withdrawal, and I kept careful notations on the arms and devices of each such band we encountered. When we finally abandoned the ruins, I spent another two days spying out as much as I could about these new foes, using various spells and devices. I will be happy to share my notes, if you would care to examine my evidence in detail. Skylua faced Peristrom. He had managed to seize her attention all right. A thousand, she asked. All of them spellcasters? Better than half, I would say. Few as accomplished as I am, of course. Of course. Skylua considered that for a time. What about the Beatazu? Did they destroy many of these newcomers? That would be a good measure of their strength, anyway. As far as I could tell, the devils did not contest their presence. I saw no fighting between the demon-winged sorcerers and the devils of Mithdranor. In fact, on a few occasions, I saw devils in the company of the newcomers. Despite herself, Skylua felt her clarity slip just a fraction. What could Peristrom's report signify, she thought? A new army in Mithdranor? One that could rally the devils of the city to their banner? At the very least, it meant that further Zentrum expeditions to the ruined elven city must be undertaken with even more care and preparation than usual. Could it pose a threat to Zentel Keep itself? 
that many spellcasters and devils would be a formidable force if they found a way to escape the wards imprisoning them within Mithdranner's walls. But there were lesser states between Mithdranner and Zentel Keep, the Dales, for instance, or Moonsea cities such as Hillsfar. Threat or opportunity? Very well, Peristrom. I agree that this merits more investigation. Skylua lifted her unfocused gaze to the wizard's eyes until Peristrom looked away, his self-assurance not quite up to the intensity of her attention. I will speak to Lord Fazul about this, and we will consider how our ignorance might be amended. Ilsevile left a raven to continue his researches by himself, spending her time in the company of Maressa and Philsalene. She said that she simply wanted more time to wander Silvery Moon's tree-shaded streets and explore its odd shops, quaint markets, and famed universities, but a raven could read her silent disapproval well enough. He promised himself that he would set aside his work for a time and join her in taking in Silvery Moon sights, but first he wanted to see what he could find out about star elves and the long-dead mage named Morthil who had helped Ithrades destroy the Delardrageths in Arcarar five thousand years ago. On the morning of his fifth day in the vault, and his second alone, a raven found himself striding from reading room to reading room in search of Calwern, anxious to locate the next manuscript on his ever-growing list. He glanced out the leaded glass windows that marched along the hall, noting the bright spring sunshine outside and the soft and distant sound of the breeze caressing the branches of the stately old shadow tops sheltering the vault's windows, when he felt the cold, tingling presence of strange magic arise within his mind. A raven recoiled, dropping the sheaf of paper he carried and whirling to search the empty halls around him. Faint whispers of distant magic coiled in his mind, and he felt a presence forming, a sense of grim competence behind it. He started to speak the words of an arcane defense, but then he felt a familiar visage behind the magic, a stern face with a thin beard of black and gray, features somewhere between an elf's and a human's. Ascending, he murmured, feeling more than a little foolish. He relaxed and focused his attention on the message. A raven, this is Gerildin, spoke the distant voice in his mind. We have found portals under Mythglorok. Starbrow suspects that Damon Fay built them. Can you come and investigate? The magic of ascending lingered, awaiting his response. A raven frowned, considering Gerildin's message. I will be there in a few days, he replied. Contact me again if you need me to be there any sooner. Then Gerildin's sending faded, its magic expended by a raven's response. He glanced up at the bright spring sunshine filling the old library and fought off a shudder. Portals, of course, he thought. But where do they lead? Sarya and her followers might easily have made their escape through the magical doorways. A portal might lead anywhere. A forgotten dungeon, an undead haunted tomb, the sunless depths of the Underdark, even a network of other portals, anywhere. And without the proper key it might prove impossible to pursue Sarya and her followers at all. A raven had certainly studied enough of the magical gateways to know that. Master Tesher, are you well? Calwern asked. The Daniroth cleric hurried into the hallway, his kind old face anxious with concern. Yes, forgive me, I just received a sending, a raven said, coming back to the library with a start. I am afraid I must go. Is there anything we can do for you? No, my friend. I think I must leave Silvery Moon. I see. Do you know when you will return? Calwern asked. A couple of ten days, I hope? A raven stooped and picked up the lists he had dropped, quickly setting them back in order again. While I am gone, will you have your sages look into these sources for me? I will come back soon and see what you and your colleagues have learned. Of course! Calwern took the papers, bowed, and touched his brow and heart in the elven manner. In elvish he said, Sweet water and light laughter until we meet again then. And to you, a raven replied. He returned the cleric's parting, then hurried out of the vault of the sages, making his way to the golden oak. In the middle of the day, the inn yard was almost empty, the tables beneath the great oak tree deserted and silent. 
he found his way to the room Il Sevele and he shared. She was not there, nor were Maressa and Felsalene in their own rooms. So a raven began to pack up his belongings, making ready to leave. He settled the account with the innkeeper for all of them, and he waited for his companions. Not long before dusk, Il Sevele, Maressa, and Felsalene returned to the inn, tired but in good spirits after another day of wandering Silvery Moon streets and markets. A raven stirred himself from a shallow reverie as they bustled into the room, laughing at some jest or another. Good evening, he said. I've been waiting for you. You're an elf. You're good at it, Maressa observed. She grinned at her own wit. In fact, we can go back out again for a while if you'd like. Il Sevele glanced at his pack and staff by the door, and the soft smile faded from her perfect features. She looked back to a raven, her expression guarded. What's happened? she asked. I've heard news of the Daemon Fay, I think. A raven stood. Starbrow had Gerildon speak to me in ascending. Your father's warriors have found some portals hidden beneath Myth Glorok, and Starbrow suspects that the Daemon Fay might have built them or used them for their own purposes. He asked me to examine the portals. I told him I would come within a few days. Portals? Leading where? Maressa demanded. More troll-haunted forests or monster-plagued caves? I've had enough of portals, thank you. I won't know where they lead until I see them for myself, a raven said. He looked at his companions and gestured at the in-room. Starbrow asked for me, and I intend to go. But there's no need for you to leave Silvery Moon if you would prefer to stay. I'll come, Il Sevele said at once. My father's fight against the Daemon Fay is my fight too and my place is with you. A raven nodded. He hadn't really expected anything other than that from her, even after their argument in the vault. It may be nothing, he said, but if Starbrow has stumbled onto the trail of the Daemon Fay, it might be more than a little dangerous to follow them. I might stumble into the middle of Sarya's audience chamber again, or they might set magical traps or monstrous guardians to discourage pursuit. You are going to attempt those portals regardless of the danger, Ilsevle observed. I will, too. Why do they need you for this task, a raven? Vilsalene asked. Aren't there dozens of skilled mages with Several and Starbrow at Mythglorok? Yes, there are. But a raven's made a special study of portal magic over the last few years, Ilsevle answered for him. He knows as much about portals as any mage in Faerun by now. When are you leaving? Vilsalene asked. Tonight or tomorrow morning, a raven said. I can make arrangements for you to remain here as long as you like, Vilsalene. I don't want to turn you out in the street. You too, Maressa. Vilsalene frowned, her eyes dark and thoughtful. No, I think I would like to come with you. If your business with the Daemon Fay isn't finished yet, the least I can do is help you finish it. If you hadn't found me when you did... I doubt that Sarya would have left me alive in that dungeon when she abandoned Myth Glorok. You don't owe us any debt, Vesalene, Ilsevele said. We would have aided anybody in your circumstances. I know, the young Sun Elf said, but even if I owe you nothing for saving me from the Daemon Fay dungeons, I owe something to my friends who died fighting the Daemon Fay. If I can help to make the Daemon Fay answer for the evil they have caused, I will. Well, I'm certainly not going to stay here by myself, Maressa muttered. She crossed her arms and glared at a raven. Next time, let's find something that needs doing in a city like Kalimshan or Waterdeep, instead of some musty old ruins in the middle of the wilderness. It's our task, not yours, a raven said. You don't have to. Oh, yes, I do, Maressa said. I didn't know him as long as you did, a raven, but Graith was my friend, too. And Brant as well. If you have any chance of finding where that demon-spawned bitch Sarya is hiding, I want to be a part of it. I'm in the habit of killing people who murder my friends. A raven grimaced. Maressa had struck straight at a point he had half forgotten. Caught up in the mystery of Salathil's lore, it had somehow slipped from the forefront of his mind that his oldest and truest human friend had not survived their battles against the Daemon Fay. I will be glad for your company, then he told Maressa. Ilsevele looked down at the pack by the door. 
So we are leaving now? she said. Soon, a raven replied. I just wanted to be ready. But if we are all going, it's dusk, and the Damon Fay already have a twenty-day head start. Tomorrow morning is good enough. Maressa brightened. Well, good then. I was afraid I wouldn't have one more chance to drink and dance all night long before we set out. It'll be a hard day of travel tomorrow if you overdo it this evening, Thilselene warned. That, said Maressa, will be tomorrow's problem. Chapter 4 Thirteen Mirtul, The Year of Lightning Storms Several Miratar spent much of his time in Luthulspar, closeted with Carith Blackhelm and the other captains of Evermeet's armies and knighthoods, describing in exacting detail the course of the campaign his crusade had fought across the wilderlands of the north. As best he could, he told them how he had confronted the Daemon Fey army and their demonic allies, which tactics worked against an army of winged sorcerers, which weapons and spells served to defeat demons, and which did not. When he finished with that task, he steeled himself for a duty he had no heart for, but that he had to do. After he tarried in Luthulspar for a day more, he outfitted a riding horse in the stables of his family's villa in the capital, and left the city. He rode north into the green meadows and airy forests of the western hills, to the small forest estate of Elvath Murareste. There he visited with Neira Murareste, Elvath's wife, and as best he could, he told her how Elvath had died. She had heard of Elvath's fall already, and had greeted him wearing the gray veil of mourning. "'I am so sorry for your loss,' Sivril said to her. "'Elvath was more than my captain-at-arms and adviser. He was my friend. I cannot tell you how much I regret his death.' Lady Murareste sighed. "'I know, Sivril. Elvath thought the world of you and he answered your call to arms with a willing heart. His death is almost more than I can bear, but it gives me comfort to know that he died fighting for a good and true cause. Nera sat in silence for a time. Then she set her hand on his and asked, How did it happen? I only heard that he fell fighting outside of Areska. Elvath had command of our right flank, Sivril said. He found that he was glad of the opportunity to simply recount the tale, rather than search for comforting words. Our cavalry was there. They fought valiantly and well all morning. Elvath's forces were outnumbered, but he commanded some of our best companies, and they used their speed and courage to great effect. After an hour of fighting, we repelled the Daemon Fey attack, and their lines broke. Their army fell back in retreat. I sent our cavalry in pursuit, and Elvath and his silver guard drove the orcs and ogres and the rest out of the West Coombe, sealing our victory. But near the top of the Sentinel Pass on the far side of the Coombe, Elvath was killed by a boulder thrown by a giant. He was simply looking the wrong way, and had no chance to dodge it. Several paused, then added, he was killed at once. Were you there? No. I was tending to wounded on the far side of the veil when he fell. I might have been able to save him had I been closer. But so many of our warriors were injured in the early fighting. He made himself look into Neira's eyes. I left the pursuit in Elvath's hands because my healing was needed so badly where I was. I should have led the pursuit myself. Nera squeezed his hand. Did others live because you chose as you did? Several considered the question. Yes. The healing spells I cast that day likely saved a number of people who otherwise would have died. Then I am certain that I do not regret your decision, Several. And I know that Elvath would not either. Nera Murareste released his hand and smiled sadly behind her veil. Several took his leave an hour later, and rode back to Luthilspar in the afternoon, taking his time. Hundreds of elves who had followed him to Faerun had fallen in battle, and he owed visits to many more people, a burden that should have broken his heart. Yet Nera's question kept him from drowning in the grief he felt. 
Did others live because I chose as I did? He asked himself. And the answer was an unequivocal yes. Elf warriors who fell in battle against the Daemon Fae had undoubtedly spared many more lives, the lives of many others who had no skill for battle and otherwise might have died terrible deaths. He grieved for each son or daughter of Evermeet who died following his banner, but he could not bring himself to believe that he had been wrong to take up arms against the Daemon Fae threat. He returned to Luthelspar late in the afternoon, following the familiar boulevards and winding ways that led to the Miratar villa. He tended to his horse himself, dismissing the groom as he unsaddled the animal, rubbed it down, brushed its coat, watered it, and put away the tack and harness. He had just filled the feed bag and was finishing his work when he became aware of someone watching him from the stable door. Yes, he said without turning. I'm glad you haven't lost the habit of doing such work for yourself, Queen Amlero replied. She glided into the stable and paused to pat the horse's neck. I see you have been out riding. Severo recovered from his surprise and bowed. Yes, my lady, I have just returned from Elvath Muraresti's home. He fell near Evereska, didn't he? Yes, he did. Calling a Neira was the least I could do. Amlerul looked over the horse's shoulders at him. That was good of you, Severo. Severo brushed off his hands and said, If you like, we can go inside. For some reason I feel uncomfortable entertaining the monarch of Evermeet while standing in my stable. It has the virtue of being a place where we are unlikely to be listened to, Amlerul said. I can think of a few people who might be tempted to scry on you, or me, for that matter. In that case, I suggest the garden. Severo led Amlerol through another door to a small bower between the stable and the manor itself. A simple stone bench overlooked a small natural waterfall that trickled through the grounds. It was nothing compared to the expansive gardens ringing Amlerol's palace, but it was quiet and private. And just to ensure their privacy, Severo spoke a prayer to Corellan and wove a spell designed to obscure any efforts to spy on them. When he was done, he turned to Amlerul and asked, What brings you to my house, my lady? I wanted to know what you thought of Selshara de Rotho's suggestion. Are you willing to resume a council seat and hold an office such as she describes? Amlerul sat down on the bench and arranged her silver-hued gown. The East Marshal! Severo frowned, thinking carefully. Are you asking me to accept this duty? Amlerul smiled. Answer my question first, and I'll answer yours. Well, no, I do not think I want to hold such a title. Is it because Selshara suggested it, or do you have some other objection? I am certainly suspicious of Selshara's motives, Severo admitted. After all, she reversed her position with the skill of a pirouetting dancer, didn't she? But even assuming that she was completely honest and forthcoming— I am still not sure that what she suggests will work. The queen tilted her head. Go on. If I swore myself to your service again, and accepted a titled office that made me a high captain of your army, I would naturally be subject to your commands. I would arrange my forces as you asked. I would march when you ordered me to march. And I would not march against an enemy unless I asked you first. Severo shrugged. That also means answering to the council for everything I do or don't do. The council does not have the authority to tell me what to do, Amlerul said. It is true that I think twice before I disregard their suggestions, but the responsibility for Evermeet's governance and safety are mine, not theirs. I will not allow the Dorothals and Veldens of the council to question my decisions beyond a reasonable point. I am not certain that is as true as you would like it to be, Severo said. Amlerul's eyes flashed, and he quickly hurried on. You will not be on the throne forever, Amlerul, and I will not be your general in Faerun for long. An arrangement we make now, because it suits both our talents and our interests, may not survive our successors. Even I do not know when that day will come, Severo. 
We can hardly allow ourselves to refrain from making good and sound judgments now, because we think those who follow us may overturn them. Nevertheless, the next monarch to sit on Evermeet's throne may not possess the mandate of the Seldarine, as Zaur did and you do. Even if a moonflower heir succeeds you, the succession may entail compromises, limits on the monarch's power. In that scenario, your heir may not be able to refuse a council demand to recall any standing army you leave in Faerun. Sivro looked down at his feet. I do not want to see my work in Faerun reversed, because Evermeet's monarch or council, or the next holder of my prospective title for that matter, change their minds about engaging Faerun in a decade or two. Sivro, I have no intention of departing for Arvindor any time soon. That's not always left to our choosing, is it? he countered. You truly believe that you will have an easier time maintaining a presence in Faerun through your voluntary call to arms, when the council and the crown are willing to consider formalizing what you have done? Amlerol shook her head in disbelief. Sivirol, I have been won over by the persuasiveness of your arguments so far, but I simply don't see how this can be true. I know. Several said, but I have given it a great deal of thought over the last few days. The queen rose and regarded him for a long moment. The council meets again in a little less than a ten-day, my friend. I am inclined to lend my support to Soshara's suggestion. It would place you in an awkward position if the council appointed a different lord to go to Faerun and assume command of those in your army who would prefer to serve under the crown. I will have an answer for you and the council, Several said. Amlerol nodded. She took his hand and smiled. Then I suppose I will go. Thank you for hearing me out. You are welcome in my stable any time you care to visit it, Your Majesty, Several replied. Amlerol laughed and turned to go. Her gown glittered like starlight in the gathering dusk but at the moonstone archway marking the garden's entrance, she paused and looked back at him. One other matter I meant to mention, she said. I have heard that one of your captains wields Carivian, the last of Demron's bane blades. I knew the sword was in your possession, but I thought that it had answered to no hand since the fall of Mithdranor. Yes, I gave Carivian into the keeping of my captain, Starbrow. I do not know him. Amlerol said with a frown. Sivril could understand her confusion. Any champion with skill and experience enough to merit such trust would have been known to her in Evermeet. You must hold him in high regard indeed. He is not who he seems to be. Amlerol studied him for a moment, and her eyes widened. It can't be Flar, she whispered. Not after so many years. Please, do not speak of this, Sivril asked. He prefers to remain just Starbrow for now. Severo, you can't simply resurrect dead heroes when you need them, and he died so long ago. Severo glanced up at the darkening skies. It wasn't entirely my own idea. Amlerol measured him, her expression stern. You spoke of my mandate earlier. I sincerely hope you have the mandate you think you do. If you are wrong about what you're doing, the consequences would be disastrous. She swept away into the dusk, leaving Several alone in his garden. The cleric sat down on the bench again and watched the first dim stars emerging overhead. I hope I do, too, he murmured. Five days of hard travel brought a raven, Ilsevile, Maressa, and Philsalene from Silvery Moon to the ruins of Mythglorak. Spring rains drenched them for several days, until a raven began to wonder whether it would be better to seek some form of magical travel to speed their journey. But he disliked teleporting unless he felt that he absolutely had to do so. Sometimes teleportation magic went awry, after all. Fortunately, they found villages and inns for much of their journey, first along the road from Silvery Moon to Everland, then at Leuvenhead and Jalanthar. From Jalanthar, at the east end of the Ralvan Vale, they struck out south and east through Turnstone Pass and arrived at the ruins of Mythglorok an hour after sunset. As before, 
The ancient city was ringed with lanterns and modest campfires of the elven army, a cheerful sight after days of riding. A raven and his companions left their horses at a large camp corral where the cavalry companies of the crusade housed their steeds, and climbed up Mithglorok's winding old footpaths, which circled steadily as they ascended the forest-covered hilltop on which the city stood. Small encampments of elf warriors and patrols of vigilant guards filled the old city, calling out friendly greetings as they passed by. With a few questions a raven and his companions learned that Starbrow and Vesilde Gareth were currently in charge of the army, since Several Miratar was away on Evermeet, and that the commanders were headquartered in the city's old library. They found Starbrow and Gareth poring over supply and equipment records, wrestling with the question of how to feed and arm not only the warriors of the army, Elf warriors in a forest could get along for quite some time with few stores, and most had brought their own weapons and armor, but also the thousands of horses and the more exotic creatures that accompanied the army. The two commanders made an odd pair. Starbrow was nearly six and a half feet tall, and about as burly as a moon elf ever got, while the sun elf Vasilde Gareth was a full foot shorter and slight of build. Starbrow looked up as they entered and grinned. I was wondering where you were, he said. I was about to have Terildin cast another sending for you. It's a long ride from Silvery Moon, Ilsevele replied. She wrung out the hem of her cloak, leaving a puddle of cold water on the floor, and glared at Starbrow. You had better have a good reason for sending for us. Vasilde Gareth raised his hand in greeting. Mage Tesher, Lady Ilsevele, welcome back. I am glad to see you. Not to speak for Captain Starbrow, but I think we have a sound reason for seeking a raven's expertise. Our mages have had no luck with opening the portals the Daemon Fay left behind. I'll have a look first thing in the morning, a raven promised. Right now we're all tired, cold, and wet, and I wouldn't say no to a hot meal and a mug of mulled wine, if anything like that can be found around here. That's the best idea I've heard in a ten-day, Maressa added. Of course. I'll see if our quartermasters can find something for you. Vasilde called for an aide, who then headed off in search of some food and good accommodations for a raven and his companions. We heard that my father went to Evermeet, Ilsevele asked Starbrow. Do you know when he will return? Three or four days, most likely. He said there was one more council meeting he wanted to attend before he came back. But if you find something in the portals, he'll return at once. A raven and his friends dined with Vasilde and Starbrow, listening to the commander's accounts of the crusade's fruitless search for any sign of the Daemon Fay and the discovery of the hidden portals in Sarya's buried vaults. Then they were shown to an old ruined chapel, its long vanished roof replaced by well-secured canvas to make a reasonably warm and dry room in which to camp. In the dark hours before dawn, a raven roused himself from reverie, found his spellbooks, and chose a small alcove of the old temple to illuminate with a pale light spell while he studied his spells of portal lore. When the sun came up, he joined the others for a breakfast of dried fruit and porridge provided by the quartermasters of the army. Arm yourselves for battle, a raven told them after they ate. If we try our luck with an unknown portal, we might step through into the fight of our lives. While they were arming themselves, Starbrow appeared in the chapel's old doorway. He wore a long green cloak over his shoulders with Caribbean belted to his waist, and he carried a large rucksack. The moon elf looked them over and grinned. You certainly look ready, he said. A raven looked at Starbrow in surprise. You're coming with us? Unless you tell me not to. Aren't you needed here? Ilsevele asked. My father left the army in your hands, after all. Actually, he left Lord Gareth in command. I'm just his second. Besides, we've been sitting here for days. If there's even the slightest chance that we might sniff out the Daemon Fay, I want to be a part of it. I've seen his work with that sword of his, Maressa observed to Phil Salene. The Genesi set her hands on her hips, her crimson leather armor gleaming darkly. I'm not going to tell him we don't need him. Very well, a raven answered. Let's have a look at these portals you found. It may be a short trip if I can't open them. 
Starbrow laughed out loud. Then he led the small company into the streets of Mithglorok. A short walk brought them to the one-time palace of the city's rulers. It was an impressive ruin, with great gaping arches and broken towers reaching to the gray skies. The Grand Mage's Palace, Starbrow said. The Daemon Fae used it as their stronghold. They climbed up the shattered steps to the open foyer, passed through into a courtyard within the overgrown walls, and there found a stone stairway deep in the palace, descending into the darkness below. A raven frowned and steeled himself. He knew all too well the vaults and passages beneath the palace, as did his companions. Starbrow's soldiers had illuminated the dark passageway with small lanterns, and they followed the string of lantern-lit hallways and stairs as they descended deeper and deeper into the cold rock of the hillside. They passed several contingents of guards, vigilant elves who stood watch in case some undetected evil emerged from a hidden depth of Sarya's dungeons. Have you had any trouble down here? a raven asked. We found a couple of magical traps, spell glyphs, symbols, things like that, Starbrow replied. But we haven't found any fairy assassins lurking in the cellars, or demon gates to the abyss, or dragon lairs, or anything truly dangerous. I think Sawyer simply didn't have the time to cover her tracks as well as she might have liked. The moon elf turned aside into a long, narrow gallery that a raven recognized from his cursory exploration of the place a few ten days ago. Statues of grim-looking gargoyles crouched near the ceiling, leering down at them. The gallery ended in a blank stone wall, a single featureless block contained within a stone lintel carved in the shape of a winding vine climbing a trellis. Here it is, Starbrow said. That's not Damon Fay work, a raven said at once. He pointed at the decorative stonework. They have no use for carvings like that. Starbrow looked sharply at him. You mean this is a dead end? No, I didn't say that. There's no reason that Sari and her vultures couldn't have used a portal like this. A raven studied it, searching for any markings or lettering to read. Can you open it? Vilsaylene asked. Possibly, a raven replied. Let me try a spell first. He whispered the words of a simple detection spell and carefully examined the flickering auras that glimmered around the ancient doorway. It has the right sort of magic, he decided, and is certainly strong and well-woven enough to have lasted for quite a long time. He spoke another spell, one that would divine many of the secrets of the portal. In his eyes the magical weave ghosted into existence, bright and many-colored, each strand hinting at work done well and carefully long ago. It's a keyed portal, he said. Which means? Starbrow asked. It won't open unless we take the right action or present the right device, a token of some kind, a password, some specific thing that would keep just anybody from opening the doorway. A raven examined the blank gateway for a few minutes longer, and he began to chant the words of a longer and more difficult spell, seeking to wrest from the portal itself the knowledge of what key would activate it. He finished the spell, and in his mind's eye he caught a glimpse of a small white flower, a tiny bell only the size of a thumbnail, really. That makes sense, a raven said with a soft laugh. What, have you figured it out already? Starbrow said. It's only a matter of knowing the right spells. They're somewhat rare, and I suppose not all that many wizards have studied them. A raven straightened and reached out to tap the carving of the vine surrounding the doorway. This vine, it is Relina, isn't it? Starbrow and the others exchanged blank looks, but Elsevile nodded. Yes, she said, I think it is. That's all we need. Each of us must carry a petal of a Relina blossom and speak a short password, Nessie Alicendali, and the portal will activate. I'll send for some, Starbrow said at once. He quickly trotted out of sight and called out to the nearby guards. In a few minutes he returned with a handful of tiny white blossoms. Here you go, he said. What would they do if they needed to use the portal and these weren't in bloom? The builders probably kept a small jar of old petals somewhere near this place, a raven said. He helped himself to a small petal and held it pinched between his thumb and forefinger. Now, how do we want to do this? It might be best if I went ahead alone, in case there's some trap I didn't expect. 
Nessie Ali Sendeli, Marissa said. She touched the blank stone of the archway and disappeared in the blink of an eye, leaving nothing but a small white petal drifting down to the floor. Marissa, Ilsevile snapped, but the genocide was nowhere in sight. The noblewoman snarled. Now what do we do? She doesn't like to waste time, does she? Starbrow observed. Well, let's hope that a raven can get us out wherever we wind up. He plucked a single petal out of the handful he held, dropped the rest into a raven's hand, and followed Maressa into the portal. With a sigh, Ilsevile snatched up a petal and hurried after him, followed by Philselene a moment later. A raven took a moment to scoop up the whole handful of relina flowers, just in case there were multiple portals on the far side that made use of the same key. Then he followed his comrades into the unknown. Sawyer de Lardegreth studied the founding stone of Mythdranner's mythal, dreaming of the things she could do with its power. Unlike the stone in Mythglorok, which was a massive natural boulder, Mythdranner's was a well-shaped obelisk of deep rose-colored stone on a plinth of granite. Golden light seemed to glimmer in the translucent stone, hinting at power waiting to be harnessed. The Daemon Fay Queen carefully swept the rest of the chamber with the most acute detection spells she could manage, making absolutely sure that she knew precisely what was or wasn't enclosed in the mythal chamber. It was a relatively large and airy room, a spacious vault with a high, graceful arch to the ceiling. By some ancient artifice, six bright columns of sunlight shone down into the room, relayed through Castle Cormanthor's upper floors by hidden shafts. The floor was a complex design of intersecting circles rendered in several different varieties of marble, covered in a thick coat of dust from centuries of disuse. Satisfied that no scryings or magical traps awaited her, Sawyer returned her attention to the mythal stone. I am ready, she announced. Excellent, replied someone from within the mythal's living fountain of magic. Melodious, even beautiful. The voice was masculine and perfect. Open your gate, then. I will join you there. Sawyer raised her hands and began to declaim the words of a very powerful spell, one of the most dangerous she knew, a spell designed to breach the barriers between the plains and create a magical bridge into another realm of existence. The mythal thrummed in response, the intangible pulse of the old device taking on a new and different note. Sarya ignored the mythal stone's change and pressed on, finishing her gate spell with skill and confidence. The gate is open, she cried. Malkazid, come forth! Before Sarya, a great ring or hoop of golden magic coalesced from the air. Through it she glimpsed the realm of Malkazid, an infernal wasteland of parched desert, wind-swept rifts, and black, angry skies torn by crimson lightning. Then, through the gate, the archdevil Malkazid appeared. With one smooth step, he crossed from his infernal plane into the mythal chamber. He was tall, well over six feet, and sturdy of build. His skin was marble white, even paler and more colorless than that of a fair complexioned moon elf. His hair was long, black, and straight, and his eyes were large and absolutely black, with no hint of pupil, iris, or white. He wore a long crimson robe embroidered with gold designs, and he carried a large silver sword point down in one hand, keeping it close by his side. A small trickle of dark blood ran down his face from some unseen injury in the center of his forehead, but Malkazid paid it no mind. I am here, he said. So I see, Sarya replied. She let her gate lapse, and immediately spoke the words of a second spell. Beneath Malkazid's feet, a complex summoning diagram flared into existence, encircling the powerful devil with a barrier of impenetrable magic. Malkazid glanced down, and his mouth twisted in a cold imitation of a smile. What is this, Sarya? he asked. A binding diagram that should hold even you, Malkazid. Simply a precaution in case you are not forthright about aiding me once summoned. It is hardly necessary, I assure you. I have come to help you after all. What could I possibly gain by betraying you now? I have no idea, 
but I see no reason to invite treachery. Sarya watched Malkazit carefully, a spell of dismissal only an instant from her lips. Malkazit shrugged. Blood dripped from his wounded forehead. As you wish, then, said the devil. I can instruct you just as well from within this diagram. Now, will you speak the spell of mythal reading? You will need to make visible the threads that bind this artifice together. Sarya hesitated. Is there any chance of warning the mythal's creators by casting that spell here? Several of those who raised this mythal are still alive. I can think of at least one who wields Mistra's silver fire. I know of whom you speak, Malkazit replied. He did not name the wizard Sarya was thinking of, for it was well known that Mistra's chosen could hear their names spoken anywhere in the world, and any words that the speaker uttered after the name. I do not fear him, but then again, I am protected inside this exceedingly thorough summoning circle. However, the first thing we will do is silence the mythos' alarms and prevent it from sending out any kind of warning to its creators. I will show you how. Can you be certain that it will work? Malkazid's dark eyes flashed, and a frown creased his noble countenance. Sarya de Lardugeth, I forgot more about Mythocraft ten thousand years ago than those who raised this stone managed to accumulate in all the time since. This mythal was raised by mere novices. Long ago I taught the Vishanti how to build wonders you could not conceive of. In the days of Arivandar's glory, mythals were weapons of war, and mythalcraft was the grandest and most terrible of the martial skills. Of course I know how to conceal my presence from such a device. Despite herself, Sawyer took half a step back. For just a moment, she glimpsed the ancient anger that Malkazid hoarded beneath his calm demeanor, and demon queen that she was, she still took note. You have had access to this mythal for nearly twenty years, she observed. If you are so knowledgeable, why haven't you subverted it already? Malkazid grounded the point of his silver sword in the smooth stone floor and glowered at her. First, I am not an elf, nor the recipient of any special blessing of Mistra's. You still possess enough elf blood in your veins to deceive some of this mythal's defenses, Sarya, while I do not. Second, I dare not set foot in the bounds of this mythal through any use of my own power. The wards raised by the Zents two decades ago trap devils within the mythal's bounds. I will show you how to modify that stricture soon. But until I found you, I had no one to bring me to this place who would not instantly trap me here. You could be trapped here now, Sarya said, nodding at her binding circle. Only if you wish to betray me, Malkazit replied and I would advise you to carefully consider any such course of action, for the consequences would be severe. If nothing else, you would find me much less forthcoming with my secrets of mythocraft if you thought to coerce me. Sarya weighed the devil's words, comparing them with what she thought she knew. I will not betray you, Malkazid. I only seek to protect myself. She indicated the mythal stone with a flick of her wing and asked, Now, how do we proceed? First, said Malkazid, I will show you how to inspect the mythal's very structure and identify the properties that are useful, those that are dangerous, and those you can modify with some work. Then, we will make you the mistress of this mythal, so that no one else can contest your mastery of the device or sever you from it in the way Mythglorok's mythal was taken from you. Now that we have learned that your enemies can do such a thing, I see no reason to allow it to happen again. Chapter 5 19 Mir Tool, The Year of Lightning Storms The first portal led to a ruined chamber high on the shoulders of an icy, windswept mountain. The bitter cold struck a raven the instant he stepped through the magical gate, and the sting of wind-driven snow and the roar of the storm left him barely able to see or hear at all in the first moments after he arrived. He threw up one arm to shield his eyes, and peered at the old stonework around him. A raven! 
El Sevele shouted to make herself heard above the wind. Where are we? I don't know, he called back. A raven finally blinked his eyes clear. The others stood around him, backs to the wind, holding cloaks close around their throats as the garments flapped and fluttered. Narrow window slits looked out over a scene of magnificent desolation, a cloud-racked sea of black peaks and deep valleys. The chamber, and presumably whatever structure it was a part of, actually stood well above the cloud layer. Sunlight streamed into the room, painfully bright. About the same time of day as before, a raven noted. We haven't moved terribly far to the east or the west. What mountains of such size stand near Myth Clorok? The Nether Mountains, but they are not so tall. The spine of the world, or maybe. I think these are the Ice Mountains, he told his companions. Two hundred miles north of Myth Clorok, perhaps. It's only a guess, though. We can't stay here long, Starbrow replied. Can we return through the portal? A raven turned to examine the blank stone face of a gateway, framed by a similar Relina vine device. Yes, he replied, but we'll need Relina again. I've got the rest of the blossoms if we need to go back. It's not so bad here, Maressa observed. The genocide seemed more at home in the frigid air and howling wind than a raven could believe. Her cloak hung from her shoulders, ruffling gently in the wind that streamed the other's cloaks like pennants behind them, and her long white hair drifted gently. She was a creature of the elemental air, and she was well suited for high places and strong winds. So what do we do now? Explore, said a raven. See if we can find any other portals the Daemon Fay might have used, or a trail or path leading away from this place. Starbrow shifted Carivian so that the heavy sword's hilt was close to his hand. He looked out the window slit at the steep slopes beyond. There might not be a road, a raven. All the Daemon Fay have wings. Maybe they just flew off from here. We'll consider that possibility when we have to. A raven looked around the tower. The row of windows overlooking the mountain slope below stood to his left. To his right a broad swath of the chamber's wall was simply gone, as if something had cleaved the old building with a titanic axe stroke. The stonework had an elven look to it, somewhat heavier than elves might normally build. But given the evident remoteness and difficulty of the location, he could hardly blame the builders for using whatever materials were close at hand. Was the place a watchpost of some kind? he wondered. They made their way through an empty archway in the intact wall to another room, this one a large rectangular hall or banquet room, also brightly lit by the dazzling sunlight on the snow. Most of the roof was absent, lying in piles of rubble and debris on the floor of the chamber. Deep snowdrifts clung to the corners of the room. It could have been a watchtower, a raven decided. The elves of ancient Ierlon would have wanted to keep an eye on the spine of the world for dragonflights or armies of orcs and giants. What a miserable post this must have been, he muttered. Yes, but the view would have been worth it, Ilsevele replied. A gust of wind slammed into the stonework hall, kicking up high plumes of blowing ice and snow. She shivered and pulled her cloak as tight as she could. For an hour, anyway. At the far end of the hall, they found a stairway leading down into a dim chamber below. Philselene spoke a brief prayer to Corellin and imbued a slender wooden rod with magical light, and they followed her down into the rooms below. There they found a set of chambers with thicker, sturdier walls, broken only by a couple of thin arrow slits less than a hand span wide. The roar of the ever-present wind diminished to an eerie moaning as they descended into the shelter of the lower floor. Vilselene raised her light rod higher, then took a step back. There is a body, she said. Undead? Starbro demanded, unsheathing Carivian. The sun-elf cleric hesitated, then replied. No, simply dead. A raven and Ilsevele moved up to stand on either side of Vilselene looking down on the corpse. The fellow had died sitting with his back to the wall, and had remained more or less in that position, his chin slumped down to his chest as if he had dozed off. The cold or the dry air had preserved him remarkably. 
He was human, dressed in the robes of a wizard, with a wooden staff clasped in his icy fingers. His eyes, dark and half-lidded, stared blankly into his lap. He just froze like that? Ilsevile asked. Who was he? How did he get here? Did the daemon fae kill him? Starbrow glanced at the dead mage and said, Look at him. He might have been here for a hundred years just like that. I doubt the daemon fae had much to do with it. I can try to question his spirit, Philsalene said, but I must prepare the proper invocations to Corellan Larethian first, and that I cannot do until the moon rise tonight. The sun elf girl frowned, then added, On the other hand, if he's been here for a long time, this husk will hold no memory of the spirit. He might have been dead too long for my spell to work. We'll try to question him if we find nothing else here, a raven decided. He isn't going anywhere for now. From the chamber at the bottom of the stairs, an archway led into a long, barrel-vaulted gallery, or readout of some kind, that was illuminated by a row of shuttered arrow slits looking out over the steep mountainside. A raven wondered who the builders regarded as enemies. The place was in such a lofty locale that it seemed hard to believe that any conventional army, the sort of enemy who might be stopped by stonework and arrow slits, would be able to reach the watchpost, let alone attack it. Then, along the back wall of the room, they discovered no less than five portals, each framed in its own stone archway. The lintels worked in the design of various flowering plants and vines. A raven recognized Felsul and Holly, the others he could not name. What is this place? Ilsevle asked as the wind moaned eerily in the ruins above them. A portal nexus, a raven said. Many portals are simple two-way devices, but sometimes portal builders wanted to link several destinations together in a network of portals. This is clearly such a place. You could step through one of those portals, and in a few moments use any of the others, choosing from a number of destinations. In other words, the Daemon Fae could be behind any of those doors, Starbrow said. He frowned. Damnation! What if they lead us into a whole daisy chain of magical doorways? We might be at this for days. Or longer, a raven answered. This explains the dead mage outside the room. He was probably a portal explorer, who used one of the doors leading into the nexus, but then lacked the key to open another door to leave by. Without the right key, any or all of these doors would be nothing more than empty stone arches. Maressa shuddered. Gods, what a lonely way to die. It just goes to show you that you should never break into a place you can't break out of. Well, I anticipated that I might have to decipher several portals today, so I have prepared a few of the right sort of spells, a raven said. Give me a few moments, and I'll see what I can divine about these doorways. The rest of the company stood watch, while a raven chose the first portal on his left and spoke the words of his seeing spell. He realized at once that at least that one was damaged beyond repair. Only a fraying remnant of its magic remained, not even enough to guess at where it might have once led. He suspected that simple time and decay had been enough to ruin it. The second portal was still working when he divined its key, a small token of wood marked with a few elvish letters. Anyone who carried or wore such a token could use the portal, but no one else could. I'll wait on that one, he decided. If he needed to, he could attempt to manufacture a proper token to awake it, but first he wanted to examine the other possibilities. The third portal was functional. Its key was a simple spell, inscribing an arcane mark on the door would open it for a short time. Many, if not most sorcerers or wizards, knew that particular spell, but perhaps the dead mage in the other room hadn't known it, or had been caught without the right spell ready. A raven moved on to the fourth portal, and he found that this one had something close to the same key that the portal beneath Myth Glorak had used, a relana blossom and a short phrase in Elvish. He turned his attention to the last of the portals in the gallery, and he recoiled at once. It was an insidious trap. It was keyed to a simple passphrase that was actually carved in the stone lintel above the arch, but a raven observed that its magical strands were designed to unravel after conveying the user to some unknown destination. 
Stay away from the portal on the right, he warned his companions. Don't say the word that's carved there, and don't touch the stone. I don't know where it leads, but it is designed to strand you there for a ten day or more. Maressa happened to be nearest the trapped portal. She glanced at it suspiciously, and carefully stepped away from the device. Not that one, then, she said. Which door did the Daemon Fay use? The third or the fourth, I think. Maybe the second, but I doubt it, a raven answered. Take your pick. One moment, then, Philselene said. She pressed her hands together before her chest and looked up at the blank stone overhead, murmuring the words of a prayer to Corellan Lorethian. Which door did the Daemon Fay use? she asked. The others watched as the slender sun-elf waited for a long moment, eyes closed. Then Philselene shook herself with a small start. Go left, she said. The third door is the one the Daemon Fay passed through. Very well, a raven said. Everybody, be ready to pass through the portal quickly after I activate it. Portals opened by spells normally remain open for only a few moments, so you will have to hurry after me. His companions gathered close around the portal. A raven checked to make sure they were ready, and he whispered the word to the spell and traced on the stone surface the mark he used as his own sigil. Blue fire awoke in the ancient gate, rippling around its perimeter, and a raven was snatched away to somewhere else. He found himself in deep, near-total darkness, with only a faint glimmer of light spilling down from somewhere overhead. Despite the lack of illumination, a raven took three quick steps away from where he had arrived, knowing that his friends would be arriving right on his heels. He barked his shin hard on something, stumbled and caught himself on a stone pedestal in front of him, muttering a human curse, and any human tongue was much more suited to profanity than elvish, after all. He managed to call a light spell from his staff and see where he was. The room was a vault or cellar below a large stone building, evidently in ruins. A stairwell leading up stood across the room to his right. The soft glow of daylight filtered down, the glimmer he had seen when he first entered. He looked down and discovered he had very nearly tumbled headlong into a deep stone well in the center of the room. The knee-high lip surrounding the shaft was what he had walked into in the darkness. Damn, a raven breathed. He might have managed a quick spell of flying while falling in the darkness, or he might not have. Blue light crackled behind him, and a raven turned to guide Starbrow away from the doorway. The moon elf had Karevian out, and looked around, anxious for any sign of a foe. Are they here? he hissed. I don't know. Now step aside, the rest are coming, a raven said. One by one, Ilsevile, Maressa, and Philselene arrived in the same manner, simply appearing in the air next to the blank stone archway marking that end of the portal. A raven carefully studied the chamber of the well. It was another heavy stone room, built in the form of two intersecting barrel vaults made of large stone blocks. At the end of three vaults stood empty stone slabs, perhaps meant to hold sarcophagi, but no such crypts were in evidence. The stairs climbed up at the end of the room's fourth arm. The vault opened out in the center, providing a little space around the well. The portal was set in one curving wall ringing the well, with another old portal opposite. He couldn't begin to guess what the place might once have been. Another portal, Ilsevile observed. Let's check the stairs and see what's above before we try the next portal. A raven said, or for that matter, the well shaft. It might lead somewhere too. Maressa leaned over to look into the dark well. A cold breeze faintly sighed up from below, musty and damp. There's some light down there, she said in surprise. A raven frowned. He didn't remember seeing any such thing before. He leaned over to look, and he saw it too, a faint silver phosphorescence that danced far below them. It glimmered and swirled for a moment, then it started to rise, climbing swiftly toward them. For a moment, he continued to peer at it, trying to figure out what he was looking at, but then he decided that anything in such a place that was moving toward him, and moving fast, was not likely to be friendly. He recoiled from the well, and called out a warning to his comrades. Watch out! It's coming up! 
Marissa retreated from the edge too, just before a swirling stream of spectral silver light exploded up out of the well. In the baleful glow, a raven could see the misshapen form of a person, a human face with an oddly dark and downcast gaze, the suggestion of regal robes hanging in tatters, and a shining silver staff clutched in ghostly fingers. It's the wizard, Phil Salinay gasped, the one from the mountainside. The apparition hovered in the air above the well, its features cruel and proud. It fixed its empty gaze on Maressa and snarled out something in a tongue a raven did not recognize. Hi, Zergol, Memmet, Erythalkol, na, it said, its voice imperious and demanding. Memmet, na, Erexalnos, Nehag. A raven, what's it saying? Starbro asked in a low voice. He kept his sword raised before him in a guard position. I can't even begin to guess, a raven replied. The elves exchanged looks with each other. I have heard stories of travelers dying in portal networks, which their ghosts then haunt. Let's just leave it alone and try the stairs. Move away slowly. Marissa carefully backed away, feeling her way along the wall toward the stairs leading up out of the vault. Phil Salinay followed close behind her, but before the two had moved more than ten feet toward the door, the ghostly wizard muttered something else in its incomprehensible tongue and attacked. It flung out one spectral arm, blasting at Maressa with a sickly purple-white bolt of crackling lightning. The genocide cried out and dived away from the bolt, which gouged a fist-deep scar across the stone wall behind her. Smaller side bolts stabbed out at Philsalene and a raven. A raven managed to parry the lightning bolt before it struck him, grounding it with his staff and a quick defensive spell. But Philsalene was spun around and knocked off her feet. That was a stupid idea, Maressa shouted. The genocide scrambled to her feet and snapped off a quick shot from her crossbow, which passed clean through the center of the ghost's chest without leaving the faintest mark, though it made Starbrow curse and duck on the other side of the well. Elsevelet whispered a spell as she put an arrow on the string of her bow. The arrow had burst into cold silver flame as she loosed it. The missile tore a dark hole in the ghost's torso. The ghost howled in its forgotten tongue, but it did not recoil or crumple as a living person might have done. It simply ignored the wound, even as streamers of mist blossomed from the ragged hole and faded into nothingness. The ghost seemed to gather itself for a moment, glaring at El Sevele, and its eyes flashed with a pale and terrible light. El Sevele screamed and raised her arm to shield her face, but her hands and arms turned dead white and smoked under the ghost's awful gaze. Her bow clattered to the floor. El Sevele! a raven shouted as he wheeled on the ghost. He hurled the spell of his own, riddling the spectral figure with a barrage of glowing blue darts. Like El Sevele's arrow, the magic punched black holes in the silver image. More missiles followed an instant later, repeating the attack as a raven threw his best effort at the specter. But the ghost, though hurt, kept its baleful eyes fixed on El Sevele, searing her with its chill gaze. I can't reach it, Starbrow snarled. Carivian glowed in his hand, a shining blade of holy fire, but the ghost hovered over the center of the well, outside any conceivable sword reach. The moon elf reversed the enchanted sword in his hand, cocking his arm as if to throw the blade, but he hesitated. Ilsevele wailed again, writhing under the ghost's cold burning stare, and Starbrow muttered a curse and straightened up. With calm deliberation, he walked over and interposed himself between the ghost and Ilsevele, turning his back on the apparition and shielding his face. The pale glow surrounding Ilsevele faded at once, only to spring into existence on Starbrow's back. He groaned, but keeping his back to the monster, he seemed to avoid the worst of it. A raven! Somebody! Kill this damn thing! he gasped. Maressa! a raven cried. Use your wand! Then he seized one of the wands at his own belt and snatched it out, blasting the ghost with dart after dart of glowing energy. Maressa dropped her useless crossbow and did the same, pelting the ghost from the other side. 
The ghost howled again and wrenched its gaze away from Starbrow and Ilsevile. The moon elf crumpled to his knees, collapsing on top of her. Then the specter intoned another spell and blasted a raven into senselessness with a mighty word of power. A raven staggered back and tumbled to the hard stone floor, eyes seared white, ears ringing, blood streaming from his nose. He could see nothing, hear nothing, could scarcely even move as his thoughts reeled drunkenly. His vision cleared a little, and he looked up through unfocused eyes as Philsalene picked herself up off the floor. She steadied herself with one hand on the wall and presented the star-shaped holy symbol of Corellan Lorethian, shouting out a prayer that a raven couldn't hear through the ringing in his ears. A great ring of golden light burst from her raised hand, racing through the chamber. When it touched the ghost, the apparition's substance simply boiled away into nothing. The same golden glow washed over a raven and the others, bringing vigor, strength, and renewal. Buoyed by the cleric's spell of healing, a raven climbed to his feet as his eyes focused again and his ears stopped ringing. He groped for the magic wand he had dropped, closed his fingers around it, and hammered the ghost again with more of the magical darts. The spirit's whole form flickered and danced uncertainly, as if it was having trouble keeping itself together. Keep after it, a raven cried. We can destroy this thing. The ghost drifted down toward the floor of the chamber, reaching out with one spectral claw for Philsalene. The cleric quickly recoiled, backing up as the apparition drew closer. Shield me, Corellan, she cried, and she spoke a prayer guarding herself with a shining golden radiance that the ghost could not seem to reach past. She whirled her longsword in front of her, but the weapon simply passed harmlessly through the ghost. A raven tried another spell, a bolt of fire, but the ghost's otherworldly body simply wasn't affected. Think, he told himself, what other spells do I have that might destroy a ghost? Before he could determine the next attack to try, Starbrow scrambled to his feet and charged at the ghost's back, Karevian in his hands. The ancient sword burst into brilliant white flame as he slashed at the specter. Unlike Philsalene's sword or Maressa's crossbow bolts, Karevian proved quite capable of damaging the spirit. One slash dragged Karevian through its torso from shoulder to hip, and Starbrow's spinning follow-up drove the point of Demron's last and greatest blade through the center of the ghost's forehead. The ghost groaned horribly, a sound that chilled a raven to the bone, and it slowly dissolved into nothingness. Starbrow held his sword ready in case it reformed, but the phosphorescent mist simply dimmed and vanished. Thank the Seldarine that's over, the moon elf breathed. He looked around. Is everybody all right? Thanks to Philselene's spell, I am unhurt, a raven replied. He hurried over and knelt by Elsevile, who still crouched by the floor, broad swaths of her flesh dead white and ice cold to the touch. Elsevile is injured! S so cold, Elsevile gasped. She locked one of her hands around a raven's forearm, pulling herself close. A raven hissed with the cold of her touch. Then Philsalene hurried over and knelt beside them. The cleric spoke the words of a healing prayer and set her own hand over Ilsevile's injuries. Beneath the warm golden glow of her touch, the pallor of Ilsevile's wounds faded, and her shivering stopped. Ilsevile shook herself and stood up slowly. Thank you, Philsalene, she said. She rubbed her arms vigorously, and the color returned to her face. She retrieved her bow and looked over at Starbrow. And thank you, too, Starbrow. You risked your life to shield me from the ghost. I don't know what to say. Starbrow said with an awkward smile, It just seemed like the best thing I could do, since I couldn't reach the ghost as long as it hovered up there. I couldn't stand there and do nothing. Ilsevile stepped over and reached up to kiss him on the cheek. Thank you again. A raven couldn't help but smile at the sheepish look that came over Starbrow's face. Well, come on then, the wizard said. Let's see where we are and where the daemon fay went from here. 
Colonel Thorndim stalked something terrible through the forest gloom a few miles from the old standing stone. He didn't know for certain what it was, but it had killed two of his fellow riders of Mistledale in their simple camp a few hours before, and they had died badly indeed, bodies marked by odd punctures surrounded by swollen, blue-black flesh, limbs broken and twisted, and awful bites gouged out of faces and skulls. He knew all the dangerous animals and most of the deadly monsters that haunted the depths of old Cormanthor, but he had never in his thirty-five years seen anything in the woodland they killed in that manner. Colonel was a burly man with thick black hair on his forearms and a heavy black beard. Despite his size, he glided through the underbrush without sound, his dark eyes flickering from sign to sign as he followed the trail of something that stood as tall as an ogre and had long, narrow feet with small claws at the toe. He was not entirely sure he wanted to catch up to it, if he was to be honest with himself. He came to a small stream trickling through the woods, and looked and listened for a long time before breaking out of the ground cover. Colonel had learned his woodcraft from some of the best, the moon and wood elves of Elven Tree, a hundred miles to the north. Nothing but the burbling of the stream greeted his ears. Colonel drew a deep breath, and slipped out of the bushes to the stream bank, looking for a print that might show whether his quarry had continued on or turned aside there. It only took a moment for him to find the end of the track. The creature's footprints simply ended on the wet sand, as if it had taken to the air or just vanished outright. That's impossible, he muttered, brow furrowed in confusion. What in the nine hells vanishes into thin air? He grimaced. The nine hells, indeed. The pieces fit together all too well. Something wicked, something strong, something that disappeared without a trace. Myth Dranner was not far off, and he'd heard plenty of stories about the horrible devils that haunted the ruins. But they were supposed to be trapped within the old elven mythal, weren't they? Some idiot set one of those things loose, he decided. Some cruel new plot on the part of the drow who lived in the shadows of the forest? Or a stupid blunder by some glory-hunting adventurers in Myth Dranner? Who would set such a creature free? For that matter, why assume that only one was loose in the forest? Colonel looked around at the silent woods and shuddered. He was sure that he had not seen the last of the monster he'd just tracked to the empty stream bed, and he didn't look forward to finally meeting it. He didn't look forward to that at all. The structure above the chamber in which they fought the ghost turned out to be a mausoleum of some kind, buried deep in a forest unfamiliar to a raven. Starbrow believed it might be one of the woodlands near the old Myth Dranor, possibly the old realm of Semberholm in western Cormanthor. A raven had never visited the eastern forest but the fact that it was near dusk when they emerged gave him reason to believe that the portal had carried them a fair distance to the east of the mountaintop stronghold. Why would the folk of Mythglorok or Semberholm have built that mountain stronghold we first explored? Ilsevile asked a raven. Are you certain the portal builders were elves? He nodded. All the portals we've seen so far have shown the same workmanship and design. I suppose it's possible that someone carved newer portals and attempted to match the workmanship of the older ones, but the spells that bind the portals together all seem to be about the same age, too. I favor the simpler explanation that the whole network was constructed at one time, most likely by mages of Mythglorok, who wanted to join their city to several distant destinations. Starbrow studied the forests, rubbed at his jaw, and said, You know... It might have been mages of Mythadranor who built this portal network. They were masters of such magic, and created portals to many distant places. Mythglorok might have been a destination, not an origin. Eventually they all decided that it didn't matter very much, since Phil Salinay's divinations revealed that the Daemon Fae had not emerged from the portal network there. Instead, their adversaries had fled through the second of the two portals in the chamber below. They rested for the night in the forest above the mausoleum, and returned to the vaulted chamber beneath the empty tomb. A raven cast his spells of portal-sensing again, and studied the doorway they had passed by before, 
As he suspected, it was another keyed portal, requiring nothing more than a simple phrase in Elvish. However, the magic guarding it was intermittent. Once opened, the portal would not work again for hours. All right, I am opening the portal, he told the others. The portal will remain open for a short time, just a few moments likely, and it won't open again for hours. You must follow me quickly. He spoke the passphrase and watched the old lichen-covered lintel glow brightly. He reached out and tapped the blank stone of the door and felt the familiar dizzying sense of moving without moving. All went dark for an instant, and a raven found himself looking on a small forest glade. One side of the glade ended in a stone wall in which the portal's archway stood. The morning was young there as well, the sky pale gray and streaked with high, rose-colored clouds. Neither east nor west this time, a raven observed. He stepped away from the doorway and studied the dark forest looming around him. The broken fingers of slender stone towers arose a short distance away, glimmering softly in the coming dawn over the treetops. Behind him, Starbrow emerged from the portal, followed by the others in short order. The moon elf warrior halted in surprise, a look of consternation on his face. I know this place, he said. We're near the burial glen, only half a mile or so from Mithdranor. Mithdranor? Are you certain? Ilsevile said. She quickly drew an arrow and laid it across her bow, scanning the vicinity for any enemies. Trust me, Starbrow said. I know this place. Aren't the ruins supposed to be overrun by devils and dragons, monsters and ghosts of the worst kind? Marissa asked, obviously uneasy. So it is said, Ilsevile replied. Myth Dranner. Of course. A raven said. Where else would the daemon fay go? Salithil de Lardrigeth and the rest of his accursed house had arisen in the ancient realm of Arcarar, which had become Myth Dranor. He'd already seen that Sarya knew how to use mythals to anchor demons to Faerun and compel their service. And there was a mythal here, one even more powerful than the mythal that had stood over Mythglorok. And mythals often served to absolutely block scrying which would explain why no one had been able to divine the whereabouts of Sarya's defeated army. Be careful, he told the others. I think there is a very good chance we have found Sarya's hiding place. So what now? Ilsevile asked. Make certain that they're here, or return and report what we found so far. Press on, a raven said at once. If nothing else, I need to get a look at the mythal spells and see if Sarya is manipulating this mythal as she did the other one. The mythal stone is in the heart of Castle Cormanthor, Starbrow said. I can't imagine how we can reach it, if the whole fairy army is here. A raven looked at Starbrow. You know Myth Dranor well. Mythal stones are usually hidden with care. I've spent some time here, Starbrow shrugged and looked away, searching the trees for danger. Caribbean's hilt in his hand. I don't need to see the stone itself, at least not right this moment. I just need to be within the bounds of the mythal's influence. That's easier then, the moon elf said. We need only walk a couple of hundred yards in that direction. He pointed toward where the old spires could still be seen over the trees. And we'll be within the mythal. We might be walking into the middle of Sarya's legion, Maressa said. Anything could be in there. Hells, even if she isn't here, I've heard enough stories about Myth Dranor to think twice about setting foot in that place. I'll conceal us, at least for a short time, a raven promised. He drew out a tiny pinch of spirit gum from his bandolier of spell components and plucked out one of his eyelashes, wincing. Pressing the lash into the gum, he carefully spoke the words of a spell. The forest around them seemed to grow dimmer, more distant. A raven, what did you do? Vilsalene asked. A spell of invisibility. It covers all of us, but you must remain close to me. If we run into enemies, do not strike unless you're sure it can't be helped, because you'll break the spell if you do. He looked over to Starbrow. Lead the way, since you know where you're going. Starbrow nodded grimly and took the lead. 
they followed an old winding path that led from the portal glen toward the city, taking pains to move quietly and avoid talking. Many things could pierce a spell of invisibility, but if they were quiet and careful, they might be able to avoid trouble of that sort. They reached the outskirts of the city and took cover behind a low stone wall. A raven sensed the moment they entered the mythal. His skin tingled with the power of the ancient magic. Let's stop here. I have a couple of spells to cast, now that we're inside the mythal. Keep watch for me. Il Sevele crouched beside him, an arrow on the string of her bow. Starbrow stood behind a tall pile of stones, sword in hand, watching the ruins with his face set in an unreadable expression. Marissa and Thilselene guarded the other side. Satisfied that they were ready, a raven first cast one of his divinations. Myth Dranner's magical aura made scrying impossible, but he hoped that a different sort of divination might work. He spoke the words of the spell that conjured up unseen drifting eyes, hovering above his head like a halo. Spread out and search for the daemon fay, he instructed them. Return when you sight any. The intangible sensors whirred away out of sight, each dodging and darting its way into the ruins and the forests around him. He waited patiently for several minutes as his spell creations went about their searches. Then they began to return one by one. A raven caught each in his hand as it came back, closing his eyes to see played out in his mind's eye the thing the magical eyes had seen. He glimpsed buildings with broken windows, fallen-in roofs, and piles of masonry inside, streets overgrown with vines and wild trees, proud old manors and schools still surprisingly intact, though their windows were dark and empty. And he also found the Damon Fay, Glimpses of fairy companies bivouacked in whichever buildings were best preserved. The demon spawn were hard at work in repairing their weapons and armor, forging new weapons, drilling with spell and blade, or simply patrolling the ruins, fluttering from building to building like oversized bats. Well? Marissa asked. Yes, they're here, a raven said. This is the fairy army, I'm certain of it. We have to leave then. Starbrow said. I have to get word of this back to Gareth and Several. A raven nodded. In a moment, he said. There is one more thing I want to see here. The others shifted nervously, watching the ruins for any sign of approaching enemies, but a raven moved his hands in arcane passes and murmured the words of another spell, the spell of mythal sight that Salithil had taught him. He closed his eyes, and when he opened them he perceived Mithdranner's ancient and mighty mythal as a golden vault filling the sky, a huge dome of drifting magic threads that slowly orbited the whole city. The beauty and power of the thing astonished him. A raven trained his vision closer in, studying carefully to see what the mythal's effects were. He glimpsed protections against scrying. Well, he knew about those already, didn't he? and wards to suppress spells of compulsion and domination. There seemed to be no modifications to the drifting strands of magic. Sarya hasn't figured out how to manipulate this mythal yet, he decided. Maybe it takes her a while to determine how to attune herself. He allowed himself a confident smile, and spoke the words of a spell that would allow him to gain access to the mythal so that he could raise defenses against Sarya. But even as he spoke the last syllable and reached out to grasp at the magical strands he saw around him, he realized that he had made a mistake. From the drifting golden strand hovering in arm's reach, a shimmering red-gold thread suddenly emerged, appearing from nowhere. A raven yelped and stumbled back, but not before the new strand hummed angrily. A scarlet veil descended over him, dancing across his body in a thousand motes of painful pinpricks, jabbing and sharp. With each pinprick, a spell vanished from his mind, draining away at a horrendous rate. A raven! Ilsevile cried. She sprang to her feet and backed away as he jerked and flailed in his crimson cocoon of light motes. The great golden dome of Mithdranner's mythal wavered and faded from a raven's view. He desperately tried to speak a counterspell, but before he had even said the third word of the enchantment, the spell was sucked out of his mind in mid-casting. He tried to quickly think of another, 
but then there was no more time. Every spell he held prepared in his mind was gone, drained away. I am powerless, he realized. Sarya set a trap for me. A raven, what's wrong? What has happened? Ilsevile asked. Are you hurt? Not physically, he managed. He steadied himself against the wall. But I've been drained of magic. I have no spells. We have to flee before the Daemon Fay come for me. Starbrow drew back from his post and glanced at a raven. Can you walk? he asked. I don't know, a raven answered. He hugged himself, feeling a strange ache in the center of his body, as if something had been torn out of him. He wasn't sure exactly how he'd been injured, but he prayed to Corellan that it wasn't permanent. He couldn't imagine being powerless for the rest of his days. He forced himself to look up at Starbrow and say, Yes, I can walk, but I think we ought to run. Chapter 6 21 Mirror Tool The Year of Lightning Storms Lord Several Miratar, your highness, the major domo announced, ringing her ceremonial staff once on the stone floor. Severo inclined his head to acknowledge the courtesy, and strode into the dome of stars amid the golden glow of the fading daylight. The dark marble of the floor caught the pale rose sky and mirrored its serried colors, so that the council table drifted in the darkness between gold-glowing floor and brilliant sky, a white ship adrift in the shadows between the two. Severo almost hesitated to set foot on the floor before him, as if he might disturb the sky's reflection with a careless step, but he continued without a pause and approached the high table where he had sat in council for so many years. Amlarul greeted him with a cool smile. The queen wore a silver gown, and her face shone like moonlight in the shadows. Welcome, Lord Miratar, she said. We did not expect you this evening. What brings you before us? I am afraid something has come up, my queen, Several replied. He halted two paces before the outswept arms of the council and bowed to Amlarul. I must conclude my business here in Evermeet and return to Faerun immediately. Amlerul met his eyes, and her brow creased. What news from Faerun, my friend? she asked. I have received a sending from Lord Vesilde Gerth, your highness. He tells me that a hidden portal network has been found under Mythglorok, portals through which Sawyer de Lagdrageth's army may have made their escape. Portals? said Carith Blackhelm. The stern-faced marshal frowned. Why, the Daemon Fay might be anywhere by now. The portals are being searched even as we speak. Rest assured, I will not give up until we have destroyed the Daemon Fay root and branch, said Several. The Daemon Fay have been defeated, have they not? Amasil Velden asked. How much longer will you persist in this interminable folly, Miratar? While you chase after ghosts and garrison gloomy old ruins, Evermeet itself remains vulnerable to attack. Clearly, Evermeet was vulnerable to attack before I called for my crusade, Several replied. My efforts in Faerun are your best defense, Lady Velden. Velden scowled and began to frame a response, but Amlerol interceded. The Delardrageths are the enemy of all the elf race, she said. I will pray to the Seldarine for your success. The queen did not glance at Amasil Velden, but the high-born sun elf frowned and subsided, leaning back in her seat. Instead, Amlerol studied Several. Have you given more thought to Lady Durothal's proposal, Lord Miratar? Several glanced up at the pale sky overhead. An empty chair stood at the foot of the left-hand side of the table, opposite the seat occupied by the High Admiral. It would be easy to take my place there, he thought. I would certainly wield power at least equal to the power I held as Lord of Elian, perhaps even more, since I would hold a high office indeed, with no one within three thousand miles to countermand my commands. I could do a great deal of good, if I chose to take that seat. But how long would that good last, he wondered. Evermeet might set a shining example for the young human lands of Faerun to follow, 
But ultimately, Evermeet is a refuge, a retreat. All the troubles that were foremost in his mind, the Daemon Fae, the Faerim, the assaults on Evermeet, even the fall of the realms of Ierlan and Cormanthor hundreds of years ago, seemed inextricably linked with the pattern of retreat and flight that had been established for a dozen elf generations. The empty seat at the table was inviting. It was familiar, comfortable, and it might undo everything he had accomplished so far. Lady Derothal's suggestion has great merit, he finally said. I wholeheartedly endorse the notion of appointing a minister or a marshal to sit on this council and speak for those of the people who remain in Faerun. But I respectfully decline to hold any such office, or to answer to anyone who does. I don't understand, Carrie Blackhelm growled. You tell us to raise up a counselor for the East, and you say you will pay no heed to him? What is the point? If I accepted the seat you offer, I would be honor-bound to answer to Evermeet's authority and conform my actions to the will of the throne and the council. I do not have confidence in this body's ability to take the actions I deem necessary in Faerun. Therefore, I must decline to be so bound. Isn't it arrogant of you to decide that you, in the solitude of your own heart, are better suited to make such decisions than anyone else? High Admiral Elsidar asked. Perhaps, but I have work that is not yet done in Faerun, Severo said. I will remain until I know that I have done all that I can, and I will not allow Evermeet's isolationists to tell me otherwise. Wander around in Faerun's dying forests as long as you like, Miratar, Amasil Velden hissed. But send home the sons and daughters of Evermeet you have inveigled with your promises of glory. Each elf who followed me into Faerun is free to return to Evermeet whenever he or she chooses, Several said, standing as straight as a fine blade. I compelled no one to follow me to Faerun, and I will not allow you to compel anyone to return, Velden. If I have to, I will found a realm of my own to prevent it. The council fell silent for a moment, astonished. Even Omlerul's eyes widened. The queen said, Severo, think of the people who follow you. You are not the only one who must accept the consequences of your crusade. By what authority? snapped Salshara Derothal. By what authority do you name yourself a king, Severo Miratar? Where is your realm? By what authority? Severo repeated. By the authority of each elf who chooses to follow me, Lady Derothal. I claim no crown. All who remain with me shall have a voice in choosing who we name as our lord and how we do so. He looked at each of the counselors and went on. As far as our realm, how many of our lands lie empty now? Who would argue with me if I raised a city in the high moor, where Mieratar once was, or the wild lands west of Tun, where the towers of Shantel Othreir stood, the border forest where once the sylvan realms of Ristolwood lay, or the elven court, or Cormanthor itself? He paused and said again, Why not Cormanthor itself? Severo looked up at the sky overhead, where the first stars were beginning to glimmer in the darkening sky. Corellan, guide me, he prayed silently. Hold me to the course you have set for me. Then he turned his back on the council, and strode from the Dome of Stars, leaving Evermeet behind him. The portal near the burial glen failed to work, as a raven knew it would. The spells that had powered the device for centuries were designed to allow intermittent functioning only. Once used, the portal could not work again for hours. He knew a spell or two that might suspend that particular property and allow the instantaneous use of the gate, but with all his spells drained, he did not have a chance of opening it. I am sorry, he told his companions. We can't escape through this portal. It will be hours before it opens again. 
Damn! Why build a magical door that's nothing more than a dead stone most of the time? Marissa snarled. Among other things, it makes a portal much harder to sneak an army through, a raven answered. We'll have to wait for it to activate again. We certainly can't wait here, Starbrow growled. The moon elf looked around the clearing, his hand on Karevian's hilt. Let's keep moving. There's a lot of forest to hide in, and maybe we can circle back in a few hours to try it again. Agreed. The farther we are from this place, the better, a raven said. If she were in Myth Draenor, Sarya would certainly have sensed his attempt to manipulate her mythal defenses and the pounce of her spell trap. He couldn't believe that she would not order her fairy to hunt him down, especially if she knew that her trap had drained away all his spells. Starbrow, you know this place. Take the lead. The moon elf nodded curtly and set off at once, leading the small party away from the portal clearing along a small footpath. Elsevele followed behind him, her bow in her hand, and a raven trotted behind her, his disruption wand clenched in one fist. He was fairly sure that the wand would still work for him. Wands didn't draw on any spells held in the mind. They simply contained spells of their own that any competent mage could make use of. It was a good weapon, and he had two more wands at his belt with equally destructive spells. But he normally held dozens of spells in his mind, many of which were significantly more powerful than any he could build into a wand. Without the power and versatility of his normal repertoire, he was in no position to invite a battle against Sarya's fairy or any of their infernal allies. How did she do it? A raven wondered. If she knew a spell to secure the mythal weave from another mage's examination or touch, why didn't she guard the mythal at Mythglorok in the same manner? He could only think of three possible answers. Sarya de Lardrigeth was simply careless at Mythglorok, which seems scarcely credible. There was something different about Mythdranner's mythal. Or Sarya de Lardrigeth had learned something new about Mythocraft in the relatively short time since he had bested her at Mythglorok. But she doesn't have the Night Star. Where could she have learned the necessary spells? Is there another Selukira she might have access to? Or did Sarya find a tutor? A raven's frown deepened, and he rubbed at the gemstone in his chest. This way, Starbrow said. He turned from the path striking off into the forests. He slid down a leaf-covered slope, muddy and wet with the spring, and splashed across a small stream at the bottom of the dell. But before they scrambled up the far side of the stream bank, a raven sensed a terrible, icy cold in the air, and a crawling wrongness that turned his stomach. He looked back up the short hillside they just descended. A pair of nightmarish monsters bounded down after them. They were a pale, bluish-white in color, the hue of dead flesh, and they were big, each easily the size of an ogre, with insectile features, clacking mandibles, and long, lashing tails studded with terrible barbs. They carried great spears of black iron frosted with supernatural cold. Behind us, he cried, ice devils! The devils hissed and clicked at each other, slowing and spreading apart as they realized their quarry had been brought to bay. A raven and his companions turned to face them. We have to kill them, Starbrow said. Don't let them teleport away, or they'll be back with more of their kind in a matter of moments. Right, said Elsevele. Her hands blurred and her bow sang its deadly song, thrumming deeply. A silver arrow struck the first devil just above its cold, faceted eye, splintering against its chitinous hide and a second arrow stuck in the tender joint between its armored torso and its bony arm. The two fiends halted, gathering their infernal power. A raven started to shout a warning, but even as he drew breath, the monsters let loose with a terrible, scathing blast of unearthly cold. The stream iced over at once, and tree and fern alike turned white and died under the deadly frost. A raven ducked down under his cloak, hoping its enchantments would help protect him. Cold so fierce that it felt like a white-hot poker seared his hands, his feet, and soaked through his cloak, wrenching away his breath and burning in his nose and mouth. He heard Elsevele cry out in pain. Then the cold eased, 
and he threw off his cloak, shaking off a mantle of deadly white hoarfrost as he stood again. The whole hillside was white and frozen from the ice devil's wintry blasts. The monsters stalked forward, iron spears smoking with cold. Before him, at the bottom of the dell, Thilsalene stood frozen. She had been in midstream when the devils attacked, and the ice on the creek held her immobilized at the knee. I'm stuck, she cried. A raven leveled his disruption wand at the nearest of the two devils and barked out the command word. A bolt of azure energy, shimmering and crackling, lanced out from the wand to knock the devil off its feet. The second devil approached Philsalene, who stooped down to smash the edge of her shield against the ice covering the creek, trying to free her feet from the ice. But then Maressa suddenly slipped out from behind a tree, leveled her crossbow, and shot the ice devil in the side of its thick neck. Blue-black gore spattered the frost-covered ground, and the monster whirled on her, moving with impossible speed for something so large and powerful. Maressa yelped and gave ground, ducking back into a young stand of alders and trying to keep as many of the slender white trees as possible between her and the devil. Is there a good way to kill these things? Maressa called. Holy weapons, Felsalene replied. You need a holy weapon to really hurt them. Anything else? the genocide demanded. The ice devil stalked closer and rammed the point of its black spear through the trees, missing Maressa by a hand's breadth. A raven blasted that devil with his wand, staggering it for a moment, then he risked a quick glance back at Osevele. He found her fumbling to pick up her bow again with frozen hands. Starbrow knelt by her, trying to help. I can't shoot, she said. The first devil regained its feet and charged at Philsalene, who finally managed to pull her feet free of the ice. She parried the first strike of its spear with her shield, twisted out of the way of the second. But then the monster's barbed tail came sweeping in fast and low, lashing her across her knees. Her feet flew out from under her, and Philsalene fell on her back in the icy stream, her sword clattering out of her grasp. The monster straddled her, one clawed foot on either side of her torso, and raised its great black spear in both hands. Then Starbrow came dashing down the slope, Karevian alight in his hands. The sword gleamed in one perfect arc that took off the ice devil's leg at the knee. The creature let out a high-pitched, whistling shriek and toppled into the creek, even as it slashed and gouged at Starbrow. The big moon elf followed the monster to the ground, blocking its claws and mandibles with lightning-swift parries. Then he set one foot on its chest and rammed Karevian's point through the monster's mandibles, pinning its head to the stream bed. Karevian's pure white fire flashed from the ice devil's eyes. The thing shuddered once and lay still. The second ice devil whirled at the cry of the first and abandoned Maressa to rush toward the others. But when Starbrow killed its companion, the ice devil halted, its eyes glittering with cold malice. It abruptly vanished, teleporting away. Damn, Starbrow said. It's gone for help. Quickly then, we must be away from here before it returns, a raven replied. He turned and helped Ilsevile to her feet, shivering at the icy touch of her flesh. Can you walk? he asked her. She winced with pain but nodded. Yes, let's go. They scrambled up the other side of the dell and ran at their best speed through the woods beyond, following Starbrow as he dashed ahead. He led them for several hundred yards through tall groves of magnificent trees that resembled nothing so much as the pillars of a great cathedral above a floor of green ferns into tangled thickets and past old ruined walls and roads, before they reached a small shrine or chapel half hidden by the hillside it was built against. In here, Starbrow said, I think we'll be safe. Are you sure this is a good idea? Ilsevile asked. Wouldn't it be better to stay out in the woods, where we can try to keep ahead of the pursuit? If they track us to this place, we'll be cornered. The fairy have wings, Starbrow answered. If they find us in the open, we won't be able to outrun them. Hiding is probably our best option. And if I remember right, 
The moon elf warrior moved into the ruined shrine and studied the floor carefully. Whatever you're doing, do it quickly. The fairy are coming, Marissa hissed. She flattened herself beside the door, watching the path along which they'd just come. There are at least a dozen of them back there. Starbrow swept aside a small bear patch, then knelt to flip up a flagstone and open a hidden catch. Behind the altar, a hidden door slid open. Into the passage, he said, and stood aside to motion a raven, Ilsevile, and Filsalene through. Marissa followed, hurrying across the chapel, and Starbrow stepped in and slid the door closed. The chamber beyond was absolutely lightless, but then Filsalene spoke the words of a minor prayer and summoned up a magical light. A raven looked around and saw that they were in a natural cave hidden within the hillside. A small pool of clear, still water lay in the center of the cave, and soft moss that glowed faintly blue-green covered the floor. What is this place? he asked. A secret refuge, hidden beneath the shrine of Sehanin Munbo. There are a few such places scattered around Myth Dranor and its outskirts, Starbrow said. Once they were also guarded by spells designed to keep them concealed, even against magic, but I don't know if those work any longer. The moss has healing properties if you are hurt. He set Karevian down on the ground and lowered himself to the moss, stretching out as if on a bed. How did you ever find this place? Ilsevile asked. She sank down onto the mossy floor nearby. Starbrow shrugged and looked over to a raven. How long before we can use that portal to return to Mythglorok? Several hours, I think, a raven replied. Of course, Sarya may be guarding it now. For that matter, we'll have to figure out a way to reach it without fighting our way through her entire legion. Can you prepare any spells that would help us reach the portal unseen? Thilselene asked. Not until I rest. Then I could ready the invisibility spell again, a raven said. He frowned and added, That is, assuming that I can commit spells to my mind at all. I think that Sarya's trap only depleted my mind of the spells I knew at the moment, but if she somehow drew out my ability to cast spells at all... Aolesso Soldari, Elsevle breathed. A raven, I didn't realize how the mythal had affected you. Well, we will cross that bridge when we come to it, as my human friends say. A raven looked over to Starbrow. If we were thinking of hiding here for several hours to allow the portal to recharge... We might as well remain here long enough for me to prepare spells, if I can. It will make things much easier if we have trouble getting back to the portal glade. They settled down to rest from their exertions, lying quietly in the moss-filled cave. Thilselene used her spells to heal the worst of their injuries, though her healing spells could do nothing for a raven's magic. Stilling his thoughts to silence, a raven stretched out and let himself drift into reverie, trying very hard not to dwell on what would happen if he found he could not wield magic. While he composed himself to rest, he listened to his companions conversing in low voices. When did you explore this place, Starbrow? Ilsevile asked the moon elf. A long time ago. It can't be that long ago. You're not more than a hundred and fifty or so, are you? That's about right, Starbrow said. That is certainly long by my standards. Marissa observed. Because you elves live so damn long, you have no idea of the value of time. Ilsevile smiled in the dim light. That might be true. But I note that Starbrow here hasn't answered my question. You said before that you were from Cormanthor, but where exactly? I thought the elves abandoned this place, Marissa said, surprised. For the most part, we did, Thilselene told her. Certainly no elves live near Myth Dranor any longer, but there are still a few small elven settlements in different places in this forest. Cormanthor stretches from the Thunder Peaks to the Dragon Reach and from Cormir to the Moon Sea. It's a big forest. How did you come to meet my father? Ilsevile asked. Until he embarked on this crusade against the Daemon Fae, I never knew him to have visited Cormanthor. Starbrow remained silent for a long time. You will have to ask your father about that, he finally said. It's not a question for me to answer. Now what does that mean? 
Elsevle asked, rather sharply. Ask your father, Starbrow said again. Then he fell silent, and said no more. A raven finally stirred fully from his reverie some hours later, and felt surprisingly refreshed. He ran his fingers over the blue moss of the cavern floor, and wondered what kind of healing magic the folk of Myth Dranor had imbued in it long ago. He found Starbrow sitting with his back to the wall, watching the secret door that led back out to the chapel. Ilsevile and Filsalene were deep in their own reveries, and Maressa was simply asleep, snoring softly. Lying still, he closed his eyes and touched the night star embedded in his chest, seeking the spells of the Selukira stored as ably as his own spellbooks. He chose a simple spell of minor telekinesis first, the sort of thing that almost any apprentice could master, and concentrated on it until its mystic symbology and invocations were pressed into his mind, like a melody he could not get out of his head. Then he sat up, moved his hands in the appropriate gestures, and muttered the words of a simple spell. To his great relief, he felt the magic, soft and familiar, streaming through his mind and his fingertips as he picked up a small stone and carefully moved it over to drop into Starbrow's lap. The moon elf looked up. You did that? A raven nodded. Yes. Sarya's defenses simply emptied my mind of readied spells. They didn't damage my ability to study and memorize more. That's a relief, then, the moon elf said. You don't know the half of it, a raven replied. He focused his attention on the Selukira again, and began furiously memorizing spell after spell, rebuilding his repertoire from nothing. He felt as if his mind were humming with arcane energy, a sensation that he had become so accustomed to in centuries of practicing magecraft that he could not begin to guess when he might have stopped noticing it. How long will you need to ready your spells? An hour, perhaps two, said a raven. Then we will see about getting out of here. Sarya de Lardrugeth stood by a ruined wall near the city's old burial glen and studied her handiwork with the mythalweave. The dark bronze strands of her crafting drilled past her outstretched fingers, winding in and among the invisible golden net that comprised the city's ancient magic field. Here, she said. He was here when the mythal's defenses struck him. Zolf waited nearby, towering over her. The Daemon Fey Prince stood well over eight feet tall, with four powerfully muscled arms and just the slightest canine cast to his features, both inherited from his demonic father. The Sun Elf Mage? he asked. The one who marred your weaving at Mythglorok? Yes, Sarya hissed. In her long life she had learned to hate many adversaries, to nurse smoldering anger and cold fury for years upon years. But rarely had she been dealt such a reverse as a raven Tesher had dealt her in the heart of her own citadel. The very notion that he had somehow followed her to her new lair and had attempted to evict her from yet another mythal was enough to fill her with a wrath so hot and bitter that even Zolf shied from meeting her eyes. A raven was here, she went on, and he attempted to take this mythal from me too. She allowed herself a cold smile. But my new defenses were more than he expected. I was ready for him this time. If I read the mythal right, he received a nasty little surprise when he started plucking at my threads. Do you think he knows we are here? Sarya's smile faded at once. It is almost a certainty, she admitted. I want him caught before he carries word of our presence back to his friend Sevril Miratar and the rest of Evermeet's knights and mages. Zolf glanced around the wooded glade. Our fairy and Beatazu have been scouring the area for hours, and the only sign they've turned up is a dead Galugan about half a mile from here. He has had ample opportunity to escape by now. My mythal trap drained him of most, if not all, of his magic, Sarya said. Without his spells, he must flee on foot or hide somewhere until his magic returns. In either case, we can still catch him. She looked up at Zolf and lightly leaped into the air, snapping her leathery wings until she hovered ten feet above him. 
Take charge of the pursuit, Zolf. Spare no effort to prevent the mage's escape. The daemon faced swordsman bowed his head and sprang into the air, arrowing off into the woods, calling for the fairy who attended him. Sarya wheeled and flew in the opposite direction, back to Castle Cormanthor. While she certainly hoped that a raven was lying powerless and vulnerable somewhere nearby, it was clearly foolish to simply hope that he would be caught before he carried word of her tampering and withdrawn to her enemies. She would have to presume that he had already escaped, and that Several Miratar and all who stood with him would soon learn of her new retreat. She needed to speak to Malkazid. Alighting on a high balcony, Sarya passed a pair of fairy who stood guard there. The proud Daemon Fey warriors knelt and spread their wings as she passed, grounding their long-headed spears in salute. She swept by them into the hallway beyond, and quickly made her way to the chamber of the Mythalstone. With the ease of long practice, Sarya whispered the words of a spell and woke the Mythal's magic to her hand. "'Malkazid!' she called out. "'Answer me! I would speak with you!' Her words reverberated in the dense magical fields dancing around the mithil stone. Then she felt Malkazid's presence in the conduit as the devil prince responded to her call. "'I am here, Sarya,' he said in his melodious voice. "'What is it you desire?' "'The mage, Raven Tesher, has visited us here,' she said. "'Ah! Did the spell trap I showed you snare him?' He triggered it, but he apparently made his escape on foot before my warriors could catch him. But it did empty him of spells, and he was completely unable to tamper with my mythal weaving here. Even though she could not see him, she felt Malkazit nodding in satisfaction on the other side of the conduit. Good, good. You see what we can do when we combine my knowledge of these things with your special heritage and talent for sorcery? Do not patronize me, Malkazid. She paced anxiously in front of the stone, her tail twitching from side to side. She had had little use for confined spaces since escaping from her prison beneath old Askelhorn three years ago, and even though the mythal chamber beneath the castle's great hall was large and spacious, she still did not care for it. If a raven has discovered me here, he will certainly carry word to Evermeet's army and anyone else who cares to listen. The Devil Prince fell silent a moment. "'You fear Evermeet's army will pursue you even here,' he said at last. "'Twice now I have been denied the realm that is mine to rule, once in ancient Saluvanid, and a second time at Myth Glorok. This city is the seat of my third realm, Malkazid, and here I will raise a mighty kingdom indeed. All I need is time.' Time to master more of your mythal spells. Time to build my armies again. You need not fear that possibility, Sarya, said the demon prince. With the right mythal spells, you could stand a siege of centuries within Mithdranner's ruins. Sarya stopped her pacing and turned to face the mythal stone through which Malkazid spoke, even though she knew that he was not physically present. I have spent ages uncounted buried in traps and prisons. I am not going to simply sit within these crumbling ruins and allow my enemies to contain me here forever. Then you must destroy Evermeet's army. Since you cannot reach them where they are now, perhaps matters will turn to your advantage if they place themselves within your reach here. Malkazid paused a moment, then asked, are you certain that Evermeet is your only foe? What of the jail ray or Oscovine drow, or the human lands near this city? Sawyer barked in bitter laughter. The drow have not seen fit to show themselves yet, and I doubt they will do so. Vezrin a Lorothi tells me that some demonic nemesis has all but harried them from the old elven court entirely. Vezrin Elorathi tells me that some demonic nemesis has all but harried them from the old elven court entirely. As for the humans, the humans have dreaded these woods for a thousand years or more. Why, the memories alone of old Cormanthir have been sufficient to keep them from expanding into the forest. A kingdom stands on four pillars, Sarya. Magic, steel, coin, 
and allies. You can do without one pillar, but your realm will not survive long if you lack two or more. Here you have magical power, and soon an army to be reckoned with, when we bring more of my infernal warriors to your banner, under the terms of our existing bargain, of course. What of the other two pillars? Commerce is for humans, Sarya growled. But allies, allies could be useful. Unfortunately, the nearest orcs or ogres of any number are in the lands of Thar, across the Moon Sea. I was speaking of the human powers that surround this forest, or even the drow, for that matter. Sawyer turned slowly to gaze into the aura of dancing gold light. I have no use for the drow, she said. She was inclined to discount the rest of Malkazid's suggestion, too, yet there was something in the archdevil's words, wasn't there? Even if she had no use for humans, she certainly did not want to see Evermeet's army ally with any of those powers against her. But the humans, Sembia or Zentel Keep, have no interest in seeing Evermeet's army in Cormanther, do they? Perhaps these enemies could be turned against each other. But what would you gain from such a development, I wonder? Your success is my success, Sarya de Lartregeth. You are the ally I have needed for five thousand years, the missing pillar in my kingdom. And I am the missing pillar in your new realm. Sarya felt the archdevil's keen hunger and ambition glinting through the mythal, almost as if she were gazing into his eyes. I have waited a long time for my freedom. You can help me gain it. Chapter 7 22 Myrtul, The Year of Lightning Storms Anticipating trouble, a raven and Philselene wove a number of spells, wards, and abjurations over their companions in the safety of the hidden cave. A raven warded them from blades and talons with a spell of stone skin, and finished by once again weaving the spell of invisibility over the small band. The spells will not last long, he said. We should head straight for the portal glade and avoid any delay. He nodded to Starbrow, and the tall moon elf set his shoulder to the hidden door leading out into Sehendin's shrine, gently opening it a handspan to peer outside. No one in sight, Starbrow said. Follow me, and stay close. One by one they slipped out of the refuge. Daylight had long since faded, and the night was overcast with only a hint of moonshine glowing behind the clouds. Starbrow lingered a moment to slide the door shut behind them and quickly scuff up the signs of their passage. No sense letting the Daemon Fay find it, he said in a low voice. They set off at a quick jog along the old forest roads, heading back toward the jagged spires of the city that rose above the trees. They hurried on through the night-black forest, until a raven sensed that they were quite close to the portal glade. He started to whisper a warning to Starbrow, but the moon elf slacked his pace and raised one hand in warning before a raven could speak. He looked back to a raven and whispered, Do I go on ahead, or do we all go together? Together. A raven whispered back. My invisibility spell won't work if we spread out too far. Starbrow nodded and moved carefully out into the clearing, his hand on Karevian's hilt. A raven followed him, peering into the dark shadows that gathered around the edges of the clearing. Nothing stirred in the small clearing. He felt Ilsevile a step behind, and Philselene and Maressa bringing up the rear. The portal! A raven said to his companions, and he hurried over to the blank stone face where the magical doorway opened. He checked it quickly, searching for signs of a sealing spell or trap, and found none. Just a moment, he told the others, and he fished out the tiny white blossoms needed to open the gate. A sinister voice hissed somewhere in the air above him, and a raven felt his invisibility spell suddenly shredded into useless scraps of fading magic. Ambush! he cried to his companions. I knew you would return to this door, pale blood, cried a harsh, booming voice from above the glade. You have troubled us for the last time. A raven whirled and looked up. Descending from some unseen perch high above, a band of armored fairy appeared in the night sky and dropped down toward his small company. 
At their head flew a terrible scion of darkness, a huge, powerfully built demon elf with four arms and a curving scimitar in each hand. His eyes burned like balls of green flame in the darkness. What in the black pits of the abyss is that? Maressa snarled. Her crossbow snapped, and a stubby quarrel glanced from the huge swordsman's breastplate. Ilsevile's bow sang beside a raven, and silver-white arrows killed in mid-air a fairy sorcerer about to cast a spell. The creature's wings crumpled and he plummeted headlong into the clearing. A stabbing bolt of lightning darted down from another spellcaster, but a raven expertly parried the spell with a quick spell shield, batting its baleful energy aside to detonate in the forest nearby. Then from another fairy, a small knot of absolute darkness streaked down into the center of the glade. In the space of two heartbeats, the black ball blossomed out into a wide cloud of roiling blackness, shot through with purple-white bolts of energy. Frigid, cloying darkness closed in around a raven, and jabbing lances of unclean fire seared him across his limbs and torso, as if icy filth had been shoved under his skin. He gasped and staggered. A raven! Get the gate open! Starbrow called. Carivian leaped from its sheath like a brand of white fire, burning away the foul blackness that had descended over the glade. He dashed forward and met the Daemon Fey swordmaster. With a roar of fury, the four-armed monster dropped down on top of Starbrow, his two lower blades flashing in a vicious crosscut, followed an instant later by a double downcut from his upper arms. Yet somehow Starbrow, with his one blade, parried both crosscuts with a single great shock, and quickly spun aside from the overhand attacks, finishing his turn with a whirling backhand slash that beat through the massive Daemon Fae's right-hand guard and slashed a deep cut across the back of the monster's calf. Carivian gave off a shrill, high ring as it tasted demon flesh. The huge swordsman roared again, then turned and sprang straight at Starbrow, unleashing a dizzying fusillade of slashes with his four blades. Then a raven wrenched his eyes away from the furious duel as more fairy attacked, scouring the clearing with gouts of green sorcerous fire and deadly curses and blights. Philselene stumbled and fell to her hands and knees, blinded by a fairy spell. Then Maressa swore a vile oath and scrambled back away from a boiling nest of magical, ruby-colored scorpions that erupted from the ground all around her, each the size of a human hand. Damn it! I hate scorpions! I hate them! she snarled. A raven spied a fairy warrior swooping down at the blinded Philselene. He snapped out the arcane words of a deadly spell and fired a bright emerald beam of magical power at the demon elf. The spell caught the fairy on her right side, and with a terrible green flash of light, she disintegrated into sparkling motes that rained down over the clearing. He searched for another foe, and found Ilsevile firing furiously at several fairy who swooped and dodged, trading magical blasts for her arrows. Already two black scorch marks smoked at her hip and left arm, but an arrow-feathered fairy lay crumpled in the clearing nearby. A raven calmly chanted the words of a spell that illuminated the whole clearing with lights of a dozen different colors. Yellow arcs of lightning incinerated one fairy, while another was turned instantly to stone and fell so close to Maressa that the genocide had to dive aside to keep from being crushed. She swore again and returned to her work of skewering scorpions on the point of her rapier. A raven turned to help Starbrow with his foe but a battery of fiery bolts from an invisible spellcaster he had missed rained down all around him. Flames seared his chest, his thigh, and his outflung arms, just missing his eyes. He staggered back, flailing at the smoldering fires. A raven! Is the door open yet? snarled Starbrow. His duel with the massive daemon Fae swordsman continued unabated. He'd been wounded at least twice with a long line of scarlet trickling down his fine elven mail. But he battled grimly on, somehow ducking and dodging and parrying blow after blow his opponent rained down on him. The hulking daemon Fay bared his fangs in pure frustration, hacking his heavy scimitars one after another at the moon-elf warrior. Philselene scrambled to her feet, 
quickly chanting a holy verse that wiped away the blindness curse that had felled her before. She looked for a foe and blanched. There are devils coming, a lot of them. Closer, a raven called back. Everybody, move closer. Then he waited for an awful moment, afraid to activate the portal if one or more of his companions could not reach the door in time, yet dreading any spell or attack that might make it possible for them to escape. Philselene was close by. She backed toward the door, sword point weaving in front of her. Ilsevile and Maressa fell back as well, Ilsevile still firing arrows at enemies who swooped and dodged in and among the trees. Starbrow tried to back away from his ferocious opponent, but the daemon Fay Lord roared in answer and followed him closely. A raven! The portal! Ilsevile cried. A moment, he said, watching Starbrow and his foe. The moon elf danced back three steps to the side as the swordsman launched a furious assault, and a raven saw his opportunity. He quickly chanted a spell, even as he felt enemy magic lashing against his spell shield, and raised up from the ground a great arching dome of white frost. In the blink of an eye, the frost thickened and spread, making an impenetrable barrier of pure white ice that shut their enemies out. We have only a moment, he told his companions. It won't take them long to dispel or destroy the ice. Follow me through the portal as quickly as you can. Then he turned and barked the words to an ancient elvish passphrase, waking the portal from blank gray stone to a glowing silver door in the side of the hill. Without another word, he leaped through, trusting to his own example to encourage his comrades to hurry after him. He stumbled into the barrel-vaulted mausoleum chamber, his ears ringing from the sounds of the battle he had just left behind. Automatically, he moved away from the portal, making sure that he was not in the way for the next to follow. The portal flashed silver, and Ilsevile and Philselene tumbled through together, followed by Maressa, and finally Starbrow. The moon elf picked up Philselene by one arm, and waved Karivian toward the far end of the room. Stand back, he cried. The ice wall gave out, and they are on our heels. Not if I can do something about it, a raven muttered. The portal was intermittent and unreliable, but there was always the chance that the daemon fay might get lucky and succeed in activating the portal again. Fortunately, he knew a spell to shut down a portal, at least for a time. He retrieved a pinch of spider silk and mortar dust from his bandolier of spell reagents and quickly spoke the words of a sealing spell. It might have been because he hurried the spell, or simply because the magic of the portal was so old, but whatever the cause, a raven shattered the ancient spell of the portal. The blank stone face of the doorway cracked like a thick pane of glass struck by a hammer, creating a jagged spiderweb of fractures. He staggered back, hands and arms burning with the shock of the broken spell, and bit his tongue hard enough to draw blood. Damn! he gasped. That said Starbrow, seems to be a very well-sealed door. I don't think they'll follow us through that. I ruined it, a raven groaned. The portal's gone. Right now, I don't count that as a loss, Philselene said. They're on that side, and we're on this side. I don't know if we could have held them off for much longer. You don't understand, a raven said. I stopped them from following us, yes. But when we want to use this doorway again, we won't be able to. He sighed, furious with his own clumsiness. All questions of practicality aside, he hated to be the mage responsible for wrecking a work of magic that might have been a thousand years old. It made him feel like a vandal. I don't know if that is a loss worth regretting, a raven, Ilsevile said. She stood up and gingerly looked down at the scorch marks on her armor. After that fight, the Daemon Fay are certain to guard that portal exit heavily. We probably couldn't have used it again even if we wanted to. So, what now? Maressa asked. Back to the mountain fortress and Myth Glorok, Starbrow said at once. We have to tell Several and the others where the Daemon Fay are hiding. Agreed, a raven said. And Sarya has found herself another mythal to twist to her own purposes. We have to stop her before she gathers a new army here. Ilsevile looked over at Starbrow and offered him a small smile. For what it's worth, Starbrow, that was some of the finest swordplay I've ever seen. 
I can't believe you're still in one piece after standing in front of that four-armed monster. The moon elf winced, looking down at the slashes he hadn't turned aside. It's not the first time I've fought such as him, he remarked. Now, let's get going before they think to gather some teleporting demons and come here looking for us. The citadel of the Raven stood on a high, windswept hilltop many miles to the north of Zentel Keep itself. Legend had it that the forbidding walls and deep delved halls beneath the ground had been made by giants, and Skylua had never managed to think of a better explanation for stairs better than two feet tall and doorways sixteen feet in height. She climbed through the glowering black ramparts, taking the wooden risers that had been fitted between the fortress's cyclopean stairs. It was bitterly cold, despite the weak spring sunshine. The citadel was dozens of miles north of even the northern shores of Moonsea, and the high elevation and lack of cover seemed to invite cold, shrieking winds from the vast wilderness beyond. She paid little attention to her own discomfort. She rarely did, after all. Her mind was fixed on other things, and she had long ago discovered that clarity and determination could overcome any bodily weaknesses such as fatigue or hunger or pain. Purpose was all one needed, and that was something that Skyula Darkhope had in abundance. She reached the gates to the stone court, the inmost bailey of the great keep, and swept past a dozen mailed guards who wore the black and yellow surcoats of Zentel Keep, not even noticing their nervous salutes. Within the high court stood several large, strong towers, armories and barracks and banquet rooms fit for a royal seat, but Skyla walked past these to a squat round bulwark at the far end of the keep. This sturdy tower housed the Temple of the Black Lord, the citadel shrine to Bane, the fearsome patron of the Zentrum, and Skylua's absolute lord and master. Temple guards in black and green stared straight ahead as she climbed the steps, refusing to acknowledge her presence, as was only right and proper. As warriors of Bane entrusted with their sacred post, they bowed to no one. Skyla passed into the fane beyond, where a towering idol of black stone carved in the shape of a mighty armored lord stood. Without hesitation, she threw herself down on the cold stone floor and abased herself. Great lord, she murmured, favor your worthy servant and destroy any who displease you. At your word the heavens tremble and the earth groans. I am a sword in your hand. Let me be the instrument with which you smite your enemies. You stand high in the Black Lord's favor, Skylua, came a voice from above her. Some mouth the words of that prayer and secretly hope that our dread master never takes them up on the offer. You, however, possess true zeal. The Black Lord has plans to do just as you ask. I am sure of it. Now, what brings you to the Citadel of the Raven? The last I heard, you were busy fortifying the Vale of the Tesh. Her prayer finished, Skyloa easily climbed to her feet despite the heavy armor she wore and turned to face the speaker. He was a tall, powerfully built man, with thick arms and a broad, square jaw. A mane of deep red hair framed a pale face dominated by a long, drooping mustache. I crave an audience with the anointed hand of the Black Lord, Lord Fazul, she said, bowing deeply. Fazul Chembril smiled coldly, an expression that failed to warm the measuring malice in his hooded eyes. Such formality is hardly necessary between us, Skylua. You are no mere novice or underpriest after all. We are all novices before the great Lord Bane, Lord Fazul. Yes, of course. But you must take care, Skylua, to avoid the sin of humility. The great lord demands abasement in the face of one's betters, true, but he also requires us to govern absolutely those who stand below us in the grand hierarchy Bane has prescribed for mankind. To suggest that any novice or initiate is your equal in the eyes of the mighty king of all is to deny Bane's will. Fazul inclined his head to the idol that towered over the shrine and descended to the chapel floor. Yes, Lord Fazul, I submit myself for correction. 
I deem no more necessary, this time. Now, I doubt that you came here to seek my instruction on minor matters of the Black Lord's tenants. I am going to take some air on the walls. Consider your audience granted, and join me on my walk. Fazul strode out of the temple into the citadel's courtyard, pausing in the doorway to hold his arms outright while a pair of attendants quickly draped a heavy mantle over his garments to keep him warm. He paid them no mind, nor did Skylua. There is something very odd going on in Mithdranor, she began. There is always something odd going on in that dreadful elven wreck. It's the nature of the place. Fazul climbed slowly up a nearby stairway to the top of the wall, ignoring the fiercely cold wind. In the distance, long, knife-like peaks still held flanks full of snow. The high priest of Bane paused to survey the view. I would not report a routine occurrence to you, Skylua said. A few days ago, the wizard Peristrom of the Black Network came to me in Eulosh. He told me that the ruins of the city are now occupied by an army of demon-spawned sun-elves. He guessed that better than a thousand of these creatures occupy the ruins, and he also said that a great number were competent sorcerers as well as swordsmen. Demon-spawned sun-elves? Fazul asked. He pulled his gaze from the distant peaks. I rode to Mithdranor to see for myself, leading a small company of trusted soldiers. Skyla possessed an unusual steed, a nightmare of ghostly white. The demon horse could gallop through other plains at need, and gave her the ability to ride fast and far by strange roads indeed. Peristrom's observations were accurate. There is an army of these fellows gathering in Mithdranor. I took the liberty of instructing the clerics and mages in my command to scry and divine what they could of this, and they gave me a name. The Daemon Fay. Now isn't that interesting, Fazul said. He pulled on one side of his mustache, thinking. You may not have heard yet, but I have just learned that the elves fought some kind of fierce campaign in the Delimbier Vale over the last couple of months. Soldiers of Silvery Moon were sent into the High Forest to confront orcs led by demonic sorcerers and an army of demons appeared near the ruins of Hellgate Keep and marched south into the trackless mountains, where the elven city of Everaska is reputed to lie. A great battle was fought on the lonely moor only a few ten days ago. Skylua nodded. The Delimbier Vale was more than five hundred miles distant, but Zentrum's spies and merchants were firmly established in the towns of Lork and Loudwater, which were not too far away and Zent agents had a way of gathering rumors from the savage races of the north, the orcs and goblins and such. If elf armies were marching around in the wilds of the Grey Peaks, the orcs would have noticed. Were these Daemon Fay involved with that, my lord? Our sources passed on stories of demon elves and such, but I had frankly discounted them. But now— Hearing of demon-spawned elves twice in the course of only a few days, I am much less inclined to treat this as groundless rumor. Fazul resumed his pacing, his hands clasped before his chest. So you say they are in Mithdranor? What is the significance of an army in Mithdranor? It menaces any of the northern or central dales, Skylua replied. It serves as a check on any designs that Sembia or Hillsfar might have in the region, and it certainly might constitute a threat to our own holdings on the south shore of the Moon Sea. They are enemies of the elves. That suggests they are no friends of the Dales folk. There is something more. Peristrom also claimed that these Daemon Fay have the allegiance of the devils of Mithdranor. Fazul frowned deeply and continued his walk along the ramparts, passing guards posted along the imposing walls. No enemy was likely to approach the citadel unseen, so the sentries were little more than ornamentation. But Skyluar approved. Discipline and regimentation were the foundations of an army's strength, and soldiers inured to onerous duties in times of peace would not balk at them in times of war. How many devils are there in Mithdranor? he wondered aloud. One hundred? 
Two hundred? There could be many more than that, if they have been keeping their true strength a secret. And Beatas who are certainly clever and patient enough to conceal their numbers if it suits their purposes. The Lord of Zentel Keep halted suddenly, looking sharply at his high captain. I had not considered that possibility. He glanced off toward the south, as if he might catch a glimpse of the distant elven towers, forest-mantled. Could this herald the beginning of a fiendish invasion of the Dales? Infernal hordes have brought down more than one kingdom in Faerun. Mithdranor itself was destroyed by such an invasion six hundred years ago, Skylur observed. At least powerful fiends contained that army. If they entered in Cormanthor once, it could happen again. Fazul grinned fiercely and struck one gauntleted fist into the other. North of Mithdranor lies Hillsfar. South, east, and west lies sparsely settled dales. Any way a fiendish army in Mithdranor turns, one of our enemies stands in the way. If we stood by and did nothing, we could hardly help but to profit from our enemies' discomfort. How much more could we gain if we actively sought to turn events to our advantage? You have a plan, my lord? Skyloa asked. I will soon, Fazul promised. I want you to march an army to Yulash, and be prepared to strike east toward Hillsfar or south toward the Dales, as events demand. In the meantime, I must seek Bane's will in this matter. Opportunities such as this do not come along every day, and I want to be certain of the mark I'm shooting at before I loose my bolt. A raven protected the portal in the mountain fortress with a powerful spell of sealing, just to make sure that the Daemon Fae would find it difficult to make use of the portal nexus, even if they managed to somehow repair or restore the damaged gate at Mithdranor. Then they gathered up for burial the body of the dead human mage whose ghost had attacked them, and returned to Mithclorok, four days after they had set out to chart Sarya's portal network. Starbrow went at once to report their findings to Vasilde Gareth, and the other captains of the crusade. Weary and wounded, a raven and the others trudged back to the ruined shell that had been set aside for their campsite, shucked their packs and armor, and tended to their injuries with spells of healing and restoration. Then they went in search of hot baths, eventually finding the city's old bathhouse down in the main body of the elven camp. Though little more remained of the building than its pools and its crumbling walls, the forest that had grown up in and around the city roofed the bathhouse well enough, and elves had arranged several screens for privacy. The pools had been cleaned and filled with fresh water, well heated by the stones kept warm in a big brazier nearby. A raven parted from his female companions and enjoyed a long, hot soak in the pool set aside for men. When he returned to the company's campsite, he found a messenger awaiting him a young moon-elf who wore the colors of a squire in the Eagle Knights. "'Major Raven,' the fellow asked, "'I have been sent to bring you to Lord Several's quarters. He has returned from Evermeet and wants to see you and your companions.' "'Several's back?' A raven sat up, shaking off his fatigue. "'I'll be there soon. You'll find Ilsevile and the others at the bathhouse.' In a little less than an hour, a raven, Ilsevile, Maressa, and Philsalene, found themselves back in the old library that served as the headquarters of Several's army in Mythglorok. Starbrow reappeared as well, still dripping wet from a hurried bath to clean the grime and blood from his body. Sorry to keep you from resting now, he said to a raven and Ilsevile, but Several wants to hear this straight from you. I simply want to make sure that I understand the tale as best I can. Several Miratar came into the room, dressed in simple traveling clothes. Vasilde Gareth followed him. Several embraced Ilsevile and took a raven's hand in a strong clasp. Welcome back. I understand you have been busy while I was away on Evermeet. We have, father, Ilsevile said. We follow the Daemon Fae to Mithdranor. They're encamped in the ruins of the city, gathering their strength again. Worse yet, Sarya de Lardrigeth has another mythal to pervert, a raven added. This one she has guarded more carefully than the last. I attempted to wrest control of it from her, and discovered that I could not contest her authority. Several's eyes darkened. Start from the beginning, and tell me everything. 
I want to hear this story in its fullness. Together, a raven and Elsevile described how they navigated the chain of portals to Myth Dranor and what they found in the ancient capital of Cormanthir. Maressa and Starbrow added details as they came up. Then they answered question after question put to them by Several and Vesilde, until Several finally nodded. All right, he said. I have heard all I need to hear. If you are confident that Sarya has hidden her army in Myth Dranor, I am as well. We will pursue them without pause, and put an end to the Daemon Fae once and for all. Are you certain that is a wise idea? Vasilde Gareth asked. You may have trouble persuading Evermeet's sons and daughters to go a thousand miles farther east and fight another campaign in a place where there are no living elven realms to defend. The Daemon Fae are our enemies. If we drive them into the middle of peaceful human kingdoms and leave them alone to turn their evil against non-elf neighbors, how will the humans and other folk of Faerun thank us? Several asked. He paced away from the others to gaze out at the snow-capped mountains, gleaming in the morning light beyond the forests that surrounded the old city. Besides, Vasilde, consider this. Sarya de Lardrigeth has already demonstrated that she can and will attack Evermeet from Faerun. I think the warriors of Evermeet who march under our banner will be willing to fight some more to make sure that doesn't happen again. Cormanthir is a long march indeed. It would be many hundreds of miles on foot, and we would have to cross a Norak as well, Vasilde said. I doubt the Faerun have forgotten their defeat in Evereska. For that matter, the Shadowvar might not permit our passage. There are elf gates leading to Cormanthir from Evermeet, aren't there? Ilsevile asked. Return to Evermeet by means of the gate in Evereska, and go from Evermeet to Cormanthir. I do not think that will be possible, Severo said. He turned from the window with a small frown, his hands clasped behind his back. The council will not permit me to launch another crusade from Evermeet's shores. Several fell silent, and no one else spoke for a time. Marissa fidgeted, but for once the Genesi kept her opinions to herself. Finally, Starbrow looked up and addressed Several. Presuming that our warriors are still willing to follow you in sufficient numbers that we can field an army, Starbrow said, there is still the question of how to get them from here to there. Is the march across a Norok possible or not? I don't know, Several replied. He looked to a raven. Can we bring an army through the portals you explored? The portal leading to Myth Dranor's burial glen was destroyed when we fled, a raven answered. You cannot bring your warriors to Myth Dranor through that door. It would have been impossible to force our way into the Daemon Fae stronghold through that portal anyway, Starbro added. It only worked once every few hours. Ilsevile glanced over at a raven. What of the portal before the one leading to Myth Dranor? Starbrow said that the mausoleum stands in Semberholm or somewhere in western Cormanthor. Cormanthor is a very large forest, Starbrow said. That portal might be a hundred or more miles from Myth Dranor. Still, it would save you the march across a Norok, Ilsevile said. It won't go quickly, a raven cautioned. The portal in the mountain fortress requires the casting of a spell and each casting would only permit a handful of soldiers to pass through. You'll need a mage to activate the portal for each four or five soldiers, and even a competent mage won't be able to activate the portal more than a dozen times in a single day. If you have twenty wizards in your army who can cast the proper spell, it would take you at least four or five days to pass your army through the portals. That assumes perfect organization and timing, Ilsevile added. Better count on twice that time to be safe. But there is no enemy waiting for us in the Sember home portal? Several asked. No, father. At least, we spent the night in the woods outside the mausoleum two nights ago, and no one troubled us. Then it doesn't matter if it takes us two days or a ten day. The Sember home gate is clearly the best choice available to us. Several fixed his eyes on the unseen dangers ahead looking away to the east as if he could see the spot where he meant to move his army despite the intervening mountains, deserts, and forests. Summon the captain, Starbrow. I must explain to them what I propose to do. All of what I propose to do. 
so that those who choose to come with me can begin to march as quickly as possible. Chapter 8 24 Mirtul, The Year of Lightning Storms After resting a night in the company's improvised quarters, a raven spent the next two days instructing the half-elf mage Jorilden and several other high-ranking wizards of the crusade in the passphrases and spells necessary to use the old portal network. The mages retraced a raven's steps through the mountain fortress and the forest crypt to the woods of Sembraholm, and confirmed that the door leading to Mithdranor was beyond repair. A shame, Gerildan muttered as they stood in the vault beneath the mausoleum. It would have been useful to be able to slip spies directly into the city through that door. A raven shook his head. The Daemon Fay were waiting for us when we sought to return. If the portal was working, they were guarded heavily with spells and infernal monsters. He thought for a moment, then added, Also, I would not discount the possibility that Sarya might prepare deadly spell traps in the city's mythal. When my friends and I entered the city before, there were spells to prevent me from inspecting the mythal. If Sarya could do that, she might be able to weave other spells into the mythal. For example, curses to afflict anyone who isn't a daemon fay. Lord Miratar means to move on Myth Dranor and attack the Daemon Fey in their lair, if they don't come out to fight, Gerildan said, frowning. How will Sarya's control of the Mythal affect a battle in Myth Dranor's streets? Consider the effect that Evereska's Mythal had against the Faerim a couple of years ago, once the city's high mages repaired it. Certainly the Daemon Fey army didn't attempt to enter the Mythal during their attack two months ago but they probably just didn't have the opportunity. The battle mage looked at a raven, his face troubled, and asked, Does Sarya have sufficient skill and ability to do that with the mythal? I don't know, a raven replied. I don't believe she has the ability to sculpt the mythal as she pleases, at least not yet. But a month ago I was able to best her at Myth Glorok, and three days ago I could not do so at Myth Draenor. Either she was simply careless the first time I attempted to contest her access to a mythal, something that doesn't really seem to be in her nature, or she has learned something new about mythalcraft in a very short time. That possibility terrifies me. I don't care for the idea of marching our army into Sarya's mythal and hoping for the best, Jorilden said. Nor do I. A raven narrowed his eyes, thinking, the magical might and lore of the crusade was formidable indeed, but would it be enough if things came to a battle for Myth Draenor? He set aside the question for a time, as he and Gerildan charted out the other portals from the mountain fortress. First they blocked the trapped portal and marked it as such, so that there would be no mistakes while moving soldiers through. Then they examined the other two functioning portals. One led to a sunlit glen in a warm, southerly forest with thick moss hanging from the trees and the humming of countless insects in the air. The other opened into a ruined wood-elven watchtower, a great tree that had once been a living fortress. A raven guessed that the portal likely opened in the forests of the Great Dale, though none of the other wizards assisting in the task knew for certain. Within hours of their return, Several summoned all the captains of the crusade to his headquarters. Gerildan, master of the battle mages, Adrela Muraresté, the captain who had succeeded the fallen Elvoth Muraresté as leader of the Silver Guard of Elian, Feral Nimersol, commander of the Moon Knights of Sehanin Moonbow, Dairon Sunlance, ranking Eagle Knight of the small company of aerial warriors, and Raylan Darthamel, the Blade Major of Evereska, who led a stout company of Everescan Vale Guards in order to repay the warriors of Evermeet for their stand on Evereska's behalf. They were joined by Keldith Orisol, who had taken over as leader of the infantry of Luthalspar after Salilo Fireheart's death at the Battle of the Coombe. A dozen lesser captains from smaller companies, orders, clans, houses, and societies came as well, each the leader of anywhere from a couple of dozen to a few hundred elf warriors. Finally, Severo also invited a score of the most prominent heroes and champions. Even though they led no companies of soldiers, powerful wizards and noted blade singers wielded great influence over the opinions of many warriors in the crusade. 
The commanders and heroes filled the great hall of Mythglorok's ruined library, gathered together beneath soft lantern light. The night was clear, cold, and breezy, with stars glimmering above the roofless white ruins, and a constant cool murmur of wind in the branches of the surrounding forest. A raven and his companions stood near an open arch leading out to the overgrown balcony beyond. When the leaders of the crusade stood assembled, Several strode to the front of the room and climbed three steps up the remains of the grand staircase that had once swept down into the room from the missing upper floors. "'Welcome, friends,' he began. "'I have summoned you here because our next campaign is at hand. As you have no doubt heard by now, we have learned that the Daemon Fey Legion has retreated to the ruins of Myth Draner in ancient Cormanthor. I propose to bring our might against the Delardrigues there, and finish the Daemon Fey once and for all. You may wonder how we will get to the forests of Cormanthor from the ruins of Mythglorok without months of difficult and dangerous marches. There is a simple answer. We will pursue the Daemon Fey through the same portal network they used to make their escape. We cannot follow them into Myth Draenor itself. That last portal has been destroyed. But, thanks to the efforts of Mage Raven Tesher and his companions, we can move our army swiftly and safely to Semberholm, which is only a hundred miles or so from our destination. My friends, I hold no one here sworn to join me in Cormantha. You and your warriors came to Faerun to defend Evereska and the High Forest from invasion and we have succeeded in doing that. But I want you to consider the question of whether we should content ourselves with having defeated one Daemon Fey attack, or should seek to eradicate forever the threat they pose to the realms of the people here in Faerun, as well as Evermeet itself. For we should not forget that this war began when the Daemon Fey attacked Tower Raylock. Luthil Spar is with you, Severil, called the moon elf Keldith Orisol. We will not allow the Daemon Fey to escape unpunished. Severil conceded a hard, thin smile and nodded toward Keldith. Do not be too quick to answer, my friends, he cautioned the others. You must lay this choice before all who serve under your banner. I asked Evermeet's warriors to follow me to Evereska but I will not take them farther without asking again. I, for one, do not like to leave a job half done, said a son elf swordsman that a raven didn't know by name. You have my answer, Several. For those of you who chose to follow me to Commandor, then, I have another question to ask you, Several said, raising his hands to still any more outbursts. So far you have regarded this campaign as a crusade. A war against the Daemon Fey. I want you to consider this. Are we engaged in a crusade, or a return? For myself, this is my return. I will remain in Faerun, even after the Daemon Fey are defeated, and seek to rebuild a realm on this shore that will prove strong enough to prevent threats such as House de Lardrigeth from rising unchallenged for generations to come. The assembled captains and heroes looked to one another, as if to confirm that they had heard Several's words right. Some shouted out their approval, raising fists and bared blades in the air. Some remained silent and thoughtful, weighing the meaning of Several's words. Others were openly troubled, frowning or whispering to their neighbors. "'Has the queen given her blessing to this?' called a blade singer who stood near a raven. "'The Council of Evermeet frankly opposes it,' Several said. "'But Amlerul has not forbidden me from asking you, each of you, whether you would consider aiding me in rebuilding a lasting elven presence in Faerun.' "'Where will you raise this realm?' asked the eagle knight Daron Sunlance. Here, in Mythglorok. If it proves the wisest course, then yes, I will come back to Mythglorok to found a realm here, Several said. But first we have unfinished business with the Daemon Fey and Cormanthor. 
Once we have driven them out of our father's lands, we might find that old Comanthir is the place to which we will return. What of the humans? Their kingdoms surround Comanthor. They may fight to keep us from our ancient homelands, Sunland said. We would be better neighbors than the Daemon Fae, wouldn't we? More than one elf laughed at Sivril's words. The Sun Elf Lord raised his arms again. As I said before, I ask for no one to swear allegiance to a new realm tonight. The crusade has work to do before the return can truly begin. But I hold this dream in my heart, my friends, and it is long past time for me to share this vision with you, in the hopes that it will kindle the same passion and determination in your hearts that it has kindled in mine. Now, go back to your warriors and tell them what you have heard here tonight. Starbrow, Thilisil, and I will begin to order our march through the portal to Semberholm under the assumption that most or all will follow us against the Daemon Fae, if no farther. Sweet water and light laughter, friends. Several descended from his steps and was promptly surrounded by several of the captains, besieging him with questions or demanding to march first. A raven, Ilsevile, and their companions moved onto the balcony nearby as the captains and commanders walked out into the starlight, many already engaged in arguments about whose company should march first, how and when to break camp, or whether it was even possible to contemplate a march on Mithdranor. The Sun Elf Mage looked over to where Several, Starbrow, and Vasilde stood, besieged by others who were unwilling to leave without seeking more answers. Your father has a talent for making trouble, doesn't he? Marassa asked Ilsevile with a mischievous grin. Didn't any of it rub off on you? It's a skill he's learned late in life, Ilsevile retorted. She looked up to a raven who simply stared off into the dark skies to the east, his hands on the ruined balustrade. She moved up behind him and laid her hand on top of his. Something troubles you? I think my path lies elsewhere, Il Sevele. A raven glanced back at his companions and touched his hand to his breastbone, feeling the hard form of the night star beneath his robes. I have to decipher the last of Selethos lore in this Selukira. If Saria turns the mythal into a weapon, Selethel's magic may be the only answer we have. What do you propose, then? she asked, her voice small against the sounds of the night. To find out who the star elves were, and where they lived, and whether some record of what Morthil brought back from Arkarar still exists. There is a right I must master before the night star will open the rest of its knowledge to me. That might be the work of years, a raven. You are speaking of secrets that were hidden five thousand years ago. That is a terribly long time, even by our standards. It might also be the work of months or days, he replied. He looked back up at the starry sky, watching the dance and flicker of lantern light bobbing in the breeze. I can always seek to invoke a vision if I turn into a blind alley. My heart tells me that Selethil's lore will be the key to any battle in Mithdranor. There are many skilled wizards marching in your father's army, but I am the only one who can do this. Even if it proves to be fruitless, I have to make the attempt. She sighed and looked down at her hand atop his. Are you going to ask me to choose between going with you or going with my father? I do not mean to. He allowed himself a small smile. But there is more of Faerun to see, if you haven't gotten your fill of it yet. Ilsevile pulled her hand away from his and drifted away across the cracked and weathered stone of the old balcony. She stared off into the green shadows beneath the trees, hugging her arms against her body. A raven gazed at her back, waiting. Finally, she seemed to give herself a small shiver and turned back to him. All right, now that I have seen Mithdranor with my own eyes... I find that I cannot argue against doing everything in our power to sever Sawyer de Lardrigeth from the city's mythal. But I fear for you, a raven. I think it is a perilous path you intend to walk. I will come, if only to guard you from yourself. A raven started to reply, but then he thought better of it and kept his argument to himself. Instead, he looked over to Maressa and asked, What of you? 
Marissa leaned against the old wall, her arms folded. Her hair drifted softly against the breeze, glimmering like silver in the starlight. I see no reason to walk toward a battle when I've got an excuse to head away from one, she said with a snort. And I like the idea that your magic might be a stiletto we can stick in Sawyer's back while she's watching Lord Several march his army at her fortress. I'm with you, a raven. A raven looked over to Philsalene and asked, And you? The sun elf girl shook her head. I think I should march with the crusade. If ever meet soldiers are heading into battle against the Daemon Fae, many will have need of healing. Lord Miratar needs every cleric he can find. She frowned and raised her eyes to meet a raven's. But, if you ask me to help you in this new quest, I will do so gladly. I can never repay you for saving me from captivity amid Glorok. You helped us in the mausoleum of the ghost and in the fight at the portal glade, a raven pointed out. I'm inclined to think you have little left to repay. Ilsevile looked at her and smiled sadly. Follow your heart, Philsalene. You should serve as you think best. And I am afraid you are right about where you will be needed. She stepped forward and embraced the young cleric. Be careful, and do not be afraid to send for us if we are needed in Cormanthor. We will come if we can. Maressa turned back to a raven. So... More portals leading into the godforsaken wilderness? Maybe a dragon's lair this time? The sun elf maid shook his head. No, no portals this time. If you're willing, I will teleport us to where we need to go. Sarya climbed the steps of the First Lord's Tower and tried not to allow crawling disgust to mar her composed features. Hillsfar was a city of humans, a hundred miles north of Mithdranor, on the shores of the Moon Sea. It was filled with the reek and clamor of humankind, and everywhere she looked, humans carried on with their senseless commerce, bickering, squabbling, and bullying each other. She was shrouded in a magical disguise, a simple spell of appearance changing that made her resemble a human woman, perhaps somewhat lighter of build than normal but graceful and beautiful nonetheless, with hair of deep auburn and eyes of bewitching green. She wore a pleated emerald dress of human design, decorated with delicate gold embroidery. She had entered Hillsfar in a small coach driven by disguised fairy, and passed through its crowded streets unnoticed until her carriage clattered to a stop before the stern, tall citadel that stood at the heart of the city. She glanced up at the banners and pennants snapping overhead, and frowned despite herself. In her day, the humans had known their place. None dared challenge the power of the great elven realms. They had been a race of simple barbarians, suitable for use perhaps as mercenaries in the wars of greater races. Yet it was an inescapable fact of the age in which she found herself that humankind must be reckoned with. That can be set right, she told herself. Soon I will be able to hurl an army of devils, yugoloths, and demons at any foe who dares to challenge me. I will lay this city under tribute, or have it torn down stone by stone and its people driven away from the borders of my new realm. Six stern warriors in heavy armor with red-plumed helmets stood by the archway leading into the tower. It was more properly a small keep, really, with an interior courtyard and high, strong walls. Halt and state your business, the guard sergeant demanded. Why, I seek an audience with First Lord Malthir, Sarya said, her voice and smile cold and dripping with contempt. I am Lady Sendra Dareth. I believe he expects me. The man-at-arms, actually a woman-at-arms, though one could hardly tell beneath the heavy armor, turned her back on Sarya and glanced at an orders book on a standing desk in a small alcove by the doorway. After consulting the book for a moment, she grunted and said, You're to be shown to the conservatory and await the First Lord there. Come with me. Sarya inclined her head without allowing her cool smile to slip, though the ill manners of the guard sergeant deserved a sharp rebuke indeed. She followed the stocky woman as she clomped along in her armor, passing through barren, cheerless halls that were almost devoid of decoration. Another guard followed at her back, a good three paces behind her. 
Is this truly necessary? she asked. No one goes into this tower without a red plume escort, the guard sergeant replied. The First Lord has made that absolutely clear. It is a standing order. She came to a tall paneled door and opened it for Sarya. Inside was a large parlor or sitting room, with several empty bookshelves along the periphery, and a number of old portraits hanging from the wall. Mostly of elves, it appeared, though with a crude human artistry it was hard to be sure. Wait here, the sergeant said, and withdrew to the hallway, closing the door behind Sarya. Sarya composed herself for a long wait, and she was not disappointed. It was well over an hour before she heard measured footfalls in the hall outside, and the rough clatter of the guards coming to attention. She turned to face the door as Malthir, first lord of Hillsfar, strode into the room. He was a human of middle years, tall but thin, with a heavily lined face and a scalp shaved down to gray stubble. He wore a long goatee of iron gray and dressed in a high-collared tunic of gleaming black, chased with dragon designs. In one hand he carried a short staff or long scepter of dark metal, with its head in the shape of a draconic claw. Four more guards followed him into the room, pale and silent warriors who seemed human at a glance, but positively reeked of plainer magic to Sarya's keen sense for such things. "'Well, you must be Lady Senda, Malthir rasped his voice completely humorless. I've never heard of any Dareths around here. Who are you, and what do you want with me? Who I am does not much matter, Sarya said, and I want nothing more than to give you a warning, First Lord. Malthir's scowl deepened. I react poorly to mysteries and threats. Choose your next words carefully. You have a new enemy on your doorstep, Malthir. The First Lord snorted and crossed his arms, tucking his scepter under his arm. Oh, do I? And I suppose you have come to tell me all about my new adversary. Very well, then. Who is this dreadful new foe? Ever meet, my lord, Sarya said. Whatever the First Lord might have been expecting her to say, that was not it. Malthir glared at her for a long moment, measuring her. What in the world does Evermeet want with me? he demanded. An army from Evermeet is returning to Cormanthor. They mean to recapture Mithdranor and restore the kingdom of Cormanthir. I wonder what they will think of a neighbor who purged his city of elves years ago, having them slaughtered in bloody games. Sawyer's eyes glittered like green ice as she delivered the barb. She had not yet managed to insinuate many fairy spies into the lands around Mithdranor, but it had not taken her long to learn that Malthir had come to the throne of Hillsfar many years ago by deposing a council dominated by elves. A momentary uncertainty glinted at the human lord's face before he bared his teeth in a fierce grin. Cormanthir is dead, he stated. The elves have retreated. It took them five hundred years to reach that decision, Lady Senda. They will never overturn it in only fifty years. Do not take me at my word, Malthir. Investigate for yourself. You are reputed to be a mage of no small talent. Scry the woods of Semberholm and see what you find there. Or send for your spy masters and ask them what passes in the western dales of late. You will find an army of elves better than five thousand strong. Sun elves, moon elves, blade singers and champions, mages and clerics, making ready to march north, said Sarya. It is a formidable array. Assuming for the moment that you are telling me the truth, who are you, and why tell me? Sarya glided forward a step and glanced at the expressionless guards with their black eyes. Do you wish me to speak freely here? The First Lord did not even look at the black-clad swordsman. Oh, yes, he said. Do not mind my guards. They will not repeat anything they hear, and they are completely incorruptible. I see no one alone, Lady Senda, ever. As you wish, then. Sarya glanced at the impassive guards again, wondering exactly what they were, then dismissed them as unimportant. 
Who I am is not important. As far as why I am carrying tales to you of an elven army in Cormanthir, it is simply a matter of self-interest. The elves are my enemies. Since it seems that I must deal with them, I naturally thought it wise to consider who else might regard an elven return to Cormanthir as less than desirable. Now it becomes clear, Malthir snorted. You picked a fight with the elves, and now that they have come for you, you hope to hide behind Hillsfar's army. Do you really wish to see a coronal in Mithdranor, Malthir? A power in the forest to shield the weaker dales against you, to bar you from the timber and resources of the woodland at your very doorstep, and perhaps to restore elves to the rule of this city? You will have to do better than that if you hope to frighten me, the First Lord said. I do not expect to frighten you. I expect you to examine the situation for yourself and act in your own interests as you perceive them. Sawyer turned her back on him and paced away, pretending to admire the portraits on the walls. You have designs on the northern dales, do you not? It is none of your business if I do, Malthir snapped. And your ally, Sembia, has interests in the southern dales. Sawyer glanced back at the mage lord. An elven army in Mithdranor would make both of these goals immeasurably more difficult. I submit to you, First Lord, that you would be well advised to think of how you could encourage the elves to retreat once again, and leave you to the business of ordering this region as you see fit. I tire of this verbal fencing, my lady, Malthir said. You still have not explained who you are, and why you are in my tower. I will have answers, real answers, now. Sarya inclined her head. Not unless you verify that I have told you the truth so far, First Lord. See for yourself the army of Evermeet marching to your doorstep. I will return in a few days to resume this conversation when you have had an opportunity to confirm the truthfulness of my words. I have not given you leave to go, Malthir said. He made no motion or sound but the pale swordsmen beside him set hands to sword-hilts in unison and fixed their dead gazes on Sarya. You will answer my questions one way or another, Lady Senda. Another day, Sarya said, and she teleported away from Malthir's parlor, vanishing in the blink of an eye. The last she saw of the First Lord, his face was set in a scowl of displeasure, but not surprise. On the morning following Several's council of war, a raven, Ilsevile, and Maressa gathered their belongings, armed themselves with swords and spells, shouldered their packs, and drew their traveling cloaks over their clothes. Then, as Philsalene stood by to see them off, a raven encanted his teleport spell and grasped the hands of the two women. The ruins of Mythglorok faded away into a golden, sparkling haze, only to be replaced a moment later by the cool green shadows of the old hillside shrine overlooking Silvery Moon, the same hillside where he had met Ilsevile before. Silvery Moon's graceful moon bridge glimmered in the sun below them. Maressa glanced down and patted at her torso and arms, as if to make certain that Oliver was present. I've always thought that was an extremely useful spell, she observed. Why bother to walk anywhere once you know it? In the first place, it's somewhat inappropriate to use magic of that sort on a whim, a raven replied. More than a few wizards have managed to forget that their feet must serve when their magic won't do. Secondly, the spell is not particularly easy. I have a difficult time holding more than one or two teleport spells in my mind at a time without giving up other spells that are equally useful. Finally, it's wise to never use the last teleport spell you have in your repertoire unless you are in dire peril. You never know when you might earnestly wish to be somewhere else. There is also the chance of a mistake, Ilsevile told Maressa. The genocide shot a sharp look at her. Mistake? What sort of mistake? It would not ease your mind at all if you knew, Maressa. Ilsevile patted her arm and walked past her, following the path down to the city below. 
the three travelers found their way back to the Golden Oak and took rooms there again. Then, after shucking their packs and traveling gear, they went straight to the Vault of Sages. I left Calwern with a list of references and texts to search for me, a raven explained as they walked through the tree-shaded streets of the city. Before we do anything else, I want to see if he has learned anything important. What will you do if the knowledge you seek has simply been lost? Ilsevile asked. It has been a very long time. The spells you need may not exist any longer. Spells rarely vanish altogether, at least in my experience. The gods of magic often intervene to ensure that knowledge does not disappear from the world. In truth, a raven dreaded that very possibility, but he did not want to dwell on it until he had to. If Morthil has been forgotten by history, it may be that his spells remain. Clerics of Mistra, Agma, or Denir hold many old spellbooks in their libraries. And if all else fails, I can attempt to reinvent the spells myself, though that would take many months, perhaps even years, of research. I think I am in too much of a hurry for that. They arrived at the vault. The great library's grey stone turrets and narrow windows made it seem more like a castle sitting in the center of Silvery Moon than a place of learning. But the library's doors stood open. They mounted the worn stone steps to the wood-paneled foyer inside. Bright dust motes drifted in the yellow sunlight that slanted through the windows. Why, Master Tesher, you have returned! And Lady Miratar, too! How good to see you again! Brother Calwern straightened up from his desk, a broad smile creasing his seamed face. You concluded your out-of-town affairs to your satisfaction, I trust. Not entirely. I dealt with the question I was called away to look into, but I fear it only led to more questions. In my experience, difficult questions are like Hydra's heads, Calwern said. Each one you vanquish leads to two more. If it's any help, I have set aside those tomes you asked me to look for. Do you want me to bring them out for you? A raven nodded. Yes, please, Brother Calwern. The second reading room is open. Make yourselves comfortable, and I will bring them out directly. A raven bowed to the human cleric and led Ilsevile and Maressa to the reading room. In a few minutes, Calwern appeared, wheeling a small cart stacked with musty old texts and scrolls. Here you are the human said. He handed a raven a parchment letter, a list of the tomes with cryptic notes and marks accompanying it. The list you requested. You'll find some notes about what is here and what isn't, as well as a few sources I added as I thought of them. Marissa eyed the stack of books with suspicion. I like reading as much as the next person, but that is a formidable stack of paper. Are you going to read all of those, a raven? As many as I need to, he said. Make yourself comfortable, Maressa, or if you'd like to help, I'll explain what I'm looking for, and you can try your hand at it, too. He looked over to Brother Calwern. Thank you, Brother Calwern. This should be an excellent start. They spent the rest of the day plowing through the collection of ancient texts and histories compiled by dozens of different authors, some human, some elf, and even a couple written by dwarves or halflings. Then they returned to the Golden Oak, ate, rested, and returned the next morning to resume their efforts, and again on the following day. By the morning of the third day, a raven had learned some things he hadn't known before. Morthil, the star elf wizard, was said to live in a realm named Yuireshenyar. A raven had never heard of any such land, and so he broadened his search, looking for anything he could find about a realm so old or so far off that even the sun elves had forgotten about it. He asked Calwern to look into it as well and resumed his reading. Late in the afternoon, Brother Calwern brought a raven a heavy ancient tome bound in dragon hide. Good afternoon, Master Tesher, he said warmly. I believe I may have found your missing kingdom. Marissa looked up from an old tome she had been examining. Thank Akadi, she muttered. My eyes can't stand another hour of this. The Deniroth cleric set the heavy book on the reading table and opened it with care. It was an ancient atlas with page after page of old maps, all marked in script a raven could not read. Is this untheric? he asked. Yes, it is. The atlas dates back almost two thousand years. Fortunately, its makers protected it with spells of preservation long ago. 
the white-haired Daenerath carefully paged through the atlas, finally settling on a spread that showed, in fading ink, a long peninsula jutting into an island-studded sea. The Uir Forest, where the realm of Aglarond now stands, the cleric said. Ilsevile leaned over a raven's shoulders. Aglarond's forests hide many secrets, but a fallen kingdom no one has ever heard of? That stretches credulity. A raven studied the ancient map and said, I see no realm or cities marked on the map. Ah, but look at the untheric caption here, Calwyn pointed with one stubby finger. It reads, Here of old stood Yui Reshenyar, which is now hidden from the world. A raven glanced up to the Daenerath. Do you have any older maps of the Aglarondon Peninsula here? No, I checked already. The ancient empire of Unther was the first human realm to settle the peninsula's shores, and this is the oldest Untheric text we have in the library. Cowern rubbed his chin. But there is something here that puzzles me, Master Tesher. Why does the map say that Yui Reshenyar used to be here, but has been hidden? If one hides something in a certain place, it is still there, isn't it? That is odd, murmured a raven. I might expect it to say, here of old stood Yuri Reshenyar, which would imply that the realm was there and has now fallen. Or I might expect it to say, Here is Yuri Reshenyar, which is now hidden. Which interpretation is correct? Cowern shrugged awkwardly. I fear my understanding of Untheric may be insufficient to the task. It could be an error on the part of the cartographer, a raven offered. He stood up from the desk and paced around the room, thinking... Morthil, the star elf, whatever that was, inherited the spellbooks and magical devices of Grand Mage Ithrades hundreds of years after the coronal of Arcarar moved against the Delardrageths. The last anyone recorded, Morthil returned to his people, taking Ithrades' lore with him. The star elves lived in Yuri Reshenyar, and here was a map claiming that Yuri Reshenyar might once have stood in the forests of Aglarond. Does anything of Yuri Reshenyar survive in Aglarond? He wondered aloud. Tau Kwesser have lived in Aglarond for a long time, Ilsevile observed. It is said that many half-elves still live in the Yuirwood. I have heard stories of old ruins and strange magic in Aglarond's forests, Calwern offered. It is entirely possible that better records of Yuri Reshenyar are preserved in the symbol's realm. I am inclined to think so too. A raven said. He looked to Calwern. Can I have a copy made of that map, and translations of the captions and names? By tomorrow? The cleric nodded. Of course, Master Tesher. I will set our scribes to the task immediately. Ilsevile looked over a raven's shoulder at the map with some interest. So, how far is Aglaron from here? She asked. It is quite far. Two thousand miles, perhaps more said Calwern. Ilsevile's eyes widened. That is two months' journey at the least. It is not as bad as it sounds, a raven said. A long part of that would be over water. We can hire a ship in one of the Dragon Coast ports and cross the Sea of Fallen Stars in a ten day or so. So the question is how to reach the Sea of Fallen Stars quickly and easily. A raven leaned back in his chair, looking up at the ceiling in thought. The portals we found under Mythglorok might serve. One led to the Chandlewood, another to the forests of the east. What of the portal to Semberholm? Ilsevile interrupted him, tracing a path on a raven's map. That would bring us within a few days' ride of the ports in Sembia or Cormir, wouldn't it? A raven allowed himself a small grimace. He was supposed to be the veteran traveler and the expert on portals, but Ilsevile had found the answer before he'd even started to consider the question. I think you're right, he said. The other portals might get us closer to our goal at the first step, but then we would have to find our way to a port on strange shores. Riding from Semberholm to Suzale or Marsember seems much easier than finding our way out of the Chandlewood. Ilsevile patted his shoulder. He could feel her smirking behind his back. What are Cormir and Sembia like? she asked. And how likely is it that we will find a ship bound for Aglarond in their ports? A raven shrugged. I haven't been to that part of Faerun before, but I know they're both regarded as civilized lands. 
Sembia is a land where gold is king, a league of cities governed by merchant princes. They're suspicious of elves, I hear, but as long as we have coin to spend, we should have no trouble there. Cormier is a smaller realm, but well spoken of by many travelers I've encountered. As far as passage to Aglarond, well, I suppose we will learn more when we reach the Sea of Fallen Stars. If nothing else, it seems likely that we could take passage to Westgate, a Procamper, and go from there to Aglarond. The quicker the better, Ilsevile said. I have a feeling my father will need us in Kermanthor before long. I do not want to tarry an hour longer than we need to. Maressa shut the ponderous tome in front of her and smiled crookedly. I've never been to Aglarond, she said. I wonder if their wine's any good. They returned to their rooms at the inn, making ready to depart on the following day. A raven left the details in Elsevelle's hands. He had something to do, and the time had come to do it whether he wanted to or not. At sunset he left the city's gates and retraced his steps to the shrine of Labelus Enereth, seeking quiet and solitude. The night was cool and breezy. Spring in the north faded fast once the sunset, and the woods around the old temple sighed and rustled in the wind. A raven seated himself cross-legged, looking out over the lights of the city below. Then, drawing a deep breath, he began to chant the words of a powerful vision spell. Before he set off for a kingdom as distant and exotic as Aglarond, he wanted to know that he could find what he sought there. He focused on the tale of Ithrades and his allies, conjuring the images he'd seen preserved in the ancient Telkira stones. Ithrades, the ancient moon elf, with his younger apprentices around him. Morthil, he thought. Star elves. Yui Reshenyar. The Telmir Karan Nashir. The Rite of Transformation. I wish to know, he called to the wind. The vision seized him at once, powerful and immediate. A raven felt himself flung out of his body, his perception hurtling eastward across land, sea, and mountains. He glimpsed a palace of green stone, a great woodland, a circle of old men here's in a sun-dappled clearing in the forest. Then his vision lurched and leaped. He reeled, dizzy, setting a hand on the cold flagstones to steady himself. When he looked up again, he saw that he stood in a great, lightless hall. Wrecked balustrades of stone lined the walls, the remnants of high, proud galleries that once encircled the place. In the center of the hall, a drifting spiral of white magic hovered in the air, turning slowly. A raven gazed at the odd apparition, trying to make out what exactly it was, and his vision leaped again, diving into the white spiral. He stood in a strange room of gray mist and shining light gazing at a great old tome of golden letters lying open on a stand. Ithrades' spellbook, he gasped. All at once the vision whirled away from him, and a raven was left cold and hollow on the windswept terrace above Silvery Moon. He climbed, shaking to his feet, only to give up and sink back down to the ground. The spell was neither easy nor forgiving, and he would not be himself for quite some time but the vision was usually truthful. A silver door of mist in a black hall, he wondered. Ithrades' lore has not been lost. With a sigh, he climbed again to his feet and started back toward the city and his companions below. Chapter 9 28 Myrtul, The Year of Lightning Storms they spent their last night at the Golden Oak much as they had the last time they left Silvery Moon, enjoying a good meal, drink, and dancing beneath the lantern-lit boughs of the great old tree. Then, in the morning, the three travelers returned to the Vault of Sages to pick up the copies a raven had commissioned from Brother Cowern before leaving the city again. It was another warm spring morning, and flower beds all over the city were in bloom around them. They climbed the steps to the vault's entrance and found Brother Calwern waiting for them with a new leather scroll case, secured for travel. The Untheric map you requested is ready, the aged Nirath told a raven. I wish you luck in your travels, Master Tesher. Come back when you can and tell us about them. Thank you, a raven replied, accepting the map in its leather case. Until we meet again, Brother Calwern. He bowed and turned to go 
but then someone called his name from nearby. The voice was human, though raspy and somewhat deep. A raven turned and found himself looking on a man who sat by one of the desks. The fellow stood slowly, pushing himself to his feet with a jangle of mail beneath his surcoat. I am Dawnmaster Donner Kurth, of the Order of Aster, he said. I have been waiting for you. The same order that Graith served in, a raven recalled. He inclined his head to the fellow. Well met, Dawnmaster, he replied, studying the Lathandarian. He was young, a grown man, certainly, but no more than his mid-twenties, if a raven was any judge of it, and he had a hard manner to him. His eyes were bright blue and intense, and his hair was hacked so short that it was little more than dark stubble covering his dusky scalp. He wore the rising sun symbol of Lathander on his breast, and a big-hilted broadsword hung at his hip. What can I do for you? You are the companion of Mordmaster Graith Holmfast? the human asked. Yes, I was, a raven said. He frowned, taking the young man's measure. We traveled together in the company of the White Star some years ago, and again this very spring. Graith Holmfast was my mentor in the Order. I understand you were with him when he was killed. His fierce manner grew even harder as his eyes narrowed, and a scowl crept across his features. He was like a father to me, Master Tesher. Tell me what happened to him. A raven searched Donner Kirth's eyes. Graith was a true friend to me as well, Don Master. I will do as you ask. He reached out and set a hand on the big human's shoulder. But I have to warn you, it will be hard to hear. He fought valiantly at my side through many perils, but in the end he was murdered in cold blood by the Daemon Fae. I mean to hear your tale, a raven Tesher, whether it is good or ill. A raven glanced at Olsevele and Maressa, then nodded. Give me a moment to finish my business here, and we will go somewhere to talk. Dawnmaster, this is my betrothed, Ilsevele Miratar, and our companion, Maressa Rost, who has also shared many dangers with us. We all rode with Graith. Ilsevele offered her hand in the human way, and Kurth surprisingly did not seek to crush it in his mailed grasp. He drew off his gauntlet to touch her fingers, and bent down to kiss her hand. My lady Miratar, he murmured. Then he turned to Maressa, who made a show of daintily extending her hand for the same treatment. A Lady Rost. Don Master Kurth, Maressa intoned gravely. The Genesi regarded the serious Lathandarian with a solemn face, but a raven caught a glimmer of humor in her eyes. Maressa was not used to such displays of courtesy, it seemed. Let us go outside, he suggested. The human assented with a nod and a raven led him outside to the green boulevard that ran past the vault. Many of Silvery Moon's streets would have passed for parks in other cities. They found a row of cherry trees in full bloom and sat on a pair of stone benches beneath the soft pink blossoms. A raven related to Donner Kurth the story of his return to Faerun and quest for the missing Talkira. From time to time, Ilsevele or Maressa interrupted with details of Graith's valor and their adventures together. A raven went on to tell of their continued quest in search of the last Talkira, the battle against Grimlight, the Behir, and the Daemon Fay treachery that snared them all in Sarya de Lardrigath's clutches. Then he came to the end of Graith's tale in the demon haunted halls beneath Myth Glorok. The Daemon Fay demanded that I lead them to the last of the treasures they thought, and so they threatened Graith's life if I did not comply. He paused, struggling with the words as the grief of the moment welled up again in his chest. I hesitated, because I did not want to put such a weapon in Sarya's hands. She ordered Graith killed, and one of her fairy cut his throat. My resistance failed, and she caught me in a spell of dominion, commanding me to do as she asked. Kurth's fierce eyes softened for a moment. You did what you could, a raven Tesher. Your lies were forfeit from the moment such monsters captured you. As far as you knew, they would kill you anyway. I know. But if I had yielded sooner, they might have saved Graith for later use against me, as they did Osevele and Maressa. In which case, I might have been able to rescue him as well. How did you escape the domination spell and free your comrades? 
a raven frowned, and rubbed unconsciously at the night star embedded beneath his shirt. Something should not be lightly shared. Sarya's captain commanded me to attempt something that risked grave harm. That gave me the strength to break the spell. After that, I returned to Myth Glorok, which had been mostly emptied, as the Daemon Fae were busy with their war against Evereska and the High Forest. I found Ilsevile and Maressa, and teleported away. He also managed to sabotage Sarya's control of the city's mythal, and banish a few hundred demons while he was at it, Maressa added. Don't let a raven convince you that he isn't at least a little bit heroic. The human glanced at a raven again, and leaned back to digest the tale, hands locked in front of his chest. After a long moment, he sighed and looked up. Does Graith's murderer still live? he asked. No. I killed the one who wielded the knife, a raven said. But as far as we know, Sarya de Lardrugeth still lives, Ilsevile added. She is the one who ordered Graith's death. We think she is hiding in the ruins of Mithdranor. Then, if you will permit me, I offer you my service in Graith Homefast's stead. The Dawnmaster bowed deeply, his arms spread wide. These Daemon Fae, whoever they are, have made an enemy of the Order of the Aster, and I intend to see Lord Holmfast's work through to its end. A raven frowned, not sure what to make of the offer. He exchanged looks with Ilsevile and Maressa. The Genesi shrugged, but Ilsevile studied the human closely, her green eyes narrowed in thought. Evermeet's army is marching against the Delardrigeths in Mithdranor, a raven finally said. However, our path does not lead us there yet. We are about to set out in search of some ancient lore that we need to defeat the mythal defenses Sarya is erecting around Mithdranor. It is my intent to travel swiftly and return to the fight against the Daemon Fae as quickly as I can, but I can't say where my quest will lead me or how long it will take. A long and difficult march may prove more important than a single glorious charge in deciding a war, the human knight said. Honor is served equally by both. Until such a time as you know that you will have no need of my sword, I would like to aid you in whatever way I can. If Graith would have followed you, I will follow you. A raven considered his reply. As far as he knew, he might be wandering in and out of libraries for months in search of the spells he needed. But Elsevile answered for him. As a captain in the Queen's Guard, she understood a warrior's honor better than he did. For the sake of Graith Holmvast's memory, we will accept your service, she told the human. The only conditions I place on you, Dawn Master, are these. If a raven or I tell you that something you see or do is not to be spoken of to those who aren't elves, you will not do so, and you will not abandon us in danger. Other than that, you are free to judge for yourself when honor has been served. The human crossed his right arm over his heart. I so swear, he said. Good, said a raven. He stood and faced a Lathandarian. If you have a bedroll and a pack, Go get them and meet us by the river gate. We need to get a mile or so beyond the city walls, and I will teleport us all to Mythglorok. Colonel Thordrim stood his ground and prepared to meet his death shoulder to shoulder with five more riders of Mistledale. He and his fellows crouched in the common room of a farmhouse, staring out through the open door and the half-shuttered windows. Skulking closer through the forest verge came shapes out of a nightmare, snarling, hissing devils with snake-like tails, wide mouths full of foul, jagged teeth, and huge saw-tooth glaives of rust-red metal. Fearsome yellow light glimmered in the fiend's eyes, and they cackled and snarled horribly in their terrible voices. "'Why don't they just get on with it?' muttered Rethold. The tall archer stood beside Colonel, a silver-tipped arrow held on his bowstring. He had only three arrows left and he was waiting until he was sure of a shot. For the better part of a ten-day, the rioters of Mistledale had been embroiled in a deadly fight that worsened every day, defending their veil against what was first a marauding devil or two, then murderous gangs of the creatures. In the past few days a dozen of Colonel's fellows had died, torn apart by fiendish talons, skewered on hell-forged hooks or spears, or blasted to smoking corpses by devil-wrought hellfire. 
Be patient and wait for your shot, Colonel told him. If we are going to fall here, we have to take as many of these foul hell spawn with us as we can. What I'd like to know, remarked Ingra, who was keeping watch by the window, is how these monsters got out of Mithdranor. She stood with a powerful crossbow in her hands, a highly enchanted quarrel laid in its rest. Colonel knew that she'd account for one of the devils when the moment came, but that wouldn't be enough, would it? They're coming, cried Ingra. Colonel raised his paired short swords and crouched by the doorway, ready to kill the first devil to enter the room. Rethold's bow thrummed to his left as the archer fired through one of the shuttered windows on that side of the house and Ingra's crossbow snapped sharply on his right. There was a sudden rush of footfalls, the clicking of taloned nails on the floorboards of the porch outside, and a furious devil leaped in the door, eyes ablaze with battle lust. It was so quick and reckless in its rush that it nearly skewered Colonel with its barbed glaive before the swordsman could move. He cursed and threw himself aside, then parried two more jabbing thrusts as the monster pressed in, two more of its fellows crowding in close behind it. For Mistledale, Colonel cried, and he heard his fellow riders take up the call. He slipped inside the glaive's point and launched a furious assault of his own, slashing and stabbing with his swords as the devil snapped at him with its fangs. The other riders crashed into the doorway with him, and for a few moments the whole fight came down to a savage press right in the farmhouse's door, blades flashing, fangs sinking into flesh, hisses of anger and sudden grunts or cries of pain. Colonel roared in anger as the devil he battled sank its teeth into his forearm, snarling and worrying at him like a great fierce hound but he managed to slip his right hand free and stabbed his enchanted blade into the monster's torso over and over again until the devil finally slipped and went down in the doorway. He stumbled to the floor, saw Rethold killed by a glaive thrust that burst the weapon's point half a foot out of the archer's back, and from all fours awkwardly parried the attack of yet another devil leaping through the press. His new opponent hissed in savage glee and drew back its weapon for a killing thrust, even as Colonel tried to gain his feet, and a silver-white arrow sprouted from the devil's neck. Colonel took advantage of the devil's distraction to gain his feet again and gut the creature with a wicked low slash under its guard. More silver arrows struck all around him, a deadly sleet of archery that took the devils in their backs until the creatures finally scattered and dashed away, seeking escape. Colonel found himself standing with Ingra and two of the other four riders, staring in disbelief at the evidence of the archery around them. "'Someone else has an excellent sense of timing,' he said. He ventured out onto the porch, looking to see who or what had just saved his life. Arrayed around the farmhouse stood dozens of elf archers, some kneeling behind the undergrowth, others standing in the shadow of tree trunks. With easy grace they glided forward, loosing arrows at the fleeing devils as they came, until the skirmish lines swept past the farmhouse and into the fields beyond. "'Who are they?' Ingra asked. "'I thought I knew most of the wood elves in Cormanthor, but I've never seen those fellows before.' "'Nor have I,' Colonel said. He limped out into the open. Somehow, during the fighting in the farmhouse door, he seemed to have been slashed across the leg without even noticing it and raised a hand in greeting to the archer's captain, who trotted up to the house. "'Well met, friend,' Colonel said in Elvish. "'My companions and I owe you our lives.' The captain, a wood elf whose silver-green garb seemed to shimmer and shift as it constantly adjusted for the green and dappled shadows the elf passed through, looked at Colonel in surprise. "'You speak Elvish,' he said, "'and not very badly, either. You must know some of the Telquesser. I do. My name is Colonel Thordrim. I spent several years in the service of Lord Desayer of Elventree. Are these his lands? the elf asked. Definitely not from around here, Colonel noted. No. Elventree lies a hundred miles or more to the north and east. You are near the human settlement of Mistledale. Ah, I think I have heard of it, the elf answered. His eye fell on the dead or dying devil sprawled on the farmhouse's stoop and doorway, and he nodded. 
I am glad we were able to help. You fought with great valor against more numerous foes. Not to seem ungrateful, sir, but who are you, and what are you doing in Mistledale? The elf looked back to Colonel and inclined his head. I have forgotten my manners. I am Phileal Springleap. My warriors and I belong to Lord Several Miratar's host. We have come from Evermy to destroy the Daemon Fay and Mithdranor. Lord Severil? Daemon Fay? Colonel shrugged. Do you mean to tell me that an army from Evermeet is in Cormanther? I mean that very thing. The elf, Phileo, Colonel reminded himself, turned away for a moment to quickly confer with some of the others, who trotted off after the rest of the company. Then he turned back to the weary riders. Have you seen many of these hellspawn here, Colonel Thordrim? For a ten day or more they've been raiding our settlements and slaughtering our people. We always knew there were creatures like this lurking in Mithdranor, but they have never escaped to the larger forest to trouble us before. Then it may be that we can help each other, Phileo said. We are here to defeat these creatures and their masters, and it seems to me that you must know much about the lands and happenings nearby. Do you think your leader would be willing to meet with us? Colonel took in the skilled and graceful company with a glance. How many more companies of elf archers were roaming around Cormanther, looking for devils to slay, he wondered. Whatever the answer, it was certainly the best news Mistledale had heard in quite some time. Yes, he said, I think it would. Donner Kurth seemed a grim and serious traveling companion, putting a raven in mind of some dwarves he'd known in his day. But his gruff and fierce manner had a way of melting away whenever he addressed Ilsevile or Maressa. Donner hailed from southern Tethir, the son of a mid-ranking noble, and he had been brought up with an exacting sense of chivalrous behavior, particularly in regards to the opposite sex. Some of the more conservative sun-elf houses embraced similar romantic ideals, but humans had a way of fixing their minds on something and carrying it to extremes that elves would never practice. At Mythglorok, they joined in with a stream of elves passing from the Delimbier Vale to Semberholm. Since a raven was perfectly capable of navigating the portal network by himself, they didn't have to wait for an elf maid to lead them through, as the rest of the warriors did. They rested for the night in the growing camp by the shores of Lake Sember, surrounded by the lantern light and cook fires of Lord Several's army. A raven and Elsevile went to see Several when they had settled on a place to camp. They found him sharing the evening meal with Jaretta Starcloak's wood elves, who sang and danced with abandon, as if to show the elf lord that their high spirits were sufficient for the whole army. The wood elves greeted both the raven and Ilsevile warmly, and it was some time before the three sun elves managed to disentangle themselves from the songs, games, and bawdy wit of the wood elf encampment. As they walked back to Several's pavilion, Ilsevile took her father's arm. Do you feel in need of some song and dance tonight? she asked. A little music never hurt anyone, Several replied. I try to make it a point to take at least half my meals with the troops. "'choosing a different company each time. "'I want to know what's on their minds "'and take some time to remind them why they're here. "'But I have to say, "'the wood elves don't give one much of a chance to talk, do they?' "'A raven smiled. "'Wood elves were notoriously garrulous, "'but then again sun elves were supposed to be distant and reserved. "'He suspected that his wood elf friends went out of their way "'to act the part when he came to visit, "'simply because he was a sun elf. Their spirits seem high, anyway, he observed. It cheers me to pass an hour with them, I'll admit, Several said. So, you have returned much sooner than I expected. Did you forget something? We're only passing through, a raven told him. We need to head south from here, toward the ports in Sembia or Cormir. We'll be taking a ship to Aglarond. Aglarond? Several paused, his eyes thoughtful. That makes sense. The people have lived there for a very long time, perhaps even as long ago as the dawn of Arkarar. But it is so far away. Do you really think you will find what you are looking for there? I don't know, a raven admitted, but it is the best guess I have at the moment. 
What of you, father? Have you found any sign of the Damon Fay yet? asked Il Sevalet. We have companies already marching north and east toward the Standing Stone. I have heard from some of our scouts that they have met demons and devils of various sorts in the forest. Apparently, the human folk who live in the forest verge have been greatly troubled in the last few ten days by the fiends that Sarya has released from Ithdranor, or summoned on her own. Ilsevile frowned. I do not like the idea of bringing our own war into the middle of their homeland, she said. Sarya made that decision, not I, Sivril said. Even if we had chosen not to follow her here, the Dales folk would still have to reckon with the Daemon Fey army, and Sarya's summoned Hellspawn, and they would not have our swords and spells to help them. They reached Sivril's pavilion, and the elf lord stopped and kissed Ilsevile on the cheek. I am afraid I have to set our marching orders for tomorrow, and make ready to meet with some human emissaries from the nearby lands who want to know why an army of elves has suddenly returned to this ancient forest. If you like, I will have Thilisil provide you with mounts to speed your journey. They thanked Sivril, and Ilsevile kissed her father again. Then they returned to their camp. The next morning they found Sivril's aide, Thilisil, and obtained riding horses for the four of them, not the elven coursers from Evermead itself, of course, since they did not know if they would be able to embark the horses when they reached Cormier's ports. They set off for the human land south of Kermanthor. From the wilderness of Semberholm, they made their way south for a day to the land of Deepingdale and its chief town, High Moon. The next morning, they rode to the town of Whiteford at the northern end of Archendale, and passed along the length of the dale to the town of Archenbridge in a long, hard day of riding, made a little easier by fine weather and good roads. Two more days of riding brought them across Sembia's broad farmlands and well-ordered hamlets to the great old city of Serloon, on the shores of the Sea of Fallen Stars. Serloon had long ago overspilled its city walls, and for miles outside the old city, Inns, taverns, stockyards, and stables lined the roads. The aroma of the place was overpowering, a mix of cook fires, animal dung, and industry such as tanning, paper-making, and smelting. Busy humans everywhere were noisily engaged in their trades with little regard for their neighbors. Few passers-by took any notice of the four riders approaching the city, but those who did looked hard at a raven at Ilsevile, saying little. Why do they stare at us so? Ilsevile asked a raven in Elvish. Not many human cities are as welcoming to our people as Silvery Moon, he replied. The humans who settled these shores learned little from elves, unlike the human lands you passed through in the north. The Sembians have long regarded elves as rivals, perhaps even enemies. Enemies? Why? Long ago the Sembians were checked in their northward expansion by the might of elven Cormanthier. Even after the fall of Mithdranor, elves remained in the forest for centuries, enough that the Sembians still did not dare to defy them. The last houses of Cormanthir abandoned the elven court only within the last forty years or so. Will the Sembians claim the forest, now that it has been abandoned? I do not know. The Dales folk still stand in their way, even if they are no match for Sembia's strength. A raven glanced at Ilsevile with a thin smile. Besides, your father may have other ideas on the question now. They finally reached the old gates, so deeply buried within the city that there seemed to be no difference between the districts outside the walls and the ones inside the walls, and rode through. Now that they were in old Serloon, the city's native architecture became apparent. Great stone buildings centuries old rose high overhead, distinguished by needle-like spires, blade-like flying buttresses high pointed arches, and an incredible wealth of statuary. Crouching, leering gargoyles seemed to adorn every rooftop. It was magnificent in its way, but more than a little sinister as well. A raven gazed up at the threatening, monstrous figures captured in stone, and wondered what had led the long-dead sculptors to adorn their city so. Let's find a good inn, he suggested, and we'll see what ships are in port and where they are bound. The waters of Lake Sember glowed with a golden sunset, 
and a dark line of storm clouds gathered around the distant desert mouth mountains to the west, promising rain before long. Several stood near the lakeshore, absently noting that the camp was smaller than it had been. Many of his companies were already well on their march to the north and east, and soon he too would be gone from there. Lord Miratar, the Dales folk emissaries are here, Thilisal told him. The efficient sun elf was a priestess of Corellan Lorethian, and one of the cleric's subordinates to Several in the hierarchy of Corellan's grove. But more importantly, she had proved to be an exceptionally competent administrator and secretary, helping him to attend to the myriad details of moving, feeding, and planning for an army numbering in the thousands. Excellent, Several replied. I will be there in just a moment. He would have liked Starbrow or Vasilde Gareth to be present for the council, but the Moon Elf warrior was leading the vanguard of the march, and Gareth was behind him, in charge of the main body. Several turned his back on the sunset and found his way back to an old stone colonnade beneath the trees. The slender white pillars had once ringed a great table where the old lords of Semberholm had feasted on summer nights. Like many of Semberholm's ruins, they were not really ruined at all, just abandoned for a time. Since Several's folk had had a few days to set things in order, golden lanterns hung once again from the branches overhead, and the table was set much as it might have been five hundred years ago. Three humans and a half-elf awaited him. Thilisal stepped forward and announced, Honored guests, the Lord Several Miratar of Elion. Lord Several, this is High Counselor Haresk Malorn of Mistledale. Lord Theremin Uloth of Deepingdale, Lord Ilmeth of Battledale, and Lady Storm Silverhand of Shadowdale. Welcome, friends, said Several. I thank you for consenting to meet me here. He bowed and took a moment to study his guests. He'd sent couriers to all the nearby lands after discouraging the troubles besetting Mistledale, even dispatching mages with teleport spells to speed their journeys if necessary. Haresk Malorn, High Counselor of Mistledale, was a tall, balding human with a heavy body, dressed in garb Several might expect of a small-town merchant, which was exactly what Malorn was. For all his evident lack of martial bearing, he had a surprisingly direct and strong look to his face, even if he seemed a little overwhelmed in the present circumstances. Lord Ilmeth of Battledale, another tall human, was the second of Several's guests. He had a thick, dark beard and a grim, almost sullen manner to him. He also shifted his feet nervously, his powerful arms folded across his broad chest. His third guest was the half-elf Lord Theremin Uloth of Deepingdale. Theremin evidently had some moon-elf blood in him. He was quite fair of skin, with dark hair and a build that was almost elf-slender. He seemed somewhat more at ease than Malorn but Several would have expected that from a lord whose domains included both human towns and elf settlements in the southern margin of Cormanthor. It helped that Several and Theremin had spoken several times already in the days since the crusade had emerged in the forests not far north of Deepingdale. It has been a long time since an elf lord has invited dale lords to his table in Cormanthor, Theremin said. I, for one, am honored to be here. Severo inclined his head to acknowledge the compliment, and turned his eyes to the fourth of his guests, none other than Storm Silverhand, one of the Seven Sisters, Bard of Shadowdale, Harper, Chosen of Mistra, and a dozen other things more. She stood watching him, her eyes dark and thoughtful in a face of tremendous beauty. She wore a male shirt and leather jacket, and a longsword rode at her hip. Her silver hair, long and straight, gleamed in the lantern light. Several had not expected her, believing Shadowdale would send its Lord Morngrim Amkothra or another representative, but he was not about to tell a chosen of Mistra that she was not welcome. Well, Several Miratar, you've certainly stirred up a hornet's nest in Mithdranor, Storm said. I suppose I would like to know what in the world is going on there, and why a whole army from Evermeet has suddenly gated into this forest. I will explain, Several said, glancing to Thilisal. But first, I was expecting a representative from Archendale, too. The swords declined to come, Thilisal said. 
They sent word that they are not concerned with elven matters, but will not obstruct your movements in any way, as long as you do not approach their land. Malorn shook his head. Trust Archendale to look out for itself first. You won't get much from them, Lord Miratar. In all fairness, High Counselor, the swords are mightily concerned by Sembia, which sits at their southern doorstep, Lord Theremin replied. They do not want to give Sembia a reason to pick a quarrel with them. Several shook his head. The human ability to ignore their own common good always astonished him but he supposed that if the rulers of Archendale wanted to be left alone, he could certainly leave them alone. He looked back to Storm Silverhand, sensing that she was the one he would have to convince. The legendary bard of Shadowdale might not hold any titles or govern any lands, but her words went a long way in the Dale lands. I promise to explain our presence, he began. We have spent the last three months marching and fighting in the Delimbier Vale, where we fought a bitter campaign against a legion of Daemon Fae, winged demons who wear the shape of elves. They are an ancient evil long ago defeated and imprisoned in the High Forest. But earlier this year, they mounted a raid on Evermeet itself and freed a great legion of their kind to launch an attack against the elves of the high forest and nearby realms. Avereska, Storm said. Several nodded. He hadn't wanted to name the city, not knowing the Dale Lords with whom he spoke well enough to speak of such a secret. Yes, Avereska, he allowed. In response, I gathered a host of warriors from Evermeet, to go to the Delimbier Vale and destroy the Daemon Fae threat. We stopped them at the gates of Evereska and in the deep refuges of the High Forest, and broke their army on the lonely moor. But the Daemon Fae fled through hidden gates to Mithdranor, where they are now rebuilding their strength. He faced Counselor Malorn and spread his hands in apology. In truth, we did not mean to drive an army of our foes into your lands. But now that they have fled here, we have come to finish what we started at the Lonely Moor. That explains your army's presence, Storm Silverhand said. But perhaps you can also tell me why the forest is suddenly thick with creatures of the Infernal Plains. Have these Daemon Fae of yours broken the wards trapping those monsters inside Mithdranor? We think so, yes. Several paused to make sure that the Chosen understood him. One of my mages, an expert on mythocraft and the Daemon Fae spells, surveyed Sawyer's handiwork at Mythdranor. He found that she has assumed control over the mythal, and is now working to twist it to her own purposes. In the High Forest she used the wards over Mythglorok to summon up a whole army of fiends. I fear she will do so again in Mithdranor if we do not stop her. Damn. Storm turned away to stare out over the lake. We've allowed Mithdranor to fester for decades, and now it seems we'll have to pay the price for it. Haresk Malorn looked to Storm and asked, Can the Sage of Shadowdale do something about a demon queen tinkering with Mithdranor's old magic? Or the Knights of Mithdranor? They would not stand aside and let this happen, would they? The bard of Shadowdale frowned, and her face grew dark. Elminster took the knights off through a magical gate months ago on some perilous errand. I haven't seen them since. My sister, the symbol, grew so sick with worry that she appointed a regent in Aglarond and went seeking them. She said something to me about the Sringe before she left but now I haven't heard from her since. I would like to know where they are, too. I know that Elminster and the Knights have proven their friendship to the Dales many times over, Malorn said. But still, what in the world is more important than what's going on right here? The world is full of troubles, my friend, and we who are chosen can only deal with a very few of them. Storm looked up at the twilight skies overhead. For my own part, I have always hated choosing which things to do and which to leave undone. The High Counselor frowned and looked down at his feet, perhaps regretting his words. The gathering fell silent for a long moment 
as the other Dale's folk chewed over Storm Silverhand's tidings. Then Ilmeth of Battledale stirred and looked over to Several. So, you're just going to march your army up to Mithdranor, kick out the Daemon Fae, and ride off back to Evermeet. As directly as we can, though the Mithil Wards may prevent us from an outright assault. We may have to invest the city and batter down its defenses, or work powerful magic of our own to contain the Daemon Fae. Several hesitated, then added, After that, many of us will likely return to Evermeet, but I intend to remain here and keep some strength in this forest. We have been surprised by threats originating in Faerun too many times. I cannot speak for all who march under my banner, but I at least have returned. The Dale Lords did not attempt to conceal their surprise. Counselor Malorn exchanged looks with Ilmeth of Battledale, and both surreptitiously glanced to Storm Silverhand to see how the Bard of Shadowdale responded. Storm, for her part, was still staring out over the lake. After a long moment, she spoke over her shoulder. Turning back the march of years is rarely a good idea, Several Miratar, she said. It took the lords of the elven court nearly five centuries to decide on retreat. Are you telling me that in a few short months they suddenly decided otherwise? The decision was not without debate. Storm snorted softly in the twilight. Sun elves make an art of understatement. Do you have any idea of the trouble that will come from this? Whatever trouble comes, it must surely be less than that which will come to this land if we leave Sarya de Lardrigeth in Mithdranor, Several answered. Lord Miratar, not all of the Dales hold on to the old Dales compact any more, High Counselor Malorn said. The four Dales represented here still abide by the promises made fourteen centuries ago by our forefathers to yours, but the compact is not remembered with much fondness in Archendale, Tasseldale, or Scardale. Even Haroldale is questionable. And there are powers encroaching on the borders of Cormanthor that never agreed to any compact with the elves, Lord Theremin pointed out. Realms such as Zendel Keep and Hillsfar, or Sembia for that matter, are not at all unhappy with the elves' retreat. They might resist your return to Cormanthor. I have no designs on their lands, Several protested. No, Several Miratar, but they certainly have designs on yours. And ours, Storm Silverhand said. The silver-haired bard turned back from Lake Sember and fixed her eyes on Several. Cormanthir long shielded the dales and the forest lands from the ambitions of kingdoms nearby. But since the final retreat of the elven court thirty years ago, the realms surrounding the dale lands and Cormanthor have been growing ever bolder. In the absence of elves strength and determination, the forest has become a great borderland, a frontier that all are eager to claim. Fortunately, Storm smiled humorously as she spoke, we live in interesting times. The Zents would have overrun the northern dales long ago, but they have murdered each other in at least two great bloody purges. They have now recovered from those feuds, stronger than ever. The Sembians might have bought Tasseldale and Featherdale and who knows what else lock, stock, and barrel, but Cormir under King Azun would have none of that. Well, Azun is dead now. Hillsfar was a city friendly to the fair folk, respectful of the old compact. Now it is ruled by the tyrant Malthir, a man known to hate elves. For a decade now, the only thing keeping the aspirations of these ambitious powers in check is the fear that should one of them move too quickly, the others would certainly join forces to drag down the leader from behind. Storm frowned at Several, her eyes narrow and thoughtful. Now you tell me that there's an army of demons spawn in Mithdranor, who no doubt plan to seize a realm to rule for themselves. That, at least, I mean to prevent. Several replied. As for the other realms, I recognize that the years have passed since the Standing Stone was raised, and that a new compact may be necessary. 
but I see no human cities standing here on the shores of Lake Sember, or rising in the silver groves of the elven court. I will not be told that elves cannot raise a realm under Cormanthor's branches. Storm sighed and looked over at the glimmering lanterns and campfires of the elven army, which were beginning to flicker into life as the twilight deepened. Before the retreat, no one would have dreamed of challenging an elven army in Cormanthor, she said. I do not think you can trade on that old fear and respect any longer. Whether you meant to or not, Lord Miratar, you have brought war to Cormanthor, and I cannot yet see who will take up arms against whom. Chapter 10 For Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms Serlun was one of the busiest ports on the Sea of Fallen Stars. Two days after a raven and his companions arrived in the city, they boarded Windsinger, bound for the city of Velprintalar, on Aglaron's northern coast. Windsinger was a graceful three-masted caravel under the command of a captain named Ilthor, a wiry, sun-darkened Aglarondon. She had carried great tons of wine, cords of fine hardwood, and small coffers full of rich amber from the Uirwood to Serlun, and was taking on Sembium pewter, ironwork, copperwork, and tooled leather to carry back home again. The day was warm and the skies streaked with rain as two longboats pulled Windsinger from Serlun's wharves. Once in open water, the caravel let down her sails and set her course south-southwest for the whole day in order to clear the great southern cape of Sembia. Then, with the northwest wind at their back, they turned due east and made for the Isle of Presper, sighting its town-dotted shores early on the third day of sailing. After that, Ilthor turned Windsinger sharply to the northeast, striking across the mouth of the Dragon Reach for the city of Procamper, on the northern shore of the Inner Sea. It would have been far swifter to simply continue due east for Aglarond, crossing the center of the Sea of Fallen Stars. But the pirate isles and the dangerous shoals south of Altumbel lay astride that course, and Ilthor had no intention of trying his luck with either. A raven found the sea voyage an easy way to travel. There was little room to spare for passengers, and the deck was cluttered with cargo and stores, but the voyage offered ample opportunity to find a cargo hatch or coil of line to sit on, watch the sea or the distant shorelines, make entries in his journals, talk with his friends, or simply sit and reflect. Windsinger was too small to boast cabins exclusively for the use of passengers, so Ilsevile and Maressa shared the pilot's cabin in the stern castle, while the pilot bunked in the forecastle with the other crewmen. A raven and Donner were given the best sleeping spaces on the open deck. Covered from the weather by the quarter-deck overhead, the after-deck was actually quite pleasant in warm weather, if not particularly private. By night, Ilthor found various small anchorages along the coastlines, dropping anchor each night in a different cove or bay. Only once did he run at night, when he crossed from Presper to Procamper. The sea is too cluttered with islands and shoals to sail in the dark, he explained. Out on the sword coast or the shining sea, they'll keep their course by day and night. But here I drop anchor when it gets dark unless I'm certain I've got an open pitch of water all around me, or the moon is bright enough to sail by. For the next few days they sailed eastward along the shores of Impilter, passing cities such as Tesurlagal, Lyrabar, and Halamak. Then Ilthor turned southeast, striking across the mouth of the eastern reach for Cape Dragonfang. On the seventh day of their voyage, a raven found himself sitting with Ilsevile at the stern, he studied his spellbooks in the bright sun, puzzling over the notations and concepts of a spell he had recorded months before, but had not yet mastered, while she gazed back at the green shores of Impilter, slowly sinking into the sea behind them. Her ivory skin had acquired a golden bronze hue in the past few days, as sun elves often did in warm climes. Even the fairest tanned quickly and easily, unlike moon elves, who could never gain more than the faintest hint of color to their skin. After a time, a raven realized that Ilsevile had been staring out over the sea for a long while, her brow faintly furrowed, her eyes distant. 
He set down his spellbook and reached to place a hand over hers. What is it, Il Sevele? You've been staring at the sea all morning. Where are your thoughts? She didn't reply for a long time, long enough that someone who didn't know her as well as a raven might have wondered whether she had heard him. But finally she took her eyes from the bright horizon and looked down at the slender white wake streaming from behind Windsinger's rudder post. Where will we marry? she asked. Where? a raven blinked, considering the question. In truth, he hadn't given a single thought to any sort of wedding preparations, and especially not since the night the Damon Fay had raided Tower Raylock. Your father's palace at Seamist, I suppose. Everyone in Elian will want to come. He managed an awkward shrug. I hadn't really thought about it. Do you think we will return to Evermeet in time for our wedding day? It is less than two years from now. Green grass in the year of the bent blade. That is the promise we made in the year of the prince. I remember, a raven said. Why wouldn't we return for our wedding day? What if my father's army is laying siege to Myth Draner, or the Daemon Fay escape again, and we pursue them to some even more distant land? What if your search for high magic takes you to some realm on the other side of the sunrise, a road whose end you won't reach for years and years? Even if all those things happen as you say, O Sevele, I don't see why we could not stand in the arbor at Seamist and speak our promises before the Seldarine, a raven said. So we would abandon our battles and our journeys for a day in order to honor our betrothal. If that is the way we must do it, then yes. Il Sevele sighed. And back to your studies, my father's battles, whatever desperate journeys and adventures we must face. That is not much of a marriage, a raven, and not much of a life together. Frustration hardened his words more than he intended, but a raven spoke anyway. If it is all we are to be permitted now, it will have to do. In time there will be years for us, Il Sevele. We won't always be called away. It isn't enough. Il Sevele glanced up at the cloudless sky overhead, her eyes as bright as emeralds in the sunshine. When we meet a raven, there was such passion in our hearts. There is nothing we would not abandon for an hour in each other's company, stealing away for a walk in the glades of the forest, an evening's dance in the wine-rooms of Elian, a morning together in the woods by the sea. But when was the last time we did something like that? You came to find me at the House of Cedars only a few months ago, he protested. For a few days, at least, I certainly did not think of anything other than you. So you say. Yet even then you were aching to set out for Faerun again. I would catch you staring off to the east at sunset, looking out over the darkening sea toward Faerun, wishing with all your heart to tread those roads and wander those lands again, even though your mind did not want to hear your heart's whispering. If you had asked me, O Sevele, I would have stayed. You know that. If you had stayed, you would have wished I had not asked you. A raven looked away, gazing at the empty sea as the breeze played with his hair, listening to the soft sound of water slipping past the hull, the ruffling of the sails in the breeze, the rhythmic creaking of lines and tackle as Windsinger rode the waves. But you came with me, he said. You have seen only a thimbleful of these lands, Il Sevele. We could roam the world for a hundred years, and still you would not have seen it all. She smiled and said, I am not a roamer, a raven. I have enjoyed our travels, the parts that weren't difficult or deadly anyway, and I'm not done with them. But my heart turns to home, to familiar places, to the people I love. You, on the other hand, when you are home, wherever that is, your heart turns to things you have not seen. Tell me the truth. Can you close your eyes and imagine our life together? Can you picture fifty years in the House of Cedars, an end to your journeys, a life of being instead of a life of doing? He started to tell her yes, but El Sevele held up her hand. Try it before you answer. All right, then. He closed his eyes and did as she asked, imagining days of springtime sunshine in the House of Cedars, the sea storms of fall and the dark clouds of winter the sound of the surf in his ears, 
nothing to do but pass his days a perfect and complete hour at a time. He might spend a hundred years there, two hundred perhaps, with Ilsevile and the children that might come. Yet he could not seem to envision Ilsevile in that house, or himself for that matter. He frowned and tried again. He was a high mage, and he wandered the halls of Tower Raylock, or the courts of Luthelspar, while Ilsevile stood at her father's right hand, or perhaps even sat at the council table in the fullness of years. But that left the house of cedars empty again, and he could not fill it with all his imagination. You can't do it, can you? Ilsevile said. I can read it on your face. A raven opened his eyes and looked at his betrothed. There was strength and unflinching wisdom behind her eyes, so bright and perfect. She had changed in the years of the betrothal. Wisdom and confidence, poise and determination, had gathered around her since he had first met her. She was not the timid young woman who had once been content to lose herself in his love, swept away by his stories of far-off places and the restlessness he had learned from a century among humankind. There, on the sun-bleached deck of Windsinger, it occurred to a raven for the first time that Ilsevile perhaps held a destiny and a passion that might eclipse his own, even if she had not found it yet. Give me a year, he pleaded. Let me walk a few more miles down the road I have to walk. When I know that the daemon they have been dealt with, when I know that your father has done what he has set out to do, things will be different. How do you know? Ilsevile said. She looked away from him, her red-gold hair gleaming in the sunshine. Because you are waiting for me, and I would have to be a fool to let you slip through my fingers. He pulled his hand away from hers, standing up slowly. I have only a little farther to roam, Ilsevile. Then I will be coming back with you. Ilsevile pulled herself to her feet and searched his face for a long moment. I know, she said. I know. She leaned on the rail, gazing at the sea astern of them. A raven followed her eyes. Nothing but empty ocean and sweeping sky surrounded them, and they remained there, looking at nothing for a long time. I can't see the land any more, Ilsevile finally said. A raven nodded. He had long since lost sight of Impilter's capes. We're well on the easting reach now, he said. We should sight the shores of Aglaron tomorrow. The street lanterns of Hillsfar glowed orange in a light evening smog of smoke from thousands of homes. The banked furnaces and forges that had burned all day long, and the cold sea mist from the dark moon sea, less than two miles from the city walls. Sawyer de Lardugeth contemplated the cluttered streets and ramshackle buildings as her hired coach clattered over the gleaming wet cobblestones. What a stinking sty of a city, her son observed. The hulking swordsman wore the aspect of a tall, broad-shouldered human, but the Damon Fay lord had little liking for hiding his true nature in a lesser guise. Do all human cities reek so? Mind your manners in the first lord's towers off, Sarya said. Malthir is a cold and arrogant man, quick to take offense. I want him as an ally not an enemy. Zolf scowled, but nodded. Sarya glanced out the coach's window. The driver pulled up before the First Lord's tower, set the brake, and hopped down to open the door for Sarya and Zolf. Two foreign nobles, as far as he knew. Sarya descended, Zolf at her side, and they climbed the steps to the tower. I am Lady Senda Dareth, she told the guard captain. Lord Malthir does not expect me but I believe he will wish to see me. The guard captain consulted his order book, then looked up sharply. The First Lord will be notified of your arrival, he said. You will await him in the banquet room. He gestured to four of the red-plumed guards, who led Sarya and Zolf through the keep's winding passages and broad halls to a large room with a great table of oak and dozens of chairs arrayed neatly behind it. The windows were mere slits only a hand's breadth wide and the two sets of doors leading into the chamber were made of four-inch thick oak bound with iron bands. Do they think this will hold us if we should choose to leave? Zolf muttered to her as the door closed behind the guards. I doubt it, 
Sarya said. Malthir at least knows that I am a mage. I suspect that the First Lord simply wants to remind us of where we are. To Sarya's surprise, Malthir did not keep her waiting. After only ten minutes, the First Lord threw open the doors and strode into the banquet room, flanked as before by the four pale swordsmen with the dead black eyes, as well as two more red plumes. There was another lord with him, a heavy-set man with an exquisitely trimmed moustache and goatee to go along with his long curled locks of black hair and dark, narrow-set eyes. Sarya decided that he had the look of a warrior who'd let himself go. Despite his evident paunch, the man's shoulders were broad, and his hands were large and strong beneath the delicate lace cuffs of his tunic. Malthir paused on entering, studying Sarya intensely, and motioned to more guards stationed in the hall. The thick oak doors swung shut, and the First Lord smiled coldly. "'Good evening, Lady Senda,' he said. You left without answering my questions last time you visited my tower. I hope you will not do so again tonight. Sarya inclined her head to the human lord. I hope I will not need to, Lord Malthir, she said, ignoring the threat. May I present my captain at arms, Alphon? He advises me on military matters. Malthir studied Zolf for a moment, and his lips twisted into a small, humorless smile. Captain Alphon, he answered, then indicated the dark-bearded lord who had accompanied him into the room. This is High Master Borstog Duncastle of Ordulin. He represents Sambian interests concerned with trade, settlement, and industry in the Dales and the Moon Sea. Sarya nodded to the Sambian lord, more likely nothing more than a jumped-up merchant, she reminded herself, and looked back to the first lord of Hillsfar. I hope you have had an opportunity to confirm for yourself the incursion of Evermeet's army to these lands. I have indeed. The elven army was exactly where you'd said I would find them. Malthir crossed the room to the head of the large empty table, kicked out the chair there, and sat down in an unconcerned slouch. The oddly pale swordsman who accompanied the First Lord moved to stand behind him. My spies added some important details you neglected to mention, Lady Senda. They spoke with Dale's folk, who in turn spoke with emissaries of the elven army, and they learned that the leader of the elves, a Lord Miratar, I believe, has discovered that an ancient enemy of elfkind has occupied Myth Draner. Apparently these foes of the elves recently waged a furious war in the vales of the Delimbier, attacking elven kingdoms in the high forest, but fled to Myth Draner when they were defeated a month or two ago. Highmaster Borstog folded his thick arms in front of his chest. My own spies confirmed the First Lord's report, he said in a deep rumbling voice. In fact, I learned a name for these adversaries of the elves, the Daemon Fae. You are well informed, Lord Malthir. Perhaps more well informed than you think, Lady Senda. Malthir raised a hand and pointed at his own eyes. I took the liberty of casting a spell of true seeing before I entered the room. You, dear lady, are not what you appear to be. Nor is your Captain Alphon, for that matter. In fact, were I to hazard a guess, I believe that I am speaking to a pair of Lord Miratar's Daemon Fay at this very moment. Zolf shifted beside Sarya, and his hand stole down to the sword at his side. The four mysterious swordsmen behind Malthir mirrored his move in unison, swiveling to direct their dark, dead gazes at Zolf. Sarya glanced up at him in irritation and said quietly, Not yet. Zolf growled softly deep in his throat but he took his hand from his sword-hilt and subsided. Sarya looked back at Malthir, who still lounged in his chair at the head of the table. "'You are more astute than I had thought you would be, First Lord,' she said. "'I am Countess Sarya de Lardrigeth, of House de Lardrigeth. This is my son, Zolf. I hope you will forgive me for taking steps to keep my identity a secret, in order to avoid any undue alarm on your part.' 
I am by nature a suspicious man, Malthea replied. There is no such thing as undue alarm. Now, with all that behind us, what precisely do you want with Hillsfar, Lady Saria? I want to drive Several Mirator out of Cormanthor entirely. As I said in our previous meeting, it seemed to me that you might share that desire. Hillsfar would not profit from an elf coronal in Mithdranor. It is not at all clear to me that Hillsfar would profit from a demon queen in Mithdranor either. Well, among other things, I certainly have no interest in guaranteeing the Dales against the natural and logical growth of Hillsvar's power, or Sembia's. On the other hand, Miratar will stand in your path. If you ever hope to raise Hillsvar's banner over Harrowdale or Battledale, or if the High Master here ever hopes to see Featherdale or Tasseldale under Sembia's domain, you would be well advised to make sure that Lord Miratar does not establish himself in Cormanthor. Whereas you would gladly stand aside while we seize the Dale lands that lie all around your forest city? Sarya walked over to the banquet table and seated herself a few chairs down from Malthir, ignoring the flash of irritation in the human lord's eyes. I mean to rule over most, if not all, of the old realm of Cormanthir. That means the woods of the elven court, Semberholm, much of the forest Cormanthor, in fact. But the Dales were never part of Cormanthir, and I could care less what becomes of them. In fact, to help secure your assistance against my foe, I am willing to help you arrange matters in the Dale lands as you see fit. An elf lord in Cormanthir, whether you or Miratar, is not something that Sembia wishes to see, said High Master Borstog. The Southern Dales are Sembia's in all but name anyway. What I need are furs, timber, game, lands to clear and settle. Trees are trees, Sarya said. I won't let you cut the whole forest, but I see no reason why I could not sell you a concession for logging and clearing a good portion of it. She smiled coldly. Trust me, High Master, no such offer will be forthcoming from Several Miratar. Borstog narrowed his eyes, and Sarya nodded to herself. She could almost see the human merchant prince counting coins in his head. Someone would have the right to exercise those concessions. Whether she permitted the Sembians to take as much as they wanted, or at the price they offered, was something she could determine for herself later. But she had little use for a few miles of forest on her southern border. Malthir stirred in his seat. So you want my red plumes to help you defeat Miratar's army, he said. In exchange, you are offering me the Northern Dales, and High Master Borstog the Southern. I am afraid it is not so simple, though. You have omitted three important factors from your calculations. Cormir, Zentel Keep, and the Sage of Shadowdale. Cormir is in no condition to contest aggressive moves in the Dale Lands, Borstog pointed out. Between the death of Azun the goblin incursions, and the shades in an auroch, Cormir is as weak as it has been in a hundred years. Lady Saria has chosen an auspicious time to reclaim Myth Draner. And I can aid you against Zentel Keep and the Chosen of Mistra, Saria said. I may lack in sheer numbers, but through my control over Myth Draner, I wield great magical power. I can dispatch hundreds of sorcerous warriors against my foes, striking anywhere within hundreds of miles, with dozens of powerful demons or devils to lead the attack. If that is the case, I find myself wondering why you need me at all, Malthir observed. Sarya leaned back in her chair and studied the First Lord. I am not entirely certain that I do, she said with a deceptively pleasant tone. I believe that I could hoard my strength inside Mithdranor and defy Several Miratar forever. 
but I am not willing to take the chance that the powerful human lands surrounding Cormanthor might join forces with Miratar. That is why I have chosen to come to you, Lord Malthir, and through you, your friends in Sembia. It is worth my while to make sure that you, at least, understand what you stand to lose from an elven return to Cormanthir. If you were to help Miratar overthrow me, I would simply melt away again, and you would be left with that army of elves to deal with. How many more centuries do you wish to spend under the shadow of elven power? Borstag glanced at Malthir, who simply studied Sarya in silence, a deep scowl etched on his face. Then the Sembian looked back to Sarya and asked, so how do you propose to go about removing Miratar's army from Comanthor? As you might expect, I have given that some thought. Sarya straightened in her seat and focused her emerald gaze on Malthir of Hillsfar. The first lord brooded, leaning against the arm of his chair, one hand under his jaw. The key, I think, Sarya began, is the land of Mistledale. From the shores of Lake Sember, the crusade marched north for three days on long disused elf roads the few other armies could have found, let alone followed, through the heart of southern Cormanthor. The weather, which had been fine for the days of the portal transit, turned cold and wet, with sullen gray skies and a strong gusty wind out of the north that seemed to carry the chill of the moon sea down into Cormanthor's green, mossy heart. Several's army had come to include a small company of rangers and archers from Deepingdale, many of them moon elves or half elves descended from those who had chosen not to retreat from Comanthor when the last leaders of the elven court had finally decided to abandon the great woodland thirty years ago. The Deepingdale elves knew Comanthor intimately, the secret paths and lore of rock, water, and leaf and they helped Toretta's wood elf scouts guide the army northward toward the Standing Stone and Mithdranor beyond that. Lord Ilmeth of Battledale had no strength to spare for such work, and little inclination to do so in any event. The Lord of Assembra had fewer than a hundred men under arms in his whole domain. Lord Morngreen Amkathra of Shadowdale had more strength than that, but his land was much closer to Mithdranor and Storm Silverhand informed Several that Morngreen would not bring any soldiers to join the army of Evermeet until Evermeet's soldiers were in sight of Mithdranor. Several sent a company of blade singers and battle mages ahead of his marching host to help the folk of Mistledale fend off the marauding demons and devils that harried their small land, and another company ahead to Shadowdale for the same purpose. He did not like to part with any of the crusade's magical strength, especially when there was always the chance that hundreds of Sarya's fairy warriors might appear in the skies overhead at any moment. But the daemon fae lurked out of sight and out of reach, letting their conjured hellspawn do their work for them. I don't understand the point of harassing the Dales folk, Several remarked to Starbrow on the morning of the third day. The Sun Elf Lord and the Moon Elf Champion stood on the banks of the Ashaba, which was running deep and swift after several days of rain, and watched the lead companies of Several's host crossing the river on three bridges of glimmering magic, conjured by Gerildan and the Elf Wizards under his command. Shadowdale and Mistledale could lend us a couple of hundred trained fighters at best. Sending devils to harry them takes almost nothing away from our strength, and makes my quarrel with Sarya de Lardrigeth their quarrel too. The demons and devils who have been prowling about in the forest around Mistledale and Shadowdale might not be a part of Sarya's army, Starbrow replied. Lord Theremin of Deepingdale says that monsters of the infernal realms have haunted the ruins of Mithdranor for centuries now. Sarya's seizure of the city's mythal might have damaged the wards that held them trapped in the city, which would mean that this might be an unintended consequence of Sarya's action, not a deliberate act on her part. Or she might be doing nothing more than testing the strength of the humans who might ally with us, Several said, thinking out loud. If Sarya doesn't know these lands well, 
She might be worried about whether the folk of the Dales can give us as much help as Silvery Moon's knights did in the high forest. Starbrow glanced up at the clouded sky above the river, then sighed and looked back to the elf lord. If you're right, it's a bad sign, he said. It suggests to me that Sarya doesn't think she needs to hoard her demons for battle against our army. Either she's got an inexhaustible supply of the monsters, or she doesn't think we're going to be able to do anything about her stronghold in Mythdranor. I don't know about you, but I certainly wonder why she'd think that. The vanguard made camp for the night in the shadow of Galath's roost, an old abandoned keep that stood little more than a mile from the Moonsea Ride. The rocky heights on which the old keep had been built offered a commanding view of the northern end of Mistledale and the great green sea of trees that rolled north, east, and south from the end of the open dale. Starbrow had the Crusade's company set out a double guard, fearing a sudden attack of marauding fairy or yugoloths, but no enemies showed themselves. Several greeted Star Eyes with the customary devotions to Corella and Lorethian and the Seldarine, celebrating the rites he had observed for so many years as a high priest of the elven faith. He spent an hour praying for guidance, trying to catch a glimpse of what waited if he continued on his way north. Myth Drana was only three days' march away, and he would soon test the strength of his host against Sarya's demonic power. But Sarya's myth awards obscured his efforts to scry her fortress, and he had to content himself with minor auguries that promised little besides danger and uncertainty. As he descended from the hilltop, still grappling with the incomplete visions he had seen, Several found Thilisa waiting near his pavilion. Lord Several, the cleric said with a small bow, an emissary from the human city of Hillsfar is waiting for you. Hillsfar, Several said. He knew of the city, having walked in Cormanthor many years before, but from what he had heard, the city of Hillsfar wanted nothing to do with elves since the final retreat from Cormanthor. Very well, show him into my pavilion. Several stepped into his personal quarters, doffed his ceremonial mantle, and washed his hands in a basin of water. Then he emerged into the pavilion's sitting area, which doubled as his reception room. He did not have long to wait. Two of the guards standing watch by his door, both seasoned veterans of Vasilde Gerth's Knights of the Golden Star, showed the human ambassador into his room, and unobtrusively took up their posts just inside the door. The human was a surprisingly short man, so stocky and thick-shouldered that Severo found himself wondering whether the fellow had any dwarf blood in him. His head was shaven, but he wore a long, pointed goatee under his wide mouth and his eyes were sunk deep beneath beetling brows. The Hillsfarian wore the elegant dress one might expect of a courtier in a lordly palace, a well-tailored garment of scarlet that did not conceal the supple links of golden mail he wore beneath his shirt. "'Welcome, sir,' Several said. "'I am Several Miratar, lately Lord of Elian, and High Priest of Corellan's Grove. I speak for the host of Evermeet.' The human offered an obsequious grin that struck Several as more than a little false. And I am Hardil Gyaros, High Warden of Hillsfar. I speak for my master, the First Lord Malthir. Several deliberately set aside his dislike of the High Warden's facetious manner, and gravely offered his hand in the human fashion. Would you care for any refreshment, High Warden? Wine, or something to eat? Not necessary, Lord Several. I am anxious to get to business. The elf lord nodded. As you wish, then, High Warden. What can I do for the First Lord of Hillsfar? The human crossed his powerful arms and looked up at Several. The First Lord would dearly love to know what you intend to do with this army, Lord Several. It does not escape Lord Malthir's notice that you are drawing closer to Hillsfar with every march. Human diplomacy may take different forms than I am used to. Severo reminded himself. I must be patient, even in the face of discourtesy. Lord Malthir need not worry, High Warden. I am bringing my army to Mythdranor in order to finally root out the evil that has taken hold there. I do not expect to come within thirty miles of Hillsfar. Some things are better left alone, Hardil Gyros answered. 
Your people haven't seen fit to do anything about Mithdranor for six full centuries, but now you seem to have stirred up much evil in a land you abandoned thirty years ago. Evermeet might be far enough for Mithdranor to ignore the depredations of the city's fiends, Lord Several, but Hillsfar is not. You have the course of events confused, High Warden. We are here to deal with the evil that has stirred in Mithdranor. We did not cause it to stir with our approach. The human snorted. So you say now, anyway. Several studied the human emissary. If this is the way humans conduct their diplomacy, the elf lord thought, it is no wonder that they get into so many wars. Did Malfear of Hillsfar have anything else to say to me? He asked. In fact, he did, Hardil Giras replied. The First Lord instructed me to advise you of three important facts. First, in conjunction with our allies in Sembia, we are moving strong forces into place to safeguard the upper stretch of the Moon Sea Ride and Ralthavir's Road. We are concerned that your reckless marching about and warmongering may jeopardize our crucial, legitimate commercial interests in this vital route and the various minor settlements and communities that lie along the way. Second, Hillsfar and Sembia recognize no other power as sovereign over the forest of Cormanthor. Your people gave up any claim to ownership over the woodlands when you left some three decades ago. Hillsfar now claims all lands within fifty miles of the city's walls. We will clear, settle, log, or otherwise use these lands as we see fit. We will regard the presence of any foreign soldiers within this area as nothing less than an invasion of Hillsfar itself. Finally, the First Lord offers you this for your consideration. In Mithdranor's day, the elven realm of Cormanthir was surrounded by human states too small and weak to do anything other than what the coronal told them to do. That is no longer true. Humans have grown strong in the centuries since Mithdranor's fall, Lord Several. We were not party to the Dale's Compact, and we see no reason to abide by an agreement made centuries ago by people who had no right or authority to speak for us. Hardil Giras bared his teeth in a cold, reptilian smile. It is in the nature of humankind to grow, to expand and to become more numerous and more powerful with the passing of a few short years. You might as well shout at the incoming tide as try to check our natural increase. We need room to grow, Lord Several, and we will have it. Several folded his arms in front of his chest, and consciously made himself wait a full minute before he responded, in order to keep his anger in check. I wish no quarrel with Hillsfar or Sembia, High Warden and I should hope they wish no quarrel with me. But your first lord Malthir must understand that I will not countenance the occupation of Dales who have no interest in being ruled from Ordulin or Hillsfar, and I will not surrender a claim to the elven court. If Hillsfar needs room to grow, I hope we could reach some agreement over the responsible use of the woodlands in question. As for your master's third point, well, it may be human nature to expand, but you should not assume that it is in an elf's nature to retreat. With the host of Evermeet in this forest, there is a greater strength of elf warriors in Cormanthor today than there has been at any time since the Weeping War. Elven armies stronger than your own failed to stop the army of darkness in the year of doom, Lord Several, the High Warden said, not even bothering to conceal a smirk. The Elf Lord watched the sneering hills Farian. What was his purpose in coming here, he wondered. Is he trying to provoke me with these threats and demands? Or is this simply a facade, a ploy of bravado to mask true fear? I mean to save my arrows for the Daemon Fay, Several told the First Lord's emissary. Whether you know it or not, they are your enemies as well as mine. For all our sakes, do not interfere with my work in Mithdranor. For your own sake, think long and carefully before you attempt any work at all in Mithdranor, Gieris growled. You will not be warned again. The stocky human inclined his head a bare inch 
and glowered at Severo before turning on his heel and stomping out of Severo's presence, waving aside the door guards with a curt gesture. Severo stared after the Hillsfarian lord. Corellan, grant me patience, he whispered into the night. Chapter 11 Twelve Kythorn, the Year of Lightning Storms Windsinger dropped anchor in the round bay of Velprintalar, surrounded by the steep green hillsides and graceful, airy buildings of the city. A raven could see the elven influences in the city's flower-covered verandas, tree-shaded boulevards, and elegant palaces high above the bay. High up on the slopes above the city's center stood the Palace of the Symbol, the ruler of Aglarond, a rambling structure of beautiful green stone that gleamed like emerald in the sunshine. Is this truly a human city? Ilsevile wondered aloud. She stood beside him at the ship's rail. Smiling, her eyes were warm when she looked at him, but there was a distance hiding in her thoughts, a searching quality to her gaze that he could not miss. I didn't know humans could be so elven in their work. Aglarond is the union of two lands under one crown, a raven answered, glad of an opportunity to speak without addressing the anxiety he knew was growing in his own heart. Centuries ago, the young human kingdom of Velprin settled the northern coasts of the Aglarondan Peninsula, while a race of forest-dwelling humans, half-elves, and wood-elves held the woodlands of the interior. Velprin tried to bring the whole of the peninsula under its rule, but the forest folk defeated Velprin's ambitious rulers. The lords of the forest folk governed both of the forests and the coastlands from that day forward. My homeland has a similar history, but a more tragic outcome, Donner Kurth said. A raven glanced at him in surprise. Their new companion had proved more than a little taciturn, a fellow who rarely used two words when one would do. In Tethir, elves and humans fought for centuries. Elves still roam the deeps of the Wealdoth, or so I am told, but they have nothing to do with the human lands beyond their forests, and humans do not venture very far into their woods. He dropped his gaze from a raven at Ilsevile. I am sorry to say that I have known very few elves, and I believe things that were said about your kind that I have since learned are not true. Ilsevile reached out and set her slender hand atop the Lathandarians. I have spent most of my years on Evermeet, Donner, and I have known very few humans. I, too, am learning that not all that I have heard is true. Maressa laced up her crimson-dyed leather armor and adjusted her sword belt. I thought you said you hadn't been here before, Raven, she said. You seem to know a lot about this place for a stranger. I haven't but I've had a long time to pick up odds and ends about a lot of places I haven't been. A raven picked up his pack and quickly checked to make sure he had everything he needed. Come, let's go ashore. The four travelers thanked Master Ilthor for their passage and paid him handsomely. Then they were rowed ashore in Windsinger's longboat. They landed along the city's stone quay and climbed up the seawall steps to the harborside streets. For all Velprintalar's elven grace, the dock district seemed human enough, filled with carts and longshoremen, and dozens of workshops, warehouses, and merchants' offices, all crowded together in buildings faced with white stone. Well, where now? asked Maressa. We'll find a place to stay, then we'll ask after sages, colleagues, wizards' guilds, and such things, a raven said. Someone will have an idea of who I can ask about star elves and ancient Yui Reshenyar. They found a comfortable but expansive inn within an hour of landing, a fine establishment called the Greenhaven, high up on one of the hillsides overlooking the harbor. A raven asked the proprietor about sages or libraries he could visit, and the inn's proprietor directed him to several locales where he might confer with learned folk. With his companions in tow, a raven spent much of the next two days visiting Felprintilar's houses of learning. He visited the temple of Agma and spoke with the high lore masters there. He conferred with a local wizard held in high regard by the Agma knights. 
and he also found a small chapel dedicated to the Seldarine, where he and Ilsevile were able to speak at length with the presiding priest. Several times a raven confirmed that the ancient realm of Yui Reshenyar had indeed stood within the Yuir wood, and that some at least of its ruins might still be found there, but no one knew anything about star elves or a mage named Morthal who had lived long ago in that realm. At the end of their second day, a raven returned to the Greenhaven, resigning himself to a long and arduous effort to unearth the knowledge he sought. He suspected that some at least of his inquiries had simply been evaded, and he was wondering how he could proceed if that turned out to be the case. But as he and his companions ate a light supper on the Greenhaven's veranda, drinking watered wine and watching the shadows lengthen over the city, a dark-haired, deeply tanned half-elf dressed in an elegantly embroidered doublet appeared at their table, flanked by a pair of human guardsmen who wore the green and white tabards of the symbol's guard over coats of mail. A raven Tesher and company, he asked pleasantly. A raven sensed his companions exchanging puzzled looks behind him, but he stood slowly and nodded to the fellow. I am a raven Tesher, he said. To whom am I speaking? I am Joran Kel Harthan. I serve the symbol. Harthan's manner remained easy, but a raven did not miss the keen alertness in his eyes, nor the businesslike demeanor of the two guards who accompanied him. A long sword was sheathed at the half elf's hip, and a long dagger was tucked into his left boot. You have been inquiring after things that few people ask about, Master Tesher. We would like to know more about the nature of your interests. Would you kindly accompany me to the symbol's palace? Careful, a raven, Marissa whispered under her breath. I don't like the looks of this. I assure you, I mean no harm to Aglarond or anyone in it, a raven told the half-elf. If we did not believe that to be true, Master Tesher, our invitation would leave you little opportunity to decline, Joran Kelharthen said. He bowed and gestured toward the door. You may find answers in the palace that you will not be given outside it. If you please? A raven could see the alarm in Marissa's face. From what he knew of her, she had reason to be suspicious of city guards and officials of the court. Ilsevile, on the other hand, was herself an officer of the Queen's Guard in Luthilspar. She glanced up at the half-elf and asked, May we accompany a raven? The symbol servant considered for a moment, then said, very well. They rose and followed Harthan to an open carriage waiting outside the inn. A raven had half feared a sealed coach that would double as a cell in a pinch. They climbed in. The half elf sat opposite a raven, with Donner beside him, while the guards stepped up on the running boards and clattered off through the winding, dusk dim streets. In a few minutes they rolled into a small courtyard below one of the palace's green stone towers, and followed the half-elf past more guardsmen into the tower. The palace of Aglaron's queen was not so large or ethereally beautiful as Amlerul's in Luthulspar, but it was easily the grandest and most elegant building a raven had ever set foot in outside of Evermeet itself. Despite his two and a half centuries and familiarity with the uses and exercises of power, he could not entirely quell the uneasy awe that settled over him. Marissa was positively petrified, marching stiffly as if she expected to be arrested on the spot, while Donner Kurth lapsed into a silence so deep and sullen that a raven feared he might try to fight his way out of the place, given the least provocation to do so. Ilsevile, though, she strode along confidently, her chin high, her eyes straight ahead, refusing to be intimidated by the setting. She was the daughter of a lord of Evermeet, after all, and she had been born to palaces. Joran Kelharthen led them to a comfortable hall with a great fireplace and a large banquet table. He spoke a quiet word to the guards walking with them, and the two warriors withdrew to flank the door. There's wine on the table, the half-elf said. Help yourselves if you like. Well, if we are being arrested... It's starting well enough, Marissa muttered. She went over and poured herself a goblet. Are we under arrest? Donner Kurth asked the half-elf. Most likely you are not, Don Master. We will see soon. Harthen leaned against a credenza and spoke no more. They all waited anxiously for a short time, 
but just as a raven was about to question the Aglarondon again, the door at the far end of the hall opened, and a regal woman swept into the room. She was tall and dark-haired, with striking green eyes as bright and keen as a serpent's. She wore a gown of deep green, and a raven noticed at once that she was quite skilled in the art, girded with subtle spells and enchantments he would be hard-pressed to match. Greetings, she said in a cool voice. I am Theodara, apprentice to the symbol. I am currently serving as regent in her stead. Now do not be alarmed, but I am going to cast a spell. Be still. With no more warning, the enchantress skillfully cast a powerful divination that a raven recognized, a spell that would give her the ability to reveal false things and unearth magical deceptions. Feldara studied a raven and each of his companions for a long moment, taking their measure, and she allowed the spell to fade away. Forgive me for that. We have learned that we must be careful of strangers. The Zolkirs of Thay have tried to slip assassins in magical guise into the palace before. What is all this about, Lady Feldara? a raven asked. If we have given offense to you or your people in the last two days, we sincerely apologize. It has come to my attention that you have been making inquiries throughout the city about Yui Reshenyar and Star Elves. I would like to know why you are interested in such things. A raven studied the symbol's apprentice for a moment, considering his answer. He could see no reason not to be reasonably forthright with the Aglarondans. They did not need to know about the Selukira embedded over his heart, but it certainly would not hurt for more people to know of the threat posed by Sarya de Lodrigeth and her fairy legion. An old enemy of the people returned to Faerun this year, Lady Feldara, he began. They are known as House de Lardrigeth, or the Daemon Fae, a family of sun-elves tainted by demonic blood. Long ago they were driven out of Cormanthir in the early days of that realm. Later they and their followers caused the Seven Citadel's War between Saluvanid, Sharvan, and Ierlan. They were imprisoned for thousands of years by high magic, but they have escaped. The Daemon Fae raided Evermead itself and launched a war against the High Forest and Everesca. We heard of war in the High Forest, Lady Feldara said. But what does this have to do with Aglarond, Master Tesher? Ilsevele's father, Lord Severo Miratar of Elian, gathered a host in Evermeet to battle the Daemon Fae. His army drove the Daemon Fae out of Mythglorok, but they fled to Mythdranor and began to fortify the ruins of that city as their new stronghold. More importantly, Sarya de Lardrigeth, the queen of the Daemon Fae, has learned how to manipulate the wards and powers of Mythals, so she has surrounded Mythdranor in magical defenses of great power. Lord Miratar's army followed the Daemon Fae to Cormanthir, but I fear that they will be unable to defeat Sarya unless we find a way to contest her control of Mythdranor's Mythal. And you think that this can be found in Aglarond? I hope that what I seek exists in Aglarond, said a raven. We have come to believe that the key to unlocking the high magic secrets Sarya de Lardrigeth now wields might lie somewhere in your realm. Specifically, we know that a great mage of early Cormanthir carried away many de Lardrigeth spellbooks when the coronal and the court mages first drove the de Lardrigeths out of that realm. That mage was a star elf named Morthil. We are attempting to trace his footsteps. Feldara said nothing, but her eyes flicked to Joran Kelharthen. The half-elf straightened and said, So you came to Aglarond in search of star-elves? We were unfamiliar with that kindred of the people, but in researching the question, we learned that their realm was known as Yui Reshenyar, and that it stood in the Yuir wood long ago. How long ago did this mortho leave Cormanthir? Theodara asked. Five thousand years, give or take, a raven said. Five thousand years, Jorn Kelharthen said, his voice incredulous. You can't seriously expect that any spellbooks have survived that long. It is an immense span of time, I know, but time means less to elves than it does to humans. 
I do not hope to find the original spell books, but I hope to find more durable records, such as Telkira stones, or mages who have studied a tradition that is founded on this missing lore, without even knowing where it once came from, or possibly even books that were copied from copies made from the original tomes. A raven spread his hands helplessly. I admit that I have little prospect for success, but there is no telling what horrors Sarya de Lardrigeth will inflict on the lands around Mithdranor if we do not find a way to stop her. Elsevile addressed the symbol's apprentice. Do the Star Elves still exist? Can they be found in Aglarond? Feldara turned away without answering. She paced over to a row of elegantly arched windows, gazing out over the glimmering lamps and lanterns that were coming to life all over the city below, sparkling like a sea of fireflies. I wish the symbol were here, she remarked. She would be a better judge of this than I. But she has left the realm in my hands for better than a month now, and I do not know when she will return. I suppose I must decide as best I can. She looked back to a raven and his companions. It seems that your need is pressing, so I will share a secret that few know, and trust that two of the Artel Quesser and anyone they trust enough to call friend know the value of keeping secrets. Yes, the Star Elves exist, but they are not exactly in Aglarond. Great, Maressa sighed. I suppose we'll have to sail off to Kara Tor or Salune itself to find them, right? You won't find them in any other land either, Jorn Kelharthen said. Donner Kurth frowned. Are they ghosts then? Nothing like that, Dawnmaster, Feldara said. Their kingdom lies entirely within the Uirwood, but it is not of this world. You could crisscross the peninsula a hundred times, but you had never set foot in it. Only a few of us outside its borders have been entrusted with Sildur Ewer's secret. The symbol's apprentice looked over to Jordan Kelharthen, who still lounged by the door. But Master Harthen knows the way. He can take you there. The half-elf frowned. The paths to Silde Ewer have grown wild and strange in recent years, Lady Feldara, and the Star Elves might not welcome the Dawnmaster and the Genesi. We will answer for them if need be, Ilsevile said. Maressa has walked in Evermeet and Evereska, and Donner Kurth has sworn by Lathander to accompany us wherever our quest takes us. They will not betray your trust. Theldara nodded. I believe you, Ilsevile Miratar. Jorn shrugged and stepped forward to clasp a raven's hand. I'll meet you at the Greenhaven an hour after sunrise. Be ready for a couple days of walking. The city of Yulash had been a ruin for decades. It sprawled atop a great shield-shaped plateau overlooking the fertile lower vale of the Tesh, with the moon sea a dark shadow in the eastern distance. From its battered walls, a sentry could see the black towers of Zentel Keep a little more than twenty miles to the north, and the white-tipped peaks of the dragon spires a hundred miles past that on a clear day. The mountaintops floated like a distant phalanx of blunt spears in the sky. But Skylua Darkhope ignored the view. She stood, sword in hand, beside her lord and master Fazul, vigilantly watching the ruins around them. The two Zents stood amid the foundations of the ruined tower that had once been the home of Yulash's greatest wizard. That mage was long dead, assassinated in the early years of the fierce civil war that had eventually consumed the city. And his tower had the distinction of being the largest and most prominent structure located between the Zent fortified districts remaining around Yulash's old citadel and the hills Farian held districts located in the vicinity of the city's great eastern gate and the fortifications there. Fazul Chembril, on the other hand, stood near a gap in the wall, gazing northward at the city he ruled, small and distant at the mouth of the Tesh. Half a dozen of the Castellan's guard, the most dedicated and skilled warriors of Zentel Keep stood watch around the clearing, and Skyloa knew that other unseen guardians hovered nearby, cloaked by magic. You may put up your sword, Skyula, the Chosen of Bane said amiably. This is a parley, after all, and we are supposed to show some sign to indicate that we won't fall on our guest the minute he sets foot in the door. This place is dangerous, Skyloa replied. 
I do not like to take chances with your life, my lord. It's neutral ground, Skylua. It's the best we could do. Fazul glanced at his zealous captain, and Skylua submitted, sheathing her blade. The air in the center of the broken tower rippled, and half a dozen figures materialized out of thin air. Malthir, first lord of Hillsfar, his four black-clad swordsmen, and the stocky high warden Hardil Gieras. Skyloa kept her hand on her sword hilt, but took care to remain still, unwilling to provoke a fight without her lord's express permission. Malthir gazed around the ruined tower and snorted. Trying to impress me, Fuzul? he asked. Not at all, the lord of the Zentorum answered. He turned away from broken walls and the view to the north, arms folded confidently across his black breastplate. He studied the first lord, his expression mild enough, even though his eyes glittered with the avid hunger that Skylua knew burned within him. Since I judged that you would be unwilling to come to Zentel Keep, and I found myself unwilling to call on you in Hillsfar, I deemed Avandalithir's tower a good middle ground. Indeed, the first lord said. It does not escape my attention that your army still occupies half of Eulash to deny Hillsfar control of this place. I might say the same thing about your red plumes, Malthir. And I'll add that Eulash lies much closer to my city than it does to yours. Fazul held up his hand to forestall Malthir's retort and continued, Let us agree to disagree about Eulash for the moment. I did not ask you here to discuss this dilapidated ruin, First Lord. I wish to speak to you about Comanthor and the Dale Lands. I am a busy man, Fazul, so make your point quickly. Fazul smiled humorlessly. You are busy these days, Malthir. I have learned that a strong force of your red plumes is even now marching down the Moon Sea Ride towards Missledale and Battledale and your Sembian friends are moving whole armies of mercenaries up Ralph of Ears Road through Tasseldale and Featherdale. I take it you have decided to seize those lands before the elven army in Carmanthor contests your actions? Malthir scowled. I am simply taking steps to defend our commercial interests in these lands, Fazul. I can't have the elves throw humans out of the forest for another thirteen hundred years. I certainly wonder what possible interests you might have in Missledale or Battledale, said Fazul, but I suppose your exact motives are not as important to me as the facts of your military movements. The last time I looked, there weren't any Zentish outposts in these lands, the First Lord said. I do not have to justify myself to you, Fazul. If you intend to build yourself an empire in the Dale Lands, you certainly do. Fazul said. Why should I stand aside and let you seize for yourself a prize that I have long desired? Do you think you can take those lands from me? Malthir demanded. Whether I can or I can't, I am fairly certain that I can make sure you don't get them, Malthir. If I can't have them, you and your friends in Sembia can't either. The Lord of Hillsfar gave Fazul a look so black that Skylua took half a step forward, prepared to draw her blade in Fazul's defense. But Malthir controlled his anger with a visible effort. The Dales are incidental to my first purpose, Fazul. I intend to drive the elven army out of Cormanthor. Neither you nor I will benefit from the return of elven power to the forest. The Lord of Zentel Keep nodded. On that point I do not disagree. Do you really believe you have the strength to beat an elven army in Cormanthor? I have acquired some useful allies lately, Malthir shrugged. They have a long and bitter quarrel with the elves. Fazul measured the first lord, then he grinned fiercely. Why, you have struck a deal with those fiendish sorcerers who have appeared in Mithdranor. That is why you think you can risk a battle against the elves? And you, if need be, Malthir said. Do not threaten the Chosen of Bane, Skylua snapped, stepping closer to Malthir. The pale, silent swordsmen who stood beside the First Lord fixed their cold gazes on her, hands dropping to sword hilts at once. 
Enough, Skylua, Fazul said. I must consider this. As I said, Fazul, I do not need your approval to act in Hillsfar's best interests. Malthir sketched a small bow, and without any other cue or command, his swordsmen gathered close around him. I agreed to a parley because you have never troubled me with such a request before. Do not expect me to come at your beck and call in the future. A moment, Malthir, the high priest of Bane said. Fazul raised a hand, palm outward. If Hillsfar and Sembia insist on fighting Evermeet's army to seize Cormanthor and the Dales, then I will have no choice but to make sure you fail. If I must choose Hillsfar or an elf coronal to be master of the Dales, I will choose the elves. The First Lord glared at Fazul. Then I suppose it is a good thing that I have not put the choice in your hands, he grated. If that is all. Fazul swept an arm at the ruins around them and said, Consider these ruins, Malthir. Is the lesson of this place lost on you? Two factions vying for rule over this city accomplished nothing but their own destruction, and neither side won. Make your point swiftly if you have one. I will not let you have Comanthor and the Dales to yourself. But I am willing to collaborate with you and your new-found friends in return for a share of the prize. Fazul stepped forward and allowed ambition to creep into his voice. For thirty years we've been waiting to carve up the Dales, but no one has made a move because of the threat posed by the other powers. Now Cormir's attention has been drawn westward by the Shadowvar of Anorak, and you have reached an understanding with Sembia. The two of us are now in the position to apportion these lands as we see fit, are we not? Perhaps, the First Lord admitted. Your proposal? You take the eastern dales, I'll take the western, and Sembia can have the southern dales. The great human powers of this land acting in concert present a threat that the elf army cannot hope to overcome. None of us gets all of what we want because the others would not stand for it. But we could all wind up with significant gains, and more importantly, we'd send the elves back to Evermeet empty-handed. Malthir hesitated, studying Fazul. Even if events fall out as you suggest, I think we will have a difficult time in sharing the Dales. That is a problem for some other day. The Chosen of Bane grinned again, his red mustache framing a predatory smile. But that is a problem for the two of us to decide between us. We do not need any elven armies to complicate the question. The First Lord nodded slowly and said, Very well. I must confer with my allies, Fazul. But in principle I agree to what you suggest. If you wish to help in our campaign, you should plan on marching against Shadowdale and Daggerdale as soon as possible. Your armies on the western flank of the Dales will draw crucial strength away from the center, where the decisive blow must fall. Excellent. High Captain Darkhope and her army can march within a day's warning. I am eager to know more about your plan for the campaign, and what Zentel Keep can do to help. Fazul motioned to the guards who stood nearby, and two of the soldiers brought up a folding camp table and a couple of large chairs. Now, why don't we see if we can agree on which dales clearly fall in whose sphere of influence, and how we can bring them under civilized rule? As promised, Joran Kelharthen met a raven and his friends at the Greenhaven an hour after sunup. The half-elf had replaced his well-tailored tunic with leather armor studded with copper rivets and a long gray-green cloak he wore thrown over his shoulder. He had his long, dark hair tied back in a simple ponytail, and he carried a curved bow and a quiver full of green-feathered arrows on his back. Joran took one glance at a raven and his friends, arrayed by the inn's courtyard, and nodded. "'I see you're no stranger to travel,' he observed. "'Good.' The Ewer wood can be difficult. The half-elf looked over to Donner Kurth and frowned. The Lathandarian wore his mail shirt over his thick arming coat, keeping his heavier plate armor on a pack horse. 
Are you sure you want to wear all that iron? Joran asked. You'll be swimming in sweat within an hour. Once we enter the forest, you won't have the sea breeze to cool you off. The Lathandarian shrugged. I grew up in Tethyr, he said. I'm accustomed to wearing armor in warm weather. Suit yourself, Joran said. We may have to set free your pack horse before we cross to Silda Uir, he thought. Do you want to leave the rest of your army here? If I have to, I'll wear it, Donner said. A raven opened his own tunic another hand's ban, thankful that the male shirt he wore was made of elf-wrought mithril, so light and fine that he hardly noticed its weight or its warmth. In bright sunlight it sometimes grew hot, but he did not expect much of that within the Yerowood's bounds. Ilsevele's armor was somewhat heavier than his, since she wore a more complete suit, but it was also made of elven mail, and she was more accustomed to the weight of her armor than he was to his. They followed the coastal road south and west out of Velprintalar, marching for an hour before they reached the River Vel. There they turned aside onto a dusty cart track that followed the river south toward its headwaters in the forest beyond. In a long, hard day of marching, they reached the small town of Hallandos, hard under the eaves of the Eurwood, and stayed the night in a comfortable roadside inn. In the morning they resumed their march, but Joran soon led them away from the Vel turning eastward on a narrow footpath that soon vanished into the warm green gloom of the Ewer wood. It was hot and still in the great forest, and a raven was surprised to find that the undergrowth was exceedingly dense and difficult. It embarrassed him to admit it, but he would quickly have become lost without a track to follow or Joran Kelharthen as a guide. For all its difficulty, the forest possessed a green and wild beauty. Colorful birds soared and chattered in the higher branches and from time to time the trail wandered into sun-dappled clearings free of the thickets and underbrush, or stone-bounded forest pools of cool, inviting water. The old forests of the north that a raven knew were distant, in some ways reserved, majestic but deeply asleep. The Ewerwood slumber was not deep at all, and a raven could feel its watchfulness, its wild wariness, lurking as close as the brambles that scratched their faces and the vines that seemed eager to trap their footsteps. This forest is restless, Ilsevele said as they rested beside a forest pool, eating their midday meal. I do not think I have ever walked in a forest so wakeful. There are parts that are even more wild, Joran said. Many of my people live within the forest, but even those of us with elf blood avoid the truly wakeful places and I think things have been growing worse over the last few years. Worse? How so? asked a raven. There have always been fierce beasts in the wood, things like bar guests and grey renders, edder caps and sword spiders, even a few bands of gnolls in the eastern parts, but the unnatural creatures have been growing more prevalent and bloodthirsty. Joran gazed off into the woods, frowning. I would give much to know what dark power is stirring in these woods. Maybe the Star Elves know something, Maressa remarked. Joran shrugged. I suppose it's possible, he said, but they do not walk in the same forest that we do. It might be different for them. They don't walk in the same forest? What does that mean? the Genesi asked. Are they here or not? They're here all right. I can't easily explain it, but you'll see for yourself soon enough, Joran said. He stood up, brushing off his hands and looked up at the forest canopy overhead. We should keep moving. I want to get a few more miles behind us before it gets dark. We're going to find ourselves in some of the more perilous parts of the forest before we reach Silda Uir. Chapter 12 16 Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms Company after company of Sembian soldiers marched over the Black Feather Bridge. A disorderly river of steel-clad warriors, horses, and creaking wagons that stretched for miles over Ralthavir's road. The day was warm and heavy, drowsy under the morning sun. The summer was still young, and though the days were long and bright, the air held only a dim promise of the stifling heat and great thunderstorms that would come to the southern dales in a few ten days. Sawyer de Lardrigeth stood by the shaded porch of a large stone inn on the bridge's northern end with a small band of her fairy beside her, Teryani Ialoeth, one of her closer relations among the fairy houses, 
and four more fairy who served Tyriani as guards, spies, or messengers. Sawyer wore her guise as the human lady Senda, while the fairy had all likewise assumed human appearance. Borstog Duncastle certainly had half an idea of Sawyer's true nature, but none of the other Symbians did. The Daemon Fay Queen deemed it best to let them continue in ignorance. Tyriani Ialoeth watched the marching soldiers with studied disinterest. She was short and slender, with a dark-eyed, heart-shaped face of exceptional beauty. One of the first spies Sarya had sent out into the human lands surrounding Cormanthor, Tyriani's task had been to insinuate herself into the councils of those Sembian lords who were most concerned with Cormanthor and the Dale Lands. Unlike other fairy, who saw no reason to hide their heritage behind shape-changing tricks unless they had to, Tyriani delighted in deceit as an end in and of itself. More than a few of the human soldiers passing by the inn-yard leered at her or offered various lewd suggestions, which she simply ignored with a cold, scornful smile. "'Are these really worth the trouble, my lady?' Teriani asked Sarya. Her voice was girlish and sweet. "'They are,' Sarya said. "'Remember, Teriani, I could hardly care less whether the army of Evermeet scatters them in an hour of fighting.' The important thing is to set Sembia against Evermeet. If Miratar's host butchers this army like bleeding sheep, we will have our Sembian friends gather more swords and throw them at Miratar. Evermeet's soldiers are precious, and I have no shortage of Sembians, do I? She paused and added, In fact, it might not be bad if these companies blundered into an utter disaster in Cormanthor. Sembia is too strong for my liking, and I'd like to see it bled dry in these little fly-speck lands they call the Dales. I will see what I can do, Teriani promised, and she returned her attention to the human soldiers marching past. The Sembian army wasn't Sembian at all, really. Companies of Chondathan crossbowmen, Chesenton swordsmen, and Tethyrian cavalrymen in half-plate armor made up most of the army's fighting power. All had been hired by a league of Sembian noble houses with interests in the Dales and the Moonsea trade routes, headed up by House Duncastle. In fact, some of the mercenaries had been in the employ of Duncastle for years, engaged in such tasks as the occupation of Scardale and the protection of House Duncastle's Moonsea caravans. Others had been quickly hired under the authorization of Sembia's great council of merchant lords, ostensibly for the purposes of restoring good order and protecting Sembian investments in the Dale Lands. Native-born Sembians themselves were not very common among Duncastle's soldiers, but then again, Sembia didn't really have an army. Instead, the largest and most powerful of the land's various noble merchant houses each fielded their own private army, some numbering many hundreds in strength. Any Sembian city or town had a small civic guard and a town watch, of course, and the overmaster of Sembia, the elected leader of Sembia's great council, commanded the loyalty of the Ordulan Guard, a small but well-equipped army that defended the capital and served to check any unreasonable ambitions on the part of the more powerful noble houses. But by and large, any Sembian lord was free to raise and provision an army, if he saw the need for one. The troops of House Duncastle were the largest Sembian contingent in the whole army, and they made up no more than five hundred of an army whose strength was more than ten times that number. Mercenaries, Sawyer de Lardrigeth murmured, not bothering to conceal her disdain. She glanced over at the shade of a nearby oak, where Lord Duncastle stood beneath the broad branches, consulting with the chief captains of his army. The merchant prince Borstog Duncastle finished with his captains, and sauntered over to watch the army pass by with her and Teriani. Sawya wrinkled her nose, unable to ignore the stink of his human blood so close to her. But with an iron effort of will she smoothed her face. Like it or not, humans were allies she needed to entice and persuade. In her war against the high forest and Everesca, she had been able to simply intimidate and browbeat the wild orcs and ogres of the Nether Mountains into marching at her command. But humans required more subtlety. Until she managed to bring them to blows with Miratar's army, she needed to consider her words and actions carefully. Long ago, in ancient Saluvanid, she had learned how to whisper a word in one ear, begin a rumor somewhere else, plot a skillful murder in another place, 
bringing one elven house after another into her growing web of influence. Her work among the human powers of Cormanthor was not very different, really, except in this case she regarded her tools as eminently disposable. Duncastle glanced at her, let his gaze linger on Tyriani's slender form for a moment, and looked back to Saria. "'Good afternoon, Lady Senda,' he said in his deep voice. "'You will be pleased to know that I have come to value Lady Tyrion's counsel quite highly in the last few ten days, especially in martial matters. For such a delicate creature, she has a mind of steel.' Saria forced a smile to her face. She enjoys my full confidence, Lord Duncastle, and I in turn am pleased by Tarion's reports of your army's progress. I did not expect you to assemble such a large force in so little time. As they say, my lady, he who hesitates is lost. He looked at Tariani again, and his eyes glittered. While I am personally delighted by Lady Tarion's company— I must say I am concerned that an army marching into battle is no place for a young lady of such high breeding. Are you certain that you wish her to accompany our army on this campaign? I am confident that you can look after me, Lord Duncastle, Tyrion said, inclining her head to the Sembian lord. And I have my guards as well. I will be safe, I think. Sarya couldn't help but smile at Tyriani's winsome manner. In truth, the Ialoweth noblewoman was a deadly swordmaster, skilled in the arts of stealth, subterfuge, and poisoning. Even if Duncastle was half the swordsman he might once have been, she wouldn't have been surprised if Tyriani Ialoweth could have carved him like a trussed pig in any kind of swordplay, or more likely, killed him in any of a dozen other ways that the human lord never would see coming. She decided to change the subject before Tyriani carried on her coquettish little act any further. You need to increase your pace, Lord Duncastle. Events are moving quickly in Battledale and Mistledale. I would not want you to miss out. Do not fear, Lady Senda, the Sembian lord said with a broad smile. We've already got five full squadrons of cavalry in Assembra. We won't miss our date in Mistledale. The sooner your whole army reaches Assembra, the better, Sarya answered. We have to halt Miratar's host and draw them into a fight in open ground. You are in a race, Lord Duncastle. In Assembra, the Sembian force would threaten Miratar's right flank. If the elven army continued north from Mistledale's borders toward Mithdranor, Duncastle's Sembians could move west on the Assambra Ashabinford Trail and cut Miratar off from his base in Sembraholm, as well as any aid from his human allies in Mistledale and Deepingdale. In fact, Sembia's army would be ideally positioned to crush those allies if Miratar chose not to meet Duncastle's threat. Meanwhile, the Red Plume army from Hillsfar descending the Moon Sea Ride could come in to block him from a move to the north, and Fazul Chembrel's Zentish army was sweeping far to the west, marching from Voonlar toward Shadowdale to seal the western side of the trap as Duncastle's Sembians sealed the eastern side. Sawyer had been absolutely enraged to find that the first lord of Hillsfar had presumed to allow yet another petty human tyrant to ally with him, but she had made herself wait one full day before attacking the first lord's tower with a hundred devils and fiends and a thousand fairy. After considering exactly how to raise Malthir's tower and execute the first lord of Hillsfar in an appropriately gruesome manner, a few hours for thought had helped her to see that Fazul Chembrel's grandiose ambitions and Malthir's underhanded dealings played perfectly into her hands. Malthir is too clever for his own good, she reflected. Either he is foolish enough to think that dealing with another power proves that he is not beholden to me, or he thinks himself prudent in providing himself with an ally whom he might turn against me if we should have a falling out. The question, of course, is who will betray whom first. Sawyer was an old and practiced hand at that particular game. "'Bane's brazen throne!' Borstog Duncastle muttered, disturbing her from her ruminations. "'What is he doing here?' Sawyer followed the direction of the Sembian lord's glance, and spotted a small party of well-appointed horsemen riding over the bridge alongside the columns of Duncastle soldiers. The man at the head of the company was a handsome lord with hair of close-cut black ringlets, attired in a fine doublet of dove-gray, 
under which mail glinted. A score of armored riders followed him, all wearing surcoats or doublets that featured at least a splash of the same dove gray. Who is this? she asked, intrigued by Lord Duncastle's reaction. Miklo Selkirk and his accursed silver ravens, Duncastle growled. He is the overmaster's son, and his chief agent and defender in any enterprise that catches his eye. He looked at Sarya and scowled. He'll be here to spy on our every move and carry tales back to his father. Mark my words. Does this overmaster have the power to recall your soldiers, Duncastle? Sarya asked with icy calm. He can certainly call my actions into question, and perhaps persuade the Great Council to issue such an order. Then I suggest you avoid giving this Selkirk offense. Sarya folded her arms and watched the riders in gray approach. Miklo Selkirk and his company passed abreast of the inn. The overmaster's son caught sight of Borstog Duncastle and turned his horse aside. He dismounted with easy grace and handed his reins to one of his silver ravens. Ah, there you are, Duncastle, he called. I've been riding all up and down this column looking for you. Selkirk, Duncastle said. He made a shallow bow, never taking his eyes from the younger lord's face. I was not expecting you, or else I would have left word that you were to be brought up to me. No matter. The ride gave me a good opportunity to size up your army. Miklo Selkirk turned to Sarya and Turyani, and he offered a deep flourish and bow. I am afraid I have not had the pleasure, dear ladies. I am Miklo Selkirk, of the House Selkirk. Lady Senda Dareth, Sarya answered. This is my lady-in-waiting, Tarion. Sarya offered her hand, and despite her deep-rooted loathing of humans in all their works, she had to admit that Miklo Selkirk was a handsome fellow, gifted with almost every elven grace and self-possession. She looked into his eyes and saw nothing but keen steel there. He is a worthy adversary, Sarya thought. She would have to amend Teriani's instructions if Selkirk was going to be near the head of the Sembian army for any time at all. A pleasure to meet you, Lady Senda, the human said. A flicker of interest crossed his face, a moment's glance as Selkirk fixed her face in his mind, perhaps, and reminded himself to find out more about her later. Then he looked back to Lord Duncastle. My father asked me to accompany you for a while, Lord Duncastle, he said. As you know, the council has expanded no small sum in adding to the forces at your command, and they want to make sure that their investment is in good hands. Selkirk glanced toward the south and shrugged as if to imply that he thought it was all nonsense, but Sawyer did not mistake the sharp calculation in his eyes. The expedition is entirely in your hands, I assure you. My only function is to ensure that accurate and timely reports reach Ordulin. Duncastle's scowl deepened, but he held his temper in check. Very well, he rumbled. You are, of course, welcome to observe as long as you feel necessary, Selkirk. Good said the younger noble. I knew you would be reasonable about this, Duncastle. Now, if I may be so bold, might I ask you to explain your plan of march? I see thousands of Sembian soldiers invading the Dale lands, and I find that I am not at all sure I understand why. Duncastle fumed, thunder gathering on his brow, but Sarya intervened. The plan, Lord Selkirk, is to bring three armies against one, and demonstrate to Several Miratar and the rest of Evermeet's army that the days of elves dictating terms to human kingdoms are over. Now, do you have the steel for the game or not? Miklo Selkirk's easy manner froze on his face. He looked back to Sarya and studied her more closely. You are playing with dangerous powers, Lady Senda, he said in a more serious voice. I don't pretend to know what sort of old elven spells might still be sleeping in Cormanther, or what the heroes who defend the Dale Lands might do about a concerted threat such as that we're offering them now, and so I fear the remedying of my ignorance. But yes, I agree that the stakes are... enticing. I do not know what to tell you about any heroes defending these lands, Sarya said, but I can tell you this, Miklo Selkirk. I wield Comanthor's magic, and as long as Sembia's army is moving against my enemies, you need have no fear of old elven spells. 
Joran Kelharthen's prediction proved uncannily accurate. A raven and his comrades passed a cold and rainy night in the ruins of an old elven tower buried deep in the forest, and when they pressed forward from the place in the morning, the drizzle followed them, soaking the party in a dripping fog that quickly became a bright, steaming bath when the sun burned through the clouds overhead. The normal sounds of the forest died away over the course of the first three miles of walking, replaced with the insistent dripping of water from countless branches and leaves. Soon it seemed they were passing through a world of emerald and silver gray, a silent world that resented their presence. They hiked on in single file, following the Aglarondon along in the narrow trail. A raven fell into the rhythm of the walk, his thoughts drifting. How long will it take Sarya de Lardergeth to detect the approach of Evermeet's army, he wondered. And what will she do when she does? Sawyer might attempt to sabotage the army's march by striking at the portal nexus in the frozen fortress. He frowned, wondering if he should have advised Several and Starbrow to keep the windswept mountaintop guarded against a sudden demonic assault. Or was there some other way for Sawyer to strike at the host of Evermeet? He paused in mid-stride, examining the thought. A raven! Look out! Ilsevile reached forward and jerked out his arm, dragging him back from his reflections. Something crashed through the dense underbrush not more than a dozen yards from where he stood, a hulking gray mass of hairless flesh that grunted and thrashed furiously through the thorn-studded vines, snapping arm-thick saplings in half as it charged toward the small company. A lesser Sadari! Where did that come from? A raven gasped. He quickly backstepped, trying to keep out of the thing's reach while he considered the spells he held ready. It went on two thick legs, with a hunched-over posture and a blunt snout that held row after row of sharp black teeth. A double row of small, yellow eyes dotted the front of its head, and its forelimbs were long, powerful arms that ended in strong, crushing claws. The thing snuffled loudly and roared in bestial rage. No one offered an answer to his question, but beside him Ilsevile's hands blurred as she sent a pair of arrows winging at the monster. The arrow sank into the side of its thick neck, but there was nothing but muscle there. The creature swatted at the arrows like they were insect bites, and bellowed with such anger that the leaves shook overhead. "'It's a gray render!' Joran called from up ahead. The monster had broken onto the trail between the Aglarondon and the rest of the small company. "'Be careful! It can crush an ogre with those arms!' The creature hesitated an instant then turned its back on Joran and thundered up the trail at Elsevile and a raven. The spell archer fired several more times, trying for its eyes, but the front of the beast's head held a mass of bone so dense that her arrows simply glanced away. The creature reared up, drawing back one huge taloned hand to crush Elsevile, and a raven barked out the words of a simple teleport spell and caught hold of the back of her tunic, whisking them both twenty yards aside. The render's claws stripped a foot-wide row of furrows four inches deep through the trunk of a cedar next to the spot Ilsevile had been standing, and the beast screeched in frustration. Ilsevile stumbled, unprepared for the spell, but she looked back at him, eyes wide. Good timing, she managed. Joran Kelharthen sprinted down the trail behind the render and skidded to a halt behind the monster, slashing at its hamstring with his longsword. The render howled again as its leg buckled beneath it, but it whirled with astonishing speed and batted the Aglarondon ranger into the underbrush with a single off-balance swing of one claw. Then Donner Kerth, who had been behind a raven and Ilsevile on the trail, charged the monster from the other side, mail jingling and armor rattling, his face hidden behind his heavy helm. He landed a heavy cut on the back of the monster's shoulder, grunting with the force of his swing. The gray render wheeled drunkenly back toward the Lathandarian and clubbed him with its other arm. Kurth caught the blow on his sturdy shield, but the monster was so strong that it drove him to his knees and began to rain down mighty blows like the pounding of some berserk smith's hammer. Donner's in trouble, Ilsevile snapped. She scrambled to her feet and drew her own longsword, gliding toward the fight with a rapid but balanced advance, ready to dart forward or give ground as she needed. I see it. A raven snatched for the Zelanthar wood wand at his belt and leveled the device at the monster, pausing only long enough to make sure none of his companions were in the way. 
The wand erupted in a hazy blue bolt of sonic disruption, blasting the render's flank with a terrible crack that echoed in the dripping wood. Behind Kurth, Maressa pointed her own wand at the beast over the shoulder of the kneeling human warrior and scorched the monster with a jet of flame that caught it full in the face. The gray render hissed and reared back, raising its head and turning its face away from the searing flame, and Donner uncoiled from beneath his shield and brought his heavy broadsword up under the render's jaw, sinking the point of the weapon deep into the base of its throat. The Lathendarian warrior surged to his feet and wrenched his blade free, ripping open a terrible wound across the render's throat. The render's hissing rage drowned in a horrible gurgle of dark gore. It wheeled around and bolted back down the trail, away from Kurth and Maressa. Blood splattered the leaves and left a crimson trail in the creature's wake. Ilsevile quickly backed away, giving the render plenty of room to flee, while Joran Kelharthen, who had been circling back in to attack again from behind the monster, literally threw himself into a dense briar bush to avoid being trampled. The creature went thrashing its way down the trail, burbling its misery, and vanished into the gloom of the forest. Donner Kurth climbed to his feet and watched the monster flee. He shucked his helmet and looked down at his sword, clotted with the render's gore for a full two feet from its point. He stared in amazement as the crashing and pained howls of the monster receded into the distance. It's still running, he muttered. By the morning, Lord, what does it take to kill one of those things? Joran slowly picked himself up and began extricating himself from the briars. Maybe a big dragon could manage it, but other than that, there isn't much in the forest that a gray render fears. It's best to avoid them. Maressa blew out her breath and sheathed her wand at her belt. I'll keep that in mind. Are there a lot of them around here? It seems there have been more of them about in the last year or two, Jorn replied. I used to go two or three years at a time without hearing of anyone running into a render, but I've heard of seven attacks already this year, not counting this one. Is that what you meant when you said that parts of the forest were growing more wild? Osevile asked. In part, yes. Jorn spotted his sword lying under the briars, and with a grimace he knelt and reached his arm through the thorns, groping for the blade. Grey renders aren't natural beasts, really. They're dimly intelligent and foul-tempered beyond belief. They'll tear down cabins and rip up trails on a whim, but then they can be devilishly patient when stalking prey. The Aglarondon reached his blade and pulled it out of the briars, but not without a good armful of scrapes. Are there more grey renders in the forest than before, or are the ones that were always here just growing more aggressive? asked Ilsevile. There are more of them, I'm sure of it, but I certainly wonder where they're coming from. Some infernal plot of Thay, I suppose. Jorn wiped his sword on the mossy trail side and sheathed it. I am sorry that I failed to spot that one before we wandered into its path. I won't let it happen again. Make sure you don't, Maressa said. I don't ever need to see a gray render any closer than that. Donner Kurth tended their injuries, mostly Joran's and his own with a few healing prayers, and they continued on their way. They pressed on through the afternoon, encountering no more gray renders, though on one occasion Joran pointed out troll sign on the trail, and led them on a long, circuitous detour by a stream bed to skirt the trouble if they could. The detour evidently worked, for they saw no trolls and ran across nothing else dangerous. They camped for the night in the high branches of a great shadow top overlooking a swift, cool stream. Some of Joran's folk had built a small, railless platform in the tree's middle branches, a good sixty feet above the forest floor, and a tug on a well-hidden lanyard brought down a rope ladder to reach the lower branches, from where other concealed ladders led up to the hiding place. Kurth's pack horse they had to leave on the ground, but a raven wove a skillful illusion to hide the animal's makeshift corral and keep any forest predators from finding it. The next morning dawned hot still and clear, the forest sweltering in the humidity left by the previous day's rain and mist. They descended from their aerial camp, found the packhorse unmolested, and set off again. But only a couple of hours into the march, the trail broke out into a large, grassy glade in the heart of the forest, a clearing the better part of a hundred yards wide. Bright sunlight flooded the open spot, and the air hummed with darting insects. 
In the center of the clearing stood an old ring of standing stones, each almost ten feet tall, arranged in a lopsided circle. Thick moss mantled the ancient stones, and a raven sensed at once the presence of an old and potent magic in the clearing. What is this place, Joran? he asked. The doorway to Silda Uir, the half elf answered. He led them between the leaning menhirs into the center of the old ring, where a large square block stood like a great altar. This is your last chance to turn aside, all of you. Once I take you through the door, there is no guarantee that you will be permitted to return. The folk of Silda Uir are not cruel, but they do not tolerate intrusion, and they will not permit a stranger to carry their secrets back to the realms of humankind. A raven and Osevele will likely have little trouble, since they are both our Telquesser, but this is a perilous journey for Donner and Maressa. Maressa gazed at the old stones leaning in the sun. Despite the warmth of the day, it was cool and quiet within the circle. I've walked in Evermeet, she said, her manner serious. I think I want to see what's on the other side of this stone ring. Donner Kurth stood holding the reins of his pack horse. He glanced up at the bright sky, shading his dark face with a hand, and nodded once to the half elf. Donner, you don't have to follow us here, a raven said in a low voice. If you go, I'll go, the human rasped. He glanced back at the dense wall of green behind them, then looked back to a raven and flashed a startlingly bright smile. Besides, it's a long, hot walk back from here. Joran indicated the square stone altar in the center of the circle and said, All right, then. Everybody set a hand on the stone and keep it there. Donner, hold your mount's reins in your other hand, there. Now be still a moment. The half-elf hummed a strange tune under his breath, and a raven felt the magic of the place waking, stirring, shaking off its sun-drowsed slumber as cool shadows began to grow within the ring. He looked across the altar stone at Maressa, who stood with her eyes squeezed shut and her teeth bared. She still doesn't trust magic of this sort, he thought with a smile. You would think that she'd become accustomed to it sooner or later. Then strange silver shadows seemed to burst out of the great old stones, whirling and darting all around the company, and the sunny clearing in the Uir wood whirled away into nothingness. Several Miratar stood at the heart of a grove of mighty shadow tops at dusk and prayed earnestly to the Seldarine for guidance, as he had every night at Star Eyes since he had embarked on his great crusade against the foes of the people. He was distantly aware of the ring of vigilant guards who stood nearby, watching in case his enemies tried to strike at him while he walked alone in the forest. But the Knights of the Golden Star respected his communion with Corellon Lerethian and the Seldarine. They waited a short distance out of sight, giving Sivril the silence and privacy to speak to his gods with his whole heart. Here, in the heart of old Cormanthor, Sivril felt the presence of Corellan Lerethian almost as clearly as he did when he stood in Evermeet's sacred groves. But at the same time, doubt darkened his heart. His divinations whispered of disaster and warned him that a narrow way indeed threaded the perils that lay before him. Three days now and the same shadows of danger hover in my auguries, Sivril thought. Our army stands motionless while our enemies move against us, and still Corellan warns me that to march on Mithdranor now courts terrible danger. I cannot remain in Galeth Roost while my enemies encircle me, Corellan, and yet you warn me against marching from this place, Sivril said aloud, speaking up at the silver starlight that glimmered in the treetops far above. I am afraid that I do not see what it is you want me to do. A soft breeze sighed in the high branches, but no answer came to Several. The gods of his people had bestowed many blessings upon the elf race, but they wished for the elves to find their own path through life. While Corellan and the rest of the Seldarine were unsparing in the divine magic they placed in the hands of priests such as Several, they had the habit of keeping their silence even when great matters were at hand, so that elves' hearts and minds might reach their full flowering and growth by striving to set right the griefs of the world and overcome the challenges life offered. To do otherwise would be to diminish the people, to make them something less than they otherwise could be, and that the Seldarine, wise even among gods, or so it was said, would not do. I am reaching the point at which I wouldn't mind a little help, Several said. At his order, 
The crusade had held its position near Galath's roost in the Sanding Stone for several days. Mithdranor lay only forty miles to the north, not far beyond the Vale of Lost Voices, but as long as the auguries against marching onward were so dark and dire, Several hesitated to advance, or to even share with his captains the reason he chose not to march. One more day, he decided. If nothing changes, then I will have to confide in Velsilde and Starbrow, at the very least. With a weary sigh, he bowed before the glimmer of early stars, then shrugged his chasuble from his shoulders and rolled it carefully, slipping it into his tunic. Corellan, if there is something I am supposed to be doing, I hope you will find a way to tell me, he said to the dusk. Then he straightened his shoulders and strode back toward the place where his guards waited. To his surprise, Several found several of his guards hurrying up the path to meet him, led by Starbrow. Several, called the moon elf, I apologize for disturbing your prayers, but Storm Silverhand has returned with news from Shadowdale. She wants to speak with you at once. It is fine, my friend, Several answered. I have just concluded my devotions for the evening anyway. Please, take me to her. He fell in alongside Starbrow as they hurried back to camp. Did she say anything more? Starbrow nodded. She told me that we've got a new enemy to deal with. Is that why you wanted me to wait here, Corellan? Several wondered. To hear what Storm Silverhand has to tell me tonight? There was no answer within his own heart, but Several still felt comforted by the thought, even as he dreaded whatever dire new development had brought Storm back to his encampment with such urgency. Perhaps there is a design at work here after all, he thought. I was meant to be here at this hour, whatever trials await me, and all who follow me from Evermeet as well. Starbrow led him back to the large pavilion that served Several as both headquarters and personal quarters, and held the tent flaps aside as the elf lord strode in. Two guests waited inside. Storm Silverhand of Shadowdale, dressed in gleaming mail and dark leather with her long silver hair bound from her brow by a slender circlet and a tall, stern-looking human lord of middle years with dark silver-streaked hair. "'Ah, there you are,' Storm said. She indicated her companion with a curt nod. "'This is Morngrim Amkothra, the lord of Shadowdale.' "'I am honored to meet you, Lord Miratar,' said the lord of Shadowdale. Morngrim offered his hand to Several, who remembered to take it in a firm clasp. "'And I you, Lord Amkothra,' Several answered. He glanced at Storm. For all her years, she hasn't lost the human habit of haste, he noted. Still, if Storm Silverhand was in a hurry, that was good enough for him. What is it, Lady Silverhand? What has happened? We've got trouble, Storm said. Zentelar are marching on Shadowdale. A strong army out of Zentel Keep started moving south yesterday, making for Voonlar. The companies garrisoning Yulash have joined them, as well as mercenary bands of ogres and orcs from Thar. Storm's anger glittered in her eyes. Better than five thousand soldiers are no more than five days from the Twisted Tower. Elas el Saldari, Severo breathed. His stomach ached with cold dread. Behind him, the Sembian army from the south was pressing up Ralthavir's road and had closed to within twenty miles of his camp, occupying Battledale in the process. Ahead of him, red plume soldiers from Hillsfar descended the Moon Sea Ride, building their strength on the far side of the Vale of Lost Voices. And the Zentarim were moving to close him on the west. Two armies he might hope to avoid through maneuver in the green fastness of Cormanthor, but three? Even his elves' skill and swiftness in woodland marches would not suffice to avoid battle for long. Sawyer de Lardrigeth had a hand in this, I know it, he murmured. Why do they aid her? Don't they understand that if they help the Daemon Fae to repel Evermeet's army, she will destroy them in turn? Malthir and Fazul will turn on each other sooner or later, never you fear, Storm promised. It's in their nature. But that doesn't mean they won't lay waste to half the dales before they're done. Starbrow looked to Morngrim Amkathra and asked, How much strength do you have in Shadowdale, Lord Amkathra? Can you halt the Zents? Three hundred men under arms, plus a thousand stout archers when I call out the militia. And I have no small amount of help from friends of the dales such as Storm here, or those who harp. 
Morngrim sighed and shook his head. But this is the strongest Zentarim army we've seen since the time of troubles, and I don't know if I can stop them. It certainly doesn't help that Sembia and Hillsfar have decided to move at the same time, Storm added. If only one threatened the Dales, the Dales folk would set aside many of their quarrels and band together against the threat. But Harrowdale won't do anything with Malthir's army on the march. The folk of Tasseldale, Battledale, and Featherdale might have mustered against the Sembians given a little help. But Mistledale is sorely pressed by the fiends out of Mithdranor, and Archendale is content to let the rest of the southern dales hang. She shook her head. I'd never realized the extent to which the great powers bordering the Dale lands kept each other in check. But with Cormier so weak now, the old balance of power is gone. The Dale's compact is dead as the stone it's carved on. Starbrow studied Several, his strong arms folded across his chest. Like it or not, Several, we are going to have to bring these human armies to battle, or they will certainly bring us to battle at a time and place of their choosing. They simply aren't giving us any choice. You can't let them bring all three armies, along with whatever fiends and fairy Sarya Deladrigeth can muster, against us at the same time. That is a fight I do not think we can win. I do not want to spend our strength fighting humans instead of Sarya Deladrigeth's daemon fay, the elf lord answered. And I do not want to fight humans at all, unless we absolutely must. Bloodshed between elf and human will stain these lands for centuries. Abandoning the smaller dales to foreign occupation won't win you many friends either, Storm pointed out. I know. Several turned away, staring out into the lantern-lit dusk that lay over the elven camp as he considered his path. He wanted nothing more than to take the forest and simply march directly on Myth Dranor, leaving the Sembians behind him and circling the roadblock Hillsfar had thrown up ahead of him. But he could see at a glance that the Sembian army could turn west and fall on the Mistledale behind him as soon as he marched, and he could not abandon Shadowdale to the Zents. At least the Sembian army had simply marched through Tasseldale, Featherdale, and Battledale without devastating those lands. The Sembians were not so foolish as to provoke the southern Dales folk into full resistance against their army and its vulnerable lines of supply. But he had no such hopes for how the Zentalar would treat Shadowdale if Lord Amkothra's warriors failed to stop them. Storm is right, he realized, refusing to help Dales folk defend their homes against tyrannical powers such as Hillsfar or Zentel Keep is just as bad as refusing to help Dales folk standing against Sarya Delardrigeth and her hellborn marauders. This is the task I shouldered when I called for return to Kermanthor. He sighed and turned back to the others. We cannot remain here and allow our enemies to gather against us while they subjugate the free Dales. If we have to fight, then it is clear that we must attempt to defeat our foes in detail. So which enemy do we confront first? Hillsfar, Sembia, Zentel Keep, or Sawyer de Lardrigeth? If we attack Hillsfar in the Vale of Lost Voices, we'll have to deal with Sembia too, Starbrow said. They'll turn west behind us and cut across our lines of communication, which will bring Mistledale under their fist as well. Several replied, The same is true if we try to avoid Hillsfar's army and march straight against Smith Dranor, except we might be dealing with Sawyer de Lardrigeth too. So we have to turn against Sembia's army in Battledale or Zentel Keep's army in Shadowdale. The people of Battledale will fare better with the Sembians than the folk of Shadowdale will with the Zents, Storm said. There is likely a better chance to negotiate a settlement with the Sembians, too, Morngreem added. Their adventurism might reverse itself if they see that no one else is still in the game. That leaves the Zents, then, Several said. He glanced at Starbrow and smiled crookedly. For what it's worth, I think that a fast march to the west is the last thing our enemies expect. We'll leave Hillsfar and Sembia miles behind us. They'll certainly join forces by the time you can march back, Starbrow warned, and Mistledale will be exposed to attack. We'll leave at least some strength here to help the folk of Mistledale repel any attack. 
As for the combination of our foes, well, maybe turning west will give us an opportunity to bring more of the Dales folk to our banner. Storm nodded slowly. We might be able to talk sense into the swords of Archendale, once they open their eyes and see the danger that Sembians in Battledale poses for their own independence. And we might raise Tasseldale as well. Then it is settled, Several said. He looked back to Morngrim. We will march before sunrise, Lord Amkathra. You can expect Evermeet soldiers at your side in three days' time. Chapter 13 18 Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms The stars of Silda Uir were brilliant and strange, so bright that the shadows beneath the great old trees were silver and luminous. The land beyond the stone circle's mystic gate existed in a perpetual twilight, a magical hour of pale dusk that was cool and perfect. The sky above the tree crowns was a soft pearl gray, as if the sun had set a short time ago and still brightened the world somewhere beyond the horizon. But in Silda Ewer there seemed to be no west or east. In any direction a raven looked, the skies glimmered along the hill crests and forest tops with that same sourceless illumination. But as the eye roamed upward into the sky and approached the zenith, the skies darkened into true night and countless brilliant stars danced in the firmament. He stood motionless for what seemed to be hours, drinking in the eldritch beauty of the place, his companions likewise silent beside him. Joran Kel Harthen simply waited with a small smile on his handsome face, allowing them to sate their wonder. A raven didn't need his mage sight to tell that they stood on another plane, a world that lay beyond the world he knew and yet somehow remained bound to it. The starry realm's forests and hills matched the landscape he remembered from the Ewerwood's sunny glade almost perfectly. The forest was not as dense, taller and more majestic, but they stood in a starlit clearing instead of a sun-warmed one, and the ancient ring of standing stones seemed exactly the same. He looked again at the forest. The trees were tall and silver-trunked with very little undergrowth a great living colonnade that stretched as far as the eye could see. Strange, phosphorescent lichens clung like shelves to the trunks, and a sweet, rich odor hung in the air. The trees reminded a raven of the mighty redwoods of the forest of worms, but how could they grow so tall and perfect with no sunlight? He finally found his voice and glanced at Joran. I never suspected, he managed. It's extraordinary. Not even Evermeet itself compares. How far does this realm extend? Silva Ewer is about the size of Ewerwood, though direction and distance are a little hard to judge here. Joran tilted his head to one side, thinking, Perhaps two or three hundred miles from end to end? End to end? Maressa glanced up at the pearl aura of dusk above the treetops. In the twilight, her pale white skin seemed to shine like the moon. It just stops somewhere? Not really. At the borders the forest grows thicker and thicker, and any track you care to follow, or make for yourself for that matter, simply bends back on itself. There isn't an edge you can fall off. Joran paused and added, I know that it is eldritch and wondrous and beautiful, but I must warn you all. Silda Ewer is not as safe as it looks. Strange monsters wander these forests, creatures that you do not find in the sunlit world. Do not relax your vigilance here. Have you been here often? Il Sevele asked Joran. The Aglarondon shook his head. Only a couple of times, and the last was ten years ago or more. Finding a stone circle that will let you reach this place is hard, because not all circles work all the time. He gazed into the woods, but beneath his bemusement there was wariness in his eyes. Now I understand what was meant by the note on my map. A raven told Il Sevele. Here of old was Eurereshenyar, which is now hidden. The star elves removed their kingdom from the Eurwood to this twilight plain alongside the forest. He turned to Joran. Are they still here? Can you take us to them? Yes, they are still here. But it is a wide land, and not many star elves remain, and I do not know where we are. Joran shrugged, a look of embarrassment on his face. I am afraid I have no better plan than to pick a likely direction and start walking. 
I may be able to help, Donner Kurth said. He handed the reins of his warhorse to Elsevele and drew a golden medallion out of his tunic. He raised Lathander's holy symbol in his powerful hand. The gold gleamed softly in the shadows. Pick a direction, Jorin. The Aglarondon studied the forest for a moment, then indicated a trail that led away from the stone circle into the shadows of the trees. I suppose I'm inclined to head that way first, the guide said. Kurth peered down the path and closed his eyes as he carefully spoke the words of a prayer to Lathander. A raven felt the warm glow of divine magic suffusing the air, and the human opened his eyes and held up his holy symbol. Lord of the dawn, aid me! Will this path lead us to those whom a raven must find, or should we go another way? The members of the company watched as the holy symbol in Kurth's hand grew brighter, warmer, until it seemed almost as if a small sun was caught in the cleric's grasp, throwing out dazzling rays of radiance that lit up the dim forest around them. Then the magic faded, the golden sunburst symbol becoming nothing more than a piece of metal again. Donner shook himself slowly, closed his eyes, and murmured a prayer of thanks. Well, asked Maressa, will it? The Lathendarian nodded and replied, Yes, my divinations indicates that this path will serve. But as Joran warns, we must be careful. We will meet with danger on this road. The small company set off down the broad path into the forest, passing into the eerie gloom beneath the gleaming silver trunks. The cool air was a welcome change after the warmth and humidity of the Yerowood, and the absence of dense undergrowth made for good visibility and long, open views from the trail. At times it was so still and solemn that a raven felt almost as if he was simply lost in some enormous temple, wandering among the works of dreaming gods. At other times they caught sight of the forest's creatures, white owls high in the branches above, silver-gray deer that vanished quickly into the gloom black squirrels that darted along the pale trunks, and once a great gray-furred bear that snuffled and snorted at something that had caught its interest on the forest floor a good eighty yards off the path. A raven soon came to realize that travel within the realm of Silda Ewer would be more than a little deceptive. The opalescent twilight that pervaded the woodland offered no hint as to how long they had traveled. It might have been an hour, or it might have been four, Gradually he noticed that the day, such as it was, had darkened somewhat, so that the purple velvet of the sky overhead had deepened into pure inky darkness, and in time a soft rain began to fall, so fine and thin that he did not even bother to draw up his hood. After a long spell of marching, they came to a moss-grown bridge of stone that spanned a gloom-filled ravine through which swift white water rushed forty feet below. "'That's a good sign,' Elsevele remarked. Someone built this bridge. I was beginning to wonder if this whole place was empty. We've been walking for quite a while, a raven said, and we began our day with a march in the Ewer Wood. Maybe we should find a place to rest and make camp for the night. The night? Maressa asked. Such as it is, a raven said. We'll halt a few hours, long enough for you and the others to get a good sleep. Elsevele and I can keep watch. We need less rest than you. I won't say no, the Genesi said. They walked a short distance past the bridge before they found a good clearing away from the path. Joran built a small fire in order to prepare a hot meal from their stores, and Donner unloaded his pack horse and brushed it down, while a raven took a few minutes to weave some magical wards around their campsite, spells of concealment and protection. So far they had seen nothing dangerous in Silda Ewer's forests but he remembered Joran's warning and decided to take no chances. While Donner, Maressa, and Joran slept the deep and helpless sleep that a raven had always both envied and pitied in his non-elf friends, the two sun-elves sat and talked softly in elvish or simply waited together in the comfort of each other's company, leaning back to back against a young tree so that they could watch all around the small camp. After a long silence in which a raven had actually started to slip into reverie, Ilsevele reached back to set her hand on his. "'I am glad I came here, a raven,' she said. "'Regardless of what comes next, I do not regret the circumstances that brought me to Silda Ewer, even for a day.' "'Nor do I,' he agreed. He started to say more, but then Ilsevele squeezed his hand twice, hard and quick. 
A raven froze, peering into the shadows under the trees. On your left, sixty yards, Ilsevile whispered. It will be almost behind you. Move slowly. What is it? He whispered back, slowly turning his head and letting his eyes slide farther and farther over his left shoulder. I don't know. Carefully, a raven allowed himself to lean just a little, getting a better look behind him. Then he saw what Ilsevile had spotted. It was worm-like in shape, with a dark, glistening hide of blue-black skin, but smaller tendrils or limbs branched from its body. It slithered through the forest, passing along the path they had been following, moving with a rolling corkscrew gait that brought different limbs to the ground at different times. Three golden orbs projected from its blunt, bulbous head, if it was a head. Behind the monster came a pair of hulking, snake-like monstrosities, pale worms whose beaked maws were surrounded by four strong, barbed tentacles. A raven couldn't say what gave him the impression, given the startling alienness of all three creatures, but something in the motions of the corkscrew monster suggested purpose and intelligence. What do we do? Ilsevile asked. Let's see if it will pass by. I'll watch, and you be ready to rouse the others. The creature's progress had brought them from Ilsevile's side over to a raven's, and he had a good view of all three. Carefully, he eased his lightning wand into his hand and reviewed the spells held in his mind just in case. The sinister creatures continued on their way, the forest silent around them. But then the dark corkscrew creature halted, right at the spot where a raven and his comrades had left the path to set up their camp off the trail. It seemed to feel around, groping like a caterpillar seeking the next place to set its feet, and it gave voice to a strange, shrill, whistling sound. It began to sway and weave its limbs in a strange, coiling motion. A raven peered closer, trying to discern what it was up to, and he saw the magic at work. Corellum preserve us, he thought in horror. It's casting a spell. The thing is a sorcerer of some kind. What is it, a raven? What's going on? Ilsevile hissed. Ready your bow, he said. When I give the word, you must shoot the dark one. He couldn't see it, but he felt her nod of assent. She moved softly behind him, drawing an arrow and laying it across her bowstring. Has it found my spell wards? he wondered. He watched for ten terrible heartbeats as the monster sniffed at and studied the concealing spells he'd woven around the camp, and for one moment he felt certain that the thing had detected his illusions. But then it whistled again and curled itself away, resuming its serpentine progress along the forest path. The large, pale, tentacled thing snuffled and followed, undulating after the first one. In a few moments, they disappeared from view, and a raven breathed a sigh of relief. You can relax, he said to Ilsevile. They're gone now. What were those things? Ilsevile sighed and leaned around the tree to meet his eyes. I have no idea, a raven said. Whatever they were, they were intelligent, and one at least could wield magic. He stared off in the gloom after the monsters, still trying to make sense of the whole scene. Let's give the others another hour of sleep if we can, then get moving. I don't like the idea of waiting here for those creatures to return. Three days of swift marching put Mistledale and Galath's Roost nearly eighty miles behind the army of Evermeet, as Several and Starbrow led their host westward toward Shadowdale. Several rode at the head of his troops, his spirits lifting as they left the Sembians and Hillsfarians behind. Regardless of what might come, the days of indecision had passed, and the shadow of disaster in his divinations had retreated for a time. His course was not without risk. He weighed that much every day with his auguries and prayers. But events were once again in motion, and Several was content with that for a time. Despite the fact that he knew better than to divide his forces in the face of more numerous enemies, Several had decided to leave a strong force behind him in Mistledale. Six full companies of infantry remained near Asha Benford, under the command of Vasilde Gareth and a small contingent of knights of the Golden Star, two companies from Several's own Silver Guard, one from Everesca, and three companies of the volunteers who had mustered at Elion and had been forged into real fighting units by the furious battles at Everesca and the Lonely Moor. Several did not expect Vasilde to repel the Sembians or Hillsfarians if they moved on Mistledale in strength, 
but he hoped that the elven infantry would deter the Sembians from attempting to follow his main body to the west, and perhaps convince them that Missildale would not be yielded without a fight. If matters came down to it, the Silde was to retreat southwest down the dale, covering the dale's folk as best he could, and giving up land rather than meeting a stronger enemy in battle but Several hoped that the Sembians and Hillsfarians would be slow to attack a resisting dale outright. The army's track followed a human-cut footpath along the river's north bank that linked Asha Benford and Shadowdale Town. In other times, it might have been a picturesque journey, with the broad, shallow ribbon of the river close to Several's left hand, its waters often swift and boulder-studded, so that the river's voice filled the forest nearby but Severo urged his captains to march long and quickly each day, exhorting his host for more speed. The warriors who followed him responded with swiftness that no human army could hope to match, often trotting for hours at a time to make better speed. Severo was not sure if he could reach the northern borders of the Dale before the Zentilar, but forty miles lay between Shadowdale's northern border and the Twisted Tower. He was certain that he'd have his army waiting in the village of Shadowdale for the invaders if he failed to meet the Zents before they entered the Dale. Several rode at the head of the army among the Silver Guard, the cavalry who had served House Miratar in Evermeet. The Silver Guard was the largest body of mounted soldiers in Several's host, three full squadrons of lightly armored knights who rode under the banner of Adrela Murareste. Adrela was a young and slightly built moon elf, so small that it seemed ludicrous that she should have taken up the sword. Adrela might have been young for her command, but she was also the single finest equestrian that Several had seen in his four hundred years, and she possessed a fiery charisma that her warriors adored. He'd placed her in command of the vanguard on leaving Galath's roost, and she and her silver guard had vigorously patrolled ahead of the army, searching for any sign of the enemy. In the evening of the march's third day, they fought their first skirmish against the Zentorim's soldiers. The track broke out of the forest Cormanthor proper, crossing a narrow neck of open land along the southern border of the dale, less than twenty miles from the town of Shadowdale. As the glittering elven cavalry rode between fields of chest-high grain straight and still in the calm hour before sunset, a pair of scouts appeared from behind a stone farmhouse, riding hard for the banner. What is this? muttered Captain Adrela from beside Several. She stood up in her stirrups and cantered forward to meet the scouts. Several restrained his impulse to go and see what news the scouts brought, and made himself wait. He didn't want Adrela to think he lacked confidence in her. As it turned out, he did not have long to wonder. Adrela wheeled away at once and spurred back to the company of Golden Star Knights and Silver Guard officers who rode by Several. Zenterum Calvary, she snarled as she pulled up abreast of Several and Starbrow. A large company, about a mile off on our right front. They're chasing after a scouting party of our own warriors. The Zents are here already, Several said. He glanced back at the twilight woods behind him, thinking of the miles-long column of marching elves who follow behind the cavalry. The forest wouldn't stop him from deploying the march into a line of battle, but still— He'd thought he would have two days more, at least. Starbrow read the concern in his face and shook his head. It won't be the main body, Several. The Zentrum likely have bands of marauders and scouts ranging all over the open dale, looking for us and causing trouble where they can. It's what I would do in their place. Adrela pranced her horse around and looked to Several. They likely don't have any idea that we've got the vanguard of the army at our backs, Lord Several, she said. Unless you object, I'll take the Silver Guard and drive them off. I agree, Starbrow said. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't teach them a hard lesson about getting too close to us. Severo hesitated. Somehow, he found that he had been hoping that it would not prove necessary to meet Zentel Keep in battle. He felt Starbrow and Idrele waiting on his words and frowned. Regardless of his wishes, the Zentorum had picked a fight and the fact that they were willing to employ orc, knoll, and ogre mercenaries spoke volumes about the sort of realm they would raise over northern Kermanthor if he avoided battle. Very well, Several answered. Drive them off, but be wary of ambushes, Adrela. Adrela did not wait an instant longer. 
she plucked the standard from her bearer's stirrup breast and waved the banner in a fluttering circle. Silver guards, follow me, she cried, and she dashed off into the dusk. All around, the silver guards spurred their own mounts after her, thundering away across the field. Several looked at Adrasen, the sun elf knight who commanded his personal guard, and said, Let's follow after them. I want to see what we're up against. Adrasen winced. Lord Severo, I can't risk losing you to a chance arrow in a simple skirmish, he began. But Severo decided to make it easy on the poor fellow. He simply spurred his own horse after the silver guard, making sure to leave a good space so that no one could accuse him of riding right into the fray on their heels. He felt Starbrow close up behind him, and looked over to see the Moon Elf champion grinning broadly. That was not fair, Severo, he called over the drumming of the hooves. He is only doing his duty. I'll be careful, Severo promised. He slowed his pace a little, and allowed Adrasen and his bodyguards to close up around him. To the young knight's credit, he did not bother to argue the point any longer. He simply slammed the half-visor of his bright helmet closed and stayed close to Several. They passed through a broken line of wind-stunted poplars and scrub, then emerged into a broad field. The silver guard galloped away, lances lowered, charging at a ragged line of human riders dressed in surcoats of black and yellow. The numbers seemed equal, or close to it, and the Zentalar did not waver. They couched their own spears and turned to meet the elf riders who flashed over the field toward them. For one terrible moment they thundered toward each other in the bright field, stained crimson by the setting sun, and the skirmish lines met with shrill ring of steel and the terrified whinnying of wounded horses. Riders in black and yellow fell, but so too did elves in silver and white and the charge disintegrated into a furious, swirling, spurred melee as any kind of battle order failed. They've got courage, Starbrow said. I'll say that for them. And that's at least two full companies over there. I see them. Several watched the battle for only a moment before glancing back to Adrasen. Captain, let's see if we can lend a hand. This looks to be a closer thing than I'd thought. Adrasen nodded behind his visor. We'll do what we can, sir, he said. He motioned for two of his soldiers to remain close to Several, then he gathered the rest of the guards and raced off to join the skirmish. Several approached more cautiously, anxious to lend his guards help to the battle, but not sure of where he could make himself most useful. The fight raged on. The Zentarum cavalrymen fought furiously, keeping their heads and working to cover their allies as best they could. Their armor was substantially heavier than the elf knights, but the elves were faster and more nimble, and they fought with a skill and elan that the humans were hard-pressed to match. Time and again, elf riders danced close to their foes to slash with silver sabers, or lash out with long pennoned lances, only to parry the cuts of heavy broadswords, or spur away from hard-driven lance thrusts. Elf warriors with some skill at magic peppered the skirmish with darting blasts of golden magic or confused the human horsemen with shifting illusions and quick enchantments, confounding the Zentalar's efforts. That's a season of fighting the daemon, Fay, Several thought with a fierce burst of pride. Our warriors have become a well-tempered blade indeed. He angled toward the right flank, drew his silver mace, and spurred forward to join the fight, shouting a wordless battle cry. He crossed the last hundred yards in the blink of an eye, his mount's hooves flashing like silver fire in the dusk, and Several found himself in the fray. He batted aside a zentish lance and hammered the warrior out of the saddle with a great overhand swing, then wheeled his horse to meet another zentilar behind him in a furious rain of ringing blows as their weapons met with shock after shock, their horses stamped and whinnied and cries of anger, pain, and triumph filled his ears. Several dueled his swordsman to a standstill and was about to hammer down his guard, but an elf lancer took the man from behind and knocked him out of the saddle. The elf lord spun around, searching for the fight. Starbrow battled close by, cutting an awful swath through the Zentilar ranks with Karevian's pure white blade. A shrill, terrible sound tore through the twilight, and the black earth around Several erupted in a great blast. His horse was thrown sideways and fell, 
but Sivro managed to hurl himself clear of the saddle before the animal rolled over him. Ears ringing, he found his feet and looked up. Overhead, a sinister, bat-winged shadow swooped down low over the battlefield. The monster's long, blunt snout held a blind, gaping smile, and a long, lashing tail twisted behind it. Between its humpbacked wings, a black-clad human wizard sat in an ornate saddle, hurling down blasts of scorching fire as the huge monster winged over the fight. It opened its mouth again, and another shrill shriek flayed a pair of elf riders with an awful blast. What kind of abomination is that? snapped Starbrow. He ducked away from the fiery bolt and turned against another horseman nearby. Severil didn't have an answer for Starbrow, but he quickly intoned the words of a holy prayer to Corellan, invoking the divine power with which he was entrusted. Holy power seethed around his hand, and he hurled a blast of supernal light up at the monster. The brilliant white ray chewed into the flying monster's flank, charring it, and the creature croaked in pain and awkwardly reeled away. But then a second flying monster appeared, also with a battle mage riding between its wings. The wizard hurled a great blast of fire down at Several. Several threw himself flat as the fireball burst over him and searing heat washed across his body. His cloak and surcoat smoking, he slowly picked himself up. All around him, Zentilar and elves alike had been scorched and scoured by the attack of the wizards on their flying beasts. With heavy, slow beats of their vast wings, the creatures circled for another pass, spurred on by their riders. Archers! called Adrela Muraresti. Get some arrows on those accursed wizards! The silver guards were outfitted for lancework and swordplay, but they were elves. Every one of them carried a short bow in a saddle holster, and knew how to use it. Many of the guards were still busy with the melee, but dozens quickly spurred clear of the fighting and drew their bows. As the flying monsters turned back toward the fray, elven bows began to thrum, and white arrows soared up into the crimson sky at first a few, then a heavier and more accurate storm. With another great croaking cry, the flying beasts turned away and flapped off, but not before their riders raised a long line of green fire across the trampled fields. Behind the leaping wall of magical fire, the Zentilar horsemen quickly mustered and retreated from the field, leaving dozens of dead and wounded behind. Adrela rode up beside Several, and took in his scorched clothing with a quick glance. "'Lord Several, shall we pursue?' she asked. Several watched the flapping beasts drawing away. "'No, I think we've done enough for tonight. We'll need to keep some eagle knights nearby from now on, just in case the Zents have more of those flying wizards. And more archers among our troops would be a good idea.' Starbrow also rode up, his eyes fixed on the departing wizards. I am thoroughly tired of fighting flying creatures armed with magic, he declared. I had enough of that with Sarya's Daemon Fey Legion and their demons. I agree, Several said. He sighed and ran a hand through his hair. At least this is a threat we know how to face. One more thing that Sarya Delardrigeth has taught us this year. He looked around at the field of the skirmish and frowned. Many of the Zentilar had fallen but so too had more than a few of the Silver Guards. See to the army's camp tonight, Starbrow. I will join you after I have done what I can for the wounded. Colonel leaned against the gray wheel of an old ox cart, exhausted beyond all endurance. The farmyard was littered with dead knolls, but two of his riders lay still on the ground. One band of bloodthirsty raiders would slay no more, but his squad was down to himself and Ingra. He looked over to Ingra, who sat holding a blood-soaked bandage to an arrow wound in her left arm. I hope to all the gods that things are better somewhere else, he said. We're getting butchered out here. Tell me something I don't know, Ingra replied. So what do we do now? Damned if I know. For half a ten day, Colonel and his riders had battled across the forest north of Mistledale, fighting their way right up to the very eastern edge of Shadowdale. He'd meant to turn back for home an hour ago, but the smoke of burning homesteads had caught his eye. The fighting had been fierce, but they'd saved the folk of one freehold from a death too terrible to contemplate. 
ride for Ashabenford, I suppose. We've done all we can here. Ingra started to nod in agreement, but then she looked up sharply. Riders coming, she hissed. Colonel straightened and looked over the side of the cart. At first he couldn't see anything through the green corn stalks, but then he glimpsed sunlight glinting on spear points. A double column of mailed horsemen came trotting into sight, led by a tall, slender woman whose long white hair was gathered in a single braid that trailed down to her waist. Grimmer, he told Ingra. He raised one arm to catch their attention and stepped out into the open. The cavalrymen turned toward Colonel and rode into the farmyard, taking stock of the dead knolls and fallen riders. Their captain studied the scene for a moment and doffed her helm, shaking the sweat and dust from her face. Colonel looked up and blinked. You're Storm Silverhand! So I'm told, the woman replied. She dismounted with an easy motion, hung her helm on the saddle horn, and turned to size up Colonel. Riders of Missledale? Yes, though there were more of us a few moments ago. So I see, Storm said with a sigh. You're a long way from home, aren't you? We've been watching for red plumes or fiends from Ithdranor, passing north of Misseldale, Colonel answered. He waved a hand at the dead knolls. We found their sign this morning and followed them here. I... I didn't know if any Grimar were nearby to deal with these marauders, so I decided to take care of them. I'd wish we'd been here a few minutes sooner, Storm said. I guess you couldn't have known we were near. My thanks for what you and your companions did here, friend. What else could we do? Colonel sighed. He ran a hand through his grimy hair. If you don't mind my asking, Lady Silverhand, what are you doing out here? Aren't the Zentera marching on Shadowdale? Storm gave him a sharp nod and glanced off toward the west. Yes, they're not far off now. In fact, I should have turned back already, but I wanted to see for myself how things stood in the eastern part of the dale. I don't like to leave such as these, she towed a dead knoll, free to pillage and plunder in the east just because our eyes are fixed on the Zentalar coming down from the north. Will you be able to stop the Zents, Lady Silverhand? Ingra asked. We're facing a hard fight tomorrow or the day after, but we've beat them before, Storm said. Cold steel danced in her eyes as she gazed off toward the smoke-stained skies to the north. Then a weary smile crept back across Storm's face. She held out her hand and took Colonel's arm in a warrior's clasp. Well, riders of Missledale, you might as well come back to Shadowdale with us. We'll have work for you soon enough. Chapter 14 21 Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms Joran Kelharthen led a raven and his friends along the forest road for a day and a half more, leaving the circle of standing stones thirty miles behind them. It was hard to gauge the passage of time in Silda Ewer. The subtle darkening and lightening of the sky was no substitute for a true sunrise or sunset, and the hours simply had a way of slipping away. A raven would find his mind turning to some thought or another as they traveled, only to come to himself with a start, only to realize that miles had passed by under his feet while his mind was occupied. He began to wonder whether the great magic that had created this world beyond the world had also altered the flow of time in that place. But, of course, he could not really test that without returning to the Ewerwood in Aglarond to find out how long he had been away. On two more occasions they encountered strange creatures abroad in the woodland. The first time they met a wheeling, darting flight of great dragonflies whose gem-like bodies glowed in soft emerald and sapphire hues beneath the trees. Each insect was better than a foot long, which caused no small consternation on the part of Donner's horse but the glittering swarm seemed merely curious about them, following the company for a time as they filled the air with whirling wing beats and soft light. On the second occasion, they sighted another one of the blue-black worm creatures crossing their path a couple of hundred yards ahead. It flew through the air on slick, gleaming wings, its spiraling motion twisting its flight into a strange aerial weave as it went. But the monster did not sight them, and simply continued on its way. 
As the dimming hour approached and the skies began to darken again, they finally emerged from the great band of forest through which they had walked, finding themselves on the edge of a long stretch of low, rolling hills, crowned with waving silver grasses beneath the stars. There another large stone circle stood, which Joran examined with great interest. I think I know where this place is, he told a raven. Distance here correlates to the distance in Ewerwood. We've come more than forty miles to the south, as much as directions mean anything here. Do you know where to find the Star Elves? Joran nodded. If I remember right, there is a citadel about ten miles in that direction. He pointed over the bare, starlit hills. It lies on the far side of this clear space. They made camp for the darkest hours within the circle of standing stones. A raven could not detect any wakeful spells or magic within the circle but he sensed old and powerful wards around the ring, and he judged them as good a defense as his own spells. He composed himself for reverie, sitting cross-legged at the foot of a great stone with his back to the cold, smooth granite, and drifted off into strange dreams. A raven! He roused to full wakefulness with a start, and found Ilsevile touching his shoulder. What is it? he asked. A rider approaches! Two more of those dark creatures pursue him. A raven climbed to his feet. Donner Kurth stood beside one of the outer stones, murmuring calming words to the hitched pack horse and looking back along the forest path they'd recently passed. Ilsevile stooped to wake Joran and Maressa next, while a raven joined the big human by the stone. He followed Donner's gaze and spied the rider, galloping along the path. The trail ran alongside the stone circle for a time, before doubling back, so they had an excellent opportunity to watch the fellow as he raced past them, perhaps three hundred yards downhill, appearing and vanishing as he passed behind trees and steeper embankments along the trail. At that distance he was little more than a glimmering white figure, tiny and distant, but a raven quickly spied the flying monsters that followed him, twisting their way through the air above the trees and gaining on their quarry. He'll pass close by in just a minute or two, Donner said. What do we do? Hail him and make him ready to stand against the flying creatures, a raven replied. He didn't know who or what the rider was, but he didn't like the looks of the sorceress worm monsters at all, and he was not about to abandon anyone to them. Besides, the longer he watched, the more certain he was that the rider was an elf. Donner nodded. He drew his broadsword and pressed himself against the stone next to him, trying to stay out of sight. Ilsevile took up a position against another stone, her bow of red yew in her hands, and Maressa joined her. Joran drew his own swords and slid down the slope a little to a boulder closer to the trail, crouching low to keep out of sight. A raven took a moment to whisper the words of a spell of shielding and waited. The rider rounded the bend close by the ring of standing stones and spurred his mount. A fine, dappled gray destrier, stretching out its long legs with an easy grace that belied the speed of its run. Up the hillside, following the trail as it wound past the old men here's. The flying monsters shifted their own course and climbed over the trees, cutting the corner against their quarry. A raven decided that he'd waited long enough. He stepped out from behind the stones and waved at the rider. Here, he cried, into the standing stones. A momentary astonishment crossed the rider's face, but he wasted no time at all. He wrenched the reins to the left and took his horse scrambling up the steep, grassy hillside. He was indeed an elf, though not of any kindred a raven knew. He had skin as pale and fair as a moon elf's, but his hair was a pale gold that didn't often appear among the two tail cresser. He wore a gray cloak over a shirt of gleaming mithril mail and a quilted white doublet lavishly embroidered with gold thread. Beware the Nilshai, he called in Elvish. They are fearsome sorcerers. The winged worm monsters did not miss the rider's change of course. They veered toward the hilltop ring and arrowed through the air. One of them whistled and piped loudly, twisting its limbs in a strange fashion, and a sizzling green orb of acid appeared before it. With a flick of its long torso, the monster hurled the acid ball at the company sheltering among the stones. 
Great glowing gouts of emerald fire exploded around a raven and his friends, searing flesh and burning foul, smoking holes in cloaks and clothing. But the stones served as good cover. A raven ducked under the spattering acid, and he saw Ilsevile throw herself forward out of the ring, escaping the worst of the blast. She rolled upright and fired three quick arrows at the nearest of the monsters. One shivered to pieces in mid-air, broken on some invisible shield of magic the worm had raised, but two others pierced its long serpentine torso. It fluttered and twisted, its weird whistling taking on a shriller note. A raven incanted the words of a potent lightning spell and blasted up at the two creatures with an eye-searing bolt of blue-white. One darted aside, but the wounded one could not escape. The bolt burned it badly, bringing it spinning to the ground, smoke streaming from charred patches on its hide. Donner and Joran charged it at once, blades bared, but the monster had fight in it yet. It pulled the Lathandarian's feet out from under him with one swift jerk of its curling tail, and at the same time it enmeshed Joran in a gleaming black spellweb of freezing shadows. Joran's charge came to a stumbling halt, ten feet short of the creature. Damn it, he snarled, gasping with the bitter chill that snared him. I can't get to it. A raven turned his attention back to the nilshai that remained airborne and managed to quickly parry the monster's next spell, batting the alien magic aside with a quick countering spell. He exchanged two more spells and counterspells with the monster in the next few heartbeats, again astonished by the speed with which the nilshai worked its magic while continuously weaving and dodging against Ilsevile's rain of deadly arrows. On the hillside below him, Donner gained his feet again and approached the wounded Nilshai more cautiously. The monster lunged at him, battering at his shield with powerful blows of its whipping tentacles, but Donner slashed it twice with his broadsword, weaving a glittering cage of steel with his blade. The Nilshai recoiled from the human knight, and Maressa lunged in from behind it, fixing her rapier in the center of its torso between two of its three wings. The monster leaped and bucked, carrying Maressa's rapier from her hand and knocking her to the ground. It shrieked a single high, harsh note, then drew into a tight coil on the ground and lay still. Maressa rolled to her feet and grinned fiercely. This one's done, she called. A raven parried another spell from the one that remained and then the creature managed to slip a spell through by virtue of its uncanny quickness, trapping him in a bitter, freezing fog of silver mist. He fumbled with his disruption wand with fingers that were suddenly stiff and numb, and fought to utter the words of a dismissing spell. But then he heard a high, clear voice ringing behind him. A brilliant white arc of magic swept out of the old stone ring and lanced upward to blast the remaining Nilshai scouring the monster's dark flesh with silver power. A raven struggled to look over his shoulder to see what had happened, and he saw the elf they had rescued standing within the stones and singing, hands clenched at his sides, eyes fixed on the winged horror overhead. The winged worm hissed and tried to climb out of the reach of the arcing magic, but then a pair of arrows from Elsevile brought it down. Its wings folded in mid-air, and it dropped to the ground like a stone. The rider held his song for one more moment, then allowed the eldritch music to fade. He leaned against a men here in fatigue. A raven finally managed to shake off the clinging silver fog that had numbed him. He turned to Joran and dispelled the shadow web with a quick word and motion of his hand, then looked at his companions. Is anybody hurt? he asked. Singed a little from that acid, but I'm fine, Ilsevile answered. She looked down at her side where a handful of holes in her tunic still smoked. I can tend to that, Donner said. He picked his way back up the hillside and began to chant a healing prayer to Lathander, holding his hand over Ilsevile's side. The rider straightened and turned to face a raven. I don't know how you came to be here, sir, but I am indebted to you, he said. His elvish was a little strange to a raven's ear, due in no small part to the remarkable voice the fellow possessed a rich tenor in which every word held music. I am Nestorin of House de Ear, and I believe that I owe you my life. I am a raven Tesher of Evermeet. This is my betrothed, Lady Ilsevile Miratar. Our companions Marissa Rost of Waterdeep, 
Don Master Donner Kurth of the Temple of Lathander, and our guide, Joran Kel Harthen of Aglarond. I am pleased to meet all of you, especially considering the circumstances. Nesterin bowed to each of them. Might I ask what brings your company to Silda Ewer? We rarely see folk of other races here. I guided them here, Joran said, stepping forward. You are of the Ewer? Joran nodded. I am. They have an errand of some importance. The symbol's apprentice decided that they needed to speak with the star elves. Nesturin studied a raven and his companions more closely. Very well, he said at last. The masters of the Eurowood do not lightly give strangers their trust, and I am indebted to you all in any event. My home is only a few miles away. I would be greatly pleased if you would allow me to offer you the hospitality of House Deir. The First Lord's Tower gleamed in the sunset, tall and slender as a sword blade over the center of Hillsfar. The evening was warm and still, and the lamplighters hurried through the streets to perform their duties as the city's bustle and commerce guttered out for the day. A whisper of magic danced in the air, and Sawyer de Lagredeth and Zolf appeared on a balcony amid a dull thump of displaced air. As before, Sawyer and Zolf wore their human guises. She glanced at the balcony around them and nodded in approval. As promised, Malthier had left it bare of any awkward spells or arcane defenses so that she or her messengers could simply teleport directly to his home. There was even an iced ewer of wine by the door leading into the tower. Sarya approved. The less she had to see of the human squalor surrounding Malthier's tower, the better. Two red plume guards stood nearby, straightening to attention and smoothing the surprise from their faces. I see we're expected, Zoff noted. Sarya looked at the nearer of the guards. You there, tell your master that Lady Senda and Lord Alphen are here, and desire a few words with him. She went over to the table and poured herself a goblet of wine, first taking a moment to work a minor spell to reveal any poisons that might be waiting for her. The red plume muttered a word of assent, and ducked through the door leading into the tower proper. He returned a few minutes later with a short, burly human warrior in fine court clothes. The fellow dressed like a dandy, but his eyes glittered coldly within deep, dark sockets. Lady Senda, he said, bowing obsequiously, I am Hardil Gyaros, High Warden of the First Lord's Tower. If you'll follow me, I will lead you to Lord Malathir. Of course, Sawyer purred. The High Warden bowed and led her into the tower. They proceeded through sparsely furnished hallways of polished stone, eventually reaching a conservatory of modest size that seemed like it had seen little use. Though the harps and recorders in their fine glass cases showed not a hint of dust on them, the whole chamber seemed too carefully arranged for actual recitals. Besides, Sawyer doubted that Malthir was much given to music let alone practicing or performing himself. She composed herself for a lengthy wait, but Malthier swept into the room almost on her heels, his four pallid swordsmen a pace behind him, and another pair of red plumes following. The First Lord was dressed in a scarlet coat emblazoned with a draconic emblem, and he carried his dark iron dragon-claw scepter in his hand. He paused in the doorway to study Sarya, and something less than humor creased his stern features. Lady Sawyer, he said, to what do I owe this unexpected call? Lord Malthier, Sawyer kept her voice neutral and did not lower her gaze an inch from Malthier's dark eyes. I am concerned by the progress of our campaign in Cormanthor, and I hope you might be able to reassure me. I am widely regarded as the very font of optimism, Malthier rasped. What specifically concerns you, Lady Sawyer? Evermeet's army has marched west a hundred miles in the last three days in order to meet Fazul's Zenterum army descending on Shadowdale, Zolf answered. We have dispatched several messengers instructing you to bring the Red Plume army north of Missledale westward, so that you and Fazul might combine and effect the destruction of the elven army. Yet Hillsfar's army has not yet moved. Malthir's eyes flashed but he kept his temper in check. Of course, 
I have not ordered them to march. Zoff squared his shoulders, a low growl rumbling deep in his throat, but Sarya set a hand on his arm and silenced him. She folded her arms and paced across the room, finding the space confining and small. This is an excellent opportunity to destroy the elven army, Malthir, she said. Your Sembian friends have led Sivro Miratar to leave a good quarter of his strength sitting in Mistledale. Between your red plumes, the Zentalar, and my own warriors, we can crush Miratar. However, if you do not move, you will expose Fazul to defeat in detail. Lady Sarya, Malthir said. That is exactly what I intend. It would suit my purposes very well indeed if Evermeet and Zentel Keep were to maul each other in Shadowdale. Therefore, I see no reason to send help to Fazul Chembrel. I do not care about your petty little spats with Fazul, Sarya hissed. I will not allow your machinations to upset my opportunity to destroy Miratar. Betray Fuzul later if you like, but today I need your army in Shadowdale, and you will not delay an hour longer. Malthir measured Sarya for a long moment, making no reply. His coterie of dead-eyed swordsmen stood unmoving at his side. I am not your servant, Sarya, he said. In fact, I see no reason to continue our association. Should Evermeet and Zento keep fight to exhaustion in Shadowdale, my Red Plumes and Duncastle Sembians will be the only powers left in the Dales. I see no reason to share that prize with a hell-spawned harpy such as yourself. You treacherous dog, Sawyer snarled. You have no idea of the might I have gathered at Mithdranor. I will destroy you for your perfidy. You would be better advised to save your strength for Evermeet's army, Hardil Giraras sneered. If you will not take the field against Evermeet, then I will, Sarya promised. I will crush Miratar with my own power, Malthir, and I will use Fazul Chembrel to destroy you. She snapped out the words of a teleportation spell, reaching out to take Zolf's arm. But to her astonishment, nothing happened. The spell simply failed leaving her standing in the middle of Malthir's conservatory. The chamber is warded against teleportation, Malthir observed. He smiled, a hard and cheerless expression that did not touch his eyes. I have no idea whether you can even begin to make good on your threats, Sarya, but as I have said before, I take few chances. Prudence would dictate that I not allow you to leave this room alive. With a curt gesture of his dragon-clawed scepter, Malthir vanished from sight, and the swordsmen swept out their blades as one. Sarya bared her fangs and crooked her hands to cast a spell, but an instant later she was battered by a whole array of deadly magic as Malthir suddenly reappeared, surrounded in a shimmering spell shield. A scintillating blast of vibrant colors embraced her in magical destruction, sending sheets of crimson fire racing over her body while at the same time a sinister black ray struck her over the heart like a spear of ice, draining life and power from her, and a dancing sword of emerald green energy appeared above her head and slashed at her with dizzying speed. Zolf was struck by a yellow ray that sent crackling yellow lightning racing over his body, charring and stabbing him. He froze time to cast all those spells, Sarya realized. The sudden assault filled her with anger beyond measure. The fires burning on her skin troubled her not at all. She was the daughter of a Baylor lord, and no flame could harm her, magical or otherwise. But the other spells were dangerous. With a savage snarl, Sarya conjured an orb of hell-tainted fire and detonated it in her hands, scouring the whole room with the sinister flames. The cabinets exploded in shards of hot glass, and the red plumes were virtually incinerated before they even took a step. But Hardil Gieras threw himself into a corner and survived, and Malthir's swordsmen, while scorched badly, did not even break stride or show the slightest reaction to the clinging hellfire that burned on them. Malthir himself stood unharmed, protected by his spell shields. You will have to do better than that, Sarya, he called. Zolf abandoned his magical guise with a roar of rage, instantly gaining two full feet in height as his scarlet-scaled form appeared. 
He leaped straight for Malthir, sweeping his swords out in one quick motion, but two of the pale swordsmen interposed themselves with uncanny swiftness. The Daemon Fey Lord tried to simply bull his way through the unearthly guards, but their sword points darted and stabbed, drawing blood at thigh, hip, and shoulder before Zolf even began his first parry. The Daemon Fey swordsmen whipped around to confront one of the pair and drove four swords into the fellow at once, ripping the blades free with a shout of bloodlust. But nothing except strange black mist came from the wounds, and despite being almost ripped apart, the pale swordsman made no sound. He only staggered a bit with the force of the blows, and came on again, moving a little slower and more awkwardly as slashed tendons and rent muscle failed him. Sarya found the other two swordsmen closing on her, while the blazing blade of green energy slashed and darted at her face. She quickly backstepped and managed to dispel the emerald sword before it did more than give her a couple of shallow cuts. But while she did that, Malthir intoned another spell, hurling a deadly blast of scathing cold at her. The thin white beam grazed her left arm and turned a solid foot of her forearm white and dead. Sarya screeched in pain and nearly died on the sword point of the first Malthir's strange guardsman to reach her. Malthir cannot be beaten here and now, she realized. The First Lord's tower was the heart of his domain, and he had prepared for a fight, while she had not. As much as she longed to rip the human dog to pieces with her own talons, she risked destruction with every moment she remained. Zolf! she shouted. The window! Zolf wheeled away from his antagonists at once, and hurled his heavy form at the row of narrow windows along the wall. They were not large enough to permit him to pass, but Zolf's strength was immense, and he was caught up in the fullness of his wrath. Nothing could stand in his way. Lowering his shoulder, he battered the lintel with such force that he sent a shower of masonry out of the tower's side and burst through into clean air. Sawyer darted after her son, abandoning her human appearance in mid-step. Swords slashed and hissed through the air only a step behind her, and Malthir's last spell, a great golden hand of magical energy that tried to snatch her out of the air, faltered and broke against the power of her demonic heritage, fizzling into nothingness. She spread her dark wings wide and soared away from the tower. I will tear him to pieces with my naked claws, Zoff bellowed, hovering in the air. I will feed his entrails to Rutterkin while he watches. Yes, but not today, Sarya snapped. She caught hold of Zolf's hand and barked out another teleport spell. In the space of an icy instant, they hovered in the air above the green vastness of Cormanthor, with hills far as spires and towers dimly visible in the warm haze far to the north and east. Sarya glared at the distant city, her eyes glowing red with pure hate. I should have known better than to try to find a use for stinking humans, she muttered. Malthir thinks he is strong enough to defy me. He will learn otherwise. I will teach the humans to fear the wrath of House Delardrageth. As he had promised, Nesterin de Ir led a raven and his companions toward his home. They walked over silver-grassed hilltops beneath the open, starry sky, leading the star elf's mount and Donner's pack-horse. As they walked, Nesterin questioned them about their presence in Silda Uir and their travels in the realm, though he was fairly courteous and indirect about it, so much so that a raven doubted whether any of his companions other than Elsevile noticed that they were being skillfully interrogated as they walked. A raven decided to turn the tables on their host after Nesterin succeeded in drawing out of Maressa a good account of their meeting with the symbol's apprentice and their journey through the Uir wood. As the company fell silent for a moment, he asked, What were those monsters you were fleeing from, Nesterin? We saw several others like them in the forest. They are Nilshai, and as you have seen, they are formidable sorcerers. They haunt the lonelier stretches of our forests. The handsome star elf glanced toward the dim line of trees, a dark tide washing against the hills by starlight, miles behind them. It does not surprise me that you met them on your way here. They have been trying to poison our realm for many years now, losing monsters in our forests and pulling the outlying reaches of Silda Ewer into their own sinister realm. Where do they come from? What do they want with you? Ilsevile asked. Nesterin shook his head. 
We do not know. Some of our sages say that the Nilshai are creatures of the ethereal plane, the spectral reality that infuses all the rest of existence. But Silda Ewer was disjoined from the ethereal when our mages created this domain long ago. I cannot fathom why they would go to such lengths to bore gates into this realm, when the daylight world that you all come from is far more accessible to them. These things are even closer to our world than they are to yours? Maressa asked. She shook her head. I don't like the sound of that. What business did you have in the forest we passed through? Ilsevile asked Nesterin. It seemed to be wild and desolate. You are the first person we've seen since crossing over from Aglarond. The star elf was slow to answer. A raven glanced over his shoulder at Nesterin, who was leading his horse as he walked alongside the rest of the company. The mage wondered for a moment whether Nesterin intended to keep his errand a secret, but it seemed that the star elf was simply organizing his thoughts. I had ridden out to the seat of House Aeropé, where my cousin, Lacera has lived for many years, Nesterin began. It is a strong tower far to the south, overlooking the shimmer sea that marks the bounds of our kingdom in that direction. The Nilshai have always been strong in that region, and their taint has filled vast tracts of the forest there with strange and dangerous creatures, things like plants or great funguses, but alive and hungry, and monsters to suit. I followed a road I thought to be safe to Aeropé. But a few miles from the tower, I found that the Nilshai had been busy since last I passed that way. The forests were choked with creeping, groping tendrils and pallid, eyeless beasts that hunted in the shadows, and the very realm itself seemed to be, well, fraying. Sluggish streams or rivers of bright gray dust sliced through the landscape, and as I struggled to find my way through to Tower Aeropé, the damnable stuff would close in behind me, trying to surround and trap me. In any event, I managed to find my way through to Aeropé, but I found the tower utterly abandoned. Everything seemed as it should be. Furnishings stood where last they had been used. Clothes still filled the chests and drawers. Food still lay almost fresh in the kitchens. But there was not a sign of another living soul. I lingered no more than an hour in that place, because it was simply so unnerving to be alone amid such silence. Then I set out at once for home. I decided to try a different road on my return, the path that led past the old gate ring two days' walk behind you. The Nilshai caught my trail, though, and they pursued me closely for the better part of a day. Nesterin glanced over at Ilsevile and shrugged. So there is my tale, Lady Ilsevile. A great house of our people has vanished, the distant reaches of my world seem to be coming undone, and I cannot explain why or how. They walked on in silence for a while longer, and they crested another low hilltop. Before them on a high knoll overlooking a shining river stood an elegant tower of pale white stone. It was ringed by a tall, sturdy wall, and its lower galleries and bastions were carved from the dark gray granite of its natural footing. Dozens of softly glowing lamps gleamed in its windows and treetops. My home, Nesterin said. He glanced to a raven and the others. No one who has battled the Nilshai will come to harm here, my friends. But I must warn you, few who aren't star elves have ever walked in Silda Uir. You will be asked to give an account of yourself, and you may be required to accept a gesh or enchantment to ensure that you will guard our secrets well. I will speak on your behalf, but I cannot say how our lord will rule in your case. Maressa scowled. I'll be damned if I let you put a gesh on me. Why shouldn't we just walk away now? Nesterin shrugged. You saved my life today. You should know what awaits you. A raven and Ilsevile, as Artel Quesser, have little to worry about. Nor does Joran, though his judgment in bringing you here may be questioned. But you and the Dawnmaster have no elf blood, and are not known to us. If you choose to depart now, I must tell my lord that you are abroad in Silda Uir, and he may very well decide that you are not to be allowed to wander about the realm. Donner Kurth's brow furrowed deeply, but the Lathandarian did not speak. Maressa, on the other hand, stopped dead in her tracks. I don't like jails, she said. 
Ilsevile turned to her and set her hand on Maressa's arm. I promise you, Maressa, whatever they would do to you, they must do to me as well. Maressa looked up to Ilsevile, and after a moment she snorted and shook her head. You've got too much trust for any ten people, Ilsevile, do you know that? She shrugged off Ilsevile's hand and started down the path again. All right, then. Let's see what Nesterin's folk make of us. They followed the path down the silvered slopes of the grassy hillside, crossed the river on a bridge of luminous stone, and came up to the mithril gates of the tower. There, half a dozen elf warriors in knee-length hauberks of white-scaled armor stood guard, armed with long halberds and slender bows. Welcome back, Nesterin, the captain of the gate guard said, but her eyes were fixed on a raven and his companions. She searched for words, evidently more than a little surprised. Finally she frowned and said, I see you have been far afield in the last few days. Who are these people? I did not find them. They found me, Nesterin answered. They slew two Nilshai and saved my life in the process. Two Nilshai? The captain glanced at a raven again before looking back at Nesterin. I will tell Lord Tessernal of your return, and inform him that you have brought guests back to the tower. Good, said Nesterin. They have a strange tale to share, and I have much to tell him of what I found at Tower Aeropé. We will be in the High Hall. The captain sent a messenger off into the tower, and detailed two guards to attend to Nesterin's graceful destrier and Donner's warhorse. Ilsevile flicked her eyes to a raven, and the mage immediately grasped her unspoken thought. The gate guards treated Nesterin with an air of deference. Their host was an elf of some importance, one of the masters of the house. This way, my friends. Nesterin gathered up a raven's company and led them into the tower proper. It was a comfortable elven palace, though quite strongly built. More a citadel than a home, really, with high, well-made walls of stone. It was large enough to be home to a hundred or more people, but a raven quickly formed the impression that substantially fewer folk than that lived in Tower Deir. They passed other elves only at odd intervals, and the echoing halls and corridors seemed too perfect and bare to have been lived in much. Nesterin showed them into a small banquet room at the top of a winding flight of steps that ascended the rocky pedestal of the tower's hilltop. Please lay down your packs. Doff your cloaks and make yourselves comfortable, he said. I will send for refreshments for you. Thank you, a raven murmured. He shrugged his backpack from his shoulders and rested his staff by the door. The others followed suit. In the space of a few minutes they were dining on platters of fruit and warm bread. Nesterin joined in as well, with an apologetic smile. I fear that I haven't eaten in a couple of days, he said between bites. I left Errol Pay in a hurry, as you might imagine. As they ate, a tall lordly star-elf dressed in elegant robes appeared at the hall's door. A raven sensed a deep and studious mastery of the art in the elf-lord, a strength of spirit that reminded him of the might of Evermeet's own high mages. He had eyes of pure jet, with not a hint of iris, and his elegant features seemed to be graven with the weight of long care. His long white hair was bound by a platinum circlet at the brow, and hung loose to his collarbone and the nape of his neck. Jeresir told me you returned, Nesterin, he said, his voice inflectionless. I see that you have company. Nesterin stood and bowed. Lord Tesserno, he said, may I present a raven Tesher and Ilsevile Miratar of Evermeet, Maressa Rost of Waterdeep, Donner Kurth of the Church of Lathander, and Joran Kel Harthen of the Uir? My friends, this is Lord Tessernal de Ir, my mother's elder brother and the master of this house. The star elf lord nodded gravely to them. I have heard that you aided Nesterin in a desperate hour. You have my thanks for that. I want to hear what brings you to our land, but first, I did not expect you back so soon, Nesterin. Is everything well at Aeropé? The younger elf frowned and shook his head. No, my lord, I fear that it is not. 
He quickly recounted the tale he had told a raven and his friends, and went on to tell how he had encountered the company in the old stone ring at the edge of the hills as he fled from the Nilshai. These travelers may very well have saved my life, he finished. The Nilshai pursuing me were more than I would have cared to face alone, and they were close to overtaking me when a raven and his friends intervened. We would have done the same for anyone in your circumstances, Donner Kurth said gruffly. How could we have stood by and done nothing? Joran looked to the two star elves and spoke. My lords, I hope you will forgive my curiosity, he said. I visited Sildeuir once, many years ago. I do not recall meeting such dangerous and fell creatures abroad in your realm. Have these monsters always been here? They have been getting much worse of late. Tessernol admitted. His habitual frown deepened until his face seemed almost empty of hope. There are portions of the realm that have been drawn almost completely into their influence. We are not a warlike people, but it is clear that we face a threat that we cannot hide from any longer. If the Nilshai have learned how to assault our towers, we face a dark and desperate battle indeed. He sighed and turned to face a raven. Now, sir, you have already seen and heard more of this realm than I would like. I must ask, what brings you to Sildeuir? Who are you, and what do you want here? I am in search of knowledge that has been lost in the world outside your realm, a raven said. I hope that it still exists here, though. Knowledge? Tessernil folded his arms. What sort of knowledge? Thousands of years ago, a star elf mage named Morthil lived among the elves of Arkarar, a raven answered. He helped the grand mage of that realm to defeat an ancient evil. I have reason to believe that Morthil returned to his homeland with magical lore that he removed from the enemies of Arkarar. I need to find out if anything of what Morthil removed from Arkarar still survives. There must be some reason you have come all the way to Sildeuir in search of this old lore, Tessernal observed. What do you need with it? I need it to defeat the enemies that Morthal once fought, a raven said. They are called the Daemon Fae, and they are an abominable house of sun elves who consorted with demons long ago. He decided that Tessernal was not an elf to be trifled with, and chose to tell him the story of events since Delardrigeth's return as completely and openly as he could. When the tale was told, Nesterin and Tessernal stood in silence for a long moment. The older lord finally moved to a seat at the head of the table and sat down heavily, his gaze troubled and distant. First Nesterin's tale, and now this, he murmured. It has been a long time since I heard two such stories in the same day. We keep abreast of doings in Aglarond and the Ewer Wood, but news of the wars and perils of the distant corners of Faerun rarely find its way to our realm. A raven paused, stealing his nerve to ask the question. I perceive that you are skilled with the art, Lord Tessernal. Do you know of magical lore brought out of Arkarar to Silda Ewer? Have you heard the name of Morthil before? Tessernal looked up at a raven, his dark eyes unreadable. I know that name, he said, and I think I know where you might recover at least a remnant of Morthil's ancient lore. But you will find that it is a dark and difficult journey, son of Evermeet. Morthil's old tower lies in the farthest reach of our realm, in the borderlands where things have been slipping away into strangeness for many years now. Even if the place has not vanished entirely, I do not see how you can get there without passing into the domain of the Nilshai. Few indeed return from that journey. Chapter 15 23 Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms For two full days, Several waited for the Zentrum army to attack Shadowdale Town and the Twisted Tower. Forty-five hundred elf warriors of the crusade held the woodlands and fields a couple of miles north of the town, standing alongside more than a thousand humans gathered from all corners of Shadowdale, a strong company from Deepingdale, and even a few dozen veterans from nearby Daggerdale, 
but having lost the foot-race to crush the Dalesfolk before the elves of Evermeet arrived in Shadowdale, the Zentalar settled for a very deliberate and cautious approach. Instead of pressing forward to the attack, they advanced at a snail's pace. By night the Black Network had fortified their camp with great earthworks and palisades. On the evening of the third day, Starbrow found Several standing among the pickets at the northern end of the elven camp, gazing out across the fields toward the distant campfires of the Zentrum camp. The Moon Elf joined him in studying the enemy entrenchments for a time. "'You understand what the Zents are trying to do?' Starbrow asked. "'I didn't until this morning, when I saw that they were not marching today,' Several replied." But I see it clearly enough now. They are going to make us come to them if we want to force a battle. And I have to do it, because the longer I sit here waiting on the Zents, the more likely it is that the Sembians and Hillsfarians will overwhelm Mistledale or march against our rear. Several ran a hand through his fine silver-red hair and sighed. I should have anticipated this response. Clearly our best strategy is to defeat our enemies in detail, and that means I must fall on the Zents while their allies are still far behind us. The burden of action is on me. Starbrow nodded. You're learning. So when do we fight? It has to be soon, Severo admitted. Tomorrow is as good a day as any. What do you think? Tonight, an hour after moonset, Starbrow said. We'd have three hours until sunup. We see in the dark better than the humans, and we need less rest. It's the best time for elves to fight humans, and our crusade makes up better than three-quarters of the fighting strength we have gathered in Shadowdale. A good part of their army consists of orcs, gnolls, and ogres. The darkness won't bother them. True, but if the Zentalar break, the humanoid mercenaries in their camp might follow. It's the best we can do. We could wait another day and plan a more deliberate attack for the day after tomorrow. But why give Sarya and her human pawns another day to close the noose around our necks? All right, then. Tomorrow morning. Several clapped Starbrow on the shoulder. Pass the word to our captains. I have to speak with Lord Morngreem and Lady Silverhand and tell them what we intend. He glanced once more at the open fields before him, wondering briefly how many elves and humans would meet their ends in those common farm fields by dawn the next morning. Then he turned away to go in search of the Lord of Shadowdale and Storm Silverhand. He found Morngreem Amkothra inspecting the old ditch and rampart earthworks that lay a few hundred yards north of the town, barring passage against any invader approaching along the northern road. The ramparts had been raised fifteen years past to defend the town against another Zentrum invasion. The elven army was bivouacked a mile to the north, astride the road, but the Grimar, as folk from Shadowdale preferred to be called, after the old castle Grimstead that had once stood in the dale, were readying the ramparts as a second line of defense. Morningreen was pounding sharpened stakes into the ground with his own hands, hard at work with the whole crew of townsfolk, as Several rolled up. Lord Miratar, he said with a nod, wiping the sweat from his brow. The Zents are staying put? Yes, for now, Several said. He dismounted and left his reins with the knights who served as his guard. They are not going to move, not as long as they hope to catch our army between the Red Plumes and their own force. Yet we have to scatter or destroy the Zentalar as quickly as possible so that we can turn back to deal with the Red Plumes and Sembians in Missledale and Battledale. We will have to take the fight to them, I am afraid. Morngreem gave a stake two more taps with the wooden sledge he held, then set down the hammer and said, I'd rather stand on the defensive, but I understand your predicament. Shadowdale isn't the only realm you're fighting for. What do you have in mind? We will march against their camp and attack an hour after moonset. The Lord of Shadowdale glanced sharply at him. You'll have to start marching in a matter of hours. Can your captains organize an attack on a fortified camp that quickly? Yes, said Several, and he felt a pang of pride in his heart as he realized that he was not boasting. It will be hard, but we have faced worse in the last few months. He paused, then added. 
There is an advantage to a hasty attack. If there are any spies around, Damon Fay or Zent, they will not have much of an opportunity to discover our intentions and report. I wish that were not a consideration, but you are right. The human lord looked off toward the north, where the ruddy glare of watchfires drew a broad red smear across the northern sky. Elven archery in the night is a fearsome thing, but my folk will be hindered by darkness until the skies start to lighten. Could you detail a company of your scouts to march with the muster of Shadowdale? A few of your elves will go a long way toward guiding my folk to the fight in the dark, and helping them until it grows light enough for humans to see well too. A wise idea, Lord Amkathra. I will make sure that a good number of Toretta Starcloak's wood elves march in your ranks in the morning. Severo looked around and asked, Is Lady Silverhand nearby? She should be told too. She's out in the eastern dale with a party of riders, harpers and such folk, Morngreen said. She saw an opportunity to waylay a Zentalar cavalry squadron and a couple of sky mages that have been causing trouble out there, and I asked her to make a sweep of the forest border to make sure that the Zents weren't looking to march east and outflank our lines. I'll send a couple of her harpers after her tonight. He offered Several a grim smile. You know, Storm told me before she left that she thought you'd move against the enemy camp within a day or two. I think she knew your mind before you did. It would not surprise me, Several answered. He stepped forward and gripped Morngreen's forearms. I must return to our camp. We will send the wood elf soon, and the moment I know where and when we will strike, I will send word. Morngreen nodded. If we can drive them out of their camp, there's no place for the Zents to stop running before they reach Vunlar. I like the thought of that. Six hours later, Several sat on his courser, armed and armored for battle. He had managed only half an hour of reverie while the rest of the camp was rising and arming, since he spent his whole night hammering out the best plan of attack he and Starbrow could come up with. Yet he did not feel tired. The hour having come for him to test his strength against Zentel Keep, he was anxious to be about it. Adrela Muraraste reports that the Silver Guard is in position, Lord Miratar, said Adrason. The young captain was Several's herald and adjutant on the field of battle. As much as Several relied on Thilisol as his aide de camp, she was not a skilled fighter. Instead, she remained with the other healers and clerics to tend to the inevitable tide of the wounded and dying, and Adrason served as his voice and messenger on the battlefield. Very good, Adrason! Several looked up and down along the line. Concealed with illusory mists that mimicked a low ground fog hovering over the damp, cold fields in the chill night air, the crusade was arrayed for battle. In the center marched Several's best infantry, the Vale Guards from Everesca he had not left behind in Mistledale. Several had also massed most of his magical might in the center. His blade singers, spell archers, and battle mages marched among his heavy infantry, some openly, others disguised as common foot soldiers. To his left, on the west side of the dale, Jaretta Starcloak's wood elves were already slipping through the dark forests. On his right, where the land was somewhat more open, the Grimar had gathered under their Lord Morngreem. Several was surprised to find the townsfolk arrayed in quiet, purposeful ranks, with none of the sloppiness or empty bravado he might have expected of a hastily gathered militia. More than a few of those farmers and merchants knew their way around the battlefield, and the elf lord realized that he had misjudged their strength. Then again, the Zents had done exactly that more than once, hadn't they? Several twisted in his saddle, an awkward motion in his plate armor, and verified once again the companies of knights and cavalrymen who waited behind the infantry. Feral Nimrosol and the Moon Knights of Sehenin, along with the remaining Knights of the Golden Star and Lord Theremin's men-at-arms from Deepingdale, made up most of that force. If Several's hammer blow on the center carried the Zentish earthworks, it was their job to stream through the hole and devastate the camp. All right, Atracen, he said. Pass the word. Forward, march! Atracen softly called out the order 
and the banners of Severo's command company dipped once. All along the line, keen-eyed elves watched for the visual signal. Severo had no intention of announcing the attack with horn blasts or battle cries. With an uneven surge, the elves flowed smoothly out into the misty fields before the enemy's own earthworks. The Zentalar had raised their last camp only five miles from the town itself. The elves and the Grimar had closed to within a mile in a cold, dark march they started three hours after midnight. Corellan, grant us a swift and easy victory, Severo prayed fervently. Lull the Zents to slumber for just a little longer. I do not want to send any more of your sons and daughters to Arvindor than I must today. Their mail muffled with strips of cloth, silent in the dim fog, the army pressed forward. The elves were taking care not to march in step, and did not have heavy footfalls in any event, so all that met Severo's ears was an ominous rustle and creaking, punctuated by the occasional soft wicker of a horse or low cough. Steadily the ramparts drew closer, and in the morning mist Severo found himself entertaining the curious conceit that his army was standing still, while the waiting battle at the ramparts was slowly advancing on him instead of the other way around. A brilliant stroke of lightning flashed overhead, followed by a peal of thunder. Severo looked up at once and saw in the fading brilliance the shape of a great winged monster wheeling overhead. He glimpsed a dark figure astride the flying monster, a staff clutched in his hands. The Zentalar Sky Mage hurled another blast of lightning down at the Grimar off to his right, but then a pair of eagle knights streaked down out of the dark skies, lances couched. The monster croaked and turned away as a furious melee erupted in the skies over the elves' march. Well, I didn't really think we would reach the camp undetected, Severo muttered. Adrason, wind your horn! Now is the time for speed! In the crude earthworks ahead, a flat iron gong began to sound, beating an alarm. But a moment later, it was drowned out by the high, clear ringing of dozens of elven horns. From the crusade came a great roar in answer, and the elves and the dales folk broke into a run, hurrying to cross the last few hundred yards of ground before the Zents could fully man their palisade. A barrage of battle magic blasted out from the Zentalar camp, streaking fireballs and scathing ice storms, but Gerildin and the other battle mages were ready for that. They quickly countered most of the Zentish magic, dispelling deadly invocations or raising magical shields to ward off battle spells. Many of the Zentish spells faltered, broken on the elven defenses, but a few streaked through and detonated amid the onrushing elf and human soldiers. Horses screamed in the cold air, and battle cries became shrieks of pain, but the elves' rush swept on unbroken. From a dozen places in the elven lines, mages halted their advance for a step to reply with spells of their own, scouring the enemy earthworks. Archers! cried Several. Cover the ramparts! Trained to fire on the move, elf archers began to shower the palisade with a silver storm of arrows. Even though the Zentalar, rushing up to take up station behind their staked ditch and berm, were well hidden by their earthworks, all an elf archer needed was a glimpse of a foe to send an arrow winging his way with uncanny accuracy. Severo was close enough to see bands of knoll archers gathering behind the ramparts to fire back, as companies of ogres, bugbears, orcs, and black-clad human pikemen streamed up to defend their ramparts. But they were slow to form ranks, and several large gaps beckoned, places where Zentel Keep soldiers had not yet reached their posts or elven battle magic had seared the ramparts clear. We have them, Severo thought and he started to give Adrasen the order to charge. But at that moment, the air all around Severo and his guard rippled and boomed with dozens upon dozens of sulfurous belches. Demons and devils by the score appeared all around Severo's banner, grinning with needle fangs, eyes ablaze with hellish glee as they teleported to attack Severo's standard. Elves surrounding Severo cried out in panic, and horses screamed in sudden terror. Where the daemons? cried Adrasen. To the banner! To the banner! The center of the charging elven line was thrown into chaos. 
Several found himself beset by a pair of insect-like mesoloths, fearsome hellspawn who carried great tridents of iron. He danced his mount aside from the stabbing points, and barked out the words of a prayer that unsummoned one of the monsters, hurling it back into the foul netherworld from which it had come. The other monsters lunged and nearly impaled the elf lord with a low belly thrust that Several barely blocked with his shield. He reared his warhorse and battered at the monster with his courser's deadly silver-shod hooves, then wheeled it around and caught the dazed Yugoloth off guard, smashing at it with his holy mace. The weapon burned with a pure white light as it struck demon flesh, and the Mesoloth's beak clicked and hissed in pain. The Mesoloth reeled back out of reach and vanished into the confusion of the fray. Several looked around desperately, trying to see what had become of the attack. The Zentish ramparts were only sixty yards away, and he could see that on both the right and the left that the Wood Elves and the Dales folk were already sweeping up and over, laying down a storm of arrows. Whole companies of elven infantry from the center continued their attack as well, already ahead of the demons who had suddenly teleported into their midst. And behind him, the Moon Knights and Knights of the Golden Star were falling upon Sarya's demonic minions. Several had wanted to use them to wreck the camp, but they had to drive off the demons and devils, and Feral Nimusel knew it. A gout of fearsome hellfire washed over Several, and he staggered in his saddle as his mount reared and screamed. The elf lord wrestled with the animal, speaking a quick healing prayer to salve his mount's injuries, and looked up just in time to catch the heavy blow of a Nycoloth's brazen sword on his shield. The hulking monster snapped at him with its awful maw, and caught Several's right arm in its teeth. Elven plate crumpled in the force of its bite, and Several cried out as the foul fangs pierced his flesh. His mace dropped from his fingers, and the Nycoloth wrenched him out of his saddle, shaking him like a dog worrying at a rabbit. "'Get away from me, Hellspawn!' Several snarled. He ignored the agonizing pain in his arm and the bruising and battering, finding the clear still center in his soul where Corella and Lorethian's divine power waited, and he shouted out a holy word of great power. In a burst of supernal white light, Several blasted a circle twenty yards wide clear of demons, devils, yugoloths, and all other sorts of foul creatures from the lower plains. The Nycoloth shaking him vanished with an ear-splitting howl, so suddenly that Several dropped to the ground and went to all fours, shaking his head. Wincing inside his helm, he looked at the blood streaming from the punctures in his arms and took a moment to whisper another healing prayer, staunching the wound. Then he groped for his silver mace and clambered to his feet, looking for his mount. Lord Several, are you hurt? Adrasen rode up his golden armor badly scorched on one side, but seemingly unhurt otherwise. Feral Nimrosol of the Moon Knights followed him, his gleaming white armor spattered with black gore. I've lost my mount, but I am all right, Several managed. He spied another horse nearby, its owner nowhere in sight, and hurried over to swing himself up into the saddle. The Golden Star Knights and the Moon Knights were all around him, battling furiously against those hellspawn that still remained. He groaned in frustration, seeing the chaos that had come from the Daemon Fey intervention. But then a ragged shout of triumph from the right caught his ear. He looked toward the ramparts and saw that only a few dark islands of Zentalar soldiers remained on the ramparts. Left and right, Wood Elf and Dale's folk archers held the earthworks and rained arrows down into the camp from point-blank range, and even in the center, the Everescans had managed to seize their line as well. What kind of unholy alliance has Sawyer forged with the lower plains? Feral Nimusel snarled. Demons, devils, Yugoloths all fighting together. They are supposed to be the most implacable of enemies. I have no answer, Severo replied though it was a question that troubled him, too. There was no time to answer it just then, however. Pharaoh, rally your knights to my banner. I mean to take that camp. The commander of the Moon Knights nodded and called for his riders to gather at Several's banner. In the space of a hundred heartbeats, better than fourscore knights of both the orders assembled in a dense knot around Several. 
Then they rode forward, veering to make for the gap where the Everescans had breached the rampart. Several kept his eyes away from the elf warriors who lay still among the stakes of the ditch and the steep berm, spurring his new mount to scramble up the rampart. At the crest of the earthwork, he paused to take in the scene. There was little fighting along the rampart. The elves had seized the camp's fortifications but a furious melee still raged among the tents and wagons of the Zentish camp. The first gray gleam of the coming dawn lightened the sky to the east, and by its faint light Several could see to the far side of the camp, where hundreds of Zents were streaming north, abandoning their encampment. But waiting for them along the road to Vunlar was the silver guard of Elian, with Starbrow and Adrela Muareste at its head. Five hundred elven cavalry to ride down and harry the Zents as they fled. Well done, Severo, said Feral Nimisol. Even with a demon attack, your plan worked. We've got half their army trapped between us and the Silver Guard. Severo nodded. Corellin has favored us again. Come, my friends, we have hard and ugly work to finish here. With a high battle cry, he spurred his way down from the earthworks into the camp, followed by the knights of Evermeet. A raven and his comrades remained at Tower Deir for several days, guests of Lord Tercernal, Nesterin, and their folk. They were not prisoners, at least they were not disarmed or confined, but Tercernal was very clear that they were not to leave without his permission. Maressa prowled the tower continuously more than half convinced that they were prisoners who simply didn't know it yet, but a raven availed himself of the opportunity to study the elf lord's library of old tomes, and Ocevile study the star elves themselves. They were an ancient people, the descendants of the old kingdom of Yuri Reshenyar, that had once stood in Aglaron's forests thousands of years ago. In appearance they were very much like moon elves, though they tended toward fair hair instead of the dark brown or blue-black of most moon elves. But a raven found their reserve and serious demeanor more reminiscent of many sun elves he knew. They had a love of song and music that was remarkable, even among elves, and when a truly skilled singer such as Nesterin raised his voice, the effect was so unearthly and beautiful that time itself seemed to fall still and listen. As Nesterin had told them, the Star Elves had created Silda Uir as a refuge, a place to which they could retreat from the cruel and ambitious human empires that had arisen in the ancient East. More than a thousand years before the raising of the Standing Stone in the Dales, the human kingdoms of Narfel and Raumathar, as well as Unther and Mulhorand, had fought furiously for dominion in the region. In western Faerun, many elves had retreated to Evermeet to avoid such ambitious human empires, but the Star Elves had decided to simply remove their entire realm rather than abandon it to flee elsewhere. All of Silda Uir was a great work of high magic, an echo of the Uir wood itself spun into starshine and dusk through mighty spells of old. Since the creation of Silda Uir, the Star Elves had slowly slipped farther and farther from Faerun, leaving the Daylight World to its own devices. Many still traveled through the old Elf Gates and roamed Aglarond or the Inner Sea, but they passed themselves off as Moon Elves and did not speak of their homeland to strangers. Few Elves remained in the forests of the East outside of Aglarond itself and those who lived within the Uir wood kept their silence regarding the Star Elves' secret. A raven spoke with Tessernil at length, and discovered that after leaving Arkarar almost five thousand years ago, the wizard Morthil had returned to Urareshenyar and subsequently become that realm's grand mage. He had played a leading role in the affairs of the kingdom for several centuries. The former apprentice of Ithrades had gone on to become an even greater mage than his master in time, founding a society of wizards known as the Cineral Tathir, or the Moon Crescent Order. The order survived all the long centuries from the time of Arkarar down to Silda Ewer's creation, three thousand years after the time of Ithrades and two thousand years before the present day. Even among elves, that is a very great span of time. A raven said to Tessernal and Nesterin as they sat together in the library. How is it that Morthol has been remembered for so long? 
His tomb lies in the rotunda of Moon Crescent Tower, Tisainol said. He was revered as the founder of the order. I saw it when I studied there in my youth. A raven's heart leaped in his chest. He set his hand to his breastbone and felt the night star murmur under his touch. Morthal's works had survived to within a single elf lifetime of the present day. Was it too much to hope that a Telkira stone or a spell passed down from master to apprentice over the years might still endure too? Does any of Morthil's handiwork still survive? Lore gems, spells he created, spell books he scribed? When I was young, there were stories told in the Cineral Tathir that the secret libraries and vaults of the tower might hold such things. But that was a long time ago, about three hundred years after the making of Silda Uir and the translation of our kingdom into this plain. A raven stared at Tisernal. You told me before that Yuri Reshenyar had been removed to Silda Uir two thousand years ago. You have lived that long? Time flows differently in Silda Uir, a raven. One year passes here for every two in the world outside. Tisernil offered a small smile. I was born over eighteen hundred years ago, but I am in truth not more than nine hundred years old. You may not find that remarkable, but few of my folk reach nine centuries, even in Evermeet, a raven said. Queen Amlerul might be that old, but she enjoys the blessing of the Seldarine themselves. It is noteworthy among my people as well, Nessirin observed. He offered a crooked smile. I introduced Lord Tessernal to you as my uncle. It would have been more accurate to add a few greats before that. You said before that you thought Morthol's tower lies in the farthest reach of your realm. You were referring to Moon Crescent Tower? Yes, Tessernal replied. So I need only speak to the masters of the tower then, a raven said. They will be able to help me with Morthil's ancient lore. That is the problem, Nesterin said. The order failed some time ago, and Moon Crescent Tower has been abandoned for centuries. It lies at the very border of our realm. Given what I recently discovered when I visited House Errol Pay, I fear that the place may no longer be accessible. As soon as you give me leave to, I certainly intend to try it, regardless of the tower's present circumstances, a raven answered. I have no small experience in dealing with ancient ruins and warding magic. The older elf lord nodded. I cannot understand the peril you may face, a raven, but I did not expect that you would depart without trying. He glanced in a starin and continued. I have spoken with some of the other house lords of our land, taking counsel about you and your companions. I have decided to allow you to attempt Moon Crescent Tower. Nesterin here has agreed to guide you, at least as far as any road will serve. I thank you, Lord Tesserno. A raven said. He stood and offered a deep bow to the ancient elf lord. You might not later, if things prove as dangerous as I fear they may, Tessernal said. He stood as well and gravely returned a raven's bow. You may set out when you like, a raven. I wish you good fortune and a safe journey. For two days, Skyloa Darkhope fought with every inch of her zeal and determination to extricate something from the disaster on the borders of Shadowdale. By all rights, the Zentrum army should have disintegrated completely in the retreat back to Vunlar, harried as it was by the slashing attacks of pursuing elf riders. But Skyloa personally commanded the rearguard action, turning at bay and standing her ground whenever the elves pressed too close then wheeling away to gallop another mile or two down the road as soon as the elves had been repulsed again. As she harangued the last weary companies of the rearguard, keeping them on their feet and moving north through nothing more than her own unswerving will, she found Fazul Chembrel at a nameless ford ten miles south of Vunlar. The lord of Zentel Keep and his company of guards came riding south, against the march of soldiers retreating north, breasting a path through the exhausted ranks with callous indifference. When Fazul caught sight of Skylua, he said, Ah, there you are. Come, Skylua. I would like to have a word with you. Skylua dismounted and followed Fazul into an old stone cottage that overlooked the ford. She did not fear punishment for her failure at Shadowdale. There was no point in dreading it. She had failed, and she would be disciplined. 
That was the way of the Black Lord. If she wanted to earn Bane's favor again, she must endure her punishment stoically, with no attempt at evasion or excuses. Fazul muttered the words of a spell and sealed the cottage from scrying or outside observation. Then, when he was satisfied, he turned to Skylua and delivered a great backhanded slap to her face that spun her half around and left her reeling drunkenly, her ears ringing. How did you allow this to happen? he demanded. Skylua spat blood from her split lip and slowly straightened. She kept her hands at her sides, expecting that her lord and master would strike her again. I failed to take sufficient precautions against an attack on my own camp, my lord, she said. I expected to attack, not to be attacked. Did you not entrench your camp every night and post a strong watch? I did, my lord, but events proved those measures insufficient. Clearly, Fazul muttered. Recount all that happened as you marched south from Vunlar. Do not seek to conceal anything from me. Skylowa did as she was told. When she had finished, she awaited Fazul's punishment with open eyes. But the Chosen of Bane did not immediately lash out. Instead, he turned away, frowning, his thick arms crossed before his chest. After a long time, he spoke. Circumstances beyond your control contributed to your failure, he grudgingly admitted. We had an excellent chance to crush the elven army but the red plumes and Sembians did not take the steps that needed to be taken. Skylua looked up at Fazul. The red plumes did not move on Mistledale? she asked in surprise. She'd simply assumed that Hillsfar would have moved against the elven army's rear. Malthir is not stupid, she muttered, talking more to herself than Fazul. He would not have missed that chance unless he chose to miss it. He has betrayed us, Lord Fazul. My spies in Hillsfar report that Malthir had some sort of falling out with his mysterious new allies. There were reports of a fearsome magical duel fought in the First Lord's Tower several days ago. Does Malthir still live? Regrettably, yes. But this story of a falling out with Sarya intrigues me. Fazul looked back to Skylua. The Daemon Fey agents who accompanied you and summoned the demons against Evermeet's army, what became of them? They abandoned us after we were driven from the camp, Skylowa said bitterly. As soon as they saw that we were beaten, Lord Rayathel and his guards declined to offer any more assistance and left. It seems that we are no longer useful to them, said Fazul. He scowled. Now what? Do I hold back strength to counter Hillsfar, or Mithdranor, for that matter? Do I strike a deal with the Daemon Fey and turn against Malthir? Or do Malthir and I hold to our agreement and simply remove the Daemon Fey from consideration? Skylowa stood motionless, blood trickling from her damaged face. She would not be so forward as to offer an opinion. Fazul was lost in his own dark thoughts anyway. He stroked his mustache and nodded. We deal with Malthir, he decided. That's the thing to do. As long as we have an understanding with hills far and Sembia, we must profit by it. Let the elves worry about the Daemon Fey, and vice versa. In the meantime, Skylua, you will repair this broken army as quickly as you can. I will have need of it soon. Chapter 16 26 Kythorn, The Year of Lightning Storms A raven and his comrades set out from the citadel of House Deir on the day following a raven's conversation with Lord Tessernal. The elf lord provided them with mounts for their journey. The horses of Silda Ewer were lightly built and graceful, with spirited manners. Donner Kurth looked on their destriers with some suspicion not entirely sure that the horses could keep up a good speed on a long ride, but the star elf mounts proved quick and enduring. They soon showed that they could outpace the heavily armored Dawnmaster, even if they were several hands shorter than the big roan Kurth had brought with him. Nesterin rode at their head, 
leading the way along dim, shadowy roads of moss-grown grey stone that wound through countless miles of dusky forest. A raven and Elcevile rode behind the star elf, followed by Maressa and Kurth. Jorn Kel Harthen brought up the rear of the party, keeping a careful eye on the shadows behind them as they rode on. Tessernal had warned them that no part of Silde Ewer outside the walls of an elven citadel was truly safe, and the Ewer ranger had taken the warning to heart. They went on for several days, as near as a raven could tell, halting to rest in the hours when the gloaming was at its deepest and the stars shone brightly in the velvet sky, then rising as the pearly gray of the lighter hours began to seep back up into the sky. From time to time they crossed over rushing streams on bridges of pale stone, or came to silent crossroads in the forests, places where dim roads led off into the shadows beneath the silver trees. They even passed by several lonely citadels or towers, isolated keeps whose gleaming battlements looked out over the forest from rugged hilltops, or slumbered in broad, grassy vales. Some of the towers glimmered with lantern light and song, but others were dark and still, long abandoned. As they rode past another of the empty towers, Maressa gazed up at the shadowed tower and shuddered. "'Is this whole realm desolate?' she asked aloud. "'We've gone sixty miles or more from Tower Deir, and we haven't met a single person on the road. We've passed more empty keeps than occupied ones.' Nesterin glanced back at Maressa and shrugged. "'Most of the realm is like this,' he said. My people built true cities long ago, but our numbers have been dwindling for centuries. With the whole plain to ourselves, we never saw a need to crowd together into narrow lands and teeming towns. But I fear that the distances between our keeps and towers and towns are growing longer with each year. Do any towns or keeps lie ahead of us? Ilsevle asked. The star elf shook his head. Our road doesn't take us near any towns, he said. We are heading out toward the edge of the realm. In fact, I know of only one more keep on this road before we reach the place where Moon Crescent Tower once stood. As it turned out, the keep that Nesterin remembered was also abandoned, with no sign of its people. Its walls were pitted and charred, as if by acid. The Nilshai, the Star Elf said bitterly, as they studied the ruins. They must have come here, too. You are under attack, Nesterin said Donner. Your foes are destroying you one by one. You must gather your strength, and soon, or you will be lost. We are not as warlike as you humans, Nesterin protested. Silda Ewer has never had any need of an army. We are the only realm on this plain. War has come to Silda Ewer, whether you are ready for it or not, Ilsevile said. Nesterin bowed his head and did not answer. They managed another day and a half of riding before they came to the first of the grey mist rivers. The road dropped into a dark, shallow dell, and in the bottom of the small hollow a silvery mist or dust flowed sluggishly across the road like a low fog. At first glance the stuff seemed innocuous, but as they drew closer the horses stamped nervously and refused to set foot in it. "'Is this the mist you encountered when you rode to Aeropay?' Elsevely asked Nesterin. The Star Elf frowned. Yes, it is, but I did not expect to meet it so soon. We're many miles from Moon Crescent yet. He glanced around the shining forest, his eyes dark and troubled. Aeolus El Seldari, what is becoming of my homeland? It's just a little mist, Maressa snorted. Just ride on through and have done with it. The horses don't like it at all, Ilsevile said, and now that I'm here, I find that I don't like it either. Ride on through if you like, but I think we should look for a way around it if we can. The Genesi tapped her heels to her mount's flanks and urged the animal forward until the mist lapped over the horse's hooves, and strange tendrils or streamers of the silvery stuff seemed to wind around its legs. The horse began to shy in fright, its ears flat along its head, its eyes wide and rolling. Maressa struggled with the animal, but then she gasped and drew away backing the horse quickly away. The mist tried to grab me, she exclaimed. I didn't see anything, rumbled Donner. Are you sure? I felt it, Maressa insisted. It's thick as molasses in there. 
and it was trying to pull me in deeper. She shuddered, her white hair streaming from her face as if she stood in a strong wind. Have you ever stood in a high place and felt as if you might fall? As if you were about to slip over, but you didn't really want to stop yourself? It's something like that. Nesterin nodded in agreement. That's how I recall it. I discovered that I didn't dare cross more than a few feet of the mist, not even when the Nilshai were on my heels. Elsevile looked over to a raven. What is this, a raven? Do you have any idea? The wizard studied the weird, silver-gray mist streaming slowly through the hollow's floor. I'm not sure, he said. One moment. He murmured the words of a seeing spell and studied his surroundings, searching for signs of magic. His companions all glowed brightly, armed as they were with various enchanted weapons or protective spells. A raven ignored them and bent his attention to the sluggish silver-gray river of dust, or mist or smoke, that flowed across their path. Slowly, he realized that the whole forest around him and the sky overhead was a vault of deep and powerful magic, a great silver artifice of staggering size. High magic, he thought. Of course, Tessernal said as much. The plain of Silda Ewer was called into being by high magic. He couldn't even begin to imagine the difficulty and precision of the high magic ritual that had called a whole world into being. But the evidence was before his eyes. He tore his gaze from the faint silver vault of flowing magic that filled the sky and shaped the ground, and looked again at the gray stream of dust. It was a crawling black gate, a ghostly portal that flickered and shifted beneath the mist, and it was growing. Whatever it touched was consumed, taken out of Silda Ewer to some other place. When the mist dissipated, its contents might return, or they might not. Like a great boring worm, the mist was chewing its way through the homeland of the Star Elves, devouring the magic and the very existence of the plain itself. Corellan's sword, a raven whispered. Well, what do you see? Maressa asked. You did well to turn away from the mist, a raven answered. It's a portal to another dimension, and if I am any judge of such things, not a dimension you would want to visit. We will have to avoid any such rivers we come across. That will become more and more difficult the farther we venture from Silda Ewer's heart, Nesterin warned. In the farthest reaches of the realm there is nothing but this cursed mist. They turned their horses from the road and climbed up the side of the dell, simply circumventing the silver-gray pool roiling across the road. But as they continued on their way, they began to meet with more and more of the glimmering streams. Sometimes long tongues or arms of the mist seemed to shadow their path, twisting through the trees and glades of the forest beside the road. Other times pools or streams blocked their path, forcing them to detour away from the road and feel their way forward through the forest. The woodland fell ominously silent, with not a hint of birdsong or animal movement. A raven realized that most of the forest creatures had long since abandoned the mist-haunted districts of the forest, seeking more wholesome environs. At the end of Silda Ewer's dim day, they made their camp atop a small knoll in the forest. A raven had observed that the silver mist tended to cling to low-lying areas, and it seemed prudent to seek a camp in some high place so that they would not be overcome while they rested. When they rose in the morning and studied their surroundings, they found that the knoll afforded a good view of the country around them. A great gulf of silver-gray mist lay only a few miles away, carving its way through the forested hillsides like a fog-shrouded arm of the sea. Other inlets and channels glinted in the bright distance ahead and on all sides, as if they were approaching a seacoast of sorts. It's closing in behind us, Jorn murmured, looking back the way they had come. I don't know if we could retrace our steps. A raven followed the Yui ranger's gaze and saw that large parts of the road they had passed along in their travel of the day before seemed to have been swallowed by the pearly streaks. He steeled himself and turned back toward the land ahead. We will find a way through, he told Joran. I know some spells that may help. They broke camp quickly, unwilling to risk being stranded on the hilltop, and continued toward the edge of the realm. During the last hour of their ride, great arms of silver-gray nothingness came to surround them on either side, 
so that it seemed that they were riding along a low, treacherous peninsula jutting out into a misty sea. Small patches and pools of mist began to appear in the road and in the woods to either side, slowly growing larger and more frequent as they pressed on, until they met and merged together. Finally, they came to a place where they simply could go no farther. Ahead of them lay nothing but endless silver-gray mist, cold and perfect. They halted and stood still for a time, looking out over nothingness. Finally, a raven shook himself and looked over to Nesterin. How much farther to Moon Crescent? he asked. The star elf looked around, studying those landmarks that hadn't been swallowed yet. Five miles, I think. But there's no other way through. It's gone. A raven stared at the mist, and remembered the pure shining fountain he had seen in his vision many days and long miles before. The night star was cold and hard in his chest, a dull, aching weight that seemed to transfix his heart. He could almost hear Salithol's mocking laughter, as this strangest of all obstacles checked his path toward high magic and the knowledge he needed to contest Saria de Lardrigeth's power in Mithdranor. I am not about to let Salithil de Lardrigeth laugh at me, he told himself. Without glancing at his companions, he dismounted from his horse and began to undo the animal's saddle belt. A raven, what are you doing? Ilsevle asked. The horses are terrified of the mist, he said. We can't take them in there. To the nine hells with the horses, Maressa snapped. We can't take us in there. Nevertheless, a raven said, I am going forward. I ask no one else to come with me. The rest of the company stared at him for a long moment, and Ilsevile slid wordlessly from her saddle and began to remove the harness from her own horse. A moment later, Donner Kurth and Joran followed suit, and Nesterin as well. Finally, Maressa swore and swung herself down from the horse. "'You're all mad!' she snapped. "'This is the worst idea I've heard in a long time!' "'I know,' a raven said." He tossed the saddle into the grass at the side of the road and patted his horse's neck. But it's the only one I have right now. The First Lord's Tower gleamed above the thin blanket of mist, smoke, and lantern light that pooled in Hillsfar's streets. Despite the late hour, the city was not entirely asleep. The distant sounds of raucous shouts and bawdy singing drifted from those tap houses that were still open. Apprentices worked to keep ovens and kilns stoked in workshops that needed their fires throughout the night, and folk were already rising to go to bakeries and smokehouses and begin their work for the morning. Squads of red plume guards patrolled the streets and kept watch from the battlements of Malthir's keep. Saya de Lardrigeth looked over the rooftops of the human city and bared her fangs in a malice-filled smile. She had spent days preparing her counterstroke to Malthir's treachery. Through her mastery of Mithdranner's mythal, she had summoned hundreds of Yugoloths and demons to her banner. She commanded the allegiance of scores upon scores of Malkazid's devils, outcasts from the nine hells who followed the branded king. Gathered around her was a small horde of infernal monsters, demons and devils stronger than ogres and invulnerable to anything other than magic spells or enchanted weapons. Some were armed with fearsome claws, fangs, and stingers, others with brazen swords and cruel axes forged in the fires of the pit, and each of them was capable of summoning scathing blasts of hellfire, blinding, choking, or stunning their foes with words of evil power, or calling on even more terrible supernatural powers. And close beside her were three hundred of her most dangerous fairy warriors, skilled sorcerers and swordsmen who could fight with blade or spell with equal adeptness. Malthir, the first lord of Hillsfar, was about to wake to a city far less peaceful and secure than he'd imagined. Slay every soul you find in the first lord's tower, Sarya called to her fiendish horde. Then tear it down and set the city afire. Now fly, my warriors, fly! With a thunderous beat, Sarya's fairy warband leaped into the air as one. Those demons and Yugoloths that could fly followed her fairy warriors, while the others simply teleported themselves directly to the battlements of Malthir's citadel. 
With the swiftness of a stooping dragon, Sarya's winged warriors arrowed over the stout city walls, streaking toward the high tower gleaming in the moonlight. Fireballs and gouts of hellish flame began to burst down in the city itself, and screams rose in the night as people awoke to a nightmare of fire and claws. Despite her orders, more than a few of her summoned demons had chosen to simply attack the sleeping city. Sarya scowled, but she didn't try to recall the fiends. Random slaughter and chaos in the streets would serve to confuse Hillsfar's defenders as to the true nature of the attack. She and her winged warband reached the First Lord's Tower, and Sarya alighted on the high terrace that Malthir had formerly set aside for use in teleporting to his keep. An iron-clad door sealed the tower interior from the open battlements. Sarya gestured to a Nykaloth hovering nearby. Through there, she commanded. Yes, my queen, the monster hissed. It dropped down in front of the iron door and clenched its great talons in the iron plate. With a mighty effort, the hulking creature wrenched the door from its pintle and hurled it across the battlements, sending it crashing to the street. Sawyer watched the heavy door shatter the stone steps at the tower's gate. Down below the battlements, a large band of fairies stormed Malthir's front gate, leaving a dozen red plumes dead on the steps, hacked down by Daemon Fae swords or charred by Daemon Fae spells. More bands of fairy and demons assaulted other entrances to the tower, or simply teleported inside. The Nykaloth ducked down and pushed its way into the tower, but a terrible flash of blue light suddenly flared in front of the creature, and a potent symbol shone brightly before it. The Nykaloth screeched once and staggered back, its talons raised in front of its eyes, and it froze motionless, its green scaly hide suddenly growing clear and translucent. In the space of an instant, the monster was turned into glass. Sarya motioned to her fairy. Get rid of that, she snarled. A pair of rocks wrestled the glass Nykaloth out of the way and hurled the petrified creature from the battlements in the same spot where the iron door had been dropped. The Nykaloth exploded into countless shards of flying glass below, but Sarya paid the creature no mind. She turned her attention to the symbol guarding Malthir's tower, and she chanted the words of a powerful cancellation spell. The symbol glowed once under the force of her magic before it vanished. A potent defense, Malthir, but not sufficient to repel my attack, Sarya gloated. She stepped aside, and her demons and hell-spawned warriors poured into the fortress. Great gouts of hellfire exploded in the doorway, and she heard the ring of steel on steel and screams of terror. Malthir doubtless had many arcane defenses within his tower, but he likely had never planned on fighting off the attack of hundreds of demons and hell-spawned warriors at one stroke. Towering constructs of stone and iron animated in defense of the First Lord's Sanctum. Eugoloths and demons shattered the living statues with their fearsome hellfire. Red plume guards fought desperately to drive off the attack, only to fall by the score under fairy swords and demon claws. Find Moth here! Slay him! Sarya cried. Leave no one alive! Powerful spells and wards appeared to slay or block Sarya's minions, but she and her most skillful sorcerers struck down Malthir's defenses or simply overwhelmed them by hurling Yugoloths and demons into the shrieking arcs of destruction until the spells were exhausted. Daemon Fae magic shattered walls, broke open vaults, and set the tower burning with hellish red flames that leaped and spread, dancing through the First Lord's Tower. For half an hour, Sarya and her warriors tore Malthir's burning tower apart, searching for any sign of the First Lord or his elite guards. But finally, Sarya grudgingly gave up on destroying Malthir in person. Even if he had been present at the beginning of the attack, she had no doubt that he would have fled rather than stay to defend his citadel against her attack. She watched over the destruction, delighting in the screams of terror. Malthir would not soon forget her visit. And better yet, Zolf was at that very moment leading an even larger attack against the Red Plumes encamped near the Standing Stone, fifty miles to the south. 
She had no intention of giving her foes any more set-piece battles, not when she commanded thousands of hell-spawned warriors and demons who could appear out of thin air or strike like dragons out of the night sky. Zoff was under orders to slaughter, not fight, to rake the standards and pavilions in the heart of the Red Plume camp with hellfire and deadly spells, then withdraw with chaos in his wake. Next, she'd visit the same terror on the Sembians. Then she'd turn her infernal hordes against those wretched humans in Mistledale or Shadowdale, and Evermeet's accursed army. There would be no disaster at the Lonely Moor to save Evermeet's traitors from destruction at her hands. With each sunset, her armies grew stronger. More and more demons and yugoloths answered her summons and poured through the gates she'd opened in Mithdranor. The next time Sarya met Evermeet in battle, she did not intend to be defeated. Malthir will not elude me forever, she decided. She had other things to do that night, and she had harried hills far enough for the time being. Sarya called for her captains and demons and strode out of Malthir's burning tower into a night that had turned red with fire. Well done, my children, well done, Sarya cried. She looked back on the inferno that had been Malthir's tower, and the firelight danced in her malevolent green eyes. Now come away. We have more slaying to do tonight. The first three steps into the swirling gray mist seemed harmless enough, though a raven's ankles crawled at the sensation of the thick vapor tugging at him as he moved deeper. It felt as if he were wading into a sea, warm and thick as blood. He could see the white tree trunks and silver-green boughs behind him, the fair green hills of silver-tasseled grass rising not far behind him, the pale mossy stones of the road leading back into the luminous depths of the twilit forest. Then a raven took another step, and he plummeted into darkness. He cried out and flailed, his senses reeling, transfixed in a moment of endless falling. But then his foot fell on the next step of the road, he stumbled to his knees and found himself on all fours on a path made of dull paving stones covered over with thick, oily black moss. The stink of wet rot assailed his nostrils, and he looked up into a pallid, festering jungle. Silver Ewer's silver starlight was gone, leaving only a humid, cloying blackness broken only by the sickly green phosphorescence of huge, rotting toadstools. The trees are dead, he realized. The great silver-white bowls of Silda Ewer's forest still surrounded him, but they were leprous and gray, choked by more of the black moss and sagging under the weight of the parasitic fungi. He had not left Silda Ewer, not really. The gray vapors marked the border of a creeping blight, a monstrous disease consuming an entire world. His gorge rising at the smell of the place, a raven pushed himself to his feet and wiped his hands on his cloak. The foul moss left long black smears on the elven greycloth. He turned to look for his companions, and for a horrible moment he saw that he was alone, until Osevile suddenly appeared in mid-air, only an arm's reach from where he stood. She gasped aloud and reeled, but a raven caught her arm and steadied her. I have you, he said. The disorientation will pass. It's horrible, Osevile gasped. A raven didn't know if she referred to the smell or appearance of the place, or her own nausea, but he held her while she found her feet. In the space of a few moments, the rest of the company joined them, each appearing one by one. Donner Kurth set his face in a fierce scowl and said nothing. Maressa winced and found a handkerchief, binding it over her nose and mouth. Nesterin stared around the poisoned forest in horror. This is what the Nilshai have brought to us? His voice broke and he hid his face. Better that it had been unmade entirely than to be corrupted like this. Nesterin, is this the road to Moon Crescent? Do we continue? A raven asked. The star elf studied the landscape. It could be. The lay of the land is right. But this is not Silda Ewer. It is a foul lie. A raven was not sure if the place was as unreal as Nesterin believed. Some great and terrible magic was at work. That much was plain to see. Maybe Silda Ewer's corrupted lands had acquired the traits of the Nilshai world through some unforeseen planar conjunction. 
The creeping blight could have been a terrible spell or curse created by the Nilshai to change the Star Elves' homeland into a place where they might exist comfortably. Perhaps some other force was at work. The presence of a malign god, the corruption of an evil artifact, something. Whatever it was, a raven knew for certain that he did not want to remain in the rotting forest a moment longer than he had to. Let's go on, he said to his companions. The sooner we find the tower, the sooner we can leave. They set out at once, picking their way along the overgrown roadway. The paving stones were slick and wet and made for difficult footing. Bulging, fluid-filled fungi dangled obscenely from the branches of the dying trees along the roadway, some overhanging the road itself. The whole place dripped, stank, and seemed to almost murmur and hiss with the rustlings and clicking of unwholesome things that wriggled and crawled in the slime and putrefaction of the forest floor. From time to time they encountered huge mounded balls of green glowing fungus blocking the road. And when they set their swords to the stuff to clear a path, it broke with soft popping sounds and disgorged emerald streams of foulness across the path. We must put an end to this, Nesterin said. When we return, I will have Lord Tessernil send for the other great mages of the realm. Together they may be able to stem this foul tide. Or, if they cannot, perhaps they can rescribe the borders of Silder Ewer, excluding the corrupted parts. If I can help you, I will, a raven promised. This is an abomination. Shh, hissed Maressa. She stood still at the rear of the party, looking back the way they had come. There is something following us. What do you see? Kurth asked, peering into the darkness behind them. His human eyes did not fare well in the thick shadows and witch light of the place. It's not what I see, it's what I hear, Maressa said. It's big, and it's coming closer. Can't you hear the toadstools popping back there? They all fell silent for a moment, straining to listen. A raven caught the sound almost at once, a distant slopping or squelching, as if someone had filled a bellows half full of water and was working it slowly. And as Maressa had said, there was an awful wet popping sound that preceded the other thing. He couldn't even begin to imagine what might make a sound like that, but there was no doubt that it was coming closer. "'Gods!' murmured Joran Kelharthen. "'What is that?' "'I prefer not to find out.' Ilsevile answered. She tapped the ranger on the shoulder and pointed down the road. Come, let's pick up the pace. Maybe it's moving across our path instead of following us. Optimist, muttered Maressa. But the genocide did not disagree when Joran and Ilsevile set off at an easy trot, pressing on down the road. They made another mile or more by a raven's reckoning. Abruptly they emerged from the closeness of the forest, and a raven felt a great open space before him. He strained to see in the darkness, and gradually realized that sickly green luminescence marked out the great ramparts of a dark citadel before them. Even though he could only catch a glimmer of its shape, a raven recognized the place at once. It was the empty citadel he'd seen in his vision, the tower that Morthil raised long ago. Morthil's shining door was near, and with it, the secret of the Telmirkara Nashir. A lambent gleam stirred in the heart of the night star, and sibilant whispers of ancient secrets gathered in the corners of his mind. Selethil knew he was close, and the evil shade was watching him from the depths of the Selukira. A raven could feel it. Is this the place, Nesterin? Joran asked. The star elf gazed on the citadel's moss brown battlements and said, Yes, that is Moon Crescent Tower. Why in the world did your mages build it so close to the edge of your realm? Maressa asked. Nesterin grimaced. It was not always like this. I think things have been slipping toward the mist for some time now. The tower disappeared from our realm decades ago. I suppose it has been here all that time. Inside, and quickly. Ilsevile said, We are not alone out here. They followed the road to a steep climbing causeway that round up the face of the low hill on which the tower sat. The air was warm, humid, and still, so thick that small sounds vanished in the darkness. At the top of the causeway, a great dark gate yawned open, leading into the lightless depths of the ancient stronghold. Be careful, 
Nesterin said to the others. There were powerful spells in this place long ago, and the Nilshai are drawn to magic. A raven drew his disruption wand from his belt and paused to review the spells he held ready in his mind. Donnerkirth slid his broadsword from its sheath and shrugged his battered shield off his shoulder, while Maressa cocked her crossbow and set a bolt in the weapon. Then a raven spoke the words of a minor spell and illuminated the tower's open gateway. The surrounding darkness quickly smothered the light of the spell, but it carried a short distance at least. Moon Crescent Tower was better described as a large castle than a simple tower or keep. High curtain walls and strong ramparts enclosed a broad courtyard in which a number of once elegant buildings stood. At the far side of the bailey stood the keep porter, a sheer edifice of graying stone that disappeared into the oppressive darkness above a raven's feeble light. The courtyard beyond the tower gates was choked by an orchard of once proud old fruit trees, all dead and rotting. Hanging curtains of green-black moss fouled the elegant arcade of arches that ran along the foot of the walls, and the trees were black with dank, sagging bark. "'This place is huge,' said Joran. "'Where do we start?' "'The front hall of the keep,' a raven answered. "'That's the place I saw in my vision. Morthil's door is there.' They crossed the courtyard carefully, brushing through the wet hanging branches of the dead trees. Weed-choked fountains and mold-grown statues were hidden in the dark foliage, a reminder of the elf artisans who had once raised the place. At the far side of the orchard, they climbed up a broad flight of steps to the keep's doorway. Like the castle gate, it stood open, lightless as a pit. A raven could hardly make out anything more than the silhouettes of his companions in the heavy darkness, despite his light spell. He couldn't imagine how Joran or Donner could see a thing. He led the way up the steps into the keep's hall, the night star whispering in his mind. Once the place had been a great chamber indeed, with a soaring arched ceiling and high galleries overhead. The walls were painted with rich frescoes, but the foulness of the corrupt plain had had its way with the paintings and the majestic old tapestries. Thick gray lumps of gelatinous mold left the paintings mottled or leprous, and the tapestries drooped to the ground. The shining silver door was nowhere in sight. A raven! What are we looking for? Elsevle asked. This is the right place, isn't it? One moment, he said. He was certain the door was there. Visions did not lie, though it was possible that he had not understood what he'd seen. He fought down his sudden panic at that thought, and carefully pronounced his seeing spell, weaving his hands in the precise mystic passes of the casting. The murk of the room lighted before his eyes, and the original shape of the ruined paintings and tapestries became clear to him. He had no attention to spare on the room's ruined splendor, though. Before him, revolving slowly in the air, a spiral of dancing silver light shimmered with ancient magic. Morthil's door, he breathed. It was there, as his vision had predicted, simply hidden from hostile eyes by the star elf's old wards. A raven stepped forward, admiring the artistry of the ancient spell, but then he heard something strange. From the shadows overhead came a soft, fluttering, piping sound, like the quick trill of a flute, followed by an odd crumpling or dull snapping beat. A raven froze and stared up at the dark galleries in the top of the chamber, searching for the source. Beware, cried Nesterin. The Nilshai come! The black hallways leading into the chamber erupted with the twisting blue-black forms of the alien Nilshai, darting and swooping as they poured into the room. In the space of five heartbeats, a dozen of the monsters appeared in the darkness, burbling and calling to one another in their weird piping voices. Maressa's crossbow snapped, and one Nilshai balled up in a dark tangle in midair, shrieking in anguish around the quarrel embedded in its worm-like body. Ilsevile and Joran began to fire as well, sending arrow after arrow up at the creatures. But the Nilshai were not so easily driven off. Two of the creatures flared their wings and hovered, stabbing down at a raven and his companions with brilliant bolts of lightning. A raven leaped aside and rolled on the flagstones, his cloak smoking from a shower of hot sparks, and the rest of his companions scattered. He found his knees and hurled a blazing fireball up into the middle of the chamber.
A great burst of crimson flame blossomed overhead with a frightful roar, blackening the old tapestries and sloughing the gray mold from the walls. Milshai reeled wildly and shrilled in anger, but before Raven had even climbed to his feet, the monsters resumed their attack. One struck at Donner with some kind of illusionary threat that only the Lathandarian could see. The human knight cried out in dismay and began to fend off an imaginary attacker with desperate parries of his heavy blade, backing across the hall and leaving his companions to fend for themselves. Another of the monstrous sorcerers created a whole writhing nest of blind, sucking, lamprey-like maws right at Nesterin's feet, and the star-elf battled furiously to pluck the slavering mouths from his limbs as the things fastened themselves on him. Get them off me! he shouted. Arrows hissed in the darkness, and more Nilshai trilled in pain or lunged out with their awful magic. A raven spied one of the monsters hovering back out of the fight, engaged in a great summoning spell that it was completing with fearsome quickness. I don't want to see what it's trying to conjure up there, he decided. He threw out his hand and barked the words of a powerful spell and before the Nilshai finished its terrible conjuration, a great golden hand materialized around it. The giant-sized fist closed around the monster, cutting off its spell and crushing the flying worm against the far wall, slowly grinding the life from the thing. A raven whirled to look for a new foe, but another of the Nilshai seized his body in a telekinetic grip and hurled him into the air. He heard Ilsevile shout in terror, and the room spun end over end. As quick as he could, a raven began a flying spell to save himself from the fall, but he was too slow. He hit the cracked flagstone with a bone-jarring impact before he finished. His skull bounced on the stone floor, and everything went black for a long, cold moment. Damn, he thought, they're quick. He started to fight his way back up through the darkness to his battling comrades, distant and strangely high above him. With a groan, a raven managed to roll over onto his elbows and knees and pushed himself upright. His head swam and his left arm dangled at his side with a searing hot pain burning in his forearm. He staggered to his feet and pointed his wand at the first Nilshai he could see, barking out the command word for the device. A terrible shriek of tortured air split the darkness as the frightful blue bolt of disruption ripped the ancient hall, bursting one of the Nilshai asunder and tearing the wing from another one behind the first. A raven whipped around to blast at another one of the aerial sorcerers, but he missed the creature. In the blink of an eye it simply vanished from sight, teleporting away. All around him the sounds of battle slowly faded. He looked around and realized that the Nilshai had broken off the fight, fleeing back into the black depths of the old tower. Half a dozen of the monsters lay crumpled on the dark flagstones around the party. Some burned, some riddled with arrows and bolts, one hacked into pieces. They ran off, Maressa cried. Come on back whenever you're ready, you foul flying slugs. Is everybody all right? Ilsevle asked. She straightened up, still searching the dark galleries overhead for any sign of the flying monsters. A raven glanced around. Nesterin bled freely from the ugly sucker bites on his legs and arms, and Joran was hunched over his clothes smoking from the lightning bolts the Nilshai had thrown. But they all seemed alive, and no one terribly hurt. He looked down at his left arm. His hand trembled and ached when he tried to close his fist. I think I broke my arm, he said. Donner Kurth sheathed his sword and came over to examine his hand. So it seems, the Lathandarian agreed. He chanted a healing prayer, setting one big hand firmly over a raven's injured arm, and the hot ache faded somewhat. It will trouble you some for a day or two, but you should be able to use it now, Kurth said. Thank you, said a raven. He flexed his arm and made a fist. It hurt, but not as badly as before. Now what, a raven? asked Ocevile. Where do we go from here? Morthil's door, a raven replied. He spoke a few arcane words and revealed the floating aura for his companions to see. Nesterin's eyes widened in wonder. What I'm looking for is in there. Do what you came here to do, and do it quickly, Jorn advised. The damned Nilshai might return at any time. Go ahead, Araven, Ilsevile said. Her bow was still in her hand, 
and she shook the hair out of her eyes. We will stand watch. I will be as quick as I can, a raven promised. He turned to face the revolving cloud of silver lights in the room's center. It, too, was a portal of sorts. He whispered the words of an opening spell. The nimbus of magic slowed its turning and grew brighter, so bright that his companions could make it out even without a raven's help. Without waiting, a raven stepped into the gleaming spiral of magic. At once he felt himself carried away, lifted up into a marvelous chamber of streaming mist and translucent walls, a ghostly room that hovered in the air above the black courtyard. His companions stared at him in amazement, but they were dim and indistinct. He suspected that he'd become nothing more than a spectral blur of himself when he entered Morthil's door, at least to the eyes of any who waited outside. But within the ghostly chamber, he felt completely solid. He glanced down at his hands and found that his body had indeed grown somewhat translucent. He could see the lightless hall outside through his own garments and flesh. Some sort of extra-dimensional space, he decided. A raven was familiar with spells of the sort, though he had never studied any of them at length, and hadn't heard of any that endured as long or as perfectly as Morthil's evidently had. He turned his attention to the chamber's contents, and as he did so, he felt himself drift farther into the ghostly walls. The world outside faded to a dull, dark smear obscured by misty walls beneath his feet, and the ghostly chamber grew more substantial. Spectral shelves and tomes began to appear all around him, the secret library Morthal had preserved in the ethereal matrix so long ago. Morthal did not want that knowledge to be lost, a raven realized. He created a place where his books and tomes would be preserved forever, safe from harm or theft, yet accessible to anyone who entered without deceit. Even though Moon Crescent Tower had been swallowed entirely by the Nilshai Plain, Morthil's library survived unspoiled. I have to find a way to bring this out of darkness. I cannot leave it here like this. He glanced up at the higher and better-defined floors overhead, and his eye fell on a great dome above him. Centered beneath the streaming mist stood a reading stand carved in the shape of two entwined silver dragons. In their outstretched claws they held a large, heavy tome of burnished copper plate, its pale vellum pages shining brightly in the muted light. It was the tome he had seen in his vision, the tome in which Morthil had inscribed the words of the Talmir Quran Nashir, the rite of binding. He approached the massive tome on its ornate stand. He could feel the magical power contained in the book. Golden glyphs crawled across its burnished pages, glowing softly in the sourceless light of Morthil's vault. He could no longer see or hear his companions in the black hall outside, but he paid that no mind. The tome absorbed his attention completely. He touched the pages, and sigils of molten gold lifted from the tome and began to swirl around him. An eldritch melody of ancient notes thrummed in the air, as if the book itself spoke to him. Eyes shining in wonder, a raven began to read. Chapter 17 One Flame Rule The Year of Lightning Storms Colonel looked ahead into the thick green woods, dark and damp with the second straight day of rain, and shook the raindrops from his hair. All around him rode the cavalry of the elven host, a column of grey-clad riders moving quietly along the Ashaba like so many ghosts. The battle at the Zentish camp was six days behind Evermeet's army. The elves and all the dalesfolk who could be spared marched hard, retracing their steps back to Asha Benford. Colonel was no strategist but it was plain enough to him that Lord Miratar had no choice but to march the army back to Missildale as fast as he could. Since the skirmish at the farmhouse, Inger and Colonel had stayed with Storm Silverhand, riding in a small company made up of all sorts of odds and ends. Some were plain-looking Grimar, who turned out to be former adventurers, murderously deliberate in the thickest of fights. Others were freebooters and travelers from all corners of Faerun who had simply showed up to ride at Storm Silverhand's side. None of the twenty-odd riders who followed the Bard of Shadowdale wore a uniform or held a commission, but Colonel guessed that half of them at least wore the silver pin of the Harpers under their dirty jerkins and worn hauberks. They'd all fought like lions on the earthworks of the Zentish camp. 
Colonel glanced toward the head of their small company, where Storm Silverhand rode, her long white hair plastered to her back. She was laughing and speaking with one of the other riders in their odd little company when she whipped her head up and to the left, searching the treetops overshadowing the narrow track alongside the river. He glanced that way, wondering what had caught her eye, when realization dawned. Ambush! he hissed. From the treetops, a dozen brilliant bolts of fire streaked down, exploding among the elven cavalry all around Storm's small company. Horses whinnied and screamed, fair voices cried out in pain or fear, and the dull gray drizzle of the day flashed into heat, steam, and mayhem. A firebolt blasted into a rider near Colonel, incinerating man and mount in one terrible, glaring blast that hurled gobbets of liquid fire throughout the small company. One thick gout splattered across his horse's face and clung to the animal's flesh, blazing fiendishly. The animal bolted off at once, fleeing in blind panic. "'Whoa, whoa, damn you!' Colonel cried. But he realized that he would never get the animal under control with the fire clinging to its face. Colonel kicked his feet out of the stirrups and let the horse run out from under him. He stumbled into the mud on the trail. But a moment later he had his feet under him again, and he scrambled ten feet toward the river to crouch by a boulder and figure out what was going on. The air was filled with winged swordsmen and sorcerers armed for battle. Colonel stared in amazement. They were elves of a sort, though their skin had a crimson hue and their eyes blazed with malice. The Daemon Fay, he breathed. The first flight swooped past the panicked column, and Colonel saw that it was not a true ambush. The Daemon Fay had simply streaked in through the rain and drizzle, soaring low and fast over the treetops, and falling on the elven column like a fiery thunderbolt. More spells and blasts came from above as the creatures wheeled in midair, scouring the track with emerald globes of acid and crackling yellow lightning. Colonel's ears rang with the fury of the explosions. White arrows hissed up through the air at the flying sorcerers, and a few of the Daemon Fey warriors reeled or crumpled in flight. Storm Silverhand burned half a dozen of the sinister warriors out of the air with a great blast of blinding silver fire, carving an argent swath out of the rain-streaked sky. Colonel swept his swords out of their scabbards and shouted defiance up at the sky. Come on down and fight, you bastards! He had cause to regret his challenge only a moment later. A wave of strange, low-booming sounds washed over him, leaving a foul, acrid stink in the air. All around the column, terrible demons appeared, teleporting into the elven ranks. Behind Storm Silverhand, a pair of hulking monsters materialized, gripping huge cleavers in their horned claws. But the silver-haired swordsman was already engaged in a furious melee with two more monsters in front of her, her sword flashing as she battled against them. Storm! Behind you! Colonel shouted. He hurled himself forward, charging at the demons attacking her. For one timeless instant the battle drifted motionless around him, his blood thundering in his ears, and Storm turned slowly to meet the new threat. Then he crashed into the closest of the ogre-sized monsters, ramming the point of his silvered sword into the small of its back. Colonel was not a small man, and even though the green-scaled monster towered over him, he sent the thing stumbling off balance directly into Storm Silverhand. With a single clean slash of her gleaming sword, she took the demon's head. She flashed Colonel one quick smile, the fierce smile of a warrior born, and her eyes flew open in horror. A terrible blade of bronze flashed past Colonel's eyes and slammed into his shoulder, driving him to his knees. He grunted in cold shock as the hulking demon wrenched its gore-spattered cleaver out of his chest. Hot metal grated on bone, and a horrible spurt of blood burst out of Colonel's collar. Colonel! screamed Storm. The demon's blade stuck for a moment and with a growl of irritation the hell-spawned monster shook Colonel viciously until he was flung off the axe. He landed badly, crumpled in the mud of the trail. Get up, he told himself. You'll die if you just lie here. But dark spots gathered at the corners of his vision, and he felt empty. His sword slipped from his grasp. He tried to push himself upright, to stand, to clap a hand over the awful wound, even to call for help. 
but he had no strength in his limbs and no breath in his throat. Damn, he thought. I don't think I can get up. Then the darkness swallowed him. A raven sat cross-legged on the floor of Morthil's vault. The great tome of the star-elf archmage lay open on his lap, but he no longer looked at it. The Telmir Karar Nashir was upon him, and having begun it, he was powerless to draw back. Of their own accord, the endless passages and phrases of the rite tumbled from his mouth, and the air of Morthil's library trembled with the magic he had unleashed. Some small part of him wondered how long he had been engaged in the reading, how much time had passed since he had spoken the words Morthil had learned from Ithrades and left for others after him to find. With each word he felt his power, his strength, his vitality draining away, dissipating like frost misting away on a winter morning, leaving him empty, hollow, and aching. He could not bear to continue another moment, and yet he realized that if he halted there he would not survive. He pressed on, repeating the ancient prayers and supplications of the spell, even as his strength began to fail him and his chin drooped toward his chest. I cannot stop, he told himself. I must not stop. Yet even though his will was firm, his words began to slur, and his voice dropped to a mumble. He felt like a cold cinder, a graying coal reduced to nothing but an empty shell of ash. Softly, slowly, he slumped to the mist-wreathed floor. It feels as though I'm falling asleep, he thought, falling asleep with my mind awake. Am I dying? He knew that he should care about dying, that he had great things to do and friends who needed him but a raven had no determination left to fend it off. He had lived long and well. He had traveled the world and left it a better place than he had found it. What was there to fear? He surrendered to the soft gray blanket that was stealing over him. Darkness hovered within, strangely close and warm. But then he sensed a growing light. He felt a presence approaching, coming to him through the dark. It was a woman, radiant and beautiful an elf in shape and features, yet incandescent with the power contained in her form. He looked up to her, and saw her with his own eyes. She was a creature of starshine and wonder, a fay queen whose eyes shone like the sun. There was light and affection of a sort in her face, but there was something more besides, a terrible strength and willfulness that awed him. She was magic made flesh. The sudden power of the storm, the capriciousness of the wind, the delight of the ancient stars. An Eldarin, he whispered. I have called a queen of the court of stars, a high lady of the Fay Lords. She stooped over him, her eyes stern, and laid a hand on his forehead. Her touch was frigidly cold. Few have spoken the words you have spoken this day, she said with her eyes alone. Is this truly what you wish, a raven Tesher? This is what I have to do, he answered, his breath as faint as candlelight. There is nothing that you have to do, she said. That is the gift of the gods to mortals. To complete the Telmirkara Nashir is to surrender something precious beyond words. He looked into her eyes, as brilliant as suns, and did not flinch. The Fay Queen seemed to sigh. You will learn the price of your power, a raven, she told him. But this, too, you are free to choose. She leaned down and kissed him, her lips soft yet bitterly cold, and she breathed into his mouth a single whisper of breath. Radiance, warmth, and life poured into his heart. He drew a great breath and felt his soul kindle in unbearable fire. Yet it did not harm him, and it did not diminish in the space of a dozen heartbeats the fire within had spread to the tips of his fingers and the bottoms of his feet, until it felt as though his entire body was a single sheet of steel-hard flame, dancing and flowing and burning and yet frozen into the shape of an elf. He looked at the white lady in wonder. "'What have you given me?' he asked. "'It is not what I have given you, a raven Tesher. It is what I have taken away.' She smiled sadly and her eyes glimmered. You will count this as a great gift for now, yet you will also know regret. Then she vanished, fading away into golden light and leaving him alone in Morthal's ethereal sanctum. 
Morthal's great tome was lying beside him closed. A raven lay there for a long moment, trying to understand what it was he felt. Then, slowly, he pushed himself upright. He glanced up at the ethereal walls of Morthil's vault and realized that he could see the threads of magic, the warp and woof of the weave, woven with skill and care thousands of years ago. He reached out to touch a wall and watched as his fingertips caused a ripple in the flowing magic just as a child might start a ripple in a still pool by brushing his fingers over the water. Despite himself, he laughed out loud in delight. He noticed that his fingertips seemed to glow in his mystic sight. Frowning, he drew his hand close to his face and studied it. Veins of magic pulsed beneath his skin, intertwined with his own blood. His flesh was possessed of an unmistakable radiance. It was still his own hand, warm, alive, and feeling, yet it was changed. Like a fine golden foil it served to indicate his shape and form, but it was delicate, paper-thin, nothing but a hollow shell of magic in which his sense of self existed. Is this in my mind, he wondered, only a perception of the rite's completion? Or have I really changed? He decided that he simply could not encompass what had happened during the Telmirkara Nashir, not at that moment. In time he might make sense of it, weigh the words of an Eladrin queen, sort out the strange sense of self and detachment he felt mingled in his own body, but he could not do it now. He could only continue on this desperate course and finish what he had started. There would be time to comprehend and reflect later. A raven drew the night star from his breast and held the gemstone in his hand. In his new vision, he could hardly stand to gaze on the device, so great and dire was its power. It blazed like an amethyst fire in his hand. Is this what Kilianthia and the others saw when they looked on the night star? he wondered. Or have I gained powers of perception that even other high mages do not share? He frowned, and effortlessly he hurled his consciousness into the gemstone, descending down through its lambent depths like a falling meteor. He sensed the vastness and the purpose of the thing, just as he had before, but this time he retained his bearings. He arrowed straight for the heart of the gem. The night star no longer held the power to overwhelm him. I am coming, Salithal, a raven said, and he bared his teeth in challenge. Ilsevile studied the oppressive gloom that smothered the ancient hall and shuddered. The air was hot and rank, and she felt a cold, sick sense of danger beneath her ribs. The place was perilous. She could feel it, and she knew that the others sensed it as well. They'd beaten off two more Nilshai incursions in the time since they'd entered the place. But above and beyond the danger posed by the alien sorcerers infesting the place, the Nilshai world itself was dangerous. The longer they remained, the deeper they seemed to sink into the darkness, even though they hadn't moved from that spot for hours. I fear that retracing our steps back to Silda Ewer will prove harder than finding our way to this tower, she thought. How much longer will a raven need? grumbled Maressa. She glanced over at the revolving spiral of faint white light hovering in the room's center. They tried several times to follow a raven through the door, but apparently they lacked something the portal required. He's been in there too long. I want to get him out of this place. Unless the Nilshai return in overwhelming force, we will remain here and guard a raven's back, Ulsevile said. He is counting on us, Maressa. The Genesai snorted and returned her attention to Ulsevile. What if he's stuck in there and can't get out? What if it's a one-way gate? How long do we give him before we leave? We remain here until we are forced to leave, Ilsevile repeated. She turned her back on Maressa and walked a short distance away, making a show of peering down a black corridor as if to check on it, but in truth she was avoiding the argument, and she knew it. What happens if the Nilshai come back? she asked herself. Is it worth our lives to protect what a raven is doing? Or do we abandon this expedition if the danger grows too great? It would be easier to answer that question if she were absolutely certain that a raven's quest was something that had to be done. If I knew there had been no choice but to come here, it would be easy to steel myself to stand and die in this black chamber if necessary, she thought. But I wonder what father is doing. Has the crusade joined battle against the Daemon Fae and Myth Draenor? And just how might I have been able to help if I were there instead of here? 
Something is coming, Joran called in a low voice. The Yuya ranger crouched on the moss-covered remains of one of the higher balconies, his bow in hand. The same thing we avoided in the forest, I think. Ilsevile cocked her head to one side, and she heard it as well, a distant wet wheezing or sucking sound slowly squishing its way closer. Did the Nilshai corral the creature to send it at us, she wondered, or did it follow us of its own accord? Everyone, move to a new place, she called softly. They're expecting to find us where they saw us last. She followed her own advice and darted across the hall to stand hidden in a narrow alcove. Maressa simply leaped up and levitated to the highest gallery, as a daughter of the elemental wind she could take to the air when she liked. Donner moved beside a pillar where he could watch the doorway leading back out to the courtyard of the keep. Nesterin flashed a quick smile at Elsevile and found an alcove opposite hers. They waited in silence, listening to the approach of the unseen monster. Ilsevile laid a pair of arrows across her bow and whispered the words of a spell to set them both smoldering with arcane power. The horrible squelching drew closer, and she heard the abominable piping voices of the Nilshai, several of them warbling to each other in the black tunnels around the banquet hall. Peering into the dank gloom, she finally caught a glimpse of the massive creature drawing near. Its skin glistened a translucent pink in the dim light of the growing doorway in the room center. Its flesh oozed and rippled as it heaved itself closer, and Ilsevile glimpsed the indistinct outlines of a worm-like body and a ring-shaped mouth surrounded by small, rasping teeth. The thing was the size of a small inn, and she exhaled in relief. It was so large that it couldn't fit through the archway leading to the courtyard outside. Thank Karelin, she murmured, and straightened up. The thing quivered for a moment, blindly groping for a way inside. Then it found the archway and began to press forward. Its flesh was so malleable that it squeezed through with ease, pouring itself into the room like a viscid stream of slime. She looked over to Nesterin in horror, and found the star elf looking back at her with a similar expression on his face. I thought I couldn't get in, he protested. Ilsevile raised her bow and shot. Two arrows flew as one each flaring into brilliant fire in mid-flight under the power of her spells. They struck the blank wall of glistening flesh and vanished, sinking deep into the monster before coming to rest with the fletching completely submerged. The shafts hung in the thing's body for all to see, burning with bright white light in the worm's snout. The creature quivered and recoiled, but still it groped onward. What in the world is that thing? Ilsevile muttered as she drew two more arrows and readied another spell. Across the hall from her, Nesterin stepped out of his own alcove and peppered the creature with arrows. More rained down from overhead, where Joran shot over the edge of the gallery, and Maressa barked the trigger words of her wands, pummeling the worm's snout with bolts of magic. The creature hesitated for a moment, then it lashed out with astonishing speed, firing a pair of long, silky strands from pores in its head, right at Nesterin. The star elf ducked under one, but the other struck him in the left thigh and clung to him. Nesterin cried out in revulsion and tried to pull away, but the giant worm gave a small toss of its head and jerked him off his feet. It started to reel in the star elf, retracting its strand and dragging him in with irresistible power. Nesterin dropped his bow and struggled to draw a knife at his belt, grimly ignoring the terrible rasping maw of the worm as he sought to free himself. Let go of him, Donner Kurth called. He stepped out from behind his pillar and dashed over to the strand by which the worm was dragging Nesterin. He gripped his sword and struck a mighty cut at the strand. It parted with a snap, sending Nesterin reeling backward. The worm moved farther into the room and fired two strands at Donner. Both struck the Lathandarian's shield, and with a savage oath the human knight shook the shield off his arm before he was dragged off his feet. The shield skittered across the floor to the huge monstrosity in the hallway. Ilsevile, Maressa cried. It's too dumb to know that we're hurting it. What do we do? Ilsevile shook her lank hair out of her eyes and looked up at the genocide in amazement. How in the world should I know, she thought but she didn't speak her thoughts aloud. Instead, she paused for a moment, then called back, Try fire! 
She changed the spell she was about to lay on the arrows on her bow, and instead chanted the words to a fire spell. Her arrows glowed cherry red and began to smolder. Quickly she raised her bow and let them fly. They struck together as flaming bolts, and the worm bucked and twisted, crushing masonry and shaking the whole building. Overhead, Maressa changed to her fire wand and seared a great black swath across the monster's quaking flesh. Donner Kurth dashed at the huge monster, chasing after his shield. He sang out the words of a holy invocation to Lathander as he ran, and the broadsword in his hand burst into a brilliant yellow corona of flame. Burn! he shouted. Burn in Lathander's holy fires, foul monster! He hacked into the worm's snout, carving great black slashes through its body as his broadsword flared with the heat of the sun. The worm shuddered and began to retreat, pouring itself back out of the room. It carried away Kurth's shield, shredding the metal warboard to pieces with its teeth as it moved away. The Lathandarian howled in outrage and redoubled his efforts, but the worm flowed away and retreated into the darkness outside. It took my shield! he snarled. Better your shield than our friend Nesterin, called Jorn from above. Ilsevile lowered her bow and watched the creature flee. Is everyone all right? she asked. I will be, as soon as I get this damn stuff off my breeches, replied Nesterin. The star elf continued to saw at the remnant of the strand that clung to his garb. The stuff was like a cable made of glue, tough and sticky at the same time, and his knife blade kept catching in the stuff. Ilsevile moved over to lend him a hand. Thank you, Nesterin murmured. I hate to say it, Ilsevile, but the longer we remain here, the more likely it is that we will meet with disaster. Is there any chance you could hurry your friend to Raven? Ilsevile looked up to the shining mist in the center of the hall. I would if I could, she answered. But for now, he seems to be out of reach. A raven streaked over a hellscape of seething lava and billowing clouds of foul vapor. For the first time, he perceived what lay outside the white walls of Selethil's palace in the heart of the Selukira. This is Selethil's soul, he realized. This is the part of himself that he preserved for five thousand years in the Night Star, hoping that his evil might endure long after his physical defeat. I am the failure of a dark hope nourished for five millennia. A raven grinned to himself. He liked the thought of disappointing Selethil de Lardrigeth. He caught sight of white walls and golden domes glinting amid the ruddy firelight below him, and he altered his course to descend into the heart of the place. With his cloak streaming behind him, he alighted in the golden courtyard of Selethil's palace. The monstrous mockeries of vines and flowers that filled the place shrank from his presence. Selethil, he called. I have performed the rite of transcendence. Come forth. Behind him, he felt a cold and sharp sensation, a gathering of malice that grew stronger in the space of a few heartbeats. He turned and watched as a column of black mist poured up out of the ground to the height of a man. It roiled violently before materializing in the shape of Selethil de Lardrigeth. I am here, he said. A raven gazed on him without lowering his eyes, and perceived the demonic corruption of the Delardrugeth High Mage. Selelithil's very form fumed with intangible streams of spite and hatred, a black thundercloud of ancient anger hidden behind the veil of a noble-born sun-elf. I see more than I did before, he told himself. This is what the Telmirkaran Nashir has given to me. Selelithil looked on him and in that moment a raven saw many things in his eyes. Recognition, a grudging measure of respect, a bonfire of hatred and envy, and finally, a shadow of fear. I see you have followed the path I set on you, Selethil said. You have purged yourself of the flaws with which the gods have afflicted all lesser creatures. Only the most powerful of mages learn how to set right what the gods made wrong in the first place. I suppose I should congratulate you, a raven. Save your congratulations, a raven answered. I am still myself. The Daemon Fay archmage snorted. You are no more an elf than I am. We are exactly alike, you and I. You have tempered yourself like steel in a smith's fire. 
I did no more or less than that when I chose my path. I am your antithesis, Salithal, a raven allowed himself a cold, hard smile. Morthil's right invoked the powers of Arvindor instead of the Abyss. I fear you no longer. Salithal's eyes flashed in anger. Then you are a fool, a raven Tesher. You believe that you have not damned yourself with your pursuit of power, as if there were a difference between a demon's embrace and an elderin's kiss. You have surrendered your soul. What does it matter to whom you surrendered it? I did not come to bandy words, Salitho. I came to study the spells of Arivandar, not debate your twisted views on good and evil. Now, show me what you have been hiding all this time. The Delardrugeth glowered at a raven for a moment, but then his face twisted into a cruel smile. Ah, he said to himself, now that I did not anticipate, the irony of it. He laughed richly, expansively, and the poisonous flowers of the garden quaked and trembled in reply. A raven frowned. Salithal's persona in the Night Star was bound by laws the Archmage had laid down long ago. That was why the Selukira had been bound to instruct him instead of destroying him when he first set his hand to the stone. Yet clearly Salithil had discerned something new, something that pleased him greatly, and a raven suspected that he would not like it at all. What is it? he demanded. I did not come here to be laughed at, Salithil. Oh, but you did, foolish boy, Salithil said. His eyes were cold with contempt as he laughed again. You have no idea what you have done, do you? A raven folded his arms and simply waited. He did not care to serve as the object of Salithil's humor. When you chose Ithrady's path instead of mine, Salithil hissed, you severed yourself from your salvation. I have not been able to destroy you because I was not permitted to harm one whose soul was marked by descent from my house, no matter how remote. He advanced to step on a raven, and seemed to grow taller. By infusing yourself with the celestial essence of the Elderin, you have removed the last thin vestiges of Delardrigeth blood. I am no longer required to serve you, which means that I am free to do with you as I wish. A raven stared in amazement. Then he stepped back and snapped out a potent abjuration, building a spell shield to defend himself for a time while he figured out what to do. The spell failed. The passes of his hand were nothing more than empty gestures, the words devoid of power. Salithal laughed aloud. This is not a spell duel, a raven. Your consciousness is enclosed entirely within my substance. Neither of us can work magic here. This is a contest of will. Salithal grew larger than a giant, shooting up into the air like a crimson tower, so tall that a raven stumbled back in astonishment and fell. You have placed yourself in my power, Salithal boomed. Now, dear boy, I will repay the indignities I have accumulated in your service. He strode forward and set one immense foot on a raven, crushing him to the hot flagstones below, leaning on him with the terrible weight of a malicious and living mountain. A raven cried out in dismay as Salithil's power gathered over him and crushed him down. Shadow rose up around him, and he felt his very substance, his life, his consciousness, compressed all around, being squeezed out of existence. Salithil's cruel laughter lashed him like the winds of a dark hurricane, and the malice and power of the Delardrugeth's will filled the universe with black hate. Do not fear for your friends, a raven, Salithil cried. You will rejoin them in a moment, or at least your body will. I have yearned for flesh to wear for longer than you can imagine. You are not so handsome as I was in life, but Osevele will not know the difference, will she? You will not lay a hand on her, monster! A raven screamed in empty protest. Salithal's scorn battered him. I will do whatever I like with you, fool! You will bring me to my niece, Sarya! and I will take up my rightful place as a lord of House Delardrigeth. I may even allow you to retain a glimmer of awareness so that you can perceive the extent of your defeat. I owe you that much after the servitude you have visited upon me. A raven despaired in the shrieking blackness beneath Salithal's will. He had stumbled into the very fate he had first feared when he found the Night Star. 
the Seleucira would crush his sentience and seize his own empty body for its own use. The evils that might follow sickened him. What might a Delarduget high mage do with the freedom of a raven's own body? Destroy more of Evermeet's high mages? Lead the Daemon Fae legions against Several Miratar's army? Or simply murder anyone a raven ever loved? He struggled to fight back, to find some purchase with which to gather his will and make a stand. For a moment, he battled his way back to the palace of Selethel's heart, struggling on the ground with the foot of a giant pinning him to the stone. But the Dlardrugeth grinned at his struggles and caught him by his throat in one fine taloned hand. This is my mind, my soul, Selethel gloated. Within these boundaries, my strength is limitless. Do you not understand that yet? A raven said nothing, but grimly fought against Selethel's grip, his feet kicking, his chest crying out for air. But Selethel drew back his arm and hurled him straight down into the ground. The palace of white walls and venomous flowers shattered like a broken mirror, and a raven plunged into the bottomless darkness underneath, tumbling and falling away from the light. He shouted in outrage, trying to fight his way up out of the gemstone, escape, return to his own mind and body so that he could simply drop the damned stone and get away from Selethel de Lardrigeth. But he could not stop himself from sinking, falling, drowning in darkness as thick and heavy as a sea of black stone. Chapter 18 Three Flame Rule, The Year of Lightning Storms the horrors of the last two days and nights had hardened Several to death in a dozen gruesome forms, but at least he looked upon something that he could not bear. Not caring who saw him or what they might think, he staggered to his knees and covered his face. Ah, Corellan, have you allowed me to fail your people so? he cried. Demons had fallen on a small company of wood elves, his wood elves, the merry band from Evermeet's forest who had followed him to Faerun with such pluck and bravado, and flayed alive all they could catch. Several stood in the center of the carnage, sickened by the sound of flies buzzing thickly around the dead, and the mewling cries of those the demons had chosen not to kill. Starbrow let him grieve for a time, standing close by with Karevian naked in his hand in case the demons returned. Over the past few days, Sarya's infernal hordes had struck again and again, hammering at the crusade as the army of Evermeet fought its way back toward Missildale to rejoin Vasilde Gerth. They were still ten miles from Asha Benford, but the smoke of the town's burning streaked the eastern sky. Starbrow looked at the place where a handful of several soldiers had fought and died alone, with no help at hand, and shook his head. Gods, what a scene, he murmured. Then he trudged over and set a hand on Several's shoulder. Come, my friend, he said wearily. We cannot stay here any longer. The demons may return to attack our healers, and we cannot afford to lose any more clerics, or you, for that matter. I have led us into disaster, Starbrow, Several said. My pride brought these wood elves to this place, and my stupidity killed them. How can I bear to live? The measure of a general does not lie in victory, Several. It lies in defeat. To continue after the worst has happened is hard, but if you do not lead us from this place, no one will. Several remained motionless, giving no answer. But then he slowly came to life again, and he nodded once. If only we had been closer. Frankly, Several, it is a miracle you have kept the army together as well as you have, Starbrow said. Many have fallen, yes, but many have lived, too. We are not defeated yet. He looked around at the blood-stained clearing and the gray-cloaked healers who worked silently among those who could still be helped. Come, you can do nothing more here. Several followed Starbrow to the far side of the clearing, where Adrasen and the rest of Several's guard waited with their mounts. They climbed up into their saddles and rode away, passing through a narrow belt of trees before emerging into the open fields and groves of the dale proper. The weather had warmed quickly since the fight at the river, and the day was hot and humid. Several could smell a thunderstorm gathering in the air. 
Doubtless Sarya's demons would strike again in the storm, falling on some other part of his harried army to maim and kill and burn, melting away before he could bring them to battle. That had been the way of it for days. We should join up with Gareth and the companies we left here soon, Starbrow offered. That's almost two thousand bows, plus many of our best champions. Even Sarya's demons will be deterred by that. Severil suspected that the Moon Elf was speaking simply to set Severil's mind on something other than the horror back in the clearing, but he allowed his friend to pull his thoughts to a new course. Vasilde has had an easier time of things than we have, he admitted. The Knight Commander had done as Severil had asked, giving ground instead of fighting. His foot soldiers had retired south and west down the dale, covering the flight of the dale's folk and surrendering Asha Benford to the oncoming Sembians. Had the Sembians wanted to, they might have overrun the whole dale with the help of the Red Plumes and forced Gareth to fight. But they had not moved farther into the dale in days, and Severil could not fathom why. Severil rode closer to Starbrow and lowered his voice. There is something I need to know, he asked. In the last days of Myth Dranor, when the army of darkness roamed Comanthor, was it like this? Starbrow did not look at him. He kept his eyes fixed ahead, gazing on the smoke from the burnings in the distance. Yes, he said with a sigh. Yes, it was like this. The orcs, ogres, and gnolls outnumbered us badly, yet we could have defeated them regardless of numbers but not while legions of demons fought against us, too. I was afraid you would say that. Starbrow shrugged. He had always been reluctant to speak of his long-ago life in the days of Mithdranor. It's harder than you might think to pick your wars. The ones you least wish are the ones you often have to fight. I picked this one, didn't I? Starbrow halted and set a hand on Several's reins, pulling the elf lord around to face him. Several's horse nickered in protest, but turned. Sarya de Largergeth picked this war, Several. If you hadn't decided to stand up to her, she would have sacked Evereska and burned half of the north in her wrath. You answered the call to arms, yes, but that does not mean that you chose this fight. The moon elf looked into Several's face, and after a moment he released the elf lord's reins. If it's any comfort to you, Sarya is not happy with her choice of enemies. She thought she was making war on a scattering of isolated wood elf settlements and a city weakened by a war against the Faerum. She did not plan on you, my friend. And that is a cause for hope. Several considered that as they rejoined the column of weary elf soldiers who marched across Mistledale's open fields like a river of dusty steel. So what do I do now? he asked Starbrow. Withdraw the moon elf said. We don't have the strength to move on Mithdranor, and there's no point in staying here. The folk from Mistledale have fled to the southern parts of the dale. We'll be defending empty farmland. I can't bear to turn my back on Mithdranor, not when we're this close. What do your auguries tell you? Severo looked sharply at Starbrow. He hadn't realized that his friend knew the extent to which he had relied on his prayers and spells of guidance during the campaign. He sighed and said, This is not the hour to march against Mithdranor, and disaster awaits us if we stay here. But I can't see what follows from this Starbrow. If we retreat, what must change for the better before we can take the fight to Sarya again? If we don't retreat, Will any of our army be left to draw sword against her in the first place? Starbrow asked. There will be another day, Several. The Seldarine did not bring you to this place, or me to this place, for that matter, without a purpose. Several nodded. He, of all people, was not likely to forget that. Call the captain, Starbrow. We must plan a fighting retreat. Starbrow clapped him once on the shoulder and rode off, calling for the captains of the crusade. The elf lord watched him ride off and looked again to the east. The thunderheads gathered there, moving lazily against the wind. Ominous rumbles rolled across the dry fields. The storm is upon us, he thought, in more ways than one. A raven plummeted through darkness, an infinite abyss in which the vast power of Salithil's will threatened to swallow him completely. 
Grimly, he resolved to endure as long as he could. Even if he was to be extinguished in Salithel's black hate, he would not go gently. You are not real, he shouted into the endless night. You are a ghost, a reflection, an echo of a mage who died five thousand years ago. You are not Salithel to Lardrigeth. He felt his fall begin to slow, and he turned his will toward arresting his plunge. You are nothing, Salithel, a ghost. Salithel's face appeared before him in the darkness, a titanic apparition that dwarfed a raven. I am substantial enough to destroy you, the Delardugeth thundered, and in your body I will be as real and alive as I ever was. You do not know my strength. You do not know mine, a raven replied. He curled into a ball and closed his eyes, blocking out the maddening plunge and terrible vistas of purple towers and bottomless violet wells surrounding him. He envisioned himself as a shining white light smothered in darkness, a diamond glittering under the blow of a terrible black hammer, and he threw his full will into resisting Salitho as long as he could. That will not avail you, Salitho laughed. He gathered up the force of his will and hurled himself down on a raven's last resistance with the force of a thunderbolt. A raven screamed with the power of the attack, and darkness welled up to fill his being. But somehow he survived the blow. Salithel roared in frustration and attacked again, clutching at him, stabbing into his mind with dark blades that seared and cut a raven's very soul. But a raven battled on, repelling the blows. Salithel's voice became the hissing of a demon, great and terrible, and black fires roared up out of the night to incinerate a raven where he huddled, alone in the dark. Yield, curse you! You cannot endure me! Salithel demanded. Yield! No! a raven cried. Salithel redoubled his assault, but still a raven refused to let himself be extinguished and with that came the realization that Salithel might not be able to crush him, not unless he allowed it to happen. I am stronger than I was when I first encountered the Night Star. I have completed the Telmir Karanashir, and I have shaped high magic. Salithel Selukira could have destroyed me a few months ago, but no longer. Salithel's terrible will lashed a raven again and again, but a raven pushed the assault to one part of his mind and concentrated on gathering his own counterstroke. In his heart he conceived a white sword, a blade of purpose and perfection. He poured his determination, his hope, his love into the sword. He shaped its point with his pride and ambition, and he envisioned himself gripping the hilt with his hands and drawing back for the blow. I will not be extinguished, he cried back at Salithel, and with all the force of his will and mind he burst again the darkness, lunging out with his white sword. In a single great cut he slashed a white gap across the encompassing darkness, and Salithel screamed a high and horrible scream. The night star trembled and thundered. A raven lashed out again, and the white-hot fury of his wrath against Salithel and Sarya and all the evil the Delardugeths had wreaked against him drove him onward. He struck and struck again, until the great violet abyss within the night star blazed with jagged lines of white lightning and the purple ramparts crumpled in white fire. The night star's interior filled with an awful flash of white light, and a raven found himself standing in the courtyard of Salithel's garden, his sword in his hand. He wheeled about, searching for an adversary, but the horrid, crawling vines were withered and dead. He looked at the ruddy fields of lava beyond the walls, yet nothing but cool black rock met his eye. Salithel de Lardrigat lay at his feet, a bloodless wound piercing his heart. Even as a raven watched, Salithel's form froze into a perfect statue of purple crystal. Then the crystal grew dark, gray, and brittle. Slowly it crumbled to powder and hissed away into nothingness. A raven looked at the smear of lambent dust in the dead courtyard, and he turned away, gazing up at the white-shot sky overhead. The night star was evidently damaged, possibly dying. The Arevandaran spells! A raven whispered in a sudden panic, and whirled to look around him. 
but at the instant he conceived a desire to see the secrets within the lore gem, he felt an artifice of magic awaken in his presence. Golden scrolls appeared around him, drifting in the air, each seeming to shimmer and tremble with the power of the spell it held. He stared in wonder, surrounded by the secret horde of lore. If Salithel had not lied to a raven, those spells were ten thousand years old, the legacy of the proudest and most powerful empire of elves that had ever existed in Faerun, the things that the Arifandaran mages might have set down. Choosing a scroll at random, a raven gently pulled it closer and began to read. The setting sun glowered in the west, sinking into the distant forest amid the acrid smoke of dozens of great fires. The day had been hot, and in the sweltering heat and fumes it seemed that Mithdranor was burning again. But these were the fires of industry, the spewing plumes of soot and ash from new foundries Sarya's best craftsmen were raising amid the wreckage of Mithdranor's outlying districts. The air rang with the sound of hammers beating against hot metal as her fairy worked to restore one by one the war machines and battle constructs they had brought with them from Mithglorok. The sound pleased Sarya well. She lingered on the balcony for a time, simply enjoying the open air and the sounds of victory being forged in the ensorcelled foundries of her folk. Then she turned away reluctantly and descended into the great hall of Castle Kermanthor descending in a single graceful leap, her wings snapping open only at the last moment to arrest her descent. Her captains bowed deeply until Sarya took her seat. You may rise, she told them. As they straightened and folded their wings again, she glanced to the side of the dais. There Malchazid stood, a pale swordsman dressed in black robes, his wounded forehead showing only a thin line of dark blood that evening. The Devil Prince smiled sardonically and inclined his head to her. In the presence of Sarya's underlings, he was careful to remain subservient, advising only when asked, never instructing or issuing orders, not even in her name. She believed she was an ally that Malchazid did not want to discard for a long, long time, but only a fool would trust an archdevil, even an exiled one. She reclined in her throne and considered her fairy lords, Mardim Rayathal, the brilliant general, resplendent in his dragon-blazoned armor of black mithril, Jazria Elorathi, the fierce champion, the match of any bladesinger she had ever seen, Teryane Eoloeth, back from her work among the Sembians with Borstag Duncastle's eyes and a small silk pouch at her belt. They were the tools with which she would raise her new Saluvanid, and her heart glowed with dark pride as she considered her cadre of captains. I have tidings from my son, she began. This afternoon Zoth broke the red plumes on the moon sea ride. Malthir's army is falling back on Hillsfar in disarray. Meanwhile, the Sembian army is vanishing like the snows of last winter. Whole companies of mercenaries have abandoned their standard entirely. Sarya smiled on Teryane Ialoeth. Lady Teryane, you have done well. She smiled at the fierce glow of pride that sprang up in Teryane's eyes, then returned her attention to the rest. Sivro Miratar and the army of Evamit are fleeing for their lives. The Zentarim have been shown to be less than nothing. Everywhere we look, our enemies are in retreat. We are literally the masters of all we survey. No army within a thousand miles dares take the field against us. Comanther is ours now, the realm we have waited five thousand years to rule. We are the true heirs of Arivandar, and this is our ancient home. No one will deny us our birthright again. Command us, Lady Sarya said Mardim Rayathal. We await your bidding. The other fairy lords bowed and voiced their assent. Sarya looked down on the fairy. Not long ago, their faith in her had wavered in the wake of their defeat in the high forest, but they were hers once again, mind, heart, and soul. She need only stretch out her hand, and they would die to do her bidding. She felt Malchazid's eyes upon her and she met his avid gaze with a dark smile of her own. Arch-devil or not, 
she was the one who ruled in Mithdranor. A month ago, we did not have the strength to challenge Miratar on the open field, she said. But we have grown stronger while Evermeet's army has bled in Shadowdale and Mistledale. The time has come to smite Sivril Miratar and break Evermeet's power once and for all. We will fall on our ancient enemies like a hurricane of fire, and we will utterly destroy them. The blackness in the hall brightened, and Morthil's door became sharply visible. It started to revolve again, a ghostly image made of white light, and a raven stepped through. He felt strange, light of step and clear of mind, as if his encounter with Salathil had served to hammer out of him the last bit of dross that weighed down his heart. His mind reeled with the things he'd survived and seen in the last few hours, and he longed to do nothing more than sit silently for a ten-day and simply sort out what he had learned. But he had things to do. He opened his hand and let the night star fall to the stone floor. It was dull and gray, its diamond-hard facets starred with countless cracks. He ground the device to powder with his foot until a single white shard remained bright and undamaged. He carefully picked up the smaller gemstone and slipped it into his pouch. The spells of Arivendar remained within, but nothing else. Then he whispered a minor spell to disperse the gem dust left on the floor. Goodbye, Salithal, he thought, and the corners of his mouth turned up in a small, hard smile. A raven, you have returned! Elsevele ran up to embrace him, but when he looked up to greet her, she gasped and came to an awkward halt. She stared at him, her face open with amazement. What? What happened in there? She finally managed. I found Morthil's tome, just as I had seen it in my vision, and I performed the Telmir Koran Nashir, he said. After that, I had a word with Salithal Delardrigeth in the Night Star. Do not concern yourself with the Night Star any longer, Ilsevelay. Salithal's sentience in the Lore Gem has been destroyed. Maressa dropped down from the top of the Great Hall, alighting near a raven. I don't think that is what Ilsevele meant, the Genesi said. Her face was tight and concerned, with little of her customary sarcasm in her voice. Have you looked at yourself, a raven? Looked at myself? A raven glanced down at his clothes and saw nothing out of the ordinary but a faint golden glow clung to him, an aura of magic that flowed through him with the smallest notion, as if he swam in a pool of light. It was not bright, but it must have been noticeable, or his friends would not have remarked on it. A temporary effect of the right, he wondered, or something more permanent? Ilsevele looked at Maressa and said, I don't expect you would be able to see it. Do you have a mirror? Oh, of course. Maressa hurried over to kneel by her pack, rooting through her gear for a moment. Then she returned with a hand-sized mirror, and without a word, she handed it to a raven. A raven felt his companions watching him, and with a little trepidation, he raised the mirror to his face. He saw the cause of their consternation at once, and almost dropped the mirror in surprise. His eyes were blank, shining orbs of pearly silver without a hint of iris or pupil. Faint streaks of emerald, rose, and sapphire danced within, slowly changing as he watched. And his face was young, even more so than might be expected of any elf. He looked as he had when he was twenty-five or thirty, in the first bloom of an adulthood that would last for centuries. Light, promise, and vitality had left his face free of the small marks and habitual expressions he'd accumulated over his long life. What did the Eladrin's kiss do to me? he wondered. A raven, Maressa said quietly. You're not dead, are you? No, he answered. No, I'm not. I am not entirely sure what has befallen me, but I know I am not dead. He looked back to Osevele. How long was I inside Morthil's sanctum? It's hard to judge time here, Ilsevele replied gesturing at the lightless hall pressing in on the small company. But I would guess twelve hours, perhaps more. We have repelled the Nilshai or their monsters several times since you left. Did you find what you were seeking? asked Donner, 
Can you defeat the Daemon Fey with the lore you've mastered? Yes, I found what I was seeking. As for the Daemon Fey, we will have to see. A raven closed his eyes, thinking back to what he had seen when he stood in the burial glen of the ancient city and looked on its mythal secrets. The wards were old and treacherous, much damaged by the city's fall and the centuries that had passed. Burning wheels of magic turned in his mind, sweeping arcs and crackling fonts that geysered from the ground. He found that he could set names to things he had not known before, and understand more of the things he had previously glimpsed only in part. With a sudden shock, he perceived the true peril that was rising in the heart of Cormanthor. Doors, he thought, a thousand doors, and they are open wide. He shook himself free of Ilsevile and stared toward the west, or what would be the west if Nilshai poisoned Sildiuer were a place where such things mattered, trying to peer through the deadly gloom of Moon Crescent Tower to distant Myth Draner. Alesso Sildari, he breathed. It cannot be. What a raven, Ilsevile demanded. What is it? What do you see? We must return at once, a raven said. He looked around at his friends, his eyes glowing like fire opals, luminous and alive. He saw their confusion and fatigue, but he pressed on. There is a graver threat at hand than the Daemon Fey, a threat to all Faerun. We must destroy the last mythal of Arivandar, or everything is lost. Everything. Epilogue it was a peaceful spot, a grassy sward high on a hillside, with the cool waters of Lake Sember glinting through the trees a short distance below. The wind sighed in the treetops, and the forest creaked, rustled, and breathed around Flar, warm and alive with the summer. Insects buzzed and chirped in the noontime sun, and lances of golden daylight splashed in the forest floor through hidden gaps in the canopy overhead. At his feet, a smooth stone marker showed the place where Serena's spirit had been burned free of its mortal flame five hundred years ago. She had outlived him by a century and a half, it seemed, there in the restful forests of Semberholm. Still, that was too young, was it not? She would have been a little more than two hundred years in age, with centuries ahead of her still. Someone might have known her here, he thought. A few of the older moon elves who lingered in Cormanthor after the elven court retreated. I hope it was a peaceful life. So much strife befell our city in the last decades, so much horror in the years of war. It would please me to think that she passed the rest of her days in peace. If I bought her a hundred years of life in Semberholm by spending my last days fighting on without hope, I would count it as a bargain. Flar's eyes strayed to the marker beside Serena's stone, and he felt his heart break for the hundredth time that day. It was not his son. That would have been hard, but he would have been content that his child had lived with his wife even for a short time in Semberholm. But there was nothing there for Arafel, and he could only guess that their son had gone on to live out his days in some other place. He hoped so, anyway. The second marker in the glade was the stone for Serena's husband, Ildrether. He laughed softly at himself, even as tears gathered in his eyes. I would not have told her not to mourn me, he said to the clearing. I would not have wanted her to be alone for the rest of her days. But now I see that I wouldn't have meant it. The strange thing was, he could almost remember a glimpse of Arvindor in his heart. He had been with her there, hadn't he? And he had not known jealousy, or resentment, or anything other than love in the eternal glades of the elven home. Or had he? He looked up into the daylight streaming down through the trees, and his tears ran freely. Is that why I came back? he asked. Is this the thing I am supposed to make right, Corellan? I am a warrior, that is all. Why have you done this to me? He stood there for a long time trying to make sense out of something so strange, so bittersweet and sorrowful that he could not begin to fold it within his heart. But after a time his heart did not ache so much, and the sunlight on his face felt warm and good. He looked down at the stone markers again, and he understood that his former life was no more. 
he had been given a new one, and he could not use it to live the old, could he? Not after six hundred years. With a sigh, Flar turned his back on the silent stones. The crusade, battered and bloodied but still intact, was encamped not far off, and he would be missed before much longer. He picked up Carivian and slung it over his shoulder, and he left Savannah's glade forever.